I know most of you remember the Tenants from Hell. A lot of you have asked me for an update on this, and I finally found one. It's nothing grand, but it is kind of interesting. A couple of different problems. All right, Mr. and Mrs. Large, would you come up and have a seat here? Amber, could you unmute your microphone? Hey, be quiet. Yeah. Are you Garth Large? Yes, Your Honor. And you're Linda Large? Yes. And you're Amber Fox? Correct. And is Pedro Pena with you as well? Yes. Pa it's Pablo. All right. Hello. Pablo, all right. Well, everyone, please raise their right hand. You all swear or affirm any testimony you're about to give in this matter will be true to the best of your knowledge and belief. I do. Yes. Yeah. All right. This is a claim, again, for the statutory limit of small claims, $6,500. Mr. and Mrs. Large were your landlords. We had a previous possession hearing. This is about damages. Looking for that breakdown sheet. <coughs> Uh, the largest claim. First, let's see if we can figure out their figures, and then we'll address your counterclaim figures. So, um, Ms. Large, you contend that rent is November through February at eight fifty per month, three thousand four hundred dollars. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Fox, what do you say to that? I say that I don't go ahead. I said I don't agree with it because every month that I lived there until we got a court date, I texted her every month and asked her if she wanted me to deposit the rent money in the bank because I was still there. And she told me no, that she had told the bank not to accept my payments. Well, once they start a landlord tenant termination action, they can accept your money. Um, so do you acknowledge that you didn't pay November, December, January, or February's rent? Yeah. All right. <laughs> then, uh, Mr. Uh, no. Large, you you had to get a dumpster, $650? That's correct, Your Honor. How much stuff was in there? We had 30, 30 yard. Only one person could talk at a time. It was a 30-yard dumpster. It was completely full. And we had pictures of it. So why don't you let me see those pictures? So, did you hire someone or you went in and emptied this all out? I did it myself and uh, put in mine. This is Bruce's statement of what it will look like. Uh, the little pictures are before they moved in, and the big pictures is well, how the they left is, it. You're here live and they're not. So, right. it's going to be very difficult for them to see these. Uh, they're all dated. Oh, my. Yeesh. We've all right. Heard. We so, all right, we have six fifty for a dumpster. Uh, roach infested, uh, eighty five seventy eight. What is that? Did you get a treatment or something? He bought he bought treatment stuff and and did it himself. It was full of roaches. <clears throat> uh, bathroom cabinet at top one ten. Odor eliminator, 60 Door locks, $35. Broken windows, 318 Wall repair, holes in walls, 41.42. Dog, $25 per month. Does the lease say that? Yes. Yeah. So that's how long is that a year. Uh, i think i don't know how long they had it i assumed a year they never let us know they were supposed to get prior permission did you have a dog there yeah but garth knew about it when our main water line broke because my my twin showed him the dog uh, we'll put a question mark regarding that um Doors and knobs, 
287.66. Bathroom cabinet, $18. Labor, Bobby Wright. Uh, that's the person that helped you under the dumpster. Yes, Your Honor. Wow. All right. So that adds up to $7,300 minus the $800 deposit is $6,500. We'll put a question mark regarding the dogs. Do you agree that the deposit was $800? Yes. Are you talking about Miss Fox? Yes. Yes. All right. So that is applied to any damages. How did the place get so wrecked up? I don't see how it was wrecked up because I had been going through there was not there was already holes in the wall that we've been that we had a repaired a whole bunch. I, I've been painting it, we've been fixing the cupboards. There was a few kitchen cupboards that was broken that we hadn't fixed. The whole bathroom upstairs never worked. Every time the bathtub or the shower or whatever was turned on, it flooded in my bedroom downstairs. Garth told me that he went through and he fixed all that. So I had to wait an extra week to move in when we first moved in. But in all reality, what happened is he went up there and he put back or black um, leaf bags in the ceiling. So Thanksgiving day, the bag must have got too much water because it fell through and it ruined the whole bedroom ceiling like all the tiles fell out on my bed it ruined my twins's brand new toddler bed it ruined my well, laptop. let's talk about that this is your counterclaim you've got water and sewer 1186 what's that about um well when i was there i paid the last bill but when i got this i called the city and the lady told me that this november and december was actually for like september and october and the january and february was for november and december because they bill ahead like i don't know i didn't understand that either so i agree to that because if it's my bill it's my bill all right uh so dumpster 650 all right these are his you got plaintiff owes me i believe uh terminex for roaches and termites that was told about when i moved in 203496 what's that um i texted um linda and i told her that i had been seeing um little bugs all around the house um she told me that she would have garth come over there and look at it which never happened I woke up, I want to say maybe about two weeks later, and the front room that we used for the twins' bedroom, um, I don't remember which one it was, their bed was by the window, and when I woke up to go out there to check on them, they had termites all over them. I well, did you them. hire Terminex? Um, yeah, because they wouldn't take care of nothing there. Linda kept telling me all that. All right, so you spent $2,034.96 of your money? I did, yep. And I actually have the contract in my email, which I didn't know how to get it to you guys because I called them to get this for you. All right. We'll come back to that. Upstairs bathroom, 650. Honor, can I comment on that? I'll, oh, I said we'll come back to it. Okay. We'll let you respond when it's your turn to respond. Okay. Um, now, oh my God. <clears throat> this is their contention this is hard to see but i'll hold these up of what the property looked like when you rented it i can't see none of those yeah well i'm doing the best i can um what? here's the room when you they rented it to you and here's what it looked like when you left can't see I, I, yeah i can't see none of those 
Uh, you can't see that view. No, I can see like me, but I. Me. 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 All right. No. Well, the place is trashed. There's okay, junk well, all over the place. The pictures from when you rented it looked very clean and neat. Uh, you can't see them, but every room is freshly painted, clean floors. Okay, well, they didn't paint nothing, so that's incorrect because I told Garth and Linda that I would paint to be able to move in faster. So there was nothing no freshly painted when I moved in. That's a lie. When did you move in? These pictures are dated uh, 1031 of 2020. I moved, I signed a lease on 11 one of 20, but I can guarantee you that there was no freshly painted nothing because I agreed to do it. You can, I mean, we're under else. So ask Linda, did I not volunteer to paint her whole house just so we could be able to move in? Oh my gosh. The toilet is deplorable. Um, oh, the, 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 the upstairs toilet never that worked. never worked. They would do nothing about it. We tried fixing it. They, they said that you don't. They, I tried fixing the bathroom. We put new pipe. Yeah, hold on a minute. We put all brand new pipes underneath the bathtub because every time the bathtub was used upstairs, it would flood downstairs in my bedroom and ruin everything. That bathroom all never worked. The whole three years we were there. We put in the new wall right there by the bathtub. We fixed all of that. <laughs> all right. Um, well, <laughs> let's see what we can figure out. Miss Mrs. Large, yes. these pictures are dated October 31st of 2020. Are yeah. these pictures that you took that day? Yes. And are they They're fair and accurate pictures camera. of what it looked like just before the day before they moved in? Right. Did the upstairs bathroom work? Yes. Well, I um, have a signed. Johnsons are the ones who moved out on the 31st. Actually, Amber approached her because they were being evicted. We felt sorry for them. And we we told them they were in a hurry. They they could move in on the kindness of our heart, but they'd have to accept it as is. But as you can see from the pictures, it was in very good shape. I mean, it was clean. I have a... Well, did she paint it? She did paint it, but she painted the colors she wanted to paint, all dark gray and so black. So those, those reds and blues that are there, that was the way it looked the day before they moved in. Right, right. yes, right. And absolutely. then she, she painted it other colors. Yeah. All right. all right, now there's junk everywhere when they moved out doors are broken there's trash everywhere there's a clogged toilet which i don't feel compelled to share that picture um it's in deplorable shape so from november of 20 and they moved out in february of 22 watch this so they were there about 14 months um all right now she claims that the ceiling broke loose and some of her property was flooded. What can you tell me about that? I have a signed statement and it's dated from Johnson's that moved on the 31st of October. It's from Penny. She says, when I moved, the ceiling in the bedroom was not leaking. Also, we did not have any cockroaches and never saw any termites. Would you hand that to the bailiff? <laughs> The uh, when I moved in, the ceiling in the bathroom was not leaking. Also, we did not have any cockroaches and never saw any termites. Termites are a little slipperier, but the way this property looked, I could see why it had cockroaches. Um, uh, so did they tell you that the bathroom was, this is the downstairs ceiling? Yes, downstairs bedroom, uh, the bathroom right above it. And I went in there and I checked it out and looked at it, thought I had it fixed. Okay. And uh, 
I guess it kept on leaking. And then I asked What him, was the source of the leak? Uh, the drain. The, so the, tub. the drain in the tub? Yes. I changed that. It, <laughs> I also called that it. I, I, just a minute. I changed, Go ahead. I changed, we changed all of that. We took the wall well, that's, down. That's not something a tenant does. That's something the landlord does. He, but every time I would call Linda and tell her that there was a problem, Linda would tell me I could either fix it or they would condemn the house. And we'll kick you out. Every time they came to the house, if there was an issue about the house being so dirty or so wrecked or whatever, why didn't they say nothing? My house was always clean. I'm not saying that I didn't put trash on the back porch, but I can guarantee you that the house was not dirty. So when I left, there was trash on the back that I I texted Linda and asked her if I could come in, if I could have until tomorrow to get dump passes in a trailer to get all the bags of trash and everything off the back porch. She said, no, we want you Linda told me no, that I she would not know that there was a writ. Okay, that's fine. What am I supposed to do with it? If I don't have a way to move it because one of my cars was down, I had my friends helping me get the stuff out that I that I needed to get out of there. They even took my furniture and cut it and put it on the front of the road that wasn't even mine. It was rent a center. So now not only do I owe them, as they're saying that I owe them, I owe rent a center for furniture that I had just got that is no good to me because somebody cut it up and put it outside to the front yard. So when rent a center pulled up to get it, they called me and had me come over there because somebody cut it all up and threw it outside. Well, that's your honor. Stop. I don't know how to show you these pictures. Okay, so then can we adjourn it and get an in court date? Because I'd love to bring in my receipt and contract from Terminex. I'd love to bring in my receipt from when me and my sister both fell through the deck and she wouldn't replace no boards and made me pay for the boards to be fixed. Like, people for the bathroom. Yeah. Penny and Penny asked for Penny. Yeah, okay, there might have not have been a leak when Penny lived there, but Garth himself knows that there there was a leak because he tried telling me that it was the it was the guts of the toilet. So he was trying to figure it out before I moved in. Linda knows herself that I called her Thanksgiving morning. I apologize for calling her on a holiday, but I told her, I don't know what Garth put up in the ceiling, but a big black leaf bag just fell through all over my bed and ruined everything she even got upset with garth and told garth why would you put a why would you put a leaf bag in the ceiling garth tried saying that i had to have did it all the ceiling tiles was already up before i moved in so there's no way that i could have been able to put a leaf bag in the ceiling and to my knowledge garth got the problem fixed so there would be no reason for me to put a leaf bag in the ceiling all right then, uh, and then okay when the slow, ceiling, slow down slow down uh, you claim that you hired Terminex, but you do have a receipt that you paid them that amount of money? Yep. I got it in my email. What do you know about that? Nothing. They never, they never approached us. They never said anything to us. We feel that would have been our responsibility if, and we and they accepted the place as is it's right on the front of the contract well as is there has to be a minimum covenant of habitability did the city inspect this property when was it last inspected uh, i think it was like a year ago and, and it looked good then it did when we went in we thought well, it, it looks looked good. i'm ashamed of looking at these pictures uh they're in fact, all the toilets are just, I can't even stand a look at them. Uh, why someone would leave a house like that. And there is a full dumpster and there's junk everywhere inside and out. And so uh, we've got to determine that. What I'm trying to determine, there's also the garage seems to be just full of garbage. That's it. And there's needles. There's yes. a picture of needles. There were spoons when we moved in in the garage. <laughs> that was all there. Needle. All right. Yes, you're going to have to be here live to see these pictures, and we're going to have to. But in the mean, but in the meantime, 
No, hold on. But in the meantime, Penny told me that two days after I moved out, Garth had to chase a whole bunch of people out of the house and off the property and all that. So, um, did <laughs> how can right. that, that's what I'm trying to figure out? Like, all right, well, all right, slow down. Did were there ever squatters in there after they left? Nobody was there the day after Garth was working in the house. We had a lady come and she says that grocery cart that's in your yard has some of my stuff in it can i get it we had um two days after they moved out the mailbox disappeared but there was mail in those two days um from um people terry wilson was getting mail there mike and peggy herring was getting mail there um they had her sister-in-law Hannah and Brandon living there. And I'm definitely that lady with that had stuff in the shopping cart. She was living there, but nobody's been in the house at all. The shopping cart. Moved. We've been there. My husband has been there almost every single day since February working on that house. Mm. All right, Miss Fox. Yep. Um did these other people also live there? I don't know who the lady with the shopping cart is. But did Terry but Mike, Wilson live there? She did not. I don't I did don't even Mike know why her Penny, Mike and Penny Herring live there. Penny was um, the past residents. Yeah, them was the past residents. There was mail for Bradley Huey coming there, Mike That's Johnson. Right. There were, when I went to the post office, there is a there's about 27 people's mail going there. Not, that's just not since I've lived there. All right. Who else lived there during the time you were there? Uh, me, Pablo, and the kids. She swears up and down that Brandon and Hannah lived there. Brandon and Hannah did not live there. I can have people over at my house without her controlling my household. She, she tried telling me who could and couldn't be at my house, who could stay the nights there, who couldn't stay the nights there. <laughs> I do what I want to do when I'm paying her my rent faithfully every month. All right. Well, you're using the belligerent technique. You trash these people's house and you're not slightly even remorseful about any of it. You're all in. Okay, but the about house was not Stop. Stop. Um, <laughs> and so it might work with somebody, but it doesn't work with me. So these pictures are embarrassingly bad. You also owe several months of rent, which is not in dispute. So this claim is going to be substantial. What I'm trying to determine is whether there's a set off for your damages. Um, they've supported their claim for $6,500. I'm trying to determine whether there should be some set off from your claim. Uh, normally, if these pictures were scanned in, we could screen share and you could see them. But this is small claims court and people aren't technically savvy, but we're going to have to be here. Now, their claim is that your claim is you've hired Terminex regarding termites. Why you would do that, I don't know. That's the kind of thing you would take to the landlord. But I did. Uh, I did. I did. All right, well, they, all right we'll, we'll, we'll determine that. So we're going to continue this. Okay. From live proceedings. Okay. The irony is you'll get a judgment. You're going to have a very difficult time getting any money collected on it. Right. Right. <laughs> We're going to continue this to Monday, July 10th at three o'clock. Does that work for you guys? Mm -hmm. live um uh, 
the before and after after pictures are uh, telling. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Large, it would also be helpful if you can get from the city of Three Rivers your last date of inspection, rental inspection. We do that. Uh, I'd like you to bring in any other documentation you have, Ms. Fox, including your Terminex uh, bill. Okay. Uh, if it's for termites, it's one thing. If it's for roaches, I'm not surprised that there are roaches if the place looked like this. Uh, but, um, we'll see what we can figure out. As I indicated, I believe they s have established their side of the case. I'm trying to determine the set off for your counterclaim. So we'll continue this to live July 10th at 3 PM. <coughs> All right. We'll address it. I've got a couple other cases that we should have a good hour and a half or so to devote to this. All right, Miss Fox, I'll see you then. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, that'll give me something to look forward to come back after the 4th of July weekend. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. But yes. All right, um, I'll see you then, July 10th at 3 o'clock. Okay, oh, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Yeah, no, you no I'm going to keep the picture. Okay, sure, fine. All right, that finishes our afternoon. I gotta make some notes here. I inadvertently left the live stream on during that PPO hearing, so I deleted it. Um, I thought it was turned off at the end of Land Lieutenant. Do Return to the matter of Garth and Linda Large versus Pablo Pena and Amber Fox. We were here by Zoom on June 26th. We took quite a bit of testimony and I reviewed a large packet of photographs which supported. <clears throat> Just a minute. I thought I was done with this guy which supported Mr. and Mrs. Large's claim for at least $6,500 worth of damage. The photograph showed the property was in deplorable position, uh, condition. Uh, Mr. Lafferty, you came back. Did we forget something? No, I didn't know what happened. So I didn't know if I should log back in and just- Yeah, no, I excuse you, you're good to go. Oh, okay. All right. Um, they had filed a counterclaim for alleged property that it was kind of hard to discern. It was all scribbled on here. Um, they claimed that property was damaged when they had water damage from the roof giving way. So I continued the matter for live testimony and we could actually see the photographs and they aren't here. She also contended that she had a large Terminex bill, which I was somewhat leery about that the tenant would pay a very large amount to Terminex. Um, and I wanted to see it. Well, they aren't here. The bill's not here. No pictures are here, and they're not here to have anything to support their counterclaim. Mr. and Mrs. Large, let me put you under oath once again. You swear or affirm any testimony you give again here today will be true to the best of your knowledge and belief. Yes. Uh, anything further since we were here two weeks ago? You did send some additional pictures which also showed a lot of damage. I'm looking for Amber Fox or Pablo Pena. Anything yeah. since we were last here? Yes, Your Honor. 
after we left court, I called Terminux and I talked to the branch manager, uh, Mr. Kevin DeVos, and uh, they did indeed sign a year contract for the amount that they stated, but they had it, they canceled it. Uh, and let's see, they canceled it in July. Um, and he explained to them they would still owe that money. And she got really irate with him. And they never paid it. And it was turned over to collection. So they, they never did pay that money. All right. You were also going to get the last Three Rivers City inspection. Yes. Do you have the date of that? I do. That was uh, September 15th of 2021. All right. So they were quite animated, but they aren't here to back any of it up. Um, very good. Your property was approved by Safe Bill, Mr. Joe Klein. Uh, in Three Rivers and Sturgis, we have the benefit of having the property regularly inspected, sometimes out in the townships or other villages like the Wild West. People are renting things that really are not up to code. City of Three Rivers does a good job at it, and so does Sturgis. But... Um, They're not here, live or otherwise. I find for the plaintiff. Zero for counterclaim. The amount of $6,500 plus costs of $97.9501 for a total of $6,692.01. I expected they were going to be here. We were going to have a big go round. Maybe somewhat moot because trying to collect on this will be something else. Right. Right. Whenever I see pictures like this, I think I'm sure glad I'm not a landlord. And the before and after pictures are quite telling. The, the property was quite neat and tidy, and then it was something else altogether. And and you're doing it yourself. So right. what you testified last week is since they moved out, you've been back in it. It's hard to make any profit when you spend $10,000 with a loss. Right. Uh, but if you go out to the counter... The clerk will give you a copy of that judgment. They do have 21 days before you can take any collection action, but you're free to go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. A lot of you have asked for an update on this case, and I finally have one for you. So not long after, a order was entered that granted a garnishment of $6,691.01. The thing is, there has to be money to garnish. So you wait till tax time. And by the looks of things, Miss Amber waited until the very last minute to file her taxes, but she did. And the property owners were able to collect $2,171 of that $6,000 plus dollar balance. So in three to four years, they'll be able to pay off the entire balance of the damage that she did, hopefully. People look at taxes in two different ways. Some people adjust their withholdings to make sure that they break even at tax time. Other people don't pay attention to it and end up banking on a large check coming in every spring. I bet she's that second one. That probably stung when she didn't get that check. Wah, wah. All right, I'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.
Lord. Hello. Hello, what's your name? Karina Jordan. All right, Ms. Jordan, you're here today. This is an adjourned date on a landlord tenant case for now paying the rent. Um, oh, we'd adjourn this for the plaintiff to work on some repairs. So it says today that there's still some issues that the landlord needs to do. What does that say? I have to read it. I, I don't plaintiff know. needs but I, I can translate something right. of something from defendant well, we and need, date for plaintiff to make repairs. A list of repairs. Yeah, we need a list of repairs and date to access. We've, um, Mr. Lando personally has reached out to the defendant, but we uh, we've not been able to respond. And without that, we can't effectuate the repairs that are being requested. Was, we don't even have that list to know what exactly needs to be in there. It's, it's been dragging a little bit. So we'd like to get a deadline for that okay. information to be sent over to us. So we can take well, that sounds fair. Uh, do you have the list? Yes. Um, Your Honor, um, Mr. Landlord, Mr. Uh, Landlord, he Landon. Landon. He received. I have emails. He always receives response. They have on February of this year, they received a list via the city of Southfield, the inspection results. That's the list? That was the list of everything that they found in the inspection that they needed to do. One, um, one thing that they needed to fix was supposed to be fixed six days after I moved in two years ago, which is a which is a safety hazard, and all they continue to do is switch management, switch um, lawyers. I don't know who I'm talking to, like the landlord. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Landau. Landau's been there for yeah, a while. Yeah, he's been, I've been. Um, but he normally sends somebody. Yeah, and I, I met with him here the first time, and then we've been emailing because I told him, you know, I am tired of them sending people to do inspections like you guys know what needs to be fixed the city of southfield i had to pay them to come out they've been out twice they gave me the results and they gave them a copy of the results i don't understand what else they need you have the results from the city fix what you, you can you measure things you look at things because the city gave them 30 days they came and they measured things and they checked everything that that, that was on that list and then I haven't heard back from them. But since I've come to court, now they're running on it on my credit report. Now they're sending me letters to an eviction, but nobody's come out to fix what the city of Southfield put. I mean, they well, have they gave them the list. Let's find out, Mr. Joseph. Why don't you have a list from the have, city? We don't have a list from the city on May 28th. You don't have the letter that she says. We don't. We haven't been able to get it, but we did. Mr. Lando reached out on. 28th, uh, the 20th of May, I'm requesting for Ms. Jackson to provide that list or even take a picture of it and text it to him. He gave her his personal cell phone number. All she had to do is take a picture of it and text it to him. She didn't. He then reached out on the 31st of May and addressed. I'm Jackson. I'm sorry, I'm Ms. Jackson. I'm sorry, Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> Where did he do that? Ms. Jordan, I'm sorry. Um, so, we just haven't, we don't have access to that report. We're just trying to get a, a oh, copy. Is this? You can call the city and get the report. So, I agree, John. My thing is this I am, I have my rent, and I told them I spoke with the landlord personally. She agreed with me. I don't know if she's an assistant, if she's gone now, because this is ridiculous. Um, now it sounds like I've been here for two years. I've been patient. The attorney general, I have a letter from them. They sent them a letter last year saying, hey, these things need to be fixed. They told me, they sent me a letter, and I have all that, saying that um, they won't respond to me. You might need to do a civil case. I was patient because every time I go in there, oh, we're under new management. So now I pay in January, and nothing has happened. And now they're talking about, he emailed me. I don't have his personal number. However the case, you're not going to put that on me. It's unprofessional. You have the city of Southfield sent you. You're representing a company, a business. 
And if they're not keeping up with their records, they're constantly keeping up with the amount of rent that's not being paid where I have my rent. But I told the lady and Mr. Landlow, I'm tired of people coming in. I'm taking off work today. I'm taking off work. I'm tired of people coming in saying, oh, let me see what needs to be done and not doing anything. So and at this point, we don't need another inspection. I paid for the city to do one. They need to come in and make the fix, fix everything. And, and you can see I have records that I have all the money. I don't have issues paying my rent. I have issues paying rent at a place where they're constantly, it's, it's the, the whole property is going down. They don't keep it up. But when is your lease up? My lease will be up. So I re-signed in, in February. Maybe they'll just let you out the lease. I re-signed because they told me that they were under new management and they would fix these things because I had gone to the city. So now that was, uh, I think, February or March. So my you thing is, stay? my thing. I have to find a place. I, I'm, I'm on workers' time. I'm going through some physical things. So now I have to up and move because we don't have to. I mean, just I'm just trying to stay until I can find somewhere because I am also going through some personal things, and it's not easy to just up and move. But if I have to, if they're telling me that they're not going to fix these things, then I'll start. I don't, I don't hear that. I just hear that they're not doing a very good job of calling the city and asking for the report and getting a copy. From the beginning, I mean, that's real here. easy. If that's the only repairs. If, if that is the entirety of it and that's a representation you get in court, that's what we will saying. get a copy of it. I'll have my client make sure that they, they secure a copy of it. But we still need access to the property so she can either provide some dates for us or make for us a representation to the court that they can come over with whatever 24 hour notice. She doesn't mind. She, okay. What she's saying is, don't have them come over there and tell me what we need to see again. Right. You, and I have email copies. I'm sorry. I have email copies where I told Mr. Landlaw when the date that they have someone to come make these fix, to fix these problems, I will be here. If I have to take off work like I've been doing, but I do not have time for anybody else coming looking around. For nothing, just to postpone and procrastinate. If you can tell me a date where you can have you two, all right. Well, just put it on them. Then. And I need to be you. There. All you need to do then, Mr. Joseph, once you get the list, is call her with a date, and she says she will make it happen. A date for repair, not a date for another look around or inspection or see what we need to do. Hopefully they got everything they need to repair. Well, they took the uh, they took this thirty days after because the city gave them thirty days, so they had to do within that time to come and say what they were going to do and how they took measurements. They took pictures. So they do have some things they, they had. Them. I don't know what management is dealing with it now, but they had those things. And, and there was that is active. There was a change in management, and so there. Mm -hmm. there was likely some disconnect. Probably got lost. There was likely some disconnect. And I know um, there's another individual, Ms. Jackson, who I was reading these notes when I was addressing Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Jordan here, but a similar situation. So they are working on it uh, for the book years. So I don't know what you're going to want to do in terms of the timeline here. Um, but um, Well, uh, let's see. Let's give another date long enough out where something can get done. You are going to ask for one question. Yeah. Um, we'll make one more statement. Um, I've, I've been there two years and they've been changing management every time a situation arises. My thing is this I want to make sure they understand that my rent is in, is in a bank, a separate escrow account okay. until the repairs are made and it will continue to go in there. All right. I'm, I'm good with that. That's what the law says you should be doing. So, well, Judge, if you want to go a little further out, I mean, you could have August. 8 or August 22nd at 10 o'clock. Is August 8th good? I prefer to stay in July, Judge. July 25th. That's fine. July 10 you think you're going to have them fixed by July 25th? No, they haven't been fixed since January. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. This one particular thing hasn't been fixed since I moved in on 22. I'll go with ago. August the 8th. You know, I, I'm not worried about her paying her rent. I'm just worried about your client moving quickly. So August the 8th, they should have something done. What, what time, time is it, Mark? 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. And so we have an agreement that the plaintiff is to call the defendant 
to give a specific date for entry or repairs. And you're going to do that from your office, right? It's not going to be the landlord. It's going to be the lawyer's office because Mr. Landau's been involved in this. Well, whatever the court prefers, I, I would say. Well, I want us, I want you all to do it so that therefore I can hold you all accountable because I don't know who the landlord is. Right. Well, the, the, the issue for us is that we don't have access to the schedule for maintenance. And, well, you all can call. And so it would become. You have client control. Your client can say, we can fix it on this date. Right. You can say, okay, that sounds good. And then you guys can call. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. That's what the court uh, prefers. So the next date for us is August the 8th at 10 a.m. And uh, we'll see everybody back here then. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Norb Leonard appearing on behalf of the uh, Plaintiff American Standard Roofing. Okay, and what's your name? I'm Sharita Moore. Okay, and uh, so this is a motion. It was a motion to set aside a default judgment previously filed. We were here on June 10th, and no one appeared for the defense. So what had happened was there was a notice that was went through the on base system for graduation, which came through, I guess, on June 4th, but it didn't get processed in time by the clerk, so we didn't know. We had just gotten it during the hearing. So we just reset it and re-noticed it for today. Okay, so that's what happened. And so let's see, now you're asking the court to set aside a judgment. And this was a default judgment entered when? Let's see, it was entered. By the clerk, April 22nd. And it was for $15,141.57. Okay. So, says they said, well, looks like they served you by alternate service. That's what the register of action says. I don't. Have that document. Okay. They have some. Justin, can you make me a hearing check? Because I, I don't have the, all the documents. This is on American Standard versus more. And I'm looking, what I'm looking for is the uh, proof of service. Where, let's see, I don't have it in my bench. So there's no. <clears throat> so there was a proof of service on the complaint that they did it by tacking on March 13th. At 2.01 p.m. at the Spring Hill Drive address. And I show a picture of it tacked to the door. So that's one. There was a motion for alternate service allowing them to do other things than serve you personally. <coughs> And that was because they made several attempts to find you and didn't, weren't successful. So they asked for that. And let's see. If that's, I think it 
So that alternate service was ordered by first class mail, tacking at your address, and then certified mail. At the proof of service for the posting. Okay, well, what I don't see in here, I see proof of service on the tacking, but I don't see a proof of service on first class mail or certified mail return receipt. Do you happen to have that? Um, I don't, I'm looking everywhere. I don't yes, see Your that. Honor, it's attached as Exhibit G. To what? To our uh, brief in opposition to this motion to set aside the call. Why wouldn't it just be filed? We should have it just as a simple file, you know, once you serve. Um, uh, it's my understanding that that was done. If, if I may, Your Honor, Judge, with respect to the tacking on the door. That I got. Right, we did get a call. I got a call from Ms. Moore right after that occurred. And she did complain about the tacking on the door. And I suggested, you know, as politely as I could, because I'm not her lawyer, my best advice would be to get that to a lawyer immediately. So she did get the, the complaint. Did and, she get it? And that's how she got my number. I got the complaint when I got back home. So it was after everything was over. And when I contacted him, I contacted him because I spoke with someone at American Santa Rosa, and they meet me and the manager. Actually, I made a payment, and we had me and me him and the insurance company got on three way call and got everything so resolved. That's when I contacted him, and he told me get away. She received my number from the complaint. That's how I knew she had received the complaint and told me it was tacked on the door, which we did get the alternative service. We also mailed it. Certified mail and regular mail. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I don't yeah. have the proof of services on. I don't know why. But, um, I have looked when, at I every get, when I did get the call from her, of course, we did. I did give her time. I mean, that was the day she was served, the day she called me that she got the complaint and the requisite number of weeks went by. Well, ma'am, you didn't respond. Well, no, I, I didn't get. I would see, I'm a licensed real estate. I stay in Georgia and Michigan. I wasn't here. When I got back, that's when everything. Because it was a transition in my family. So I was down there helping. I come back. That's when everything was transpiring. That's when I called American Center Roofing. I called, contacted him. He did tell me to get a lawyer. But the well, okay, well, we can't say you weren't served. So we can't say that there was lack of jurisdiction if you were actually served. Constantly. But that was after the judge, after the court day. When that you, was after. No, no, you were served before the judgment even got entered. Okay, you have to be served before we even enter a judgment. But no, but I wasn't served because I, I wasn't here. That's what I'm talking about. Well, no. oh. What you're not understanding is there's a difference between serving you personally and you getting it in your hand and us tacking or having them tack, send it by mail. You could get it by mail, right. first class, or certified and just never pick it up. Oh, yeah, and you yeah. still serve, right? Yeah, so and I tacking did. on your door is still service. It's still good, even if you there's don't know anything about it. Got you, right? right. All right. So you can't say you don't. We don't have jurisdiction because I think that was done properly. You just didn't get it. Yeah. Although he did say he gave you some extra time to try to respond when you called him, but he did not advise me of that. Okay. So that's that's you know. Well, you had a right to try to file some type of response. Okay, you didn't do that. The reason was you're out of town. Okay, yeah, I get that. What is your meritorious defense to the claim that you owe American Standard whatever the amount of money is? Um, well, because me and American Standard Roofing, um, it was the amount, even in this, in this uh, the motion. Yeah, the, the, the original complaint. complaint says that they that you owe them uh, twenty something in excess of twenty five thousand dollars. Right. Which we can't give you no, in excess of twenty five thousand dollars. Something oh, okay. us, um, something not in excess. So it, it, was it, less than, it was fifteen thousand. Not in excess. Okay. All right. So in the complaint it states that the insurance company paid the entire claim, which is false. 
and I have um, documentation from the insurance company that showed the payments that was paid out. Um, me, American Standard Roofing, and the insurance company, which is insurance on a three-way call, because it's, um, insurance provided me with statement balances that was all different types of amounts, 16000 14000 9000 So I was going back and forth with them, asking them, what is the accurate amount? Because this is not the amount that insurance paid me. So um, I see names in here that I never spoke with. The um, only person I dealt with there was Zach. So when me, Zach, and insurance got on the line, which was for, um, April the 19th, we agreed at that time. And he spoke on the phone with the um, agent. Who is he? Uh, I'm sorry, Zach, mm -hmm. which is from American Santa Rufin. She explained to him that these are the payments that was made. He understood at that point. I did withhold a six thousand dollar check, which is the last check, because of the discrepancy of the amounts that they they gave me. Once we was all in agreement, that's when I paid. It. So, do you know about that? Oh, uh, it's set forth in our motion. There was a check after we went through all this, paid in the amount of six thousand, but that is inconsistent. We're we're reducing whatever is owed on the default judgment by that amount. But judge respectfully, the the amount set forth in the original complaint, which she did acknowledge receiving by a tacking on the door, even if she hadn't, this clock would still begin to um, tick when we posted it, but she got it and called me and I suggested um, firmly that she get a lawyer and she had time to get a lawyer. We didn't seek the default before the number of days went by and we did not hear from her. She knew my client was represented. We're not seeking to double dip any payments here. Whatever she paid and is indicated in our uh, response to her motion to set aside will be deducted from any default judgment. But she has to show respectfully judge good cause and a meritorious defense. She's, That's what I asked her. She yeah, said she, her defense is that there's different amounts that your client assessed. Sir, please step outside. Like now. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, now that's the first warning on phones. If it goes up again, you gotta get a penalty fine. So please make sure everybody that your phones are off because it's so much of a distraction. Yeah, her argument is basically that the amounts that you was alleged were different and that she came to some agreement as to what the amount was is different than what the complaint your judgment was and i have all the emails from american standard roofing that shows all the difference um, it started at 9,000, 16,000, 13,000. so i'm calling asking why is it, all these are these discrepancies they kept telling me we're going to get someone to call you back we're going to get and at that point so yeah. what is the amount that you claim was due the um the amount that i claim was due it was supposed to be the six thousand that i withheld plus a fifteen hundred dollar deductible because me and zach worked that out it was actually a three thousand dollars deductible, but um, fifteen hundred dollars well, deductible. Well, if Zach worked it out, why we can't? Why didn't we just confirm with Zach that this that's the amount that they've all agreed upon, and then just deal with it? And I, I he's the with, client. That's America Standard himself. Apparently, I'd be willing to adjourn it to let that occur. Because we certainly, I mean, if it's all paid off now, the agreement, agree it, then we could just. Judge, I do want to make it clear. I represent them. I, she should not be contacting my my, my clients. She well, knew. she, I don't know when she did that. She's not doing it now, but she, she says after, she after did it. Receipt of the complaint. It's, it's, it's but so, Judge, I, I want to make it clear. Our position is she's in default. She has to show good cause. Her argument is. Okay, her good is, cause is that she was out of town. And didn't get the complaint. In Which time. all occurred before our motion for alternative service and tacking it on her door. That tacking was service, whether she got it or not. What makes this argument egregious is she got it and called me. I asked her to get a lawyer. I implored her to get a lawyer. No lawyer ignored it and in default. Why do I have to get a lawyer when I have payment? Okay, then, and, and you're, you're, well, I'm not going to do an injustice, and it would be a manifest injustice if this is not the right amount, and I just don't know. 
She claims she has documentation there to support it, that she talked with your client and that they came to some agreement about what was supposed to be paid. Now, that's only fair. And, and we want to get him in here, whoever he is from the company, to talk to tell us that. Sure. That's great. Sure. And if he says, no, that's not right, then maybe Mr. Fauci is saying. But at this point, um, the, I think there's some question, especially when she's saying she has information from the client himself that said they worked this out. This is not just her saying this is what I think. This is what she's saying that the client agreed to with her. And so I need to know what his position is on this. And so what I'll do is I'm going to, I'm not going to grant the motion yet, but I will adjourn it over. And we can, what's his name? Oh, Zach. Zach, yeah, let, let's get Mr. Zach in here and have him tell us. Judge, he, he resides in Chicago. Well, okay, well, he can get on soon. That's what we get to. Judge, I do want the record to be clear. Under Michigan law, she has not shown good cause. That's no. up to me to make that. No, I understand. I'm just making the I'm just making the record. And she has not submitted the requisite affidavit of the people, but she's given me enough information to make me question it. I'm not granting the motion, just so that's clear. I'm not granting your motion because what you're asking me to do is telling me to get enough information to set this aside to go to trial. Okay. And I don't know if that's what you're trying to do is go to trial, but I do want to know why you have emails from the client himself saying, okay, yeah, this is what we're agreeing upon. And you released your last $6,000 and that everybody agreed that takes care of it. And if that doesn't, we got this judgment out here. I need to know what the answer to that is. Judgment. Uh, the court ordered her to give me a copy, or maybe she will sure. give me a copy. I'm more than glad to review but, it. And another thing is, your, uh, the complaint keeps is throughout the complaint, it states the insurance company paid the entire claim, which is inaccurate. The insurance company did not, and I have a letter stating it. So, well, what do you have there that you can take copies and share with him so that he can see what your client, okay. his client said to you? Because we can we can get some copies. This is a letter from the insurance company insurance to show that we was all on a three-way call on the papers that was made up. Yeah, I judge. Thank you. No, you made it. My car is khaki. My nose is totally. Yes. Oh, great. 35 years in there. This is not. Golden children. And now you're down to the city. It's not. And this is important. And judge, for the record, she had a letter from Karen and Sander. Somebody wrote it to me. Eddie Viskowitz, head of elections. Um, yeah, you have an outstanding balance of fourteen thousand seven hundred and fifty eight dollars on our probation. Yes. Your hand yeah. number and our complaint. Oh, but what about this one? This one's after that. Well, when you have to invoice, and then she has a from National General Insurance Company. Apparently, checks were issued to her for twenty two hundred ninety. You've got to be insane. Poor Angel Washington. She did it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what all that means. It was in a vacuum for me at this point. That's why I need to understand it. I haven't seen any of it, and I need to understand it. And I need the client to verify what's going on with this. So we'll get you copies of that. So much. So that everybody has a copy. Make two copies. Make one for me. Yeah. How are you doing other copies to show the different amounts that they do? Want? Yes. Yes. All right. So we can't do just courts available. July 16th at uh, 9 a.m. Um,
entire week on vacation. And you were tired. Let's go <laughs> another day. Um, Courts available July 26th at 1.30. July 26th at 1.30? Yeah. Is that good for both? Could I push it one only because that day I have a major settlement conference on something? Okay. I'm just not going to write it till we get it for sure. Right. What, what, what's the, first the next two week? weeks of August? I'll be in Georgia and we're in South Carolina. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, courts available August 22nd at 1.30. School starts. <laughs> Oh. oh, August 22nd, 1 30. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> that gives us plenty of time to work through it. And I'm, a, I'm expecting that you all will both do that once uh, Mr. Leonard gets a real good chance to review the documents, talk to his client, and then we'll come back and we'll have the client present to explain to the court for his view of what was said. Um, and we'll we probably be able to resolve it hopefully on that date. So that'll conclude the matter for today. And we'll come back, we'll send the notice out for August 22nd at 1 30. Judges, is the court ordering my client to be present or representative? Yeah, you know, you could come on soon. That's fine. Doesn't have to actually be here physically as long as he's seen everything and you talk to it. That's fine. This case pushed a lot of buttons when we first watched it. We're gonna push through and watch it again, and then I will follow that up with an update. Here's one we haven't seen before. Dad is trying to get mom's parenting time taken away because mom keeps throwing out SA allegations against dad and making her children go through SA physical examinations with doctors. How do you think this one's going to play out? For the record, this matter is before the court on the plaintiff's motion for to show cause, as well as the defendant's motion, emergency motion for sole legal custody essentially modification of custody as well to, as to suspend plaintiff mother's uh, parenting time. This hearing is being conducted via Zoom. President is attorney James Petrangelo representing uh, the plaintiff mother, Regina Smith. Ms. Smith is present. In addition, attorney Teresa Olet is present representing the defendant father, Shane Smith. And Mr. Smith is present with Ms. Olet. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, before we begin, the court would note for the record that this court did enter in order to show cause on February 29th. Uh, directing the parties to comply with the order of this court regarding parenting time and for the father, defendant father to return the minor, the minor child to the mother and appear on this date. Um, within a couple of hours after signing that order, the court received an ex parte order from uh, Attorney Olet on behalf of Mr. Smith suspending mother's parenting time, uh, but the court had already set this matter for hearing, so the court uh, did not take any action on the defendant's request for an ex parte relief. Uh, both having been received within hours of each other. Um, anyway, the parties have conferred with uh, Ms. Pred this afternoon. Ms. Pred has recommended the current printing time remain in full force and effect. If the court's who calls, Dad's has printing time every weekend, Friday 5 to Sunday at 5. Um, also noted that uh, not only Father, but also mother violated the orders of this court regarding parenting time. Um, there's no question the parties are taking things in their own hands. Uh, Mr. Pred, have you received 
copy of the defendant's response to the plaintiff's motion. Uh, there is attached to it uh, a number of uh, CPS law enforcement reports. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, the court went through all of those, and obviously there's concern, uh, we say to everyone, on, on, on protective services, law enforcement, of on the mother's conduct, uh, making uh, particularly, the court would agree, Mr. Petrangelo, these go, and most of these date back to prior to the last order of this court of July 18th, 2023, but uh, the court was sort of somewhat taken back by repeated uh, unsubstanti um, unsub sub unsubstantiated complaints of child abuse on the part uh, made by Ms. Smith. Uh, the minor, the daughter of the parties that went through three same exams, same exams within three months. Three same I don't exams. I just said this better for a hearing. I just want to make sure the front of the court's aware of all that. It's a protective service has never sought to petition this court or file a complaint against Ms. Smith. Why? I don't know with that kind of history. Um, but the most recent complaint that was made by a mother in January of 2024, um, and that report was made to West Side Police Department as well as Protective Services. Does anyone know the status of the January 2024 uh, incidents reports by mother? To my yeah, knowledge, well, no formal case. action has been taken uh, toward either party. Okay, so it's still pending as far as you know, Mr. Petrangelo? Well, I, I suppose... It's a question. If no action is being taken, I don't know if anybody's acting on it. Um, I, I've seen no uh, reports of any recent activity from law enforcement. Okay. Mr. Petrangelo, did you receive a copy of the defendant's response to your motion and all the I attachments? Did. I did. I don't know if those. I don't know if those were provided just to the court or if the other uh, other party received those and Ms. Laprade received those. Obviously, Ms. Laprade, her office received those. Yes, sir. Uh, we we received it. All right. Um, and uh, the court would note that mom filed a police report against dad as late as February 6th, um, claiming an occurrence occurred on February 3rd again, with again a false allegation. And according, we, we just received the report today um, that, again, Westland Police is they're going to close the case because it's yet again another false allegation of sexual abuse against dad. Right. Um, Mr. Petrangelo, is uh, Ms. Smith still being assessed by a uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner by the name of Patricia Tiemann? Do you know? I, I know my client attends counseling. I'm not sure if that's uh, something different. Uh, uh, Ms. Smith, there, do you know who, who the judge is referring to? She is uh, retired. She retired uh, a few months ago. So is she, are you still seeing her for any reason? No, in October, I believe, of 22 is when I started getting on antidepressants with uh, when I was seeing her, but I no longer see her. That was a year and a half ago. Yes. Okay. Well, the reason the court's asking, uh, thank you, Ms. Petrangelo, is the court believes that uh, Ms. Smith should not to be evaluated. And I, uh, she previously saw a, 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 a nurse, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, so somebody of that level that can do an assessment. Um, they, of course, somewhat uh, shocked these allegations had come before the court prior. I know where the parties were back in this court in 2023, but uh, they said the reports that Ms. Oletta's provided the court, uh, the court never, those never came to the court's attention in the past. And uh, the well, court, uh, if the court's going to follow this recommendation today, the court's going to add to it. I wanted, uh, the, the court wants in a psychological evaluation of Ms. Smith. Well, Your Honor, if you're going to order psychological evaluations, they should be done of, of each party. Uh, I would I would say, Your Honor, in this case, everything that's been raised with the, uh, except in the last few weeks, is all related to prior to your last order. These, uh, uh, the parties met with CPS. They haven't seen fit to take action against either their letter that i attached dated february 15th 
said the parties should follow the order, current parenting time order of this court. So CPS saw no emergency, saw no urgency. And what did my client do? She followed what CPS said. What did Mr. Smith do? He took the children, refused to return them, pulled them out of school, which is in the effect of telling the kids, don't you dare ever report anything I do, or I'll put you somewhere where you can't get any help. You have no counselor to talk to, no school authorities, no parent. Uh, that's the scenario we're here. He held, held them. The only thing we have recently is she went to a doctor. The doctor said, report it. And I've attached the doctor's statement to that effect. She followed what the doctor said. When CPS said, follow the court order, she did. So she did exactly what this court, what was required for except for two days. That's a proportionate response by her, does not indicate any psychological problem. What isn't proportionate is father with no emergency because CPS didn't see any, refusing to follow what they said, refusing to follow what you said, pulling the kids away, pulling them out of school. I don't know what that has to do with anything except to keep them away from everybody. So it is, uh, Mr. Uh, we've, we've submitted photos to the friend of the court today and to counsel that uh, uh, show what appeared to be injuries. I can forward them to this court. I didn't want them in the court file. Uh, huge red, uh, purple, uh, circle on the child uh, similar kind of injuries on the child uh, it was a couple of days before she got into the dr benjamin uh, but his recommendation was you you are to go to the police he made the report to cps um that, i mean that's the scenario i don't see anything based upon that of of any conduct in the last eight months with these people for uh, uh, to suddenly say my client's acting psychologically inappropriately. And your honor, well, I just would the like court to point out- the, court's read the, the court has read the pleadings thoroughly from both sides. So I understand there's appropriate response um, uh, by withholding of the print off a weekend, but no, not a long period of time. They both parties are at fault, but clearly there's a history here, which this court was not aware of till just recently on the part of Ms. Smith. And the most recent was manifested in this uh, another January 2024 report. I agree, most of these allegations go back to July of 2023, but the court was not aware of some of these allegations. There's numerous witnesses that indicate that these children are being coached by mother. Uh, the professionals have concerns about, about mother's relationship with the children. Um, and the uh, protection is very slow to act, very slow to act. So I'm, I, uh, it's not surprised that they have not taken the action. And the court sees no reason for a psychological evaluation of Mr. Smith, but the court will or that'd be a psychological evaluation of uh, Miss Smith. I was hoping somebody, it doesn't have to be a physician, maybe a physician's assistant, uh, somebody that maybe, uh, I don't know if Miss Tiemann does any private practice. Does she do any private practice, Miss Smith, or is she totally retired? She's retired. All right, maybe she can uh, she suggest something to you. I, I'm just, I'm really concerned about the, the, the it's the, uh, the continual. I mean, there's a pattern here. And back, and yes, my Miss Miss a lot of these things are old. Um, it doesn't provide the court for the, the basis right now to change custody or parenting time because they go back to most of go back to prior to this order of July 18, 2023, which the court rec recalls the parties agreed to. Yeah, his parenting time was every weekend, Friday at five to Sunday at five. But th there's a history here that's quite disturbing to this court. Um, and your, your honor, I mean, she just filed in February another police report and they didn't attach ironically enough, the full medical record as to why the doctor referred mom to make another CPS report. And that's because of mom's history of what happened. Mom is the one who stated that, um, which has improved. Mom develops suspicion of injury when she overheard the child talking with his six-year-old sister, whispering, 
Mother stated she heard daughter state the father threatened to hurt them and for them not to tell anyone. Mother further stated the daughter stated father tied patient to a chair by the ankles and has given him an Ms. Olette, Ms. Olette, yeah. the court has read all of that. You don't need to recite to the court either. Instead of read every pleading, every piece of paper has been submitted, I've read. Uh, the court notes for the record there are sexual complaints made complaints made by the plaintiff mother on October 2022, April of 2023, May of 2023, June of 2023, now again in January of 2024. So the uh, the court is inclined to adopt this recommendation. Parent time will continue. I'm going to set a review date, and then the court's going to order that to Ms. Smith secure a psychological evaluation. And, uh, and so mother's and parenting I think time whoever's going to do that evaluation needs to be provided with the, all these reports. So Ms. Bertrand, once she's identified a person that would do this, if you could uh, inform Ms. Olette, uh, the person who is going to do that evaluation, so Ms. Olette can uh, transmit a copy of these all these CPS reports and doctor's reports to that um, psychiatrist or the nurse practitioner psychiatrist. Um, so they have the, the basis for this court's concern. So um, can this be a psychologist or psychiatrist? You said psychological report. I wanted to be yeah. clear before I ever get somebody lined up. Uh, any thoughts, Mr. Pratt? Or, uh, again, I, I just know the reports that my mother was previously being, uh, was seeing a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Uh, so I, I think it's more of a psychiatric issue than a psychology issue. I, I, Looking for some uh, suggestions, guidance, help. Your Honor, I I would think psychiatrist. It, it's been my uh, history of knowledge that psychologists are more so medication when a patient needs medication. So if you want an actual diagnosis, you're probably going to want a psychiatric. Okay, Miss Olat, would you agree? Um, yes, we would agree. All right. So, Miss Petrangelo, an answer your question via a, a psychiatric evaluation. Your Honor, for the record, a week ago, the parties had a family meeting with CPS as well as Westland Police and uh, Attorney Olette was involved in that, which is part of the reason I made the recommendation I made. Um, they did note, though, that mom needs to stop filing false allegations with CPS. So there has been involvement, Your Honor. Okay. Is it possible they may file a authorize a CK authorization of a complaint against mother? Is that still open or pending? That's what we were told by the Westland Police Department. Okay, okay raise to be seen. Furthermore, CPS has already indicated that they are um, formulating another case against mom for um, medical abuse as well as mental abuse of the children for having them undergo all of these exams. And if, uh, if that comes to fruition, Ms. Ollett, bring it to the court's attention. Um, again, the court's going to add to Ms. LaPrade, if you add to your recommendation, uh, to your recommended order, Ms. LaPrade, that the, uh, the plaintiff mother secure a uh, psychiatric evaluation uh, as soon as possible. And the court, like I said, this for review. I don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, perhaps you can assist her, Mr. Petrangelo, in identifying such a person. I was hoping this Ms. Tillman was still available. Ms. Tiemann is T-I-E-M-A-N, Patricia. Uh, perhaps uh, we could, con I don't know if we can reach her anymore if she's retired to uh, see if she would recommend someone. Uh, the uh, There's a few psychiatrists here in the community. Uh, okay. So perhaps Ms. Smith can reach out to her, see whether she's got any recommendations. And uh, if so, Ms. Smith, uh, pass uh, any names on to Mr. Chandro. Ms. Chandro, if you could would notify Ms. Olette uh, once you know of the identity of this uh, person, whether it's a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner, I think that would be sufficient. Um, and I'm gonna court's gonna set this for review. Um, I would anticipate it's gonna take, just first we have to identify someone, then she has to make an appointment and all that. It's gonna take a few months before we'd have any information for the court, I assume. Okay. All right, we'll set a review date in May. Ms. Olette, if something comes to your attention about any uh, charge being authorized uh, against Ms. Smith, whether it's CPS or West Ham, please bring it to the court's attention. You can always uh, notice this on, and we can, we're can we pretty good at giving the relatively quick hearing dates. Um, yes, so we'll I'm, set this for review and sometime in May. Children go through again another actual exam. 
Well, I, and he, yes, the, the court, I, I'm reluctant to order that this child not submit, the, this minor daughter not be submitted to another SANE exam, but I, I'm not surprised what's your thoughts on This child went through three SANE exams within, I believe, a period of the three or four months. I mean, that's traumatic. And there's some comment that the doctor was concerned about her emotional well being. But I, I'm reluctant as a court to simply uh, prohibit the parties from securing such an exam. I would just strongly warn Ms. Smith, you better have some pretty uh, a strong documentation before you just submit the, your daughter to another exam. It's very traumatic for a six-year-old. Uh, Mr. Pratt, your thoughts on that? Your Honor, I, I think that uh, an order barring that would probably be contrary to what this court is attempting to do, but I would, I would just strongly... You know, I, I'm a firm believer in reminding people of fairy tales and the boy that cried wolf. So we just need to be cognizant that we're being honest when these things are happening rather than, uh, and again, the police said no more false allegations. So it's brought to the police's attention, Your Honor. So if we could curtail and that, maybe we could get back on track. The problem right. is the kids keep undergoing these exams and, and yeah, I feel well. there's no intervention. Well, that's uh, maybe CPS, push CPS. I'm, uh, CPS is very slow to, to respond, Ms. Wett, and I understand that, but I think uh, hopefully Ms. Smith heard the, the comments of Mr. Pratt. Um, you better make sure that they're accurate and you're not making false allegations, Ms. Smith, because that could result in a loss of custody if there's another occurrence. In any event, uh, Mr. Petrangelo, Ms. Wett, do I have May 21st or May 22nd? Um. And obviously, if Ms. Smith takes her to the hospital, dad needs to be notified immediately. So dad can go over to the hospital. you got joint legal custody. Ms. Smith, you need to immediately notify dad on your way to the hospital before you arrive there that you're heading over there. If you take any of your children to the doctor hospital, you need to notify dad. Is that understood? Yes. And so Mr. Smith can respond immediately and be at the hospital. And he can provide input to the medical staff. So May 21st, May 22nd, Ms. Olette, Mr. Petrangelo, what works with your schedules? What time on both those days, Your Honor? Uh, we got the number of dates available, the times available. On the 21st, we have 10 a.m. or 2.30. <laughs> on the 22nd, we have 8.30 or 1.30. Um, uh, the 10.30 date on the 21st would work or the 1.30 oh, date on the 22nd? We'll take the earliest date because I, I don't want to see any more happen to these children. It's yeah. grotesque. So what time at 21st, Mr. Pantrell? I believe you said 1030. 10, 10 or 10 or 230. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, 10, well, time. E e either one on the 21st. Okay. All right. 10 a.m. then. Uh, we'll put this review at uh, May 21st, 10 a.m. All right. Uh, Let Mr. Smith had a question. I don't know if you want to see what his question is. Um, is there, I mean, so mom gets unsupervised, unfettered parenting time. That's correct. Correct. And no makeup time for the time she missed at this point. Or is there? Well, again, we can reserve that. Do you want to talk about that? I, I, at this point, I'm fine with reserving it. I, I guess after the court has more information after this well, evaluation, okay. Yeah, the, the, the court's probably not inclined to grant make a parenting time, uh, Mr. Petrangelo. Um, obviously, with uh, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, yes, he should have petitioned the court, but he can't do that overnight. Uh, he was he acted out of trying to uh, protect the the children for another medical exam. So, yeah, at, at this point in time, I'm not going to reserve that. Of course, not going to make up uh, give the mother any make up parenting time. I, I would just, and, and I don't care if it has to be in an order, Your Honor, but this idea of pulling the kids out of school to, uh, I, I don't see how that relates to anything that happened here that was appropriate. School issued a truancy notice. Uh, we just want to be sure nobody's going to do that again. It was hey. wholly appropriate because dad was withholding so that the children wouldn't have to continue to go through school exam. In fact, the school worked with dad. The school worked with dad. It is not a misrepresentation. We have lots of documentation. The school worked with dad to get the children out of school because mom was coming up there to pick them up. So the school is aware of what is going on with mom. 
I don't know why the school would issue a, uh, a truancy letter then, if that's the case, and which I attached. And uh, certainly uh, this, I mean, there was no exam or anything like that, no SANE exam in this. All that occurred before last July. All right, that's all noted for the record. Um, and obviously what I understand is we have just a, what, a first grader, six-year-old, so it's uh, yeah. we're not in the middle of high school uh, final exams or anything. So uh, yeah, yes, the court agrees the child should be attending school, but I understand obviously if the child went to school, mom could have swooped up the children, let's just move forward and review this matter on May 21st at 10 a.m. Ms. Smith, reach out to Ms. Tiemann um, and see if she can recommend a an individual to the psychiatric evaluation so we get that done. Let Mr. Petrangelo know the name of that person. All right, uh, anything further, Mr. Petrangelo or Mr. Olat? No, Your Honor. Okay, so uh, what did the parties exchange for parenting time? On Fridays. Friday at five. Right, but where do they where do they do the conduct the exchanges? Oh, where? Where is it? At a guess, it's a it's a middle point. Okay, so that's been the exchange point in the past. So if uh, no, so want to make sure it's on the same page, and they will continue to use that same exchange point. Yes, sir. So the children with mom right now, and uh, mom will uh, transport the children to the exchange point on Friday at five o'clock. Yes, your honor. Yes. Right. She did right, that so last weekend, just as the order provided. Yes. All right. That will conclude this hearing. Oh, I wonder if something broke. I left this part in because I feel like it weirdly gives us a little bit of a glimpse into dad's personality. He doesn't really say much during the other hearings. And here he's kind of talking. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> so I see a message that says this meeting is being live streamed. What does that mean? It's broadcasted. Okay. So yeah. I was also I was also prompted with a message that said that this meeting can't be recorded. So if it's being broadcasted, then it seems to me like um, I'm just a little confused. Yeah, you can't personally record it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Why does it say, it says recording on this Zoom in the upper left corner, it says recording. That is, the court is recording the proceedings. Okay, thank you. The court is now in session, top of page two, Regina Smith versus James Smith. For the record, this matter is before the courts and the uh, plaintiff, Sorry. Defendant father's motion to modify custody and spend mother's period time. Uh, it's also before the court for the purpose of reviewing a psychiatric report of a plaintiff mother. This hearing is being conducted via Zoom. President is attorney James Petrangelo, representing the plaintiff mother, Regina Smith. Ms. Smith appears to be present. In addition, attorney Teresa Olette is present, representing the defendant father, Shane Smith. And Mr. Smith is also present. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Just for the record, the court did review the non-public record of the court ordered psychiatric evaluation uh, of uh, Ms. Smith. Uh, that's not part of the court file, but simply uh, in possession of the court. The court has reviewed that. The parties have conferred with Ms. Pratt this morning for the front of the court. Ms. Pratt, Pratt has provided the court with a fine recommendation that uh, the current parenting time order continue and remain in effect. And um, your honor, if I may, um, that is one moment, please. Oh, Let me share yes, with you the sir. recommendation, then I'll, I'll hear from counsel. Thank you. Um, further, it's recommended the mother shall have a psychological evaluation from <laughs> Wise Mind or other or another qualified provider on the list provided by attorney Kathleen Reed, who is a counsel for the psychiatrist who performed the psychiatric evaluation. Either attorney may submit materials to the evaluator for purposes of a full evaluation. The paternal grandmother must attend all appointments with mother and the minor children. You know, are the children to be involved in this evaluation? 
No, sir. It's just for mom. Okay. Obviously. So the recommendation, Mr. Pratt, about maternal grandmother being present for all medical appointments. Any medical appointments for the children, paternal grandmother will be present. Correct. All right. All right. That's understood. All right. Uh, Mr. Petrangelo, is this recommendation agree with your client this, this, afternoon, this morning? It is essentially, Your Honor. Uh, I, I think uh, the only thing I would say, the language paternal grandmother must be present. We're, we're fine with notifying and making arrangements for her to be present. We can't make her come. So I, I wouldn't want it be, to be interpreted uh, that my client's done something wrong if she won't go. Uh, but, but otherwise the concept uh, we, we've had, and we've already done that since we were here last and that was something recommended by mental health. Uh, I did, I can wait for counsel's uh, statements. Uh, I did raise the issue of uh, whether there comes to be a cost of this evaluation. Okay, well, what about, is there another third party that can be present if paternal grandmother is not available? So far, she's been very willing to be uh, available. Yeah. It's, I don't know that that's a problem, but uh, that's who oh. uh, that's who uh, I believe CPS recommended long ago as part of a plan for these folks. But yeah, let's assume part she's part not available. Safety. You suggested she may not be available, so let's come up with another third party that uh, we can provide uh, required their attendance in the event patrol grandmother is not available. Shane, do you have another proposed third party that you would recommend? Yes. Um, I myself can be added to that list. Now, please understand that if I miss work, I don't get paid. But if it's something important, like, um, a, for example, my son has some type of mental health assessment coming up, I will absolutely be there for that. It, obviously, if it's an emergency, I don't expect there to be a, a third party even in mind because an emergency is an emergency. Um, but to answer your question, uh, yes, my mother's husband, who the kids call g would be... What's his name? The only person that I would exclude from that list um, would be Regina's mother <clears throat> or um, Regina's sister, Benet. Okay, I'm going to have you talk with Ms. Pratt, and you can work through that issue, and I'll recall the case. I've got a very busy doctor this morning. We'll put you back in the breakout room. Let's add a, a, come up uh, with I a third think we could just leave Robert Lerwick. Is that okay, Shane? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay, can you spell the last name, please? L E R W I C K. Mr. Petrangelo, any objection? Any objection, Ms. Smith? This is if grandmother can't be there. I've never really spoken with uh, Mr. Lerwick except for okay, here and there. We put the breakout room. So, okay, we put the breakout room. I've got other things to take care of this morning. Okay. Um, Mr. Petrangelo, uh, Ms. Oletta, the parties agreed upon a, an additional third party other than the paternal grandmother? We, we agreed to uh, a change she made in the language to conform to what mental health issued, uh, and uh, my client's satisfied with that. We agreed to change the language. I, I don't agree with the mental health portion, but um, we agreed to the change in the language. One moment, please. Uh, so, Your Honor, we changed the word must to will. Okay, yes, paternal grandmother will attend all appointments with the, the mother, minor children. So, if she's not available, then obviously the appointment needs to be rescheduled. Um, all right, thank you, Ms. Fred. All right, so uh, again, uh, uh, the remainder of the recommendation uh, appears to be the same. The current printing time order shall could 
remain and continue in effect. Uh, mother shall have like, apparently another, it's a second psychological evaluation. Is that correct? Both of another party? No, the first one that you ordered was a psychiatric evaluation. Okay, this is a psychological. Thank you. Of course, Dan's corrected. Thank you, Ms. Olette. So, um, uh, Mr. Petrangi said one issue with this recommendation is the, the, the cost. Maybe Ms. Olette raise that. Yeah, yes, Your Honor. I, I would indicate uh, I, I, I did raise a concern when this was first ordered that maybe psychological might be what where we're going to ultimately end up, but we went ahead and uh, my, my client's on public assistance and, and maybe this will all be covered. She, she made sure she got someone who covered it. I'd say we time. just lost, uh, we lost Mr. Smith. I'm sorry, I'm told. Yeah. I mean to drop it. We lost Mr. Smith. So. We'll, uh... My gosh. <clears throat> So that perhaps you can text your client. Um, yes, I will. Sorry assume about he that. knows that he can't see the court that he needs to connect back up. Here it comes. Okay. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Mr. Smith has uh, returned. Uh, Mr. Petrangelo, you were addressing the issue of the cost of this psychological evaluation. Yes. And, and, I, um, and, and I hate to make a big argument. It may not be a, a problem. She was able to get this covered. She is on, this is state insurance and state, uh, she is on public assistance right now. Uh, it, the problem comes if there is a cost. You can't keep going to uh, experts and uh, she doesn't have the resources. So uh, if, if there's a cost, perhaps we have to circle back uh, or the court. I just want the court aware that's the part she can't just uh, bankroll it. And uh, we would argue that mom's caused this litigation. So if there is a cost associated that cost should be paid by mom. Well, There's a public assistance, Ms. Olette. Pretty hard to order a payment of some costs when someone's on public assistance. So she was so able to can... afford an attorney, Your Honor. All right. Well, I guess we can reserve ask. that issue, Mr. Petrangelo. We can reserve that issue. Um, now, I'm not sure who came up with this individual. This, uh, Your, Your Honor, uh, mind. this was uh, uh, counsel had a exchange with uh, the attorney for the psychiatrist. Uh, that attorney has provided the list uh, and said that a psychological evaluation would be needed to address the things Ms. Olette wants addressed. Um, this isn't a question of, you know, we, we certainly, we will comply. I assume the court would order it under that circumstance. So we're not arguing about doing it. Uh, it's, uh, and I, it probably will be covered, but I don't know that. Uh, if you want to reserve that and have us re notice it on some kind of short notice, if the issue comes up, uh, I, I'm fine with that too. Right. So that would that resolve it if we, of course, simply adds no sense. This recommendation, the court reserves issue of a cost if there is an, uh, out of uh, uninsured expense? Yeah, we can um, reserve that issue. I mean, I, I don't think we should argue if we don't know. So I'm okay with reserving that, but we do take issue with the parenting time remaining the same. Okay. We um, are arguing that parenting time should be supervised. If the court reads the psychiatric evaluation, mom's chief complaint is he told the children he was going to kill me. There, there is some legitimate concerns here with mom. CPS, if, if you've read through the CPS reports as well as the um, therapist reports of the children, the children are, yeah. are not believing themselves. And that's an issue. She's a danger to the children with the constant 
accusations with the constant taking to the doctor and 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 these constant falsehoods that she's portraying by way of the children so we were are just asking until the psychological evaluation is complete that mom have supervised parenting time your your honor um i had hoped not to rehash what was a heated issue uh, in the other room but uh the history here is is mom was violently and feloniously attacked by Mr. Smith and convicted and put on five years probation. Uh, he's gone through mental health treatment. He has gone through inpatient alcohol treatment recently and relapsed. Uh, my client is afraid of him. She does have PTSD. Of course, she raised her history and her concerns with the psychiatrist. That it, it wouldn't do her much good if she didn't uh, tell the psychiatrist about this background. I know this counsel didn't include any of that information in her motion about what leads us to today. Uh, so what what has been stated by Mr. Smith and, and is acknowledged that since we were here 10 weeks ago, things have gone a little better. And uh, nothing's happened in this 10 weeks to now suddenly cause us to need um, supervised visitation when we didn't need it 10 weeks ago. Uh, my client's actually gone to get treatment. She's seeing somebody now uh, on, on this sort of uh, issue. Uh, she's agreeing to have a psychological evaluation. There was a, a, a doctor visit. She did contact and make arrangements for Mr. Smith's mother to go. Um, he, he appreciated that that's in place. We're headed in a better direction, not a worse. So, so I don't think uh, the request is warranted at this time. And we would argue that mom's also been convicted of domestic violence against Mr. Smith. And the reason that we were brought here today was not because of Mr. Smith's past domestic violence that occurred well over five, seven years ago. We're here because mom is falsely accusing dad against the children, causing them to go through sane exam. And most important to note is as of 4-1, the date of her psychiatric evaluation, it wasn't a history that was given her chief complaint. So that is something actively that she's going to be evaluated for was he told the children he was going to kill me. I would just tell the court that counsel provided me her exchange with the attorney for the psychiatrist. Uh, and I would tell you that my client tried to get just an evaluation for the court she had trouble finding anyone unless it included also addressing treatment for her. And the attorney says the intake report state staff states she was seeking both an evaluation for parenting court and behavioral health treatment services. So she very clearly at the at the offset told them why she was here that this was part of it. We made sure counsel was given the name of the person. Counsel submitted documentation. Counsel doesn't like it that the doctor said, ignored it. Uh, the, uh, but I can't, we can't tell these um, experts what they have to decide is most important. Uh, my client went, she was honest, she disclosed, she uh, told them exactly what what the issues were, she's doing what she should do. Uh, she shouldn't be attacked for that. And he's arguing the issue of the need for a psychological evaluation, which we've already surpassed. What is concerning is mom's current and still believe that the children are telling thing, telling her things that dad is allegedly doing that is not the case. And that's what's concerning. The The children's own therapists, if you read through the CPS reports, say that the children aren't believing themselves because of mom's coaching. 
So mom is a danger to the children. I still believe that mom is a danger. Have things gotten better? I can acknowledge that they have to some extent only because paternal grandmother is involved in the doctor's appointments. However, as early as Thursday of last week, less than a week ago, mom again sends an accusatory text message to dad asking what's this bruise on the minor child. And this is how it it, it just gets ramped up and started every time. I would only say she's trying to put my client in an impossible situation. She sees something, she asked, she got a response. Nothing further came of it. There was no CPS complaint report. Uh, is she want to create a situation where if there's an injury, my client can't ask? Of course she can ask. Uh, she handled it properly. Uh, she there, There's nothing, none of the things being brought up have happened in the last 10 weeks. And, and we dispute that uh, much of any of this has happened recently. But uh, in any regard, it wasn't necessary then. No harm has come because we didn't put supervised parenting time in place 10 weeks ago. If anything, it's gotten better. So what is the justification to now go back to this unless we're going to have some kind of hearing uh, to demonstrate some increased harm to the children or danger? May I speak? Right. Uh, it's not necessary, Mr. Smith. Uh, the, the courts heard enough. Uh, you can speak with your attorney after we're done here. Um, the, the court um, will rely upon the recommendation of Ms. Pratt. She has conferred length with the parties this morning. A recommendation that per current printing time remain in effect. The court will is not convinced that supervised printing time is necessary at this point in time. The court would simply add another note that it's unfortunate that Ms. Smith did not advise the this Dr. Cushman, who did the psyche. Uh, the psychiatric evaluation of what prompted us. So it was all here because of the, the numerous complaints of my dad did and uh, the ch children being taken for um, examination, examinations unnecessarily when in fact there was there's no basis for some of the allegations. That should be, that information needs to be provided to the psychologist. So this, with this re recommendation today is that both the council can provide the materials to that evaluator. That's essential. It's unfortunate Dr. Krishman did not have that information. That's Dr. clearly Cushman missing from the evaluation. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Dr. Cushman did have the evaluation. That is what prompted uh, Attorney Reed to reach out to me because um, I was told by Dr. Cushman's office that Dr. Cushman would not be given the materials because she does not have to review them. I said, well, sure she does. And the court has instructed that I can submit materials for her review and that's when attorney reed said that she this doctor cannot perform an evaluation for custody and parenting time that would be inappropriate and we would have to go with a psychological examination all right uh, so hopefully we'll have better insight with the psychological evaluation so the court will adopt the uh, recommendation mr pratt if you could simply add that the court will reserve uh, the issue of addressing any uh, out-of-pocket expenses associated with that yes sir um, this uh, obviously is for the benefit of the children, this evaluation. Uh, so yes. if, in fact, Mr. Smith has to contribute toward that, then so be it. But we'll address that at a later date if it's necessary. All right. Anything further then uh, this afternoon, this morning, Mr. Petrangelo or Ms. Ouellette? I know Mr. Smith wanted to talk. Do you want to talk with Mr. Smith? Ms. Ouellette, we can put you in a breakout room separate. Uh, no, you're up. No. Okay. He's okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, the court will adopt the recommendation. And uh, uh, do we need to set a review date on this? Or is somebody going to re notice it? Um, I think we need a review date for the psychological evaluation. Do you have any idea of the time frame? Your Honor, I, I'd request uh, this. The court gave us 10 weeks. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, you tr you're trying to get scheduled, get in, get a report and so forth. Uh, I'd, I'd ask about for that same time frame. Ms. Hullet, would you agree? I would agree. Okay, so 10 weeks, so we're looking at uh... I, have, I have Tuesday 
July 23rd at 8.30. July 23rd, 8.30, would that work with everyone? That would work for me, Your Honor. Would that work for you, Shane? Yes. Uh, that will work. All right, Ms. Bright, could add that the uh, re uh, review on uh, July 23rd, 8.30, please? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, with that, uh, we'll adjourn this matter to, uh, to that date, July 23rd, 8.30. Thank you, Your Honor. You. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Pratt. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank Welcome. you. This is in the District Court of Butler County, Kansas, case entitled State of Kansas versus Michael Angelo Centeno. It's case number 2023 CR 300026. Red Sweeney appears for the State of Kansas. Joseph Favre is Defense Counsel. Uh, the defendant, Michael Angelo Centeno, appears at the Butler County Detention Center Zoom location. I also have present Sharon Teal from the court services office filling in for the pre-sentence investigator, Carrie Seeley. This matter comes before the court at this time for sentencing. It would appear that the defendant appeared before this court on May the 3rd of 2024. At that time, he pled guilty to count one, possession of methamphetamine, a severity level five drug felony. Court ordered a pre-sentence report and set sentencing for today. Court has received a pre-sentence investigation report compiled by Ms. Seeley. I trust each attorney also has had access to this report. And I'll ask the state's attorney first, is there any objection to the criminal history which is stated therein? No objection, Your Honor. Any <clears throat> objection by the defense, Mr. Favre? I reviewed it with Mr. Centeno. We have no objection. The court will adopt the criminal history as stated in the report and finds that the criminal history score applicable to today's sentencing his criminal history score A, and the court will proceed further accordingly. Mr. Sweeney, do you know of any legal reason why sentence should not be pronounced in this case this morning? No, Your Honor, I'm not. Mr. Favre, are you aware of any such legal reason? I'm not, Your Honor, no. Mr. Centeno, do you know of a legal reason or any other good reason why the court shouldn't proceed further with your sentencing? No, oh, Your Honor. The court will proceed further then. Counsel, I am aware that there is a departure motion before the court. It's entitled Request for Durational Departure Findings, submitted by Mr. Favre to the court. I'm now familiar with its contents. You may proceed further in regards to this request, Mr. Favre. Judge, the, the bulk of the argument is listed in, in the motion, which is that, that Mr. Centeno uh, has um, a criminal history that's severe however it's severe out of just one case they are person felonies um but they all occurred at one time he does not have a lot of entries on his criminal history as far as number of of convictions uh, relative to what we see from from other uh defendants anyway he is 30 years old he has some potential for rehabilitation he the agreement is agreed upon by both both parties um and i think part of the reason for that is that Mr. Centeno has a has a parole hold. He's had this entire time. And so even if the court were to grant him a departure, um, he would need to go to address his DOC hold. So he's been in custody for a, a very lengthy period of time for this case. It was a simple uh, find of methamphetamine. Um, it wasn't anything that was, you know, very uh, it wasn't a very exciting fact pattern where there was violence or anything involved in that. I would add something that's not listed in there is Mr. Centeno is also a father. He has three children, 17, 14, and nine. 
He lives in Wichita. He needs to get back to try to support them. It's been a very long time since he's been able to do that. He um, has worked fast food in the past, although he's been trying to work construction lately to improve his ability to provide for his family. So that's something we'd also ask the court to consider factoring in when looking at granting his durational departure request. All right, Mr. Favre, uh, did you read your departure motion before you submitted it? Uh, yes. Did you think I it think. through before you submitted it? Um, I believe so, yes. Well, look, let, let me address my concern here. here. Here's what you appear to be asking for in your motion. That uh you state that you want the court to grant your request for a, a durational departure and then place the defendant on probation for this offense oh i yes okay you see the fundamental I, I, flaw with that request I, I absolutely do judge and i i just missed that i yes i apologize that that was that was a mistake on my part okay so so here's here's what i understand you're asking for I, I'm going to address Mr. Sweeney in a moment as to why Mr. Centeno gets this special treatment. But what, what apparently you're asking the court for is to take a sentence which was intended by the legislature to be at least three years in duration, bust it down to eight months, give him credit for time served, and turn him loose? Judge, we are asking for a durational departure to the time served that was the agreed upon recommendation for, as part of the plea, yes. And he's been in custody for a lengthy period of time. Yes, it's not nearly as much as the legislature intended. Um, but I also think that there's other factors that weigh in that support maybe giving him such an extreme, I guess, I don't know, extreme cut in time and that we've tried to outline for the court. All right, Mr. Sweeney, then I will turn to you. This is an extraordinary plea agreement in the view of the court. You're, you're generally very fair. I'll, I'll state that for the record here. On the other hand, this is really an extraordinary plea agreement that was reached to essentially only require about a fourth of the time which the uh, guideline sentence would otherwise call for. Why, why special treatment for this individual, Mr. Centeno, above every other person that comes through this court system charged with this serious felony crime? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, as a... Uh... I would tell the court that we always try to stay uniform um, to the most for the most part in our recommendations um, for individuals. And I think really uh, in large part the reason um, that the state has cut Mr. Centennial a break is the large amount of time that he has served in custody, the uh, 241 days up to this point, but maybe even um um, greater and the the state and what it's factored into this decision is essentially the fact that this is uh, such a small amount of methamphetamine. Um, it was one tenth of one gram, so 0 0.10 grams of methamphetamine. Um, probably just a little bit more than residue. I think it's still certainly, obviously, uh, methamphetamine. Um, and so, still something that the, I think the uh, state takes pretty seriously. Um, that being said, you know, I, I don't make the substantial and compelling reasons, but it was part of the um, plea agreement that the state would join in and the durational departure to the time served with the understanding that he still would have uh, the post release supervision. The state's still asking that this case um, run consecutive to the 17 CR Sedgwick County case. Um, with whatever is left of that. And I'll, I'll have to be honest with the court. I'm not sure exactly where he stands with his completion of that Sedgwick County case. Um, but it, it's also my understanding that yes, he still has parole DOC holds um, as it relates to this. Anything further, Mr. Favre? No, that, that is correct. And I did fail to mention the quantity, which was a big factor as well. So I'm glad Mr. Sweeney mentioned that. Very well, that will conclude the uh, departure hearing portion of this proceeding. The court will move on.
Um, the court uh, at this time would ask if there's any victim or members of a victim's family present who desires to address the court in relation to the sentencing or finds no such persons present. So at this time, the court will ask for formal recommendations from counsel regarding an appropriate sentence for Mr. Centeno. Mr. Sweeney, what are your formal recommendations? Thank you, Your Honor. As previously noted, the state is recommending or would be joining in the uh, durational departure um, for a sentence of 241 days in custody. Um, as we previously noted, we believe he served that. Um, uh, we would note that the maximum good time percentage for what it's worth um, uh, would be 20%. Um, I do believe the post release supervision duration is noteworthy, um, and I think that would be 12 months. The state is not asking that the defendant be placed on probation. Um, as is previously noted, so it, it wouldn't necessarily be a dispositional departure, but only a durational departure with a sentence effectively served. Um, the state is requesting uh, the court costs in the matter. We're not requesting a fine. Um, there was a KBI laboratory report that was completed, so we're seeking $400 in restitution for that. Um, of course, we're seeking uh, inquiry into the bids and attorney's fees um if those are appropriate and we're also asking that this case um, run consecutive to that Sedgwick County case and that case number on that is 17 CR 821 and that's all I have you on all right thank you Mr. Sweeney Mr. Favre your formal recommendations regarding an appropriate sentence judge we join with the state in those recommendations for a modified sentence of 241 days I will note that the court's correct that my motion incorrectly requests for probation. Just to be clear, we're not requesting a probation sentence on this based on the motion filed. We're requesting a durational departure. Um, no objection to any of the costs or fees listed by the state. We would ask the court to consider waiving his attorney's fees. Mr. Centennial has been in custody for a long time. He also, um, as noted, has been working fast food jobs prior to that. Um, so we don't know how long it's going to be before he gets out on his parole hold. But when he does, he'll need to start working and paying off the extensive fines he'll have. So we'd ask the court to consider waiving his attorney's fees. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Favre. At this time, the court will address the defendant, Michelangelo Centeno, personally. And I'll ask him if he has any statements that he wishes to make in mitigation of punishment or anything further that he would like to present to the court. Mr. Centeno, if you've got anything to say to the court, you need to say it now. Uh, Your Honor, uh, I, I speak very fluent English right now, so I'm just going to try to say. Uh, that's pretty much all I, all I have. Hmm. It would seem to the court that Kids and methamphetamine don't mix very well. Would you agree, Mr. Centeno? Yes, yes, Your Honor. Quite frankly, counsel, the court is struggling with this plea agreement. Uh, this, this is an unusually favorable joint recommendation that's been made. I, I think I've already made that comment. It's really extraordinary for the prosecutor's office to make a deal like this, where they're joining a defense recommendation for such of a reduction in the overall sentence in the case. I will note, and I think it's fair to note, that it's his criminal history which causes the time to be so large for this drug crime. Most uh, possession of methamphetamine cases um, involve a much less amount of controlling sentence than there are in this case. But that's one of the implications of being in the A box, which is the worst criminal history that a person can be in. Mr. Centeno, it also bothers me that you want to get back to your kids, yet you got yourself, as a convicted felon, you got yourself involved with this dangerous street drug of methamphetamine. I don't really care uh, about the quantity when it comes to the principle that we just talked about, that methamphetamine and parenting do not mix. Play not. Maybe eight months locked up in jail have reinforced that principle for you. Maybe the prospect of spending three or more years in prison has 
lock that in for you once and for all? I hope so. Court hereby establishes count one as the base sentence in this case for the offense of possession of methamphetamine, a severity of level five, drug, non-person felony, in which the defendant has a criminal history score of A, thus placing him in grid box five, drug A. The court hereby sentences the defendant to a departure term of 241 days uh, in the Department of Corrections custody. On this sentence, the defendant may earn up to 20% of good time credit and would be subject to 12 months of post-release supervision. No fine is imposed here, as this was not a financially related crime. Court has implicit in its ruling granted the request for a durational departure for the reasons stated in the request, uh, the long period of time since his previous criminal offenses, that it was an agreed upon disposition that the state joins in. It's been a uh, compelling factor in the case. Uh, the court also is somewhat assured that he's going to face justice in relation to a Cedric County case. The uh, court has considered that as a reason. And that the quantity involved ultimately is a factor that supports a mitigated sentence. The court does find substantial compelling reasons as a result, to grant the durational departure sentence. This, in essence, flattens the time. The court does order uh, that this defendant actually do 12 months of post-release supervision. Ms. Teal, I know you're filling in for the pre-sentence investigator. Could you use the resources of your office to contact state parole? and make sure that they're aware that this court is actually ordering the post-release supervision. There are times that in the past where I've heard that they wanna know specifically that a flattened sentence still has a post-release supervision period ordered. I certainly want Mr. Centeno on a supervised uh, release program stemming from this case. So anything that you could do to Communicate that to an appropriate state parole office would be greatly appreciated. Do you need any further clarification on that, Ms. Teal? No, sir. I'll do everything I can. All right. Thank you. Court will be assessing a felony docket fee to this defendant and four hundred dollars KBI laboratory fee in light of the fact that he is not going to be released apparently because of the the parole hold out of Cedric County. I'm not going to assess bids amounts. I don't know when he's ever going to get out and what kind of work he's going to be doing. I just don't have enough information to assess those fees. So obviously, Mr. Favre's skills and abilities have been greatly beneficial to this defendant. So all bids amounts are waived. Um, I'm going to declare all of these amounts immediately due and payable. There will be a recommendation to the state parole office on the post-release supervision period in this case that uh, I recommend a substance abuse treatment program be required and successfully completed by this defendant while on post-release supervision. If you wouldn't mind communicating that, Ms. Teal, if you can include that in the sentencing journal entry, um, Mr. Sweeney, understanding, of course, this is a recommendation from the court to state parole. Yes, sir. This sentence is run consecutively to Cedric County case number 2017 CR 821. Even if this court were not required to do so, the court would do so in this case as a matter of discretion. As stated earlier, uh, the sentence is flattened. The defendant is credited with 241 days of jail time credit in this case and applied to the DOC sentence, which essentially flattens it at this point. Some point in the future, Mr. Centeno, you may have the right to seek expungement of this offense. Certain statutory limitations do apply. If you have any questions about your right to someday seek expungement, you can address those questions to a lawyer and I'm sure get your questions answered. 
Under certain limited circumstances, a criminal defendant has a right to appeal their conviction to an appellate court having jurisdiction. And if they are unable to pay the cost of an appeal, the defendant may request the court to appoint a lawyer to represent them on appeal and that they be supplied with a transcript of trial court proceedings. Pursuant to KSA 22-3608C, you, the defendant, have 14 days after this judgment in court to file any notice of appeal with the clerk of the district court of Butler County, Kansas. And you do have the right to appeal this sentence if the court has ruled adversely to you at this hearing. I will remind you that there are prohibitions against a convicted felon possessing a firearm, that there are losses of certain civil rights, such as the right to vote until your sentence is fully discharged. I'm looking at my notes from this proceeding, Mr. Sweeney, and I'm trying to determine if there's any other sentencing related matter that I need to address. Is there any other ruling that you're asking for at this time? No, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Favre, is there anything further that I, that you believe the court needs to address? No, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Centeno, do you have any questions about the court sentencing orders? No. Okay, let me tell you where you stand right now. As of this moment, you're released on this case. Okay. You do have a hold apparently out of Cedric County. You're going to have to take care of that. Yes. Then you need to get out in the community and you need to put methamphetamine in your past and never touch it again. Yes, Your Honor. Good luck in that regard. I hope you make it and I hope you're there to be a, be a support system for your children. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Teal, did you need anything further? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your involvement here today and your work on behalf of the court. Thank you. If there's nothing further, then the Michael Angelo Centeno matter will currently be in recess, and this meeting may be ended for all at this time. Fact, some people shouldn't have kids. This is uh, here for a hearing on the question of the extension of an order of protection that was issued ex parte, which means without a hearing. And uh, First question, uh, both of you raise your right hand, please. All right, step to the microphone, please. You are Lauren Elizabeth Hall, is that correct? Yes, sir. Ms. Hall, you filed a petition asking for an order of protection that was issued, and the, the court issued an order of protection. Um, this hearing today is for the court to determine first uh, whether or not there should be a, an extension of that order of protection. And if so, for what length of time? So are you asking for an extension of this order of protection? Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> Second uh, thing then is Mr. Hall, you have, or Mr. Ladd rather, you have um, the right to contest the extension of that order of protection uh, and you have the right to counsel if you were to choose so. Are you asking to, uh, are you opposing the extension of this order of protection? Uh, are you planning on hiring a lawyer for this matter? Okay, well, you don't think you'll need it? We have an active DCS case for physical and psychological abuse from him. And so if he sees our children, I feel like it's best it's supervised. Because well, number one, you're getting into the issues. I first have mm -hmm. to determine if there is a basis for this order of protection to even be extended. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if you'll, Mr. Ladd, if you'll have a seat at that uh, table right there to your left. Ma'am, you've been placed under oath. I'm going to ask you to come around and have a seat in the witness stand. We will conduct a hearing. Ms. Hall, you've been previously sworn. Uh, this is your opportunity to tell me, number one, why you think you need an order of protection, and secondly, uh, 
Uh, what are the facts that, that uh, you think justify this extension of this order of protection that was issued without a hearing? The main concern is for the scoot up to that oh, microphone. Our, the main concern is for the safety of our children. We have three small children. Um, the most recent incident was uh, like two weeks ago. Whenever I filed for the order of protection, he lined our kids up in a kitchen and threw glass vases at them. And I don't feel like there's any justification for that. I don't care how mad you are or how upset you are. Um, and like I said, we have a DCS case, and at first only two of our kids were listed on the case because they were the two kids that were um, cut whenever he threw the glass. They were minor injuries. It wasn't significant, but still the principle of it. Um, now, were you and Mr. Ladd living together at that time? We haven't been together in six years. We've okay. been divorced for four, I think. Um, once upon talking to our children, the DCS worker put psychological abuse um, from the father. So I just feel like it is not in their best interest to see him. Uh, I have multiple witnesses, not necessarily here today, but I do have one here who has seen him bully not only me, our children, my grandmother. Um, multiple times I've called the police on him and somehow he gets out of it. The sheriff's department actually called off a phone call one day that I had made to the sheriff's department whenever he took our kids from me and locked them inside of his home. I called 911, I was in fear of my life. And he made a personal phone call to someone else, and they called that 911 call off. They never showed up. All right, so your basis for this is the fact that he threw this glass and it broke and cut two of the children? That's, yes, but I mean, I've known him for 14 years, and he's been abusive to me, abusive to our children. He's a bully. And he shows it what to is the, the status of that order of protection uh, of the DCS investigation? Uh, it's still ongoing. And you, have they made any recommendations to you about this? Uh, I have not talked to her, but I mean, obviously, our kids need therapy. Um, they have been in therapy previously. I have contacted multiple therapists in Dixon, and they won't take them because they have commercial insurance. So oh. I'm having a problem finding a therapist at the moment. All right, anything else that you want to tell me about uh, your reasons why you feel like this order of protection should be extended? No, sir. Okay. Mr. Ladd, you're acting as your own attorney. That means you have the right, if you choose, to ask questions. I'm going to give you a chance to testify, so it's not a question, not a point where you will argue with her or, or do anything, but you can ask questions. Do you want to ask any questions? All right, thank you, ma'am. You must step down. Do you have any other witnesses that you wish to call? Does she have any knowledge about this case? Well, if you want to call her, call her. You will raise your right hand, please. Oh, sorry. Come right around here. Have a seat, please, and try to speak directly into the microphone. Okay. What is your name? Eugenia Wisniewski. And if you would go ahead and ask her any questions that you feel like relate directly to the issues on this order of protection. Um, the most recent event, uh, there was some acknowledgement from Michael about what he did and things that he has posted. Mm -hmm. um, on First of all, let me just, so the, I'm, I'm trying to establish the record. How are you related or how, what is your involvement in the case? Um, I'm her aunt okay. and the kid's great aunt. Right. And so she's asking if, if you spoke with Mr. Ladd or had some contact with him in which he acknowledged something happening? No, I have not spoken to him directly. Okay. Um, I know he posted a 10 minute long rant video on Facebook about how he did throw the vases at the kids. Um, and Did I think, you see that personally? <clears throat> the video, yes. yes. And so it was a video of Mr. Ladd? Yes. And what exactly did he say? Um, he acknowledged throwing the glass and in, in breaking the glass and cutting two of the kids. Okay. And um, he also posted that um, a previous investigation, he had made claims of abuse. He, he 
he posted all of those documents with all the children's name on it for everyone to read. And to me, that is violating their protection, their safety. And um, he's nothing but a jealous bully. And the only person in this situation that he does not bully is me because of my husband. Lauren doesn't have a husband, so he bullies her. My mom doesn't have a husband, so she, so he bullies her. He bullies anyone that he can get away with. And that's the kids. I've seen him line the kids up and just break them. Just till, till they are nothing. All right. Anything else? No, sir. Mr. Ladd, do you have any questions for this witness? All right. Thank you, ma'am. You can step down right, and have a seat. Thank you. All right. Ms. Ladd, do you have any, or I think you're going by Hall now, is that correct? Ms. Hall, do you have any other witnesses? All right. Mr. Ladd, you are not required to testify, and <clears throat> if there are any pending criminal charges, you need to be aware that you have an absolute right not to be compelled to testify. If you do testify, anything that you were to say in this courtroom under oath could be used against you in a subsequent prosecution for a criminal act. So the question becomes, do you want to testify in this case? All right, you come around. You've been previously sworn, so I'm gonna ask you to have a seat in the witness stand. All right, I'll hear anything you have to say about this situation. Uh, yeah, I don't know what they're talking about. Like, I don't know if I'm not articulate enough for them, but I said the case was made because I, they said I threw the glass at somebody. It don't say that I threw it at the kids and cut them. It just said the case was made of that. And it's on Facebook. And as far as the, the other stuff goes, it wasn't an accusation by me, the children. And as far as the aunt goes, she was testifying for us to begin with. Her husband means nothing to me, and I ain't never had a charge of bullying nobody. Uh, I say what I want to say, and I'm not going to bend for them. You know, if they don't like what I do with my children, that's fine. But I'm not going to do what they want me to do. Like, their track record shows better than mine how their family's raised. I ain't never had no kids before. Theirs is grown. Her granny's is grown. Eugenia's is older. So, you know, like, I didn't do nothing, and this is the game she plays. There's nothing to be jealous of. I don't talk to her. I barely speak to this woman. And the cops, uh, Chris Stobham, Sheriff, they came to my house, and uh, so did DCS. They've already, uh, I guess they already filled it out because they said they had no reason to be here. There was nothing to warrant the case against me. But she didn't tell me till Friday, like, when I was picking the kids up, until after I was getting off work, that I couldn't come get them. All right. But uh, uh, Jessica Lane is the DCS worker. Lena, that was at the house. They all came to the house. The sheriff came to the house. Chris Stoneman, 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 the one that had the official report, the one that was investigated, the tech, the tech, the All right. and they got video, there's video, because I got cameras at the house, so there's video of the confrontation that they're talking about, you know, this was just a jump to conclusion, like, they just want to, I ain't got nothing to say to them, like, they're not even supposed to be at my house, and I let them come to the house to drop the kids and pick them up, well, I ain't did nothing to them, man. It's just like it's just like trying to keep the kids from me. But both, of, but the, the officers got the video, and the, the DCS worker seen it. All right, Miss Hall, do you have any questions you want to ask him? Now, if, if you want to say something, you're going to have to take the stand again. But right now, I'm offering you the opportunity to cross-examine this witness. You can ask questions, but you can, if you want to make a statement, you'll have to testify. You want to ask questions of this witness. Thank you then, Mr. Ladd, you may have a seat. Mr. Ladd, do you have any other witnesses you wish to call? Ms. Hall, do you want to testify again about anything? All right. The purpose of an order of protection in, in a case like this is to ensure that there is a, um, a protection and safety for 
uh, domestic abuse from domestic abuse for individuals who uh, are able to satisfy the court that there is, in fact, a uh, preponderance of the evidence indicating that they are, in fact, the subject of domestic violence. In this court's opinion, the proof has shown that there is a justifiable reason for the extension of this order of protection. Therefore, the order will be extended for a period of six months. You have a form that I can use to fill that out. You'll have to wait around outside. It will be extended for a period of, of six months. Any visitation between Mr. Ladd and the children will need to be supervised by the Department of Children's Services uh, pending the out, uh, outset of their investigation or conclusion of their investigation. So that's the judgment of the court. If you will, Ms. Hall, if you can wait in the courtroom if you want. Mr. Ladd, if you'll wait outside, the officers will serve you with a copy of that once it's filled out. Right. And I think that's where we are right now, although let me take a Initially, I thought this was a normal custody agreement. It was a little interesting because dad and mom were kind of equal and, you know, how do you decide who gets the kid when it's equal? But then they started talking about taxes and things like that. And dad's understanding of what happens in a custody agreement kind of, kind of got me. Plus it's Judge Ricky and I'm always down to watch Judge Ricky. How about you? So, enjoy. This is in the District Court of Butler County, Kansas, case entitled in the matter of the paternity of W.W., a minor child, by and through parent Aaron Leanne Moore and Scott Wesley Watkins. It's case number 2020-DM-304. Uh, Susan Locke appears as counsel for Aaron Leanne Moore, who appears in the office of her attorney by Zoom. Scott Watkins appears by separate Zoom. This matter comes before the court for further proceedings in regards to a motion to modify residency and parenting time and for other relief. Mr. Watkins, I'm, I'm aware of what the uh, movement is asking for here. Are you opposing any part of this motion? Yes. Okay, what, what are you opposing? Uh, pretty much all of it, Your Honor. All right. Then let's review what that means. Ms. Locke, okay. what exactly is your client seeking here? Let's talk about what the existing parenting plan is and how you're trying to change it. Sure, Your Honor. Um, and just for the record purposes, my um, client's husband is present in my office as well. He's just not on the camera. Um, we are asking that residency and parenting time be modified. The current ordered parenting time is a week on week off. However, the parties by agreement um, when the child's name is Wyatt, when Wyatt started school, uh, the parties agreed that Mr. Watkins would exercise parenting time during the school week and the child would attend school in at USD 490. Um, and then my client mom had every weekend we are requesting that mom become the essentially the school parent. Even though she lives in Greenwood County, she's committed to making sure that Wyatt attends school regularly and maintaining his current school district of USD 490. Um, the concern is that frequently and uh, more frequently over the last four months, um, she has had to be the school transportation for Wyatt. Um, this is very difficult to be happening on a sporadic basis. Um, Mr. Watkins, we understand that his adult daughter used to live with him 
And once she moved out, um, consistency in transportation became very difficult. And there's been frequent times where the school has called my client and said, the child's still here. No one's come to pick him up. Uh, is someone planning to pick him up? Then it's my client that has picked up those pieces. So we're asking that for consistency purposes, she become the school parent. She's committed, like I said, to making sure he has transportation to and from school, maintaining that regular schedule, maintaining the evening schedule to allow for homework, um, regular childcare after school, all of that to be maintained. It's not clear exactly how that's being maintained in father's home. There's been um, many late assignments. There's been many days where he's been absent or tardy or again, not picked up. Uh, and we think that consistency is very important. In exchange for that, where mom had every weekend, uh, dad would have every other weekend with mom's Saturday work uh, to be offered first to dad. So if she's coming to El Dorado on a Saturday, she would offer that time to dad so that he can exercise that parenting time, additional parenting time, in addition to the every other weekend. Okay, well, I saw from the file that your client previously lived in, uh, I think, Montgomery County, when one of these parenting plans were established, and now she's moved to Eureka. Is she not stable in one residence? Yeah, because if we're going to change school residency, consistency is important for the child. And if she's going to keep moving around, that's an issue. Mr. Watkins, where'd you go? We've been there for so much. Um, I was going to wait for back until he was back. Mr. Watkins, you disappeared on me for a moment. I do apologize. I don't know what happened there. Okay. Your Honor, when my client first got married um, to her now husband, he was working on a ranch in Elk City, Kansas. They have since returned to essentially his homestead in Greenwood County. They've been living there for three years and anticipate that it will be their life time home. All right. So Watkins, why are you opposing this motion? They are correct in saying that at a certain point in time, my adult daughter did live with me. She was the primary caregiver when I was at work. She did move out unexpectedly, which put me in a pretty rough position ambulance i apologize so i did go through a little bit of a rough patch with child care and transportation absolutely i got that figured out my vehicle situation at the time was a little rough also so there was just a lot of issues i had asked miss moore for assistance she had been picking him up dropping him off whatever from school for about approximately a month. And then she had some issues at work. She had to back off from doing that and it become my responsibility. I mean, I, I can pull up the chat logs because I've kept it all. But <clears throat> towards the end of the school year, the transportation issue, who I had picking him up, I don't know what was going on with them. I don't know, but their communication stopped. It wasn't always her. I picked him up several times. If he was sick, it wasn't according to the motion that it all fell on her. I got several phone calls when he was either sick or, you know, they did communicate with me that they couldn't pick him up or drop him off. I did several times within the last approximately two months of school. Uh, I have given him very steady home. Uh, I think part of it says that 
you know, uh, basically I do no meaningful activities, although almost on a daily basis, as long as the weather is nice, we go do something every day be at a park. I, we live close to the pool, the lake. Uh, I had to go buy a bicycle so I can keep up with him riding his bike. You know, we do something every day that he enjoys and it expands his mind. There's been no point in time where beyond like a 10 minute wait because no communication with his transportation to and from school that he's been left alone. All right. Uh, but you don't necessarily take him to work or excuse me, to school every day. Not every day. No, but I did the last month and a half. I took him all except for, uh, seven days. All right. My my work allowed that. And I can't remember, I don't have my notes right on top of me how many days that I picked him up. But it it was several. Well, we appear to have a bona fide dispute here, Ms. Locke. Uh, the court is going to need to hear evidence uh, more than just the statements made here today by the by the parties to make a determination of the best interest of the child for the upcoming school year. We're not under extreme time pressure, but we do need to get this heard before the start of the next school year, which I presume will be around mid-August. Is that right? I, believe so. I think it's the 14th or 15th, Your Honor, yes. Mr. Watkins, do you intend to get an attorney to represent you on this? I do not. All right. I'm financially unavailable. I'm reasonably confident I could hear this in a half a day. I'm looking at the afternoon of Thursday, August 8. Ms. Locke, your availability at that time? I'm, I'm available, Your Honor. All right. I'm going to set this for an in-person proceeding in courtroom B in El Dorado for 1.15 p.m. on Thursday, August the 8th. Each party can present their case at that time. I will uh, require the parties uh, to exchange any exhibits, in other words, any documents that you believe the court should consider. They need to exchange uh, with each other uh, at least by the day before. August the 7th. Actually, I'm going to back that up a little bit. Um, I'm going to require the parties to have all of their documents to the opposing party by Monday, August 5. I'm not requiring anybody to produce documents, but if you intend to have any type of uh, pictorial or documentary exhibit, you need to make sure that that's been shared with the opposing party, presumably by email. And I trust you have Mr. Watkins' email address, Ms. Locke? I believe I do, Your Honor. Okay. We need to have that to the opposing party by Monday, August the 5th. As a prelude to our hearing, the afternoon of Thursday, August 8th, starting at 1.15 p.m. I know that's cutting it close as far as enrollment and the start of the school year in either district. Um, but that's the date that's available, and uh, that's a week ahead of, I think, or at least the week before most schools are going to start. And, Your Honor, we don't anticipate that he would change school districts. Um, All right. He's already Despite the fact that he would live in Eureka, he would still go to school in 490 in El Dorado? 
Yes. Correct, Your Honor. My client comes to El Dorado daily for work. That's good. All right. So Thursday, August 8, 1.15 p.m. Now, I want to address the other issue that was raised here, and that is uh, involving um, tax exemption claiming, apparently, which yes. is referred to in the paperwork as tax deductions. Um, I'm trusting, Ms. Locke, that we're relying on uh, a parenting plan provision that was filed October 6th of 2020. And that would be paragraph 13. Your Honor, I did, oh, we lost Mr. Watkins there for a second. There was an amended parenting plan that was filed on June 23rd of 2021 that did impact the tax. Okay, paragraph 13 of, what's well, paragraph four of that document, which refers to paragraph 13. Yes, Your Honor. The reason for that change was this happened previously, where Mr. Watkins claimed the child on his tax return on a year that we understood that Miss. Okay, where'd he go? Yeah. Scott Watkins? We keep losing you. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, we're discussing this tax. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I, I didn't. Okay. Um, all right, Ms. Locke, you said that previously Mr. Watkins had claimed the exemption in the wrong year, so it was reversed. The original provision was reversed, where your client would claim the minor child as a dependent on her tax return for even tax years. Now, tax years isn't defined. Uh, in any way, I, I am presuming that the parties intended that a tax year be the year for which income is earned and a tax return is filed for. Correct. And and my client claims the child in the odd tax years. So this would have been her tax year to claim the child. And when she filed, her return was rejected because Mr. Watkins had already filed and claimed the child for the second year in a row. Okay. All right, Mr. Watkins, uh, again, I, I presume you knew that a tax year means the year for which income is earned and which you're filing a tax return for, and you're claiming the child during odd years as well as even years? despite the fact that you've agreed otherwise? It was not originally intended to be that way, Your Honor. That was a mix up with my tax agent. Well, okay, it's your responsibility to control your own tax return, which you sign and you submit. So I'm not gonna put this on your tax person. You, you agreed that, that you would only claim the child as a dependent for certain years. Did you file an amended return once you realized that a mistake had been made? No, not yet, Your Honor. And I see you're, you uh, at least have an electronic signature on the amending document. So I'm presupposing that you really did approve that change. Okay, so what is your position regarding the request for some financial relief because you claimed an exemption, which you would agree not to claim. At this point in time, it's verifiable that according to our parenting agreement, it is 50-50 parenting time. 
Now, it is verifiable that I have our child far and above that 50% mark. So at this point in time, being above that 50-50 parenting time gives me every right to claim him because our parenting agreement failed once I passed that 50% mark. Regardless of what that parenting agreement says, once one of us goes up and beyond that 50% mark, that person can claim him on their taxes. All right, Mr. Watkins, I'm not here to construe federal law. I, this court doesn't allocate tax exemptions. It is, it is my opinion that that is governed by federal law, not state law. And therefore, uh, this court isn't responsible, nor does it want to take on the responsibility of trying to determine between you and IRS who gets to claim an exemption. That's what you're arguing. What I'm here to do is to enforce the party's agreements. And you agreed originally and then agreed to change a provision that you and the mother of the child agreed to regarding allocation of exemptions. And it's that agreement that, that the court is here to enforce in accordance with its terms. I don't get into whether that agreement should be in effect or not. I'm here to enforce what's on paper. And you agreed when there was this modified parenting plan to share the exemption so that there would be no adjustment to the child support worksheet. Whether you should agree to that or not is a separate question. What IRS would construe your situation to be is not the question before the court. It is whether there's an agreement in place to share exemptions. And if there is, the court intends to enforce it. You agreed that during the, uh, for odd tax years, the petitioner will claim the minor child as a dependent on her tax return. She has every right to rely on an agreement that she made and you made. Um, and you haven't filed any anything to correct any improper claiming of the exemption. So I'm going to presuppose at this point that you're not going to. Or you would have done it by now. But one of these refers to 2021 return. Does it not, Ms. Locke? The other 2023? Correct. And we're only asking for damages associated with the 2023 return. And what amount are you seeking? It's slightly modified from what's in our uh, motion because my client received more than anticipated in her state return. So that amount, amended amount, is $7,126. Okay, back up a minute. As I understand, you were seeking the difference. Oh, I apologize, Your Honor. Yep, that's Are you that. talking about, okay, go ahead. What's what's the new difference between whether she got to claim the exemption on federal estate and if she didn't get to claim? Sorry, we're asking for $3,746. All right. That's a number that makes more sense under the circumstances. All right, uh, Mr. Watkins, I'll give you the floor again. Uh, do you have any additional arguments or remarks to make in that regard? Other than uh, I agreed to the parenting agreement based on the fact, or I, I do apologize, the, the tax return, the, the tax exemption, I agreed to that at the 50% marker, the 50-50 parenting time marker. So beyond that, that is why I have not filed an, an amendment yet. I would have, but Miss Moore decided to come to court instead. I would have done this amicably and easily, but she didn't give me an opportunity. So at this point in time, I agreed to the parenting agreement and the provision with the tax returns that we maintain the 50-50% marker. Verifiably, I have him over that 50% mark, which completely throws out that 
part of the parenting agreement and the admitment. Okay. Did you get the court order change or get her to sign a new agreement to that effect? No, I did not. Well, I, I think you're under some impression, Mr. Watkins, that you can unilaterally just declare that the provisions that are in effect are no longer operable and you don't have to follow them anymore. But that's not fair to uh, the mother of this child. She has every right to rely on what the state of the agreement is in filing her own tax returns. And I can see it makes a substantial difference to her whether she gets to claim why as an exemption or not. Uh, according to the figures before the court, which the court at this point has no reason to dispute, $3,746 with the difference. And I'm sure it made a substantial uh, impact on your tax return and probably allowed you to come out in a much better position than you would have if you had not claimed Wyatt as an exemption for that year. Um, again, the, the, the court's jurisdiction here is to enforce the agreement that's in place. And the agreement in place said you weren't supposed to claim Wyatt. And you, you don't get to just unilaterally decide you're just not going to follow it. And so I am going to grant a judgment in favor of Aaron Leon Moore uh, versus Scott Wesley Watkins in the amount of $3,746 as compensation for uh, that provision not being followed that both parties had agreed to and was essentially approved by the court as part of a, an overall parenting plan adjustment. Finding that she suffered damages in that amount. Further, the court will expect that the parties will follow their agreement regarding sharing of the exemptions um, to avoid future problems. Now, a parent can always voluntarily sign it away. The parents can get together and reach a different accord when it comes to sharing of exemption benefits. But until then, the court will enforce the provision which is in effect. Ms. Locke, I trust you'll draft an appropriate uh, order which uh, grants that judgment. Yes, Your Honor. If the court's okay, I'll we'll also include the continuance for hearing. Yes. You may combine that in one order. Right. Were there any other issues that were raised by your motion that haven't already been set for hearing or ruled upon by the court, Ms. Lott? No, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Watkins, anything else that we need to address currently? No, Your Honor. Okay, then just understand that you'll need to be there in person. It's my understanding you'll be representing yourself uh, at the hearing in courtroom B, Butler County Judicial Center, Thursday, August 8, 1.15 p.m. for further proceedings on the motion to modify the parenting plan in the case. If there's nothing further, the uh, Moore and Watkins matter will currently be in recess, and this meeting may be ended for all at this time. Today, we're taking it back to the old school, the little landlord-tenant action from the 3B. Judge Jeffrey Middleton, way up there in St. Joseph County, Michigan. Good afternoon, Mr. Moore. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, you have a bright light right behind you, which is 
Uh, not a big deal. Let me see if I can fix it. Well, just turn the other way here. Find another spot to sit. Did we fix it? Yes, that's very good. We have a ceiling fan, but I see lots of those. All right. Uh, this is a return in the matter of Carrington Mortgage Services versus all unknown occupants at 53. Attorney David Schulte is here for the plaintiff's Carrington Mortgage. The tenants are not unknown. Uh, they are descendants of Earl Moore and uh, Jason Moore, uh, Robin Adair Moore, who is Earl's ex-wife, and at least one other person was residing there, a child. When we met last week, there was discussion about what this is. It's a house with five garages full of stuff. And uh, there was a foreclosure in this case quite some time ago. Now, the mortgage holder was Earl Moore, who apparently didn't share this financial distress with anyone else. And he died, um, I think, March 10th. No, April 6th. And then the occupants realized what the circumstance was. So I, I think it was Mr. Schulte who said he would offer 45 days to move, but we didn't come to any resolution. We continued the matter until today. Mr. Schulte, what's the position of your plaintiff? Your Honor, we could still offer 45 days to the defendant if that works for him. I think the problem we had last time as well, though, was with the consent judgment, if he had authority to sign it. Yeah. He couldn't must, consent yeah. for everybody else. Uh, so I could just do it as part of a consent on your side or just rule it with the plaintiff's consent. Uh, Mr. Moore, do you think you can vacate the property within 45 days? Well, let me be honest um, and, and just say this. I got the death certificate yesterday. So now I can move forward with paperwork to get things done. Um, we did find Aaron Bowers was the young boy that they actually had custody of. We have found a family member who is going to step up and try to get custody of him. Again, we had to wait on the death certificate because uh, my dad Earl actually had guardianship of him and they can't change that without proving he was dead. Um, there is a lot there to move. Robin is uh, on full-time oxygen, bedridden. We are working very hard to get her into a home. You know, I'm going to do everything I can to be out of there in 45 days. Um, I, I just, I, it, it's just so much. It's just so much to do. And, and I just now finally got paperwork to get started. Well, and it's certainly better than 10 days. And even then, they don't have to evict you on the 45th day. So today is March 3rd, uh, March May 3rd, 3rd, May 3rd, excuse me, I do that often, May 3rd to June 2nd is 30 days, 15 more days after that would be June 17th, would be 45 days. Now, I'm going to just issue the order of that. Uh, the parties move by June 17th. Your appeal date is May 13th. Patterson's bowling out there or something. Uh, this, if they stuck to their guns, you'd have 10 days to move. And there are several problems. A, you have to find something for this young boy. You have to find a placement for someone who's on oxygen and bedridden. And you got a lifetime worth of possessions stuck out in these barns. Um, the primary concerns are finding a place for this young Mr. Bowers and for uh, Robin Adair Moore. But uh, at some point, they wish to get this property back. The foreclosure was a long time ago. The redemption period actually expired last September. They could have started this matter in September of 23. 
And they didn't start it until, well, maybe the sale was in September of 23. Anyway, more than six months have passed. In defense of you, you're just here trying to do the best you can to pick up the pieces in this circumstance. And Fred Moore, who's or Earl Moore, who's not here, uh, had Earl been a police officer at one time? Yes, sir. 27 yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, several of them were right there in St. Joe County. He said he knew everybody there. Yeah, I knew him years back. All right. I'm going to do an order that says any occupants have 45 days to move with the consent of the plaintiff. That would be June 17th. So, Mr. Schulte, I'll ask you to send me a judgment for uh, uh, termination of tenancy effective June 17th, 2024. The appeal date will be May 13th. Uh, Mr. Moore, I would strongly suggest that are you the contact person, Mr. Schulte? Yes. Uh, Mr. Schulte's name and address is on the pleadings. It shows a Kalamazoo address, but the phone number of 312-541-9710, uh, is that still accurate? Yes, that'd be preferable to it, to the mail, just because it goes right to our office. Yes. So if I would suggest you stay in contact with him and let him know what your progress is. Do you uh, have any questions? Can yes. I give him my phone number on here too? So if he has well, I don't want to. I don't want to do it here on the live feed. He's a business, and uh, his phone okay. number is available on the internet. And if anybody wants to hire him, they can look him up. But uh, I don't want you to put your number. So call him and give him that number and email information. Then you guys can uh, deal with each other. In fact, okay. I'll put you in a breakout room right now, and you can provide that while we're here. Real quick, Judge, how do you want us to file the judgment? Do you, is, should we email it to I the courthouse? To, I want you to email it to me. At okay. This wasn't my idea. Uh, that's somebody else created that complicated. <laughs> that's okay. Anyway, I'm going to put you in a breakout room. Just hit the button that says join, and you can exchange that information with Mr. Schulte. And then you're free to go on about your business. Good luck, Thank sir. You, Thank sir. you for what you're doing to help your family. Thank you, Your Honor. Looks like they're wrapping up. Meg, I need the breakout room, so I'm going to close this one. Yep. And reopen it. Thank you, Judge. I was able to get them connected with us. Okay. They can. I wasn't clear what their defense they were trying to state, but. Uh, they may not have right. a de defense, but we can at least advise them. All right. Yes, I didn't think they did, but all right. I'm going to put Miss Olivier and both of you hit the button that says join the breakout room and I'll conduct other business while you're talking. Yeah. All right, um, Ms. Thompson, just stick with me. We're going to work on some other stuff. We're going to switch back to a landlord tenant docket. which is Carrington Mortgage. Versus Robin Moore and any all occupants at attorney David Schulte is here once again for the plaintiff. Jason Moore is present once again. And I have another party, Jimmy Kreitzer, who is also interested in this. Uh, this was a termination of tenancy uh, after a sheriff's sale. And um, I 
think this is brand new. Uh, Mr. Schulte, what's the situation here? Didn't we already do this? Yes, Your Honor, but there was um, some complications with it. So we had a judgment order for Mr. Moore to be out of the property by June 17th. Um, and while he was moving things out, it appeared the property was reported vacant by a vendor that Carrington uses, um, I believe just during a routine check. And that was prior to the 17th. And so um, since it was reported vacant, Carrington instructed them to proceed as vacant and change the locks and, and begin a trash out process. All prior to this, um, Mr. Moore was still moving things out and returned to his home and was locked out and have had some problems with that since then. So he's still in possession of the property while we were trying to work things out. And I believe Mr. Kreitzer is here to help explain why the property was reported vacant. Um, well, this has happened in a couple of recent cases. I have one right now where they're alleging that the move out people stole their stuff. Let me get into this because I don't have all the pleadings in front of me. Okay. And I believe that's similar here. Something important to, to Mr. Moore um, seems to be taken from the property. And I believe he filed a police report about it too as well. All right. We did have a judgment yep. that was... Uh, for a move out date of June 17th. That was agreed upon. Yep. Uh, then uh, we got email um, from Mr. Moore stating what you had said. And uh, I was told the attorney, they were trying to help recover the items. The police officer told me to contact the courts. So I'm not exactly even sure what I have authority to do here but I set this for hearing. Uh, Mr. Moore, uh, you're yes. content that they took your stuff before you'd finished moving out of your father's house. Is that correct? What? Yes, sir. Um, I, I just dumbfounded to how they could say a property is vacant. The doors were locked, the lights were on. I mean, I made it very clearly known <clears throat> You know, so you can visibly see, hey, if the doors are locked, the lights are on, the property's not unsecure. There's boxes all over the front porch. We're obviously moving stuff. Why they would call it vacant and break in in the first place, I don't understand. And in the second place, why they would violate the court order and not do things right, I don't understand. I'm just I'm just dumbfounded. There's a lot of stuff missing. And as I've told this attorney, David Schulte, I don't care about most of it. There's one box that was my father's law enforcement retirement stuff that is very valuable to me and my family. And we would like it back, but no one seems to want to admit to who took it. I, now, I, I had to wait. All right. Well, I've, obviously, as we discussed, I knew your dad. And I worked with him when I was prosecutor. Then he went to Hartford and did some other things, but I'd known him during his law enforcement career. Um, and in the past, I've charged people criminally when I was prosecutor with this, in this circumstances. I don't think this is going to turn into a criminal case, but I've charged when I, 25 years ago, uh, this. So Ms. Schulte, you indicated they were trying to recover the property so there's some blame to go around. They called you and said it was vacant. Someone from your office said, go ahead and do it, even though the time period for the court order had passed. Mm -hmm. And property that's valuable to them has been taken. Um, have you had any success in finding it? In finding his property? Yes. Yeah the goods no we haven't um that's i was hoping to talk to the police officer because the vendor that carrington hires provided some contact information with who all had been out to the property and have been doing my best to get in contact with them individually to to ask questions and see if anyone has seen you know what's missing um one individual gave me a call back and and prior to this hearing i was in contact with mr moore and gave him the contact info that I was given so that he could provide to the police officer and hope that gets taken care of. 
because it seems like um, from Mr. Moore's perspective, you know, and mine now at this point, the the top priority here is getting his lost goods back because that seems to be what what he cares about the most here. And well, obviously, Mr. Kreitzer, what's what's your involvement here? Hi, I'm a, a realtor, and I do a lot of bank foreclosure properties. And I was hired to go to the. Um, I've been watching the property for about nine months. And I do a bi-weekly Occupy check. And during one of my Occupy check, it looked like nobody was living in the house. I got out and walked around the house. And then there was a neighbor outside to the left. And I talked to the neighbor. And he said that, because um, I'd been to the property and I talked to a person named Earl Moore. And... Um, he said that Earl well, passed that's true. away. No, no one was living in the house, so and Earl passed but they away. They weren't done moving out. So did you give? Did you hire somebody to, to come then empty the house out? I did not. I hired well, who, nobody to come to move out the house or anything. Well, All who, I did is report that the house the firm? was was vacant and there was personal property inside. Your Honor, I believe he reported to a company called MCS, and MCS then reported to Carrington. Your Honor? Yes? Part of my problem is, is I left on the night of the second morning of the third to haul a load down south. Um, knowing I had to be back by the seventh because I had a clean-out crew coming in the seventh with dumpsters and clean-out you know, guys to clean the place out. When I got back, they had locked me out. When I got back on the night of the 6th, I was locked out. It took until the 13th to finally get someone to let me back in. So now I had to drive back there, and I had to stay in a motel and wait till the 13th after calling everybody to get back in. This attorney that's here now is the only one that had even helped me any. All right, well, let's talk about this. This has to do with possession, and they now have possession of the house. What you have is a claim for money damages. You also may have well, a I'll violation. Still... Of... Hold on for a minute. You may have a violation of the lockout law where they came and locked you out. And this is a kind of an amorphous group of defendants. It was your father's house. There were people in it. Um, a number of names. You weren't actually living there, but you were trying to help facilitate this. Uh, they're subject to being sued financially for the unlawful taking of your property. I guess you could sue everybody involved, um, but I don't have the authority to order anything in the context of this landlord tenant case. As I said, in the past, I've charged people with crimes. Um, I have another one right now where the people are quite upset. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what, what I'm going to do with it. But well, your honor, to clear point, anything up, I do live there. OK. All right. So you did reside there? I still do. I'm still there right now. Well, the date for the writ has passed. You're subject to being evicted. Judge, if I can add something, we uh, we yes. separately provided Mr. Moore some more time. And, and even as a part of this hearing, we're going to be willing to give him some more time to, to continue to move things out, given everything that's happened and given that he was locked out. Um, okay. But that's where... We were also kind of confused and, and waiting to hear what you had to say about the matter with the eviction, with, with everything else going well, on. I, uh, I we guess were ready I to give him more time. This as a information. Well, how much time are you willing to give him? If if Mr. Moore, we were trying to, to reach some agreement with Mr. Moore, if there is any time that he would be willing to go with. Just with everything that's happened, we obviously understand the situation and, you know, any matter of one or two weeks would be preferable just because our client wants the property back to proceed. But I also understand what's going on with Mr. Moore and that there are more things going on. And if there's any sort of compromise we could, we could reach, that would be great. 
All right. Well, Mr. Moore, how much more time is it going to take you to vacate? Well, I had to reschedule with the move out company because we were locked out and couldn't get in. They showed up and couldn't get in. Uh, more importantly to me, I want to know, you know, a couple of weeks is fine. I can live with a couple of weeks. We'll, we'll, we'll get what we can get out and be done. More importantly to me is I incurred a lot of expenses staying at a motel and having to get police involved and everything, trying to get back in the house. And I want to know who is, how, you know, let's just say we give them back the house, Your Honor. If we give them back the house, they can fight me for the next hundred years over who stole that stuff. They're just going to sell their house and move on and forget all about I even exist. They don't care. They have a lot more money than I do. They'll fight it forever. I'm not trying to get everything back that was missing. There's a riding lawnmower missing, all kinds of stuff. I'm not trying to get all that back. I want the box of his retirement stuff back. That's all I have of my dad. While trying to move out and move Robin into a home, as we discussed before, she died on us. So this has been a tragedy multiple times throughout my family. And the one thing that we have of my father's life was his retirement stuff, his golden police chief ring and stuff. It's all gone. I mean, how do you put a value on this stuff? So what am I supposed to do? Walk away, give them their property back and say, okay, you just, you, you win. I'm never going right, to get so nothing. What, what's the question? You want to stay longer for free because you're mad because they took your dad's stuff? Sue them. Sue them for no. $25,000 and uh, no, subpoena people. That's not what I'm but, saying, Your Honor. I'm not trying right, to well, do that. What I, I, well, I understand why you're upset, but. I want them uh, to reimburse my cost in the motel and stuff. Which All I right, think well, David Schultz they said can, they would do that. We they spoke to them. They haven't confirmed the reimbursement. We'll, we've contacted them about it and asked. All right. Well, they can, Your they Honor, can do that if they choose to. Yes. Your Honor, I want to say I have never go on record. I've never been inside that house at all. I want to go on record for that. All right. Now, I do have one more question. You know, if I break a court order, I get in trouble. What happens to them for breaking a court order? Uh, I guess that's a good question. Uh, they could be found in contempt. Um, I don't even know who it is. Uh, the, the problem they have is they're going to say, we have the authority of the law firm to do this. Um so we have a, a succession of mistakes. Um, and so to charge them criminally is probably not realistic because they'll say, well, the lawyer told us to go do it. Uh, or someone from Carrington Mortgage. I'm not sure at this point who gave them the authority to do it. So I agree with you. I'm not very happy about this. But at some point, you need to vacate the house and that's what we're trying to establish here is when you're going to be out. And and I will be out either way in that two weeks. I'll have whatever I can get out will be out. I'll be done. But uh, if right, I well, ask the question, hold, 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 hold it. Let's decide when two weeks is. Today is June 28th. Two weeks from now would be July 12th. Is that long enough? Or you want to go to July 19th? Let's go to the 19th. All right. So the move out date is July 19th, 2024. And no writ will enter before that time. Judge, do you want us to prepare a new order for that to submit? Yes. Also, the plaintiff is attempting to recover defendant's missing property. Hello? Yes. Oh, I, I lost all video. <laughs> okay. Uh, well... All right, we'll cover missing property and uh, consider reimbursement for expenses.
Your Honor, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. If if the owner of the said property is is Carrington Mortgage, whoever gets hired below them would be Carrington Mortgage's responsibility. So wouldn't Carrington Mortgage be responsible for what others do? For say, if you hired me to paint your house and I didn't paint it, I had somebody else do it. I'm still responsible for who I hired to paint your house. If you're not happy, you're going to come after me and I have to go after them. Yes, you could sue Carrington Mortgage if you choose to. Well, I guess what I'm asking you is in the terms of penalizing someone for breaking a court order, it would still fall back on Carrington Mortgage. They're the ones that hired the other people. It's Carrington Mortgage should have done better due diligence to see if the property was vacant. Uh, yes, but this, this is a landlord-tenant foreclosure action. Um, so I'm not doing your heavy lifting for you. If you want to sue them for money damages, you can do it. Uh, you've got until the 19th of July to vacate or you're subject to being evicted. Mr. Schulte is going to be working with Carrington Mortgage. Somebody screwed up here. There, uh, there isn't any other way to describe it. Yeah. But uh, let's see what we can do. In the meantime, you need to vacate. But if you want to sue them. I, I will. All right. Well, let's see what they can accomplish in the next three weeks. Uh, Mr. Schulte will submit a new order. So everyone else is vacated but you? Yep. And now if they don't reimburse me all my expenses that they have caused me, do I come back to you for this or what? Yeah, you file, a, you file an action. Uh, Ms. Bauer, were you going to say something? Just, I'm happy to consult with Mr. Moore if he's interested about his general about his civil rights and obligations. Would you like to talk to Legal Aid about this? Yes, definitely. All right, I'll put you in a breakout room. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Judge. Well, the problem is I'm going to need the breakout room again in about two seconds. I, I'm, um, I'll just direct him for an intake and give him a basic all right. Con contact. All right, I'll do that. This year, we gave about forty-five thousand. Um, each equally distributed uh, to three women entrepreneurs who are building their business right here in Michigan. And how did you feel shitty about? Miss Olivier, that's your microphone. Is that your other hearing? No, he's really got products that you know. Um, no, I don't know what you're hearing. I'm hearing another court bleeding into our record. Now he's okay. All right, let me do the breakout room. Or Mr. Moore can stay until the end of the well, proceedings. I'll put, I'll put you in a breakout room and then we'll take up our next matter. Okay. So, Mr. Schulte, I'll wait your order. Okay. So, is under. Do you need me for anything after their breakout room? No, I don't. Okay. All right. Thank you. More. I'm sure we'll be in contact again going forward and you have my contact info and whatnot. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And Mr. Kreitzer, you're good to go. Thank you. Okay. I didn't pay $2,000 for a Metcalf. You know what's really awesome? When you record the whole entire intro and then you look down and your microphone's on mute. So cool. So, this is an update to a really, really old case. This one started the hashtag Free Zeke movement. Um, most people probably saw it on Law Talk with Mike since my channel was absolutely tiny at the time and maybe 12 of you saw it here. However, that's where it started. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the bottom, we have Miss Burke. She purchased a cat from Miss Benson, although it wasn't really a cat to her. It was a possession. It was supposed to be a showpiece. Yes, they have cat shows. That's a thing. I know. Shocking. However, the cat was not showable. It wasn't good enough quality. And um, 
she had expected this because you can predict genetics and all. And so she is suing Miss Benson for not giving her a perfectly bred cat. Because, you know, we can control perfection, whatever. Good afternoon. All right, Miss Burke, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, and Miss Benson? Yes. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and go on the record. This is in the District Court of Greenwood County, Kansas. Case is entitled Tracy Burke versus Kimberly Benson. It is case number 23 CV5. The plaintiff, Tracy Burke, appears in person pro se. Defendant Kimberly Benson also appears in person pro se. All parties are appearing by Zoom. Case comes before the court today for a pretrial conference. This case was originally filed um, on a small claims petition under case number 22 SC3. As I understand it, there was a trial held in front of Judge Webster back on January 19th. There's a verdict in the favor of the plaintiff, Ms. Burke, and Ms. Benson appealed that decision from the magistrate court to the district court. This is the petition filed in the original case, and it was refiled again in this case. So Ms. Burke is filed an action against Miss Benson, and Miss Burke says that Miss Benson advertised an Egyptian Mao kitten for sale on her website as a show slash breeder quality. The cost of the kitten is more than pet breeds due to the expected show quality, and the buyer retains breeder rights, which has potential of breeding income. Has the kitten, I think that's supposed to be, as the kitten developed, his coat markings as well as his eye color are out of breed standard for Egyptian Mao. I contacted Ms. Benson and she agreed to DNA testing. I paid for the testing and the results showed Egyptian Mao slash Bengal mixed breed. I ultimately had the cat altered due to inability to show slash breed. I have made numerous attempts to resolve this matter with Ms. Benson to no avail. Note, transportation was at buyer's expense. However, I would not have traveled 1,616 miles for a crossbred cat. Ms. Burke is asking for a payment of $2,000 plus interest costs and any damages awarded under KSA 60-2610. This is small claims court. And B, recovery of this personal property plus cost. I'm not sure what personal property she's referring to, but she lists additional costs incurred as... Travel cost, picking up purchase, 1,616 miles at 56 cents a mile, which is $905. CFA registration, $15. Vet immunizations required for show, $100. The neutering, $101.76. DNA testing, $106.69. Should have bought one on Amazon for $67. Court cost of $82.50. And court travel, 1,676 miles at point. 625 cents a mile equals $1,048. She's appearing via Zoom, but whatever. So the total is $4,358.95, but she notes, I am amenable to waive any amount above the small claims court max of $4,000. I'm also not claiming income loss due to breeding potential. Nice of her to be amenable to following the law. However, Judge Webster ultimately ruled in favor of Ms. Burke in the amount of $3,310.95. Now, that is considered the magistrate court because Ms. Burke, it, I'm sorry, <laughs> because Judge Webster is actually a magistrate judge. It was signed off by Judge Ricky. Since they appealed that, Judge Crum is now reviewing it in a de novo review, which means he's looking at the case completely anew. He's not, a, he's not reviewing any specific issues brought by them from the fire, prior case. He's just going to wipe it clean, and start all over again from the beginning. So Ms. Burke has refiled the same petition again, and it's a brand new case from the beginning. So that seems to be the progression through the court at this point. Would you agree, Ms. Burke? Yes. 
And Ms. Benson, would you likewise agree? Yes. Okay. And Ms. Benson, let me address you first. Are you still wishing to pursue this appeal? Yes, I am. All right. Um, I typically schedule a pretrial conference first uh, just to determine uh, what we're going to need to do in terms of exhibits, how much time we need to set aside on the court's calendar for trial. So today is, is not the trial. I just want to get some information um, from you both and give some instructions on, on what we need to do moving forward. Um, this is a trial de novo, which means it's tried again to this court. It's not a case where I review the a transcript of the record of the previous hearing and then and then make a ruling. So you'll each present your cases um, again in full. So okay. do you both understand how we how we proceed at this level? Yes. Yes. Okay. And how long approximately, if you can recall, did it take to try the case in front of Judge Webster? It we were on zoom for about an hour and a half but there was some starts and stops getting started so okay. was that due to technical issues technical issues and there was somebody else in front of us that we had to wait for as well okay so you were on a on a docket yes okay all right as far as exhibits go did you all have exhibits that you presented uh um, yes at the time, uh, mainly I just had the phone call conversation with Wisdom panel. Um, I also did go ahead and show a sibling to the cat she got this last weekend. So I plan to present that as evidence as well, since she took her eight her winner's ribbons in all eight rings under eight different judges. Okay, and so approximately how many exhibits do you intend to present, Ms. Benson? Uh, the photographic evidence, which will be probably about 25 photos from the cat show, as well as the um, show catalog to show that she was at that cat show, entered in that cat show, and that was her number, um, and that it, when it was as well and uh the conversation from wisdom panel the catalog you're referring to how how many the front page is all you need to see because it has everything you need on it okay and this phone conversation is that on a it was recording? a video recording yes okay and miss burke how many exhibits do you intend to present eight to ten, eight to ten eight to ten separate pages yes okay um typically what i do on these cases is i require that those exhibits be forwarded to us here at the court and then you'll each need to provide your exhibits to each other in okay. advance of the hearing uh, that way everybody has an opportunity to look at the others exhibits and when they're presented to the court a lot of times on these cases, people are bringing in their exhibits. They haven't forwarded them in advance, and it's it takes a lot of time to try to get them presented when you're doing it over Zoom. Okay. So I, I like to have all that accomplished ahead of time so we can just quickly reference the exhibits okay. as they come. Now, Ms. Burke, you reside in Alabama? Yes. Okay. Do you have the ability to email your exhibits to us and to Ms. Benson? Yes. Okay. Do you have Ms. Benson's email address? I don't know which one is the current one. She has multiples. Okay. Another the one, one you sent can... 75 emails to will work. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you do you wish to provide her your email address so she can forward you those exhibits, Miss Benson? Yes, that would be fine. And which email address would you like this, her to utilize? The same one that we've had 75 conversations back and forth on, KS Persian, K-S-P-E-R-S-I-A-N 
at yahoo.com. Okay. Do you have that email address, Ms. Burt? I do now. Thank you. All right. And Ms. And you said you had 10 or less exhibits, Ms. Burt? Yes. All right. And Ms. Benson, again, state how many separate pages of exhibits you intend to present. There are approximately 25 pages of photos or 25 photos. There. I'm sorry, but what are the photos of this cat itself? No, the sister, since hey, I don't have that. All right. Let me, let me stop you both. These exhibits haven't been admitted yet. These are just exhibits that each of you intend to present. So we'll take that up at the time of the trial okay. as to whether or not they're admissible or not. When you each are going to present your exhibits, you'll each have an opportunity to object if you have a legal objection to their admission. But that's something that will be done at the trial. So, May I also present all of our email conversations? <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to say what you can and cannot present. I okay. can't tell you. I can tell you. I can't tell you they'll all be admitted. You can certainly present them, and then we'll determine whether or not they're they're admissible at the time of the trial. All right. Thank you. And you live in Hamilton. Yes, Kansas. Okay. Now the I typically require if there's going to be more than 10 pages of exhibits that those be presented in what's called a trial notebook where they're where they're marked by numbers. That just makes it easier to present and reference at trial. Okay. And and this would go for you too, Miss Burke, on the exhibits you present by email. If you could have those marked as um, plaintiff, yours would be done numerically. For okay. instance, your first, this goes for Ms. Burke, your first exhibit would be plaintiffs one, plaintiffs two, so forth. And as the defendant, Ms. Benson, your exhibits would be marked defendants A, defendants B, okay. and so forth. And That way, it just makes it easy to reference at trial um, as we're going through these, which ones are admitted, and you can easily go back and forth between the exhibits. Um, Ms. Benson, do you have an email address for Ms. Burke? I'm assuming you do, based on your prior statements. Yes. And you'll need to provide these exhibits to each other. Okay. Um, beforehand and and to the court and Miss Benson, since you're going to have those additional exhibits, I'm going to request that you provide those um, to my office in a notebook form. Okay. And I'll I'll tell you the dates that all of these need to be exchanged by here shortly once we set the um, trial date. Let me ask you first, Miss Burt, do you have any questions about the exhibit process at this point? No. And Ms. Benson, do you? No, thank you. Okay. So Ziggy said this one's a little boring right now, and he's trying to climb across my lap on top of my desk to get to my monitor to see the Fur Baby channel on my Discord. If you haven't joined the Discord, there's a link in the description. Some of our members have posted pictures of their Fur Baby friends, and Ziggy is trying to lick the computer monitor. So I thought, hmm, since it's a little boring right now, let me show you some pictures of some of our members' adorable little fur baby friends. Enjoy. Now, the, the way the trial is presented, I'm assuming will be uh, similar in nature to how the case was presented in front of Judge Webster. Miss um, Burke, you're the plaintiff. You would put your case on first. And... Then when you're done presenting your evidence, uh, Ms. Benson would have the opportunity to cross-examine you or, or your witnesses. And then the same procedure would occur when Ms. Benson's putting on her case. Uh, Ms. Burke, do you have witnesses other than yourself you're, you intend to call to testify? Yes. And how many? 
How many other one? Witnesses? Okay, and who would that witness be? He is the ombudsman for CFA. Could you say that again, please? He is the ombudsman for CFA. And what is CFA? Um, Cat Fancy Association. Okay, and is this individual and going to be somebody who's going to be in a location with you, or is he going to be coming in separately? He would come in separately, and I also um, Kansas um, State Attorney General. All right, Have you, are you going to you plan to subpoena these individuals? Sure, I can do that okay so you'll have two additional witnesses yes all right and miss benson do you have witnesses other than yourself that you intend to call i had not uh, realized that this was going to be that much different than the original trial so i had not prepared any witnesses um i mean i could prepare one of my veterinarians that i've used for the last 20 years well, I, I can't provide advice on what witnesses you call. Again, you can call them. They're subject, obviously, to objection by the other party as to the contents of their testimony. Obviously, it would have to relate to the claims made in the petition. Oh, and I also need to uh, put in there uh, the Small Animal Division of Kansas. All right, I'm going to schedule a half day's time to try the case. And Angela, do you have some dates you can provide? Such on May 19th at 1.15. May 19th at 1.15. This would be, trial would be conducted by Zoom. Does that date work for each of you? Yes. Yes. And just for clarification, that's May 19th or May 9th? 19th. May 19th at 115. All right, I'm going to set a deadline to exchange exhibits on at May 16th by five o'clock. That's a Tuesday, May 16th by five o'clock. Miss Burke, you'll need to have your exhibits marked and emailed to both um, our chambers here and to Miss Benson. And Miss Benson, you'll also need to have your your notebook delivered here to my chambers in El Dorado by that date. Okay. And you'll need to provide email copies to Miss Burke by that date. Okay. Again, just to be clear, May 16th by five is the deadline to submit exhibits to the court and to the other party. Trial will be conducted May the 19th at 1.15 p.m. by Zoom. Okay. All right, Angela, any other matters? I've missed that you can think of that we had discussed previously. Uh, no, Judge. Just does Miss Benson know the address here for the El Dorado Courthouse? Uh, no, I do not. Can you provide that to her, Angela? Please? Are you ready? Yes. It's 201 West Pine, 
Sweet C. El Dorado. Okay. 67042. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, Ms. Burke, do you have any questions? No. And Ms. Benson, do you have any questions? No, thank you. All right, and since you both are are proceeding pro se, which means you're representing yourself, if you have questions um, of the court between now and then, um, if you could include each other's for instance, if you're going to send an email asking a question about some aspect of the case, be sure you can include the other party's email address so there's no what's called an ex parte communication. Okay. I'm not allowed to, to visit with either one of you individually about the case. So any communication you have will need to include the other party. Do you have any questions about that? No. no. Okay. All right. Well, we will see everybody back then on, on May the 19th. Thank you. And if there's nothing further, we'll be in recess. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And Miss Burke, let, just to clarify, are you in Eastern time zone where you are? No, I'm on Central time. I'm on your same time. Okay. So just to be clear, 115 Central Standard Time for the trial. Yes, sir. All right. With that being accomplished, we will be in recess. Have a good day. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. We'll go ahead and get started. This is in the District Court of Greenwood County, Kansas. Case is entitled... Tracy Burke versus Kimberly Benson, case number 23, CV5. Plaintiff Tracy Burke appears in person pro se. Defendant Kimberly Benson also appears in person pro se. All parties are appearing by Zoom. We are set today for a trial on an appeal from Judge Webster's um, decision in this case. In Kansas, an appeal from a small claims decision is heard de novo, which means this court hears it um, as if it's hearing it for the first time. The, it's not based on the prior record. Okay. So the manner in which we'll proceed is probably very similar to the manner in which you proceeded when the case was heard in front of Judge Webster, Miss Burke, as the plaintiff. You will put on your case first. Um, if you if you call um, witnesses um, to testify, including yourself, Miss Benson will be able to cross-examine you or ask you questions based on your testimony or the witness's testimony, and vice versa. When Miss Benson puts on her case, um, I do note that you both have submitted um, some exhibits. When you wish to reference an exhibit, you'll need to. They're not marked, and I, I understand you both, or well, maybe they are. I'll, since you are both representing yourself, I'll give you a little bit of, of leeway on, on court procedure, but we still operate as if you did have attorneys. So, um, Ms. Burke, do you have any questions about how we'll proceed? No, sir. And Ms. Benson, do you? No. All right, and I will urge you both during if somebody else is testimony uh, is testifying or presenting evidence, try not to interrupt. If you disagree with what somebody's saying, don't don't say anything. You'll each have an opportunity to um, tell me whatever um, you feel um, is necessary for your respective cases. So. Um, I typically will give each party an opportunity to make an opening statement if they wish. An opening statement is just a uh, preview or a brief summary of, of what, what you hope to um, show the court regarding your position on the case. Ms. Burke, do you wish to make any sort of an opening statement? 
Uh, yes, sir. I would. Uh, what about this little kitten for a daughter? Um, as the cat grew older, it did not meet uh, Egyptian mild standards for breeder quality. That's when we reached out from to Miss Benson to let her know that we had issues with the kitten. Uh, she had asked us to get a DNA test, which we had done, and uh, it came back with the Bengal cat background. Um, we have raised Egyptian moths for probably 14 years. We've never had a kitten that had yellow eyes. This kitten does have. That totally disqualified the kitten for show. Um, that's just in the CFA standards that a cat with yellow eyes will be disqualified. We paid $2,000 for a breeder show quality cat, and that is not what we got. All right. Thank you, Ms. Burke. And Ms. Benson, do you wish to make an opening statement? Yes, I would. Thank you. Actually, uh, CFA Breeder Standard does claim that a kitten has up to 18 months of age to reach green eye color. She decided to come to me when the kitten was seven months old and said that it was not breeder quality in her opinion. Now, I've been showing Egyptian mouths for 22 years. So I do know a little bit about how the show system works. I actually even showed a half litter mate and first cousin to the cat she purchased. That cat did champion and it looked the same as far as eye color, uh, general type and the markings on the forehead. Um, so that's why I took it and showed it. It championed under all eight judges. She got her winner's ribbons. She came home a champion in one show. So I believe that statement to be completely incorrect. I brought four kitties for her to decide from, the one that she had picked online from the photos, plus its litter mates, plus an older male kitten that I also had available when she met me at my vet's office in Howard, Kansas. She picked out the kitty of her choosing that met the criteria she wanted, had me do additional testing on the cat for her, which I did at my cost, and then she took the kitty home. So, and to, as to the claim that it is a Bengal cross, again, I have been raising Egyptian mouths for 22 years and showing them. There is no Bengal in my background to my knowledge. However, Egyptian mouths were used to create the Bengal breed. So there is Egyptian mouth in the Bengal bloodlines. It's just different strains. And Wisdom Panel does state clearly in their terms and conditions that they are not to be used in a court hearing. That's why I sent that as part of my evidence. It says it's more for a general idea of what might be in your cat. And I did not ask her to get wisdom panel done. She did that on her own. All right, thank you, Miss Benson. Occasionally, I might interrupt you all if I have a question or need a clarification on a, when you say things like wisdom panel or something similar. I, I don't know what that is, so sometimes I might interrupt and, and ask those questions. I'm not attempting to be rude, but just trying to make sure I understand all okay. of what I can do. So, all right, Ms. Burke, I'll allow you to put on your evidence now. Do you do you have witnesses that are going to testify? Or are you, are you going to testify they, on your own behalf? They should have been subpoenaed um, per the last court. And I'm not sure who was supposed to do that. I didn't because I don't have the quality to do that. But I will tell you what I have in my possession. Well, let, let, me stop, let me stop you there. You, you think you subpoenaed witnesses? What was that that we were supposed to do for the whole photo three? Who is supposed to subpoena them? Sorry, we're, we're going without them. We're going without them. 
Okay. All right. So do you wish to testify on your own behalf? Yes. Okay. I'm going to have you raise your right hand and swear you in. You swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. So help me God. All right. If you could uh, just start by stating your um, full name for the record, please. Tracy D. Burke. All right. Go ahead and provide your testimony. Okay. When we bought the little kitten, uh, it was a $2,000 breeder cat, show quality. Um, and we paid for that, and we did pick the kitten up in Kansas. Egyptian mom disqualifies as a show quality cat per our exhibit four if uh, blue eyes, lack of green eyes and color in cats over the age of one year, six months is disqualified from show. We paid $2,000 for breed quality, show quality, and this cat has yellow eyes. All right, okay. let me stop you there, Miss Burke. You were just referencing Exhibit 4, is that correct? Correct. And where, where is, it's a page that seems to describe Egyptian Mao, then it has a point score. What, what is this document? It's the Cat Fanciers Association. It's where the cat is registered. Such yeah. as uh, AKC registered dog, only this is a cat. So it's called a cat fancy what? Association. All right, Miss Benson, have you seen this exhibit? Yes, it's the point scoring system for Cat Fancers Association. It does not say it's a disqualifying trait. It just means it gets less points. <laughs> It okay. clearly states what are disqualifying traits. Is a lack of spots, blue eyes, lack of green eye in color in cats over the age of one year, six months, mottled or pink, and that is a disqualifying per CFA. All right. Do you wish to admit this exhibit? It's exhibit four. Yes, sir. All right. Any objection to the admission of this exhibit, Ms. Benson? No. All right. Exhibit, plaintiff's exhibit four will be admitted. You may proceed further, Ms. Burke. Okay. Exhibit five is a cat color eye. It is clearly yellow, not green. Is this the cat in question that you purchased? Yes, sir. And when was this photograph taken? April of this year. April 2023. Do you wish to admit this exhibit? Yes. Any objection, Ms. Benson? I would like to see it. I was unable to pull it up and see it. Were you provided a copy of these exhibits? I. Yes, I did not see one that showed the cat's eye color clearly. So, do you know. have those in front of you, the exhibits that I'm you I'm trying received? to pull that up right now. Let's see, it's three days ago. I'm assuming the cat in question is named Zeke. Yes, sir. I think what I'm going to do so this will flow better is I'll just allow you to testify, Miss Burke, and then then we can go back and address the admission of the exhibits later. So we're it'll just let your 
testimony flow a little bit smoother. So, all right, I, go ahead. Um, the markings on the cat is incorrect. He does not have uh, the mall M on his forehead. He also does not clarify the color of the coat of a, uh, an Egyptian mall as per exhibit five. Uh, that's exhibit five, page two. I'm apologizing. And when was that photograph taken? About three months ago, I would say. He's still a small cat. But the reason why that we chose the wisdom panel was because our vet has him classified as a gray tabby cat. And when we asked him about the having the DNA done, he uh, recommended the wisdom panel. So whether ever it's um, allowable in court or not, that's what our vet asked us to do. And it what wasn't it? done on a... Uh, whimsical whatever just to find out what the cat was what is because a wisdom panel it is a dna testing that can give you some idea of what your cat is and me and miss benson had talked back and forth because we had had questions and she had recommended for me to have the dna testing done and when the kitten come back with part bingo cat is when she started, she didn't want to hear anything about that. I had gotten in touch with CFA's um, ombudsman, who said that if it, she accused me of having a bingo cat in my house, which I do not. Uh, and he said, even if I had have had a bingo cat in my house, it would not have changed the DNA on this cat. Now, I'm not going to say that Miss Benson did or did not know the background of the cats that she's breeding, but she passed this kitten off as a show quality Egyptian mall, in which in turn she talked to her lawyer and she could find a buyer to buy it for three, 350 bucks when we paid 3000 and drove to Kansas to pick the kitten up. And you live in Georgia? I live in Alabama. Alabama? Okay. All right. You can proceed further, Ms. Burke. Okay. Um, the back of the cat, uh, from the head to hit the back of his shoulders, is not in uh, Egyptian mall um, pedigree markings. Uh, as Miss Benson said, she had raised been, uh, Egyptian moss for 20 years or so. So have I. And evidently, I got a better cat out of New Hampshire than I did out of Kansas because he looks nothing like this kitten. And this is exhibit five, page three. Also, uh, exhibit five, page four. He should have a button vest. Not all of these button stripe looking stuff that is incorrect for this cat breed. We did have the wisdom panel done after we consulted with our own veterinarian. Um, and that's exhibit six, page one, that shows that this cat is not a, a third breed cat. It's got another cat mixed in with it. And this was a blind test check. A blind um, test what? The Shit. wisdom panel showed a blind test pat, a blind test, uh, a cheek swab. Typically, that's done in dogs, cats, humans, 
to find out what their uh, genealogy is or who belongs to who. Uh, this might be trivial, but this is something that me and Miss Benson had agreed to do after I had some questions back when Zeke's eyes didn't color come out to be green. Uh, that was my first heads up, was the cat has yellow eyes. And that totally disqualified him from a show ring. And I certainly would not want to breed that cat with a show quality female and it have disqualifying features which would cut the cat out of show. On exhibit six, page two, you will see how there's two different cats that was shown up in this um, DNA test. And it shows an Egyptian mall and a Bengal cat. Also on page uh, exhibit six, page three, there's been a long line of this Bengal cat going all the way up to our Zeke's parentage. I talked to our, when I was accused of having a Bengal cat in my home, and I talked to the ombudsman of CFA who registered this kitten as to be a thoroughbred cat, he told me that there was no way in this lineage would that cat ever had a Bengal in our home. That's what that background of that cat was. Now, I do have the parent lineature from the certified pedigree, but I also own. Um, Plaintiff Exhibit 8, it shows a email uh, captured from Edward L. Raymond Jr. of the CFA Ombudsman, who texts me back and said, your cat was registered based on the fact that its parents were CFA registered. Please understand that they, not every offspring, from a pedigree of two CFA registered cats ends up being show quality. He apologizes that I did not receive the cat that I wanted or bargained for, but for CFA was not a party to that transaction. And CFA is the Cat Fancy Association? Yes, sir. That's who uh, registers the cats for to make sure that their pedigree cats to travel along with their genetic line where you can go to show or you can breed the cats and it be a little bit better quality than your typical muck cat, which nobody ever knows what's in those cats because most people don't care that we didn't uh, go to a shelter and get a baby 30, 50 buck cat to help this uh, humane society out. I actually have a cat that I plucked out of tractor supplies box at the cat's register. She was free to me. Uh, that was 30 miles away. I didn't drive all the way to Kansas to go pick up a kitten that was supposed to be registered only to find out that it did not be the breed quality of what I paid for. Um, she's just a little old mutt cat. Now, little mutt cat's called what people might say as a mixed breed dog, a mixed breed cat. You don't know who their parents are. The, our little red cat come out of a storm drainage. We also have had this cat neutered because he is not show quality. He does not fit the description of what a uh, thoroughbred mall should be looking like. We had this cat neutered. That's the end of the line for that cat. And that's on exhibit nine. 
Miss Burke, when when was the cat purchased? Okay. August the 6th, 2021, a deposit was sent. And we picked the kitten up on October the 8th at uh, Miss Benson's vet in Hamilton, or it might have been off skirt of that little area in Hamilton, Kansas. All right, go ahead. Okay, we attempted to uh, settle this transaction, Exhibit 11, to offer her uh, to pay us back $2,800, which would cost for the cat and our uh, transportation cost to come pick the kitten up. Usually when you go out of state to buy a kitten, because there's not one available in your area, um, our first mall come out of New Hampshire. This one actually comes out of Kansas. Um, we offered her $28 settlement to make this issue correct, and that was denied. Okay. Miss Burke, who is sitting? Who is assisting you? My husband is sitting next to me. Okay. Since he drove us to Kansas, so I figure he has a right to be here. Okay, you can. He can certainly be there, but he can't assist you in presenting your case. If you wish to call him as a witness, you can certainly do that. Then go ahead. Uh, I will agree with that. I work third shift. I apologize. I've had three hours sleep today. I work 12 hour shifts in a nursing home. But today is the day of court. So we will travel along. You can proceed with your testimony, Ms. Burke. Okay, we went ahead and did a um, small claim court, which we won. Um, and I guess I'm not sure why. I guess Ms. Benson had that obligation to uh, appeal that decision, and she has that right to. But um, when we're having to pay court costs, for her to appeal a case, I don't agree with that. I'm sorry, us Alabama folks don't work like Kansas people, evidently. Uh, and I guess that's probably, we're having to be charged an additional $300 uh, for Ms. Benson to appeal this case that we've already won. Um, but um, whatever what your decision is, and we have a any. Who assessed uh, you three hundred dollars, Miss Burke? Sir, where you were sent a bill for three hundred dollars for appeal fees? Uh, that was on what I was sent from district court, sir. Yes, sir, I did. A hundred ninety-five dollars. When was that assessed to you? When it got sent to your district court. It's on the docket. All right, you can proceed further. Okay, from what all we have been through and trying to settle this with Miss Benson, and she don't think that she owes us anything back in this cat is what it's worth. Uh, we disagree. Me and my husband both have lost work, and neither one of us have a cheap income. We don't sit on our butt. I work for a nursing home, and I'm a nurse. 
My husband works for the federal government. It's not that $3,000 is nothing to us to lose, but it is the fact of the matter that somebody in Kansas can fraudulently do something that should not be done. When I called CFA, they agreed. They did not think that the kitten was registered thoroughbredly uh, breeder quality. And I have that uh, email from Mr. Benson. I also have attempted numerous times to let Ms. Benson know that she had a problem with her cat's heritage. And all I got was that I was trying to slander her. And I did not. I called CFA and Mr. Uh, Raymond told me that that cat was a mixed breed cat to its lineage. And I had that uh, DNA testing done through me and my Miss Benson's agreement to let's see what the cat come out from. And that's when she become very... Uh, Hostile, so to say, to me and some emails saying that she did not um, agree with that. Was it done by blood? Was it done by saliva? And if I'm not wrong, whether it be dog, cat, or human, cheeks are usually swabbed for DNA. Now, this wasn't meant as a trivial, let's see what our cat's made up of. But that's what it came out to be, was a mixed breed cat. She agreed during small claims court that all of her cats may not develop into show quality. Well, the show quality price on her cat goes back to plaintiff exhibit one where a silver pet mall is 1200 bucks. That's usually where you get one altered and it cannot breed. When you go to breeder show quality at $2,000 a piece, then that is a big tremendous difference. But then I also got an email from Ms. Benson saying that she had talked with her attorney and that she could sell the cat between three and three hundred and fifty dollars. That's a far cry from two thousand that we paid for the cat, plus to come pick it up. That is plaintiff exhibit ten. Yeah, you can proceed further, Ms. Burke. Okay. I contacted um, Kansas um, Attorney General. Uh, he did advise me to take it up with the Federal Trade Commission. I have not done that yet, and I don't know what difference it would make. Um, I did call CFA because I had some issues with the markings on the cat. That by no means was any slander to anybody. I was trying to get to the bottom of what this cat is. And were we just fraudulently sold a cat? So I also had the state of Kansas uh, small animal uh, division to call me back 
And they actually told me that Ms. Benson did not have a business license in the state of Kansas and that she was hard to find. And I probably agree with that because it wasn't until I told the sheriff's department I knew where she was. And if they needed me to drive back to Kansas to help her locate to get to the bottom of this situation, I would be happy to. And they found Miss Benson. I did not have to make that trip. Um, I don't have anything else to say. That's where we stand with this cat. It is a mixed breed cat. He is at least two years old now, and he still has yellow eyes. Uh, so if I decided to take him to show, and there's show quality, and there's also called a premier quality, which a cat has been altered but can be shown in a cat show, uh, his yellow eyes would disqualify him in either show ring. And I'm not even going there to embarrass myself. And I guess that's all I have to say. All right, Miss Benson, do you have questions of Miss Burke based on her testimony? And keep in mind, you'll have your opportunity to testify on your own behalf. But if you have cross-examination questions, you may ask those of Miss Burke at this time. Thank you. Ms. Burke, I would like you to read your Exhibit 10 aloud in its entirety, not just the small excerpt that you keep picking out of it. Uh, you said again. Your, your, your Exhibit 10. Uh -huh. Okay. If I'm going to be able to talk, don't talk over me, please. I All need right, to go right, to Both of you, this needs to be done orderly and respectfully. So... I'll advise each of you, please don't talk over one another as we are taking a record. So you may proceed um, answering the question, Ms. Burke. On this email text, I guess it was an email because um, I, had, I have both and I was in contact with her frequently as the kitten aged. On October the 13th, 2022, Ms. Benson contacted me again and said, again, your cat is not mixed breed. I did go to an attorney after our last talk. He did tell me the only thing you can do since you already have slandered me everywhere you can is for me to sue you. And there is no way that you will win. Please feel free to do so. He also asked me what I can resell the adult cat for. I told him that as a neutered adult, I have only been able to get about 300 to 350 adoption fee. After a year old, if I find a buyer, he informed me that if I were so inclined, I could offer me, Miss Burke, $350, or I did bring up that I would be willing to allow to trade him for another young adult male. I have that I thought would be more to your liking. He informed me that he would not feel that this is necessary, but if I do, you would have to sign a contract that he would draw up for me and that you would agree to rescind all your defamation statements you have made publicly and agree that this was the final contract we would have. If you would like to see this boy under those terms, I will get you some photos. If not, I will await the contract, the contact from your lawsuit, which will be here in Kansas as a sale 
was here in Kansas where it will have jurisdiction. Okay. Well, I tell you what, why don't you go back? All right, Miss Burke, it's Miss Benson's uh, time to ask you questions at this time. So do you have additional cross-examination questions, Ms. Benson? Since I have shown many Egyptian mounds with yellowy green eyes, which is what his look like, my question is, where do you find it a disqualifying trait? Because I've been showing for the last 22 years, and I've never had a judge disqualify one for yellowy green eyes once, ever. So where is it stated that that is a disqualifying trait? Okay, if you will see on um, Plaintiff Exhibit 4, uh, 2022, the Cat, Cat Fanciers Association, uh, when you look at that entire sheet that you can print off, it says disqualify, lack of spots, blue eyes, lack of green in eye color, and cats over the age of one year, six months, modeled or pink paw pads, kinked or abnormal tail, incorrect number of toes, white locket or button distinctive from other acceptable white color areas in color sections of standard. So yes, ma'am, this come from CFA in 2022 of their cat breed standard for the Egyptian mall. Additional questions, Ms. Benson? No, thank you. All right. All right, Ms. Berg, do you have additional witnesses or evidence you'd like to present? No, sir. All right, I need to, I want to address these exhibits. Um, you've referenced a number of exhibits here, but there's also some that you didn't. Is it your wish that the court admit all of the exhibits that you submitted correct do i need to go over each and every one of them for you well i will find that out in a minute miss benson do you have any objection to the court admitting these exhibits no all right there's no objection so miss burke i'll admit all of the exhibits that you presented which appear to be um, 15 numbered exhibits, some of those with uh, multiple pages. So those are those are admitted. Thank you. All right, Miss Benson, it is now your turn to put on your case. Do you intend to testify on your own behalf or do you have other witnesses to call? No, I'm testifying on my own behalf. All right, give me just a second. All right, if you could please raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. All right, go ahead and state your full name for the record. Kimberly Renee Benson. All right, you may proceed with your testimony. Okay, um, I submitted evidence that I showed a sister out of the same male, and the mother was a first cousin um, that looked exactly like the features that she did not like in the male. So I took her to a show in Garland, Texas, and showed her under eight judges, all eight of which gave her her winner's ribbons. She came out of that show a champion. Uh, Miss Benson, let me let me stop you there. Okay. This cat you're referring to is a sister of Zeke. Yes. From the same litter. It is from a different litter, and the mothers are first cousins, but it's the same father. She was born about a year ago. I have her registration papers as one of the exhibits. 
Did you say same father, different mother? Same father. The mothers were uh, sisters. So cousin on mom's side. Okay, go ahead. But the reason I showed that one was because it had the same qualities of Zeke. You know, the same lighter pattern, the same lack of a very distinctive M that she kept yelling was a disqualifying trait. Um, and the same, you know, yellowy green eye color. Same exact features as Z. So I took her to a show down in Garland, Texas, um, which is listed. She has her championship certificate also in evidence from that show uh, that I applied as well, also in CFA. And we had no trouble championing her. Uh, that's why I had asked if she had ever shown Z at one point when we were conversing back and forth. And she had not. I did not at any time tell her to go get the DNA done, but I didn't have a problem with it because, you know, it's, <laughs> he's been three or four generations into my bloodlines of Egyptian mouths that I've been raising for the last 22 years. Many of my mouths have shown to grand championship. One of my mouths was best Egyptian mouth in Europe. So, you know, he's got good bloodlines behind him. If he didn't turn out perfect show quality, well, that's why I put breeder show because he might make a great breeder. Some of my best breeders are not my best show cats. And some of my best show cats aren't my best breeders. It doesn't always go hand in hand. But he was sold as breeder show quality, which is exactly what he was presented, which is exactly what he was. She could easily have championed him if she wanted to or gone further if she wanted to. But she chose to never show him and just decided on her own that he was not breeder show quality. What does it mean when you say could have championed him? If she'd have taken him to a show and eight judges deemed him fit and worthy, they would have given him his blue winner's ribbons. When you get those blue winner's ribbons from six different judges, your cat becomes a champion. And then all you have to do is apply for the certificate. But it's automatically goes towards the registration papers. Any cat that becomes a champion in CFA then has the CH in front of the name from then on. Once you pay the $10 fee and, you know, get the little championship certificate, if you want, you can have the paperwork redone to show that championship. But any kittens out of it would automatically have the CH in front of his name from then on once he becomes a champion or she. So I felt like I sold her exactly what we agreed on. I did try to make her happy. And I said, okay, you know, I can send you another cat that is more what you're thinking a championship cat should look like or a grand championship cat should look like. I do have a darker spotted male who's much more distinctive, much more has the look that you would like, you know, that you think of as a mouse. There are a lot of different looks in the silver Egyptian mouths. They go from a very light silver to a very dark spotted black, pinky black spotted silver and everything in between. CFA doesn't say it has to be this shading or that shading. They just want to be able to see the pattern, which he has. Um, like I said, I've been showing them off and on for the last 22 years whenever I've got enough money to go because it's $350 to $500 to spend on a show weekend. To show cats. That's just the reality. So I don't go all the time, but off and on I go whenever I can afford to. And my cats have done very well. We've placed in the top 10 all breed finals repeatedly. Um, and to be in a top 10 all breed final, that's they take all the breeds and they bring back their favorite 10 cats. I've taken a best cat and show twice. So I do know my breed. I've been doing it predominantly Egyptian mouse for 22 years. That's why I was so offended that she was calling and talking to everybody that she could think of to try to discredit me. I have many people that come back. I have people that have come back this year from 17 years ago, wanting a new mouse because theirs had gotten old or was about to die or had died from old age. I have people that come back for three, four, five, and six cats for me. I try to make my people happy. 
but I don't feel like I should give them all their money back and then some every time somebody decides they're not happy. I've had people come back and a year later and say, well, my cat's not a kitten anymore. I want you to give me my money back so I can go buy a new kitten. That's the world we live in. Everybody wants what they want and they want it right now. And they don't necessarily think about anything except what they want. So I did try to make it right. And when I said that I could get three to 350, that's any adult spayed or neutered. People don't want adults. They want kittens. Once you spay or neuter it, you don't have an opportunity to sell it as a breeder to someone else. All you can get is an adoption fee because it's now an adult and everybody wants a kitten. So that's where I was coming from when I said three to 350 is what I can get for a neutered adult, period. I just can't get any more than that because nobody wants adults that they can't use in a breeding program. They want kittens. So that was where I was coming from. I tried to make it right in the only ways I know how, but I'm not going to be just giving people money because they've decided it's grown and I'm no longer interested and I want my money back. That's like wearing a pair of jeans for a year to me and then take them to the store and say, oh, you should give me all my money back and then some because they no longer fit me. You know, it, it's just not reasonable. So that's where I was coming from. My case is, is based on, I sold her exactly what I said I did. She picked out the kitty of her choice. She didn't want an older kitten. She wanted the as young as possible. And I understand that people want as young as possible because that's what they want to bond with. I don't let them leave under 12 weeks of age. So I met her at my vets when the kitten was 12 weeks of age. I brought the one that was a couple months older with me in case she liked him better, but she'd made up her mind. She wanted that younger one. And that's fine. I let her see all that I had available. She took the one she wanted. And then I didn't hear anything bad from her until seven months later when she decided she was no longer happy with the kitten. How many different cats did you take for her to look at? Four. That's what I had in kittens available at that time. All right, you may proceed. Okay. Pretty much that is my case. Um, you know, I, I basically, I sent the photos of the cat to show how much she looked like Zeke that I showed. And with her winner's ribbons and on each judge's table, with each judge, I sent her championship certificate and I sent the copy of her registration papers with her new champion designation in front of her name. And you can see that they're out of the same father when you look at Seek's registration papers and hers. Like I said, the mothers were cousins. So or, or, the mothers were sisters, which made them cousin on one side and half sister on dad's side. I have never raised are you, them. Are you referring to exhibits that you submitted to the court? Yes. yes. Well, let's, let's see. Okay. Do you have additional testimony? Not at this time. All right. Ms. Burke, do you have any questions of, of Ms. Benson based on her testimony? Uh, yes, nice cats don't have anything to do with Zeke's qualifications. And if I can get you to go back to exhibit one, about halfway down that, it says the overall balance in our kittens is coming together nicely. And I raised for sweet tempered, outgoing, affectionate if not somewhat clingy. Well, let me tell you what Zeke is. All right, Miss he, Miss Burke, do you, this is an opportunity for you to ask questions. I'll give you a, one last opportunity to make a further statement. But do you have a question to ask Miss Benson? No, I didn't. I had a comment to make about my exhibit one. Okay, well, this is cross-examination. So this okay, is- Okay, I don't have any to cross-examine. Okay. All right. Let me address these exhibits then, Ms. Benson. You've submitted. They're not marked, but there's one, two, three, four pages of photographs. Yes. 
And do these photographs all depict the sister cat you referred to in your testimony? Yes. Ms. Burke, do you have any objection to the court admitting these photographs? I didn't get such photographs. I don't know what cat she's inquiring about that may or may not be linkage to the cat that we got from her. Right. You don't, you have not received these exhibits? No, sir. Angela, do we have the ability to email those to Ms. Burke? They were emailed to her on 516. No, ma'am, I never received those. You didn't receive an email from, was that sent from us? I haven't gotten an email from your court system since March. Can you confirm the email that they were sent to to make sure we see if we have the same email address, Angela? Yes, Judge. I have T-A-B-U-724 at iCloud.com. It's T-A-B-U-724 at AOL.com. That is my email address. All right. Can you send that email to that email address at this time, please, Angela? Yes, I'll do it right now. All right, and then Ms. Benson, there's a Cat Fanciers Association Inc. certificate. Yes. Does that pertain to this sister cat? Yes. And then the last document, what is that? Registration form of some sort? Yes, her registration with her championship, new championship designation in front of her name. Do you wish to admit this as evidence? Yes, please. All right, Angela, can you forward these other documents to Ms. Burke also, please? I do, Judge. Do you have the ability to access those documents, Ms. Burke? Yes. Okay. If you could review those. Okay, they're still not coming through. You might check your spam folder. You seen anything yet, Ms. Burke? Yes, sir. What would you like for me to look at? If, if you could please review those um, exhibits that Ms. Benson's wishing to admit and indicate whether or not you have any objection to the court admitting those. Okay. For one, I don't know who, who these cats are, what their heritage is, or nothing else. It's a bunch of cats at a cat show. I don't have any proof that this is even related to this cat. So where's the lineage on that? Because I don't see it. Miss Benson, did you take these photographs yourself? The photographs of the cat at the cat show, yes. With each judge and then by herself with her winner's ribbons between each, each ring. And when were the photographs taken? March, uh, shoot. Put on there when the date of the show was somewhere. Let me look be on the date of that show. Well, I didn't have it on this computer and the other computer doesn't allow me to be seen at the same time, but it was March the 16th, I believe, and 17th on that show. It is in the, uh, the notes that I attached with the photos was the date of the show. 
of, of what year? Uh, this year. It was just two months ago. All right. Well, I think Ms. Benson's laid the proper foundation for the admission of the photographs. The court will determine what weight um, to give to the exhibits in due course. And then the other exhibits are a certificate and a registration form. Do you have, did you receive those exhibits, Ms. Burke? Uh, yes, sir, and I also have Zeke's registration and uh, forms from CFA, too. So to me, that means nothing. Okay. Do you object to the admission of the exhibits? Oh, no. Go right ahead. Okay. So all of respondents' exhibits are admitted at this time. Do you have additional evidence to present, Ms. Benson? No. All right. At this time, I'll give each of you an opportunity to make closing statements or remarks. Ms. Burke, I'll start with you. Okay. I'll put it plain and simple. We went and bought a little cat, cat and we wanted breeder show quality just for the quality of the cat, not to ever breed it, not to ever show it. We wanted that quality of cat because we have had that quality of cats. I also, too, have raised Egyptian moths. Uh, our old male Egyptian moth never thought about calling me up. Um, and he also has registration papers from CFA. Uh, this kitten is not what it ever uh, was put out to be. Every kitten picture I had of this kitten was in a cage. And I'm not sure if that's not what is part of his personality. Um, when the cat did not um, grow into his qualifications of a show breeder, uh, that's when we started asking some questions from Ms. Benson. And we got shut down fast. Um, we've taken every avenue that we could to find out what this cat was. Uh, we have figured out that that line is on her mama's side, his mama's side, not on the male side. Uh, and whether that is, uh, the court wants to know that, hear that, and that might be just um, whimsical as to having a DNA test done. Uh, I think it is pretty sad in the day that a cat owner would want to go this distance to be charged that much and an issue come up and the owner of the cat isn't willing to back it up. She did not bring all four siblings of this cat to the vet's office. She had in her possession the cat that we purchased and a Bengal cat, a, Geoff a Geoffrey, which is another breed cat, that she was going to get on a plane to and fly to uh, New York. Well, small animals decides that she has more than two litters in the year. Miss Benson doesn't have a license in the state of Kansas to sell cats. Uh, I have just had some questions. I was not being uh, mean or derogatory. I just needed some help with her to find out what was wrong with this cat. Because he has never acted like any mall that we have raised in 20 years. Uh, my adult male treats me as well as my husband does. He waits for me on the sidewalk when I get home. He comes in with me, and if my husband's off from work, he won't come out till I get home. So just because our cat was allowed to go out and in, that cat still had the respect for the owner not to claw it up, it is whim. Uh, that is very abnormal for an Egyptian mom. They attach to one person in the family. And when you have that cat that attaches violently towards a person needs to be put down. 
we have not put this cat down till we figure out what the poor system wants to do with this cat. Because right now, we're not even thinking about do we want another mall out of Miss Benson to trade out a cat with her? No, sir. She cannot prove our cat's lineage because she has multiple cats in her home. That was our question. And when she got defensive and did not want to make an act that we felt was incorrect, correct, then okay. Uh, we're stuck with this mixed bread cat that since court will be over today or in your judgment, we will find a new home for this cat and it's not going to be in my home. This cat is disqualified from CFA. We paid $2,000 for that cat, a kitten. So I, I appreciate you hearing the, some squabble over some cat. I never meant for it to go that far. And I thank you for you. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Ms. Benson, closing statement. Well, the cat's lineage is known. I mean, she's got the generation, three or four generation pedigree, she said, from CFA. And that is his lineage. That is what's behind him. That's what's in his background. He's from all registered cats as far back as at least six generations. You know, um, as to the fact that he didn't turn out to be the way she wanted him to be, I'm sorry for that, but they grow up and what, she, you know, they don't always turn out exactly how you envision they will. That's why I offered her one that was already older, established. If she wanted a stud, he was already, you know, ready to be a stud. If she wanted a pet, he was a very sweet pet and had the look that she thinks is the only look a Mal has. But I've known from all my experience in showing that there are many looks in the silver Egyptian mouths. They don't all look alike. And one look doesn't necessarily win and another one loses. It just depends on the judge viewing the cat at the time, what their personal preference is, how they read and decipher the standard, the breed standard. Uh, again, I tried to make it right. She did not want to respond to that. She'd made up her mind. And I'm sorry about that. I know that I can't make 100% of the people happy 100% of the time. I did maintain my breeder's license for over 18 years. I let it expire when I no longer raised four to six litters or more a year. The last year I raised a total of two litters. I didn't renew my license because I only had two litters of kittens. They're not selling. They haven't been selling for the last three years, and that's related to the COVID pandemic. People aren't interested in going out and spending money on cats and dogs. So I came to terms with that and went back to work and, you know, lowered my breeding to next to nothing. For that reason, I still have people come back wanting more of my kittens that have bought from me previously. And I've had to tell them I'm not breeding at this time. The last litter of Egyptian mouths I had was... Well, they turned 12 months old this month, a year ago, because nobody's been buying mouse. But the one that I put in the photo, she sold as a breeder to another breeder. She sold as part of a breeding pair to another breeder. I mean, we, I've been divesting myself with my breeders because they no longer sell and I have to go back to work. I don't have time to take proper care of them being home, but they are cage raised for separation issues because the state requires it. So yes, they were all started in a cage because the state requires they be caged every time they show up and they can show up anytime between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. And you have to be available. Your cats have to all be caged. So we do know who the parents are. It's no doubt, no question. And I have not owned a Bengal in 20 years. So there's no way that it had any Bengal in its bloodline. Because as long as I've been an Egyptian mouth breeder, I've not owned a Bengal. At least not from my lines, unless it's way far back that had nothing to do with me and I knew nothing about. And that is all I have to add to this case. So Ms. Benson, 
This yes. wisdom panel says 24% dingle. Suggested. That's what they say, suggested. But they also state clearly in their terms and conditions that they are not to be used as in a court of law to determine parentage. And they state that in two different places in their terms and conditions. All right, thank you, Ms. Benson. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna need a little bit of time to review these exhibits before I issue a ruling. Okay. I don't typically look at the exhibits until they've been admitted. So um, let's take about a 15 to 20 minute recess to let me review these exhibits as well as my notes. Um, you can just mute your camera and um, go off video while we're waiting. Don't leave the meeting. Okay. So we're in recess. All right, we'll go back on the record. Same appearances as before. All right, I've had an opportunity now to review the exhibits of both the petitioner and the respondents, as well as go back over my notes that I'm going to find as follows that the defendant, Ms. Benson, advertised the sale of Egyptian now cats, indicating prices for uh, pets or for breeder show that she had been doing involved in the breeding and showing of Egyptian moths for 20 some odd years. The plaintiff, Miss Burke, has also had numerous years um, in owning um, an experience with Egyptian mouths, drove from Alabama to Kansas to pick up the cat. Zeke is the cat at issue uh, with the intention of um, having a breed or show cat paying the $2,000 price tag. It's assumed that Miss Burke had an opportunity to review the cat in person at the vet's office in Howard, Kansas um, before paying the money and transporting the cat back to Alabama. As the cat grew older, Miss Burke became dissatisfied that the, the cat didn't meet the qualifications to be a show or a, or a breed cat. There's a DNA testing done uh, the court has has reviewed the wisdom panel, however, without having much more scientific background, it's hard to, to gauge the accuracy or how much weight to give to give that, but I think it does deserve some weight. In essence, uh, Ms. Burke testified that, while they didn't intend to show or breed the cat, they, they wished to have the quality of cat that could be shown or bred. And I've reviewed the photographs of the sister cat submitted by Miss Benson and the photographs of Zeke, and they don't look very much alike in the court's opinion. However, I'm my only knowledge on what's a show quality Egyptian now has come from what I've heard in, in this hearing today. What I'm going to do is award Miss Burke eight hundred dollars, finding that that's the difference in price of a breed or show cat and a pet price of $1,200. I'm gonna order Ms. Benson to pay judgment in that amount to Ms. Burke.
So that's that's the order of the court. Um, either one of you can appeal this decision if you wish, if you choose to do so. At this stage, it goes from up to the Kansas Court of Appeals. So, Ms. Burke, do you have any questions about the court's ruling? You're muted. Ms. Burke, you're muted. You'll need to unmute. All right, go ahead. Do you have any I questions? will be appealing to the higher court. Okay. I didn't pay $2,000 for a mutt cat. And so I will proceed higher. Very well. Ms. Benson, do you Thank have any you questions? Thank you so much for your time. Ms. Benson, do you have any questions? You're muted as well. No, sir. Thank you. All right. Angela, do you know on these small claims appeals um, who's responsible for the journal entry or is that something that the court produces? That I do not know, Judge. All right. Well, we'll look into that um, and send you both a copy of an order. Okay. Thank you. So. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you that we were awarded 33 something dollars in small claims. I really do appreciate you offering us a hundred, uh, $800 um, difference of that. Uh, but thank you. But I will appeal on and take it to the next higher court and I will let the Federal Trade Commission know. So I appreciate you very much. You're very welcome, Miss Burke. Have a good weekend, everyone. We'll be in recess. Absolutely. So as we saw, Judge Crum ruled in favor of Miss Burke, even though I don't think she deserves it. Sorry, my opinion doesn't matter. But he only gave her $800, which is the difference between a show cat and a mutt cat, I guess. That cat's freaking gorgeous. I would have taken that cat. Anyways, so apparently Miss Benson has not paid Miss Burke because in January of 2024, Miss Burke filed a request for citation of contempt, small claims. And in that, she said the judgment creditor requests, which is her, that the court issue a citation for contempt to the debtor, which is Miss Benson and that the court ordered the judgment debtor to complete a statement of assets form and return it to the clerk no later than 30 days after receiving the form, and the debtor failed to complete the form. I don't see anywhere where that was ordered. I've, I've looked through the orders, and I don't see that. I pulled up that form, and it says, if the debtor has not paid you, it says this is instructions for the creditor, if you haven't received your money within... 14 days following the file stamped journal entry. The journal entry is what they fill out to be recorded in the computer system, like the official record of what's going on. Then mail a copy of the journal entry in this form to the debtor. You must also file a small claim certificate of mailing with the clerk to show that you sent the documents. So what she should have done is filed a copy of this to show, hey, I sent this. And then Ms. Benson responds, has 30 days to respond. And it's, it's basically your, I guess, showing them what you own to justify why you didn't pay. Hey, I'm broke. But instead of doing that, what she filed was this request for contempt. And then she put a copy of Ms. Benson's Facebook profile, and then some listings for Jeffrey's cats and Egyptian Mao kitten prices and a picture of an adult Egyptian Mao and 
I guess she's maybe she's trying to show that there's no address. However, um, in the original documents, both of their addresses were listed multiple times. And um, I guess she's trying to show here that she's still breaking the law or something along those lines. I don't know. I guess it's like the subpoenas. She just thought somebody would magically do it for her. I guess that's how they do things in Alabama. I don't know what happened on the hearing on the 16th of March, I or the 19th of March. I have looked through every um, hearing from that day and there's nothing with her in it. So I have no idea where they were on Zoom at, but it wasn't on YouTube. So I will um, keep an eye out and see what happens, but it looks like Ms. Benson should be in contempt, but if Ms. Burke doesn't file the documents properly, she's not gonna be held in contempt, so we'll see. Crazy cat ladies. Everyone, meet Crystal. Crystal has a little bit of an attitude problem. She feels a little entitled. Like, she doesn't care if she's smoking on Zoom court, which is, you know, absolutely not allowed in any way, shape, or form. She kind of feels like she can tell everybody what she wants and that should be done, and when that doesn't happen, she kind of throws a hissy fit. She's kind of like a Karen. And she's going to go through the legal process for an entire year. And some days she's going to behave. And some days she's going to be batshit crazy. Are you ready? We are on the record in the 13th Judicial District, the District Court of Butler County, Kansas. This is our Monday, August 7, 2023 misdemeanor docket. First, I will call the uh, click case. Hi. Good morning. Good We're morning. The record in 2023, CR 243, State of Kansas versus Crystal Dawn Click. Please announce appearances. Jared Riggio on behalf of the state. Joshua Andrews on behalf of Ms. Click. And how does Ms. Click wish to proceed today on this matter? Uh, Your Honor, I was appointed on this case uh, last Thursday, um, so I would ask if we could continue this, and then I would also ask if I could have a breakout room uh, with my client to schedule a uh, uh, telephone conference and get some more uh, contact information from her. That certainly all sounds reasonable. Any objection, Mr. Regeer? I do not believe so, Your Honor. So... Savannah wins our next, uh, this, let's see, our next Monday control. We can do October 23rd at 9 a.m. Does that work for everyone? October 23rd, 9 a.m.? Unfortunately, I'm currently scheduled to be in a trial that day, Your Honor. Okay. The next after that is November 6th. Or we can do earlier and squeeze it on and maybe in September. Um, I would request November 6th just to make okay. sure I have time to talk to my client, get the discovery, review it, and then maybe see if there's something that could be resolved. Mr. Regeer, are you okay with that? It's awfully far out, but it's the nature of our calendar. Uh, Your Honor, I'm fine with the November date. However, I would respectfully request the court reiterate the special conditions of bond, um, which would appear to include no contact with the victim or the property as previously ordered um, at the first appearance hearing. And that, that will certainly be the order, Ms. Click. Make sure you maintain all conditions of your bond, including no contact with any alleged victim or property or anywhere a victim might be found. 
Understand what your conditions are? Yes. Okay, thank you. Anything further, Mr. Andrews? Uh, just the, the breakout room, Your Honor, but otherwise, no. no I'll okay. do that now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Click, we don't, for, for everyone's knowledge, we don't smoke in court. We don't ride in moving vehicles or drive moving vehicles. So if you are in a moving vehicle, please pull aside to a safe spot. County, Kansas. This is our Monday, November 6, 2023, 9 a.m. misdemeanor control docket. We will begin this morning with Heather Beasley. Mom, can, can you tell me how to get on this video, Mr. please? Mr. Miller, you're on it. Oh, I'm on. Okay, sorry. Do you, right? you have another one, Mr. Andrews? Yes, I do. I do have one more case on the docket, Your Honor. All right. And who is that? Uh, that is Crystal Click, Your Honor. Let's take that case up, too. We are on the record in 23CR243. Please announce appearances. Jared Ricky on behalf of the state. Joshua Andrews on behalf of Ms. Click, uh, who should be present as well. Ms. Click, where are you? I'm so sorry. I'm right here, Judge. Hello. Okay. You're the one Mark superstar. Okay. Oh my gosh. I didn't change that. I'm sorry. I, I used That's to. All right. That's all right. I've seen, I've seen other things that are less appropriate. <laughs> Mr. Andrews, how does your client wish to proceed? Your Honor, at this time, I have reviewed the discovery. I've discussed this matter with my client. Um, and there is um, referenced in the discovery uh, is another case that is directly relevant to this one. Um, essentially, this is a criminal trespass. Um, and the evidence that Ms. Click was um, advised of a no trespassing order is in another case, and that was not provided. So I'm requesting continuance so I could issue a request for discovery of the other case that would actually have the uh, necessary information to determine you know, how we want to proceed in this. Okay. Mr. Regeer, your response? Ms. Click seems to have a lot going on, but it all seems to trace back to a divorce and a messy child custody fight that's been going on for a couple of years. She's received trespassing charges and violation of protective order charges related to the child custody case where the original order stemmed out of. Your Honor, I'm reviewing the affidavit in this matter. There does appear to be reference to um, some other case. Uh, I am looking through my notes, and this would appear to be only the um, second time that Mr. Andrews has appeared on this case. So professional courtesy to um, counsel, if nothing else, I do not believe my office would object to a continuance at this point, provided that the court continues the prior bond in this case with all prior conditions, as well as no contact with the victim or address, which is specifically um, written as a special condition besides all standard conditions in the 500 professional surety bond, which was executed back in May. Okay. Excuse, me. Excuse me, may I, may I uh, speak real quick? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know how this goes, but I would just like to say that uh, this is kind of harassment. This is like an offensive thing. I was just there on Mother's Day to see my children. I'm supposed to have parenting time. He's not. He, he's not recognizing that. Um, it's just been a real abusive thing. I feel like I have suffered so much, and um, this is this is a, an offensive thing against me. Uh, an action against me. Um, and I, I have, I have rights. Um, Ms. Clark, you know I, mean? I mean, I'm supposed to be able to see my kids. He's, he's been pretty abusive Clark, and harassing. Hold, hold, hold up, Ms. Clark. Who's been abusive and harassing? Sean Hawker, my, my kid's father. Um, okay. When I okay. left him, okay. he started. All right. I'm sorry. So, um, Sean Hawker is named as the alleged victim of the trespass. Yes. So, when, 
Okay, and he is what, the father of your children? Yes, we were together for 13 years. When I left him, I started getting harassing phone calls. When we were passing the kids back and forth, he would no. scream at me. Um, you know, he's just been very, very hard to deal with. When I try to communicate with him, he would lead things into um, arguments on purpose and stonewall me. And then I'm going to, I'm going to screenshot this to sh show the judge. And like, it's just been constant, uh, you know, like, um, okay, I tried well, hold to up, Ms. Clark, hold up. You, you made the, you made the comment that you're not an attorney and yes. that you don't know how this works. Well, you do have an attorney a very experienced, competent attorney, Josh Andrews. He's here on the screen with us. And he's asked for a little more time to make sure he has everything he needs for your defense. So I would urge you to take up your concerns, if you haven't already, with Mr. Andrews. And I can, I will call Ms. Glick immediately after this hearing to talk to her some more about that. Okay, so he can take you down that path. But I think, I think I'm sensing that uh, you're not wanting a long continuance because you say this is harassing to you. So I was prepared to grant the continuance to February, I think is my next available docket, but Savannah, do you have anything else available on my docket that you can fit it in? I mean, it's hard to tell with the system down exactly how many yeah, right. cases we have on every day. Um, we can probably yeah, put it on the January 29th day. I know that's not a lot sooner than the February, but. I was just thinking, Savannah, we had packed the 29th. At some I time. know. That's, that's why I had moved on to the February one, but. Yeah. Well, Miss. Click, it just sounds like February is the earliest date. However, if you and your attorney can work out some kind of resolution with the state, maybe we can get that put on Judge Lee's docket, or we can just put it on the trial docket if you can't work it out. So let's go with, what was that date in February? It's February 12th, Your Honor, at 9 a.m. Oh, February. <laughs> I thought it was the 5th. Sorry, Your Honor. Uh, but well, I'm February 5th, if you want it for trial, that'd be the pre-trial. Do you want to put it on there? No, no, Your Honor, I misunderstood. Okay. I didn't misheard. heard. Uh, February 12th, I'm available. All right. And then and if you you and counsel work something out where you can make use of a Judge Lee docket, then feel free to ask and see if we can put it on his docket. But for now, Ms. Click, I am going to order that you continue on your bond with all the conditions, including the contact issues with the father of your children. And you'll need to be back here by Zoom, February 12th at 9 a.m. unless your counsel tells you otherwise. I know that this might not be the time to ask, but is there any kind of countermeasures that I can take? Because I'm the one that's being harassed here. I'm the one that's being hurt. I'm the one that's been attacked. I'm the one that's being kept away from my children. He has not suffered any kind of consequence at all like i am not harassing him i am not hurting him i'm paying him to hurt me you know what i'm saying like is uh, you know i'll i'll ask i'll ask my lawyer i don't think this is the appropriate time all right i think you've made a wise wise decision there so we'll be in recess miss click is excused mr andrews anyone else on the docket not to my knowledge your honor all right then you also are excused mr andrews thank you thank you your honor Mr. Cummings. I just didn't get to the mute button, but go oh. on. You can go ahead with Mr. Andrews and All I'll right. hop in. But. Thank you, Mr. Pate. Mr. Andrews, are you ready on the click matter? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Ms. Click, are you here? I'm looking for Crystal Dawn Click. Are you here? We are on the record in 2023. CR243, State of Kansas versus Crystal Dawn Click. Please announce appearances. Chair Brickier on behalf of the state. Joshua Andrews on behalf of Crystal Click. Apparently Crystal Click is not with us. She was, uh, let's see, August 7th of 23. 
Uh, Your Honor, I, th I believe the uh, act the last court hearing was actually November 6th of 2023. Well, I'm looking at case number 2023-CR243. Is that what you're looking at? It is, yes, Your Honor. Um, on November oh. 6th, 2023, we, okay. uh, that's, that's what it was set over to today's hearing date. Okay. I don't have those notes, but they probably just haven't been inputted with since the computers have been down. So if you can fill me in on our status, what we're doing today, Mr. Andrews, what our plan is. Thank you, Your Honor. So on November 6, 2023, I had requested some additional discovery. Um, this is a, uh, uh, I believe, criminal trespass, if I remember correctly. And the um, trespass order or notice of the trespass was issued in a separate case. I had requested um, the, I guess the the narrative, officer narrative uh, from that case, uh, confirming that my client was in fact trespassed from the property. Um, I spoke with my client after the hearing on November 6th. I had advised her that um, I, I've requested this, you know, additional discovery that I'm waiting to hear back. You know, once I get that from the uh, prosecutor's office, I will. Uh, I would call her to follow up with it and, and discuss how we wanted to proceed. Um, I, I've not yet received that information from the prosecutor's office, um, and so I don't know if. And I've not spoken, or I've not attempted to call Ms. Click, and I've not spoken with her since the November sixth hearing because I have not yet received that discovery. Um, so I'm not sure if that is the reason that she's not here today. If uh, it's because she was expecting to hear back from me. Um, and has just been waiting to hear back from me, uh, but I've not had any contact with her to, to confirm one way or the other as to why why she's not present today. Okay. Mr. Regeer, do you know why the information requested in November has not been received by now? That'd be about four months later. Your Honor, unfortunately at this time, um, I am not in a position to advise the court one way or the other. Certainly I will put a note in the file, um, but in any event, uh, there is still the matter of the um, defendant's um, apparent lack of appearance here today. And my notes do suggest that the defendant did appear at the last hearing back in November. I am showing that, uh, that the, uh, an appearance bond in the file um, previously for the for a date in August, it appears to be a professional surety 500 with a second chance bail bond. So I might respectfully defer to this court as to how it wishes to proceed insofar as that issue is concerned. Okay. Well, Mr. Andrews, let's be again on the record very clear what it is you're seeking from the state at this time. Your Honor, I am requesting a copy of the narrative or some other type of documentation from the case in which the law enforcement officer trespassed misclick from the uh, property in question. Okay. Uh, that, so, uh, you're saying when he would have removed her or told her she wasn't to be on the particular property in question? Yes, Your Honor. And according to the affidavit filed in this case, uh, it says, and I quote, Affiant checked Butler County case number 2023-00002489 um, in the documented case. It shows Deputy D. Danninger had previously trespassed Click from the property on February 25, 2023. Okay, so it referenced Butler County case number 23 CR three zeros and then 2489. No, it just said 2023-00002489. I'm assuming oh, that's that, a sheriff's number. Yeah, I, I yeah, I believe it's a okay. sheriff's number. All right. Well, I am going to order that the state submit that affidavit or report in Sh Butler County Sheriff's case 23-00002489 within the next two weeks to defense counsel as part of his discovery in this case, uh, 23CR300037. And under these circumstances described by defense counsel, you know, I think most people, most responsible people would still think they had to come to court or at least ask their attorney, but 
I can see where the defendant might think she didn't do any, need to do anything until her counsel told her. So rather than issue a bench warrant, I will grant. Are you asking for a continuance, Mr. Andrews? I am, yes, Your Honor. I will grant a continuance. And Savannah, that next date isn't until April. Is that right? Yeah, we can put this on April 8th, Your Honor. April 8th at that 9 o'clock. If that works, Mr. Andrews? It does, Your Honor. And I will uh, send a letter to my client making it clear that her personal presence is required at the next hearing date. Thank you. If there's nothing further, we'll be in recess on Crystal Click. If only her attorney had let her know that there was a continuance because Miss Click shows up about an hour, two hours later, fresh out of bed, ready to go for court. Hair fluffed, makeup on, let's do this. Your Honor, may I have leave to go off mic and off camera briefly? That'd be fine. Thank you, Your Honor. Seems like no matter how I try to organize these so you all don't have to wait, it just never pans out. <sighs> I always think I've got it organized and I have a plan and I'll get the attorneys in and out or get the jail in and out. Yeah, such is life, Your Honor. It's Indeed. busy. <laughs> Your Honor, Miss Friend, um, I'm scheduled on the docket for 9 a.m. Um, am I still uh, in line? Hey, you are still on the docket as a yes. My name is Crystal Click. Oh, you're Click. You're not Friends. I think I yeah. I'm so sorry. Miss <laughs> Click, I called your case and you didn't answer. I am so sorry. I. Honestly, just woke up and hold realized up. that hold up, I hold missed up, it. Hold up, hold up. I don't have my Mr. Regeer, were you the one on that or was it the other attorney? Mr. Canfield, who had the crystal click case with Josh Andrews? Your Honor, it was it was Mr. Regeer. Um, okay. We, we continued it to April 8th. We did. We did. Jared Regeer, can you join us? Oh, he's the one I gave permission. All yeah. right, I'm back on the record uh, in 23 CR 243, State of Kansas versus Crystal Dawn Click. I do not have an attorney. Mr. Regeer is tied up on another matter and Mr. Andrews was released, but Ms. Click has shown up at 10, 10 a.m. She was to be here at 9 a.m. And I believe Ms. Click, you were telling me you just woke up. Yes, I am so sorry. All right. Um, this was an unusual situation in that I did grant a continuance. Please call Mr. Andrews and discuss that with him at this time. He will give, okay. he will give you the new date and time, but you better not oversleep next time. Okay. You're excused. Absolutely. Thank you. I was here for uh, the hearing on Crystal Click. Okay. Well, let's look at is that who you have in court security now is Crystal Click? No, it's not. I have uh, Danielle Moriarty. Uh, okay. Crystal Click is my other case, Your Honor. Um, she's here by Zoom. Okay, let's take her up. We're on the record in 2023, CR 243, State of Kansas versus Crystal Dawn Click. She is here for motion to revoke or modify bond. It, it, as well as a uh, control matter, Your Honor. Do you have two cases on here? Or just the one? I'm only seeing one, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Yes, on March. Okay. This is another case getting ready to have a one year anniversary. Ms. Click, as I said, you're charged with criminal trespass by remaining in defiance of an order by the owner to leave, dated May 14th, 2023. And you've been here a number of times. We did have you set. For hearing, uh, it looks like on March 25th, 
for your motion to revoke or modify Braun. You requested a continuance. And so I suppose the first order of business is to take up Pick up the control status. How does she wish to proceed, Mr. Andrews, on the criminal trespass charge? Your Honor, um, I uh, spoke with the prosecutor. Um, this case is a, an Amber Norris uh, case. She was out of the office last week. Um, and so I was unable to connect with her uh, between the March 25th and today's date to try to work out a, a resolution. I have a, resolu uh, a proposal that I've submitted to Mr. Canfield. Um, but, um, Ms. Norris, I think is going to need to, to review that proposal, um, and, and see if that's agreeable to her or not. Um, so I, based on that, I, I would be, I, I am personally optimistic that the proposal is going to be acceptable and we're going to be able to resolve this. Uh, but, uh, I can't guarantee that, but, um, I, I would ask if we could just set this over. Um, I mean, I, and I, I don't know how badly this would, would mess up the docket, but I know I'm going to be back here on April 22nd, which is two weeks from today. Um, if it was po would be possible to set the control over to that day um, to hopefully hear back uh, from Ms. Norris on the proposal. Well, if I set this over, we're going to have to address that bond modification. And again, Ms. Norris is not available at this time, Mr. Canfield, to try to resolve this today. No, Your Honor, she's been out all last week, and I believe it's going to be out part of this week as well. Okay, so the motion to revoke or modify bond looks like it dates back to February 29th to 2024. This is one of the reasons I'm cranky about this can't be a stock it. We can't even get a motion to revoke bond between 229 and 48. See, we have a problem here, folks. And I have to get this straightened out. So expect me to be a little bit cranky if, for a while until you guys start getting these resolved, if, if you can, beforehand. So it is alleged the state filed the motion to revoke bond. It's file stamped February 29th, 2024, alleging that on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2024, the defendant repeatedly called or text the alleged victim, Sean Hawker, as reported to the Butler County Sheriff's Office in case number 24 dash, et cetera. Wherefore, the state respectfully requests that this court conduct a hearing to determine whether or not the defendant had violated the terms and conditions of her bond. And now the state who filed this motion, Ms. Norris is not here. And, and I understand things come up that she may not be able to help it, I don't know. But she's not here and she hasn't given any instructions apparently to her colleagues on how to handle this. So it looks to me like if the state wants to set this motion that they filed back in February over for a while, there's no point in having a motion to revoke bond, is there? Mr. Canfield, you guys still wanna pursue this motion to revoke bond if, if you're not in any big hurry? Your Honor, I can, I'll move to withdraw the motion for judgment. Okay. Motion for, motion well, it wasn't, a motion, it wasn't a motion for judgment, it was motion to, let me go back and, and It was a motion to revoke bond, Your Honor. The state will move to withdraw it now. Deputy Nelson, I appreciate you being here. We can set this over on the state. Yeah, my understanding was it was a motion to revoke or modify because she was having contact with somebody she wasn't supposed to, and this deputy was supposed to testify to that. And it dates back to February, and we're now into April going into 
whenever we can get another date for the control setting. All right, so motion to modify, revoke or modify bond is withdrawn by the state. And then Mr. Andrews, are you, give me a minute and let me know when you're ready on your next one. Uh, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, Crystal Click, um, you're right. Uh, I don't see, is, is Ms. Norris going to be on this morning's DACA or was uh, Mr. Regeer, Mr. Canfield covering for her on it? Mr. Regeer should be covering that one, Josh. Okay. Um, Your Honor, uh, uh, well, okay, I'm, I'm ready to take up Ms. Click, Your Honor. All right. We uh, are on the record. In 2023, CR 243, State of Kansas versus Crystal Dawn Click. Please announce appearances. Jerry Regeer on behalf of the state. Joshua Andrews on behalf of Ms. Click, who is also present. Uh, Crystal, could you turn on your uh, video, please? All right, and now does Ms. Click wish to proceed? Although I'm I'm not finding her. She did she turn on her video like you asked her to? No, she didn't. Ms. Click, we need your audio and your video. I think you turned off your audio instead of on your video. Crystal Click, I know she heard you, and then she disappeared on us, didn't she? I, I'm not sure you're right. I know she had, uh, I met with her at a breakout room, and, and her video was working at that time. Um, I had indicated to her that I thought that Ms. Norse was going to be here because of the motion that was filed. That I was going to try to meet with Ms. Norse in a breakout room. Um, uh, uh she She's showing up. I see her C and her name, but... She, you asked her to turn on her video, and then she said okay, and then her both audio and video went off. Oh, Miss Miss Click, now, can now you hear us now? Well, there it goes. Hi, hi. I am so sorry. I actually had to uh, log in on a different device to get it to to work this time. I apologize for the wait. Okay. Well, you're here. Good. Now you were saying, Mr. Andrews, as far as status. Your Honor yeah, thank you, Your Honor. We had set this over. I was uh, needing some additional discovery, which was provided uh, by the state. Um, so I have all the discovery on this case. Uh, however, in the meantime, a motion to revoke uh, or, oh. and or modify bond was filed by the state. And in it, it references a uh, narrative report from the Butler County Sheriff's Department. And... I don't have a copy of that. So I, I am asking for a continuance of both the motion and, and the control setting um, just so I could get a, a copy of that uh, report. In the meantime, I think that it may be possible to work out a resolution on this case uh, with uh, with the prosecutor, who, again, I believe is uh, still Ms. Norris, um, that maybe would hope hopefully render the motion moot if we can work something out. Um, so I, I would be asking for a very, very brief continuance because I do believe that, that we would be able to work something out between now and then. Well, as I look at this motion to revoke or modify that Ms. Norris filed, it's pretty straightforward that on February 14th, 2024, defendant allegedly texted the alleged victim, Sean Hawker, and then as you mentioned, Mr. Andrews, the Butler County Sheriff's case, uh, 24, et cetera. So she either did or she didn't. So I think you're right. It's pretty, we can handle this 
for fairly quickly. Uh, can we put this on? What's uh, next Wednesday afternoon look like for council and the court? Savannah, do we have time next? Not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, or is that uh, interpreter docket? Yeah, that's the interpreter docket. You have 52 hearings in the morning and five on the interpreter docket. I can do April 8th. That's in two weeks. Um, I'm I'm already here April 8th, so that would work for me, Your Honor. Okay, what is the state's position on this request to continue to April 8th? Your Honor, while the state is eager to address the motion um, currently before the court, um, the state does not have an objection to um, saying it over one time. Um, it will be necessary to issue the um, appropriate subpoenas for the next hearing. Now, Savannah, were you thinking at one thirty or 9 o'clock? 9 o'clock, Your Honor. April 8th is a Monday. All right. And then... Mr. Regeer, are you able to say if she's got any new charges coming up from that? Is, does she have a summons out, for instance, where maybe we could put them together, the motion and any new charges? And then, <sighs> I'm and so fucking about parenting time. This is ridiculous. Like, the guy just Chris doesn't Crystal, want to work Crystal. with me, and he's being punitive. Okay, Miss Click, I'm inclined to revoke your bond right this minute. Excuse me. Because if you think my orders are ridiculous. No, ma'am. I was saying um, my the children's father is ridiculous for being punitive and not just working with the mother. I'm just saying right. I'm well, supposed to have to right. I think you better stop now. Yes, ma'am. I assume the children's father is the alleged victim in this case. But if you, you know, we're talking about court orders here. This isn't any longer just a dispute between you and your children's father. You've gotten yourself one way or another, rightfully so, wrongly so, in the middle of a criminal prosecution. And you have yes, emotions, you have a motion to revoke your bond pending. And I could either go ahead and revoke it right now just based on your comments to the court. I don't mean to be disrespectful. I was All just right, trying well, I to bring up that I'm supposed to think, have these court ordered rights. And now you won't even let me talk in my own responsibility here. So you better let your attorney talk for you. I think yes, he suggested that to you. Okay. Anyway, Mr. Regeer, were you able to answer my question of whether she has another court date on any new charges or if Savannah can? Your Honor, I, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to advise the court one way or another at this time. Okay, well, let's just go ahead and leave this for April 8th at 9, and if any new charges come up between now and then, we'll, we'll deal with them as we will. Oh, and I'm so sorry, Your Honor. I should have actually looked at my notes better. Um, this matter actually is already set for April 8th at 9 on the control docket. It was just set for a motion hearing this morning, so uh, okay. that, that makes things okay. a lot easier uh, that we are already set. So what we're just requesting is a continuance of the motion to April 8th at 9, uh, with, where it was already set for control. Okay, so it's motion and control. And if if that other case ends up filed between now and then, would you be able to take the appointment? I know a lot, I'm just saying, as we all yep. know, a lot of times if you have contact while you're on bond, uh, that's a violation of the law if you're under a no contact order. So. Yes, I would take that appointment, Your Honor. Okay, so Savannah, we might try to remember that between us if it happens, and it may not. I don't know. Okay, so anything else, Mr. Regeer, on this matter, other than for me to highly emphasize that Miss Click, no matter how ridiculous she thinks it is, stay away from her children's father, uh, i.e. the defendant alleged in this case? Your Honor, I believe that adequately addresses the state's concerns at this time in this matter. Okay, and... So, Ms. Click, you're excused at this time, but you don't have any contacts, no texts, no telephone calls, no contact in person, no contact through third parties. Okay, so you may go at this time, Ms. Click, as long as you honor your bond. Thank you, Your Honor. Have a nice day. You Thank too. You, Your Honor. Uh, we are, I think, I believe we have a plea agreement with the state. Uh, but in, it involves a, another case of Ms. Clicks, um, and it would be actually in that case that she would be entering the plea. And I don't believe that's set for 
on this on your honors docket today uh is okay. that um is that something that we would be able to move forward with the plea if you don't have that file or will we need to be setting it over to to make sure you have that file to do the plea yes and and we are also here on 24 cr 149 that is the purpose of the delay so uh mr Regeer, that is your plea agreement is that correct that is the state's understanding of the proposed plea agreement your honor probation for a year for a freaking going and seeing my kids on mother's day like oh my god you guys are so ridiculously looking for something well <sighs> then you don't have to go forward miss click do you want to go to trial or talk to, about this to your attorney some more if that's the way you feel that is definitely the way i feel i i kind of want to go to trial i'm just not because i have parenting rights okay it was on mother's day there was I wouldn't see my kids on Mother's Day and the guy is just looking for something to hurt me with again. Like, it's just an insult and I don't deserve to be punished. All right. Well, I'm, I'm trusting you've shared all of this with your attorney and the two of you came to a conclusion that this plea agreement was in uh, accordance with your will. Well, I mean, I was told that if I take it to trial that I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to win. Well, you know, I, I don't know the facts. Your attorney's had access to all the reports, but I'm sure he's not going to try to force you to do something. He'll give you his, his best legal advice, but he's not going to surely. I mean, this has already been drawn out for a whole year. Well, um, didn't, you, didn't you start with another attorney on this case a year ago? No. All right. Well, first, I've been drawn out for a whole year, and now you want to put me on probation for a year, so I still can't see my kids. Like it's ridiculous. I think the guy's just running out the clock, so he can just up and and take the kids away. Okay, like, well, Miss Click, we started out today with just one case on my dock, twenty three CR two four three, and in that case, you have a long history on it. Going back uh, May 15th to 23, you appeared in front of Judge Hart. There's a lot of notes about that exchange. Mr. Patterson was appointed, but then he had a conflict with the alleged victim. And then uh, at some point, we appointed Mr. Andrews. And yeah, I'm getting pretty tired of dealing with this. Uh, and I think you may have disappeared. We may have had some bond issues in fact there was a motion to we've had some issues on your bond but now the question is um what are we going to do about this criminal trespass that you were told to uh that was in case number 243 i understand that as part of your plea agreement the state's willing to dismiss that whole case and yeah but i mean if win. i see to the other you want me to do more you want me to do like a mental have, health evaluation where with the trespass okay, i wouldn't this whole or miss click i haven't asked you to do anything yet on that regard but in the 24 cr 139 that was asked to be added to this docket and save you a date of coming back for first appearance i will advise you that in that case the state is alleging that on February 13th of 2024 that you did um, violate an order that was issued in case number 23CR243 of Butler County to have no contact with Sean Kerwin Hawker and they're alleging that you did have contact with Sean Hawker on February 13th, 2024, which amounts to violation of a protective order, a class A person misdemeanor punishable up to $2,500 in fines and one year in the county jail. So that's that's your new case. And they're, they're saying that if you plead to that, they will dismiss the other case in its entirety. 
Now, I just need to know if that's what you're going to do or not. Can I talk to my lawyer again? Absolutely. Mr. Andrews, where are we with your people, your clients? Uh, your honor, my understanding is, is that after speaking with Ms. Click, she is uh, prepared to enter into the plea agreement that we've previously discussed. Right. But now I am not seeing her. Oh, there she is. Okay, yes. In and out again. All oh, right. no, she's Go back, Your Honor. We're Go back. We're back on the record in 2023 CR 243, uh, which was scheduled for control today with Attorney Andrews for the defendant. We are also here on uh, what appears to be a requested first appearance in 24 CR 139. I have gone over the uh, charges, as I recall, with Miss Click. And we were going over the plea agreement, and she wasn't totally happy about that. Uh, I will, for the record, clerk appoint Mr. Andrews on the 24 case as well. And now, Ms. Click, picking up where we left off, when you were telling me uh, your feelings about the charges and the plea agreement, after you've had more time to talk to counsel, do you still want to go through with the plea agreement or not? Yeah, I guess that's really my only option. Okay, well, I can't have you doing this this kind of, I, uh, it's my only option thing. You have several options. You know what they are. Is it the one you choose freely and voluntarily? Yes. Is anyone making you enter this plea agreement today? No. All right, you're not being forced or threatened to do it. No. All right. And you've had plenty, have you had enough time to talk to your attorney about it? Yes. All right. And you're pleading is it no contest in the twenty 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 four CR one three nine, Your Honor. That's when she's pleading no contest. Is the newer one the twenty four? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So, so just to remind you, that's the one where the state's alleging that on February 13th, the 2024, you violated a protection order that had been issued in another case that had contact with the person you were ordered not to. Is that what you're pleading no contest to? It's my only option, yes. <laughs> Is there anything more you want to say about that being your only option? Yes. I mean, I was under the impression that my attorney could actually go back to the prosecutor and say, she doesn't want to plead to this. Can we do this? Like a counter offer type of thing. Is that not a thing? Well, they, usually, they usually do that. Um, they can either do it in several discussions or one discussion. All right, I'm, I'm not getting the, the impression, Miss Click, on either of these cases that you feel you are freely and voluntarily accepting the plea agreement where they dismiss the one case in exchange for plea to the other and recommend probation. Am I correct that you don't want to accept that offer? Yes, that's correct. All right, so you, you want to set this for jury trial. You say that's your only option. You have a been an option for a bench trial. You have an option for a jury trial. It may not be what your attorney thinks is best for you, but if you want to do it, I'm sure he won't stand in your way. I would just, I want, I just wanted to make an offer for something less than a year probation, obviously, because I've already spent a year on this and like, it's kept me from seeing my children. I'm actually worried about what this guy's trying to do. Right. So um, I'm going to set this for jury. Do you want bench trial or jury trial? Do you want a jury of, of 12, of six coming in and deciding your fate on these two cases? Or do you want the court to hear the evidence and decide? I'll just take the plea. So do you understand you do have uh, more options than just taking the plea? Yes, ma'am. And that's what you want to do. Is it uh, not because anybody's making you, but because that's what you want to do? 
Yes. All right. So the violation protection order in 24 CR 139, you're pleading no contest, is that correct? Yes. You're not admitting the charge, but you're not denying it either. You just are going to stand mute knowing you'll be found guilty. Is that all correct? Yes. All right. And you understand that if I finish this plea agreement with you, there will be no trial in either case. One will be dismissed and will proceed to sentencing in the other. Yes. And do you understand that as a judge, I am not a party to your plea agreement and I am not held responsible for following it. Although I often do, I don't have to. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. I just realized who she reminds me of. I accept the plea. If you want to plead guilty, you need to say guilty. Do you want me to say guilty? Okay, fine. If you want to plead guilty to this offense, then you need to say that you plead guilty. So for a factual basis to support this no contest plea, Mr. Regeer? Your Honor, pursuant to the affidavit in the 2024 case, um, that paragraph four would appear to refer to an address um, in El Dorado, Butler County, Kansas. Paragraph five goes on to a series of text messages, which pursuant to paragraph four appear to have been provided by law enforcement, by the victim to law enforcement. Um, and those text messages would appear to have been um, sent by the defendant to the victim. And um, pursuant to the um, paragraph nine of the affidavit in the 2024 case, it would appear to refer um, to um, the other case currently before the court, 23 CR 243, as part of a uh, bond release condition. Well, and I, I understood the defendant tell me earlier in these proceedings today that she went, made arrangements to see her children for Mother's Day, but this allegedly happened February 13th of 24, Mr. Regeer, which isn't close to Mother's Day. Your Honor, the, the criminal trespass was the Mother's Day incident. Okay, very well. All right. I accept the no contest plea and find this factual basis exists. I find the defendant guilty a violation of a protection order in 2024 CR 139 and I dismiss with prejudice for plea agreement the case in its entirety 23 CR 243. So Miss Click you're not even being a uh, convicted or sentenced on that case that you thought was ridiculous so your your attorney helped you get that dismissed but we do have to proceed to sentencing for violating a protection order in february of this year 2024 so recommendations mr regeer your honor the state's understanding of the of the plea offer as previously reiterated by counsel andrews is a 12-month underlying sentence with 12 months of reporting probation with court services, no contact with the victim, costs and fees with all standard probation conditions, mental health evaluation following the um, recommendations. Um, the state does not, the state is still of the opinion um, that those are appropriate in this matter. All right. Mr. Andrews, anything further before sentencing is pronounced? Your Honor, I would join in the recommendations of the state uh, pursuant to that plea agreement, a 12-month controlling jail sentence, but with 12 months of uh, probation with court services, um, costs and fees, uh, standard conditions of probation, including no contact uh, uh, with the victim, uh, Sean Hawker, um, and uh, mental health evaluation to follow any recommendations. All right, Ms. Click, tell me, you, you're a mother of how many children? Two. Two boys. Two boys, and they live with you or with Mr. Hawker? Or? They live with Mr. Hawker. Um, okay. And do you work? Do you have a job? 
Yes, ma'am. No, um, I'm sorry. I I was just going to CDL classes. Um, it's a month long, ten hour a day thing, and I I haven't found a job yet. No. All right. So you're looking at over the road trucking or some kind of commercial driver's um, license? I'm not. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure where I am with that. But you're not employed. How long have you been unemployed? Um, a couple of months. What kind of work did you do before? Um, I was driving. I was driving a cab. Okay. Well, at this time, I'm not going to assess a fine, but you will have $158 in court costs, $60 supervision fee. I will waive the attorney fees at this point. Your controlling sentence will be for 12 months, but I will follow the plea agreement and order that you be given 12 months of supervised probation to be supervised by the court service office. You will need to call them immediately after this hearing. Do you have your pen or pencil ready? Yes, ma'am. Uh, no one should ever come to court without <coughs> All right, Ms. Click, as soon as this hearing is over, report to probation by telephone at 316-322. 4153. All right, did you get that? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All standard conditions of probation will apply, plus special conditions that you set up a mental health evaluation. I want you to call and get an appointment for that. That call needs to be made within uh, 14 days of today or as soon as they can get you in for the evaluation. You are ordered to comply with all recommendations in that evaluation, which means if they don't think you need any treatment, you don't have to get it. But if they want to see you every day, they can see you every day, whatever you need to do. And then uh, there's a special condition that you have no contact with Sean Hawker. What we'll about him, his place of business, his residence? I don't do those things. He's a piece. Okay. Excuse me? I'm so sorry. I said I'm not going to do those things. Uh, let me put myself on mute. I apologize. No, unmute. You're in an open court and I want to talk to you. Now, if you're not going to do those things, I'm not going to follow the plea agreement and grant you probation. No, I'm saying I'm not going to go and see him. I am oh. going to follow that. I'm All so right. sorry. You <laughs> had me worried that I was going to have to make you go down and start serving a 12-month sentence. Because probation is a privilege that we want you to be successful with. Uh, fines and costs, you're going to have to pay a total of, it looks like, about 218 I'm thinking, give you, Can you get those paid in 60 days? Or do you need a little more time? I need way more time. How much more time? Oh, gosh, I don't even know. How much per month can you pay, do you think? God, like $30? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll start you out at $30 a month. But as soon as you get your job, you need to let court services know and we need to increase that. Otherwise, you may be on probation for a long, long time. So your first payment of $30 will be due May 22nd, 2024. And, and then you'll have a $30 payment every month thereafter. Now, if probation decides you want, they want to increase that, they can either work that out with you and and take care of it that way or we can come back to court if we need to but i'm going to start you out at 30 dollars a month don't miss a single payment because if you violate your probation you can end up serving that 12 months in jail anything else mr regeer that we need to address your honor in for purposes of preparing the journal entry do i have leave if it is the order of the court do i have leave of the court to journalize that the mental health evaluation shall be scheduled within 14 days of today's date. I would ask that you please do that, put that in the journal entry. Nothing further from the state, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Andrews, anything further from the defense? You're muted, Mr. Andrews. Was that a nothing further? I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, nothing further, Your Honor. 
All right, Ms. Click, anything further before I let you go to call your probation? No. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. Now be successful and you won't have to come back to court again, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, Chief. Savannah, was there anything else? Um, just the warrant on 2024 CR 139. Did you want that withdrawn? Yes, if we have an active warrant, there you go. You just got a warrant lifted on that too. And forgive and forgive me, Your Honor. Um, if the my understanding is that this is the first um, time the 24 CR case has come before the court. Um, I'm not sure if the court is going to make any orders concerning booking at this time. Uh, you do need, since you weren't picked up on that warrant, you do need to go out to the county jail and get your picture and prints taken. Deputy, do you have any advice on that? What was the charge on that 24? I'm so sorry. I cannot make it to Butler County Jail. I, I can't make it to Butler County. I just don't, I don't have it. Just, I can't. Just click. You're kind of starting to try my patience by telling me what you can't do and won't do. I just don't have the transportation. I don't right, have the money. Hold on a minute. Just hold on a minute. All right. The charge deputy is violation of a protection order. It occurred. It occurred February 13th of 2024. Okay, that's all we need. We can put her in a breakout room and we'll schedule her a time. All right. You're good. Miss Click, you're really making it a lot easier. You've got so many problems with probation. It'd be a lot easier just to put you in jail for 12 months. Please, if you don't want to do that, work with us or you're going to be right back in here and you're going to end up serving the 12 months because you're not doing what you're told. So you're going to go into a breakout room with this court security and they're going to figure out when you're going to get over there and get that done. But that's an order of your probation that you get that done. Can't get it done. I can't. I don't have the fucking transportation, dude. All right. We don't use that language in court. That's contemptuous behavior. Well, where are you right now, Miss Click? I'm at home. I don't have a car. Mm -hmm. I don't have uh, I don't have 80. Actually, it's more than $80 to get there by Uber. I had to do it before because of this person. Like, I, I just okay. can't Let's get stop, please. Where, what town do you live in? I live in Wichita. Who transports you around town? I take the public trans, uh, the bus. I, I take the bus. Well, you're really making me think that probation is not workable. Maybe I just need to send an officer over to get you and bring you to jail and have you start your 12 months. That I, I know, my that I know I can make you do. That I know I can make you do. So if I don't do that right now, can you maybe talk to the officer in the breakout room and figure out when you can get over here? I just can't do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. Your Honor, it, it, would it be possible for me to have a breakout room with Ms. Click to talk to her about what her options are? Well, her options are pretty simple. You do it, or you're in violation of probation, and we do a warrant again. Yeah, you can have a breakout room with her, Mr. Andrews, but Ms. Click, we need to get this moving. Thank you, Your Honor. Click again is ready to have a breakout room with the uh, court security to arrange for how she can get over and get uh, booked and processed as the court had ordered. All right. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Uh, Savannah, if you could please put Miss Click and court security in a breakout room. Mrs. Click, Crystal Click. When she went into the breakout room, she refused to set up a date and time for fingerprints. Basically, after arguing and screaming and then she basically told the officer to f off well it sounds like she's already violated her probation yep. mr patters who's, who's she was yours mr andrews yes she was your honor apparently your call didn't uh, work out as well as you hoped it did yes not so I think the state on its mo own motion, I'm going to order this for resentencing.
The defendant will need to appear in person. Mr. Andrews, do you think you can get her back on here with us this morning? Um, I don't know, Your Honor. Um, I, I would have to go to my office to try to call her okay. and see if All she right. would answer. Uh, but on the record, before we do adjourn again, Back on the record in 2023, CR 243, State of Kansas versus Crystal Dawn Click. Council appearing as before, Miss Click not appearing. Uh, Deputy Alton Caulfield, Court Security One, you had some information following my order as a condition of probation that Miss Click go into a breakout room and set up a time for picture and prints. Your update? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> If you could restate for the record what you told me before we went back on. Well, actually, it was my other officer in two that uh, visited with her. But she told him she refused to give fingerprints, said she had no way over, continued to argue. And I think he advised her that if she didn't do it, that a warrant would probably be issued for her arrest. She basically told him to F off. Okay. And that's your deputy sitting next to you there? Yep, and that's him right there. All right, yep. thank you, sir. And that's, you confirm that is what happened? Yes. Gentlemen, thank you. We'll be in recess, and I will take appropriate action on that following this docket. She's going to get herself a free ride and free lodging. Wow. Hey y'all. So everyone's got a story. Some of them are funny. Some of them are sad. Some of them are uplifting. But they're all different. So I got some stories for you today. You ready? Let me tell you this first one. You see, what had happened was he almost died. And then he saw the light. And now he's changing his life for the better. All right. And this is who? Henry? Mr. Henry, yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, we are on the record in State of Kansas versus Andrew Martin Henry. It is 23TR3060. The state appears by and through Mr. Canfield. Mr. Henry is in custody. He has been arrested on a probation violation warrant um, that was signed by Judge Ricky back in December of 23, December 22nd. And uh, the request for probation office involves the case not being paid off and not reporting as directed. Your Honor? Yes. May I read you a letter, please? Ms. Satterfield? Uh, yeah, this is post-conviction, so you're probably fine. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, dear Ms. Satterfield, I wanted to write to you today to explain that my charges are serious by the court. However, that is nothing that I would run from. I did miss my probation violation in my hearing on my other case as I was in the hospital. I had low white blood cell meningitis. Um, I was in there for almost three months. Did you know that meningitis is just the infection and inflammation of the fluids and membranes surrounding the brain and spinal cord? I mean, I thought it was a lot more complex than that. It's still really bad, but it's, you know, not as bad as I always thought it was growing up. It usually results in headache, fever, and stiff neck. Stiff neck's the big one everybody knows about. The severity varies, like, from one end of the spectrum to the other. Some people, it can resolve without any treatment at all, and other people die. 
there's two causes. Um, like most illnesses, viral and bacterial. Viral meningitis is caused by many of the common viruses we're familiar with, influenza, measles, mumps, varicella, zost the chickenpox, shingles virus, herpes simplex, and Epstein-Barr virus. Fun fact, everyone with MS has Epstein-Barr virus antibodies. There was a Harvard study. They haven't linked it yet. Bacterial meningitis, though, tends to spread easily in group settings like college dorms or, say, like prisons. However, both normal forms of meningitis usually result in elevated white blood cell count because your body's trying to fight off the infection. I couldn't find a disease anywhere that was called like low white blood cell count meningitis. However, there's a couple diseases like Lyme meningitis that result in low white blood cell count. And that's just a rare complication of Lyme disease. You know, when you get a tick bite and then apparently Lyme disease is horrid. And in addition to the normal meningitis symptoms, you also suffer numbness, pain, weakness, facial palsy, and visual disturbances. Sounds wonderful. I'm glad he healed and is better. And I did report this to my attorney, Joseph Fabre, as well as Joanne, the clerk of the court, was made aware of my situation. As soon as I was out of the hospital, I surrendered myself. I have no new charges. Um, um, uh, during the three months that I was in the hospital, it was really hard because I had to pray to God to keep me alive. And no one wants to die, obviously, but when you're faced with that kind of a situation and you feel like you had to fight like hell, no legal matter seems more important. I was given a 25% chance of recovery, but made 100% recovery. And that was through the salvation of God. I'm asking that this court please OR me. I don't have any money right now. And I do have gainful employment. My job is willing to take me back. I have a house now. Everything has gotten better from the last time in my situation. Um, I wanted to let you know that uh, if I was given a second chance, Your Honor, and I was allowed to OR today, that I can guarantee you 100% that I will be at court as I am feeling great now. Okay. Well, do you know who uh, Anthony Bauer is? Uh, that is the uh, uh, probation officer, right? Yes. Yeah. And see, I didn't even make one contact because I was in the hospital. They put me on probation and I couldn't even make a contact. I called the court. I talked to Joanne. And I also talked to um, Joseph Fabre, which is my attorney. As soon as I got out, I turned myself in. I surrendered knowing that I was going to be in this position. I have zero new charges. That's why. Okay. Well, I'll give you a 5,000 OR bond unless the prosecution has some uh, evidence to show that you've I still made have all hospital this. marks. So I'll give you an opportunity to reappear Thank on these misdemeanors in front of Thank Judge Ricky. I'll give you a 5,000 OR bond. That means you. that you're signing an order saying the state's going to take judgment against you yes. and be able to collect against you $5,000 if you yes. fail to appear. Yes. Plus, be there'll be a bond forfeiture bench warrant. Yes. And then Judge Ricky will issue a no bond hold. Yes. So when you get picked up or you turn yourself in, whatever you do, you're going to be held for several months until yes. he gets scheduled for a hearing. I know. So when you get released today, I want you to call, go see, make sure you make some kind of contact with Mr. Bauer today. I will. And stay in contact with him. I will. Your revocation hearing is scheduled, and I would suggest you do try to get to work and start paying on your case. Yes, yes. It's only $600. I'll pay it right off. Okay. So your next hearing then will be a warrant show cause hearing in front of Judge Ricky on May 10th, May 10th. at 2.30. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Satterfield. Should be a Friday. Okay. Yeah. At 2.30. Those Friday, are you, May 10th at 2.30. Yeah. Yeah, and he requires on revocation hearings for you to show up here at the courthouse. Okay, so no Zoom, just at the courthouse. Yes. Okay. Yes. He Thank may you. Zoom the hearing. He may be remote, but he wants you here. Oh, he wants me there. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't know. I'm... Were you saying that you just... 
couldn't stay in touch very well with Mr. Favre. I did stay in touch with Favre. Favre except I, the thing is, when I got put in the hospital was the day after my actual court date. And I called him and told him and the warrant was already issued. I talked to Joanne oh. and she said that there was nothing she could do about it. Okay. Once the judge issues well, the warrant. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, reappoint Mr. Favre for you then. Thank you. Unless you just want to go ahead and represent yourself. No, because Fabry has all my documentation. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. And Your Honor, I'm showing two cases for the... Uh, oh, shoot. Mr. Henry, now I'm really going to be fouled up. No. They were, there was two cases. I had a hearing on one. But I will appear on both of them. I swear to God, Ms. Satterfield. And they're very low-level stuff, and I... Please, I have no but money. This is front in front of Judge Hart. I just have to be careful what I do with other judges. Please. I understand. I will not let you down. I promise. So I haven't seen my family since I got out of the hospital. Have you been on uh, narcotics in the hospital? Uh, I have been on um, some narcotics, yes. Because... This is a, was originally a fentanyl case, and I don't want you going back. No, to no. It was, it was hydrocodone, which is a way less narcotic. Well, it says fentanyl here, but... No, okay. fentanyl was my charge, but hydrocodone is what the hospital gave me. Right. What I'm right. saying is that it's, it would be easy for you to I will not. back to street drugs. I literally was just, my life was just on the line. I had a 25% chance to live. That's a life-changing moment for anybody. It should be. It was. All right. Well, I'll give you a 5,000 OR on that one too, I guess. Thank you you'll so either, much. You'll either make these judges proud of you I'm gonna make them proud of cool make either proud one so all right so <laughs> 5000 or on this you've got it this is um you haven't even had a prelim on this that's what i'm saying no i, I literally went to the hospital and haven't been able to finish any of this uh, my last case was put on probation though um and then i'm i'm closer i had my first appearance and then um, I was going to my second appearance, and then they asked for a continuance. And then my my third appearance is when I was in the hospital. All right. So your court date with Judge Hart is June twenty fourth at two thirty. That will be by Zoom. Okay. Was Mr. Favre your attorney on this too? I'll yes. point Mr. Favre on it too. Yes. Yes, Miss Satterfield. Uh, do you want me to note this, Mr. Canfield, over your objection? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right. We'll see what happens with you, sir. Thank you so much, Ms. Satterfield. All right. We are adjourned. Now, story number one may have seen the light, but story number two is kind of confused. You see... What had happened was he had a court date and he showed up for court. No one was there. Why was no one at court? Are you Antonio Xavier Jones? Yes, I am. You got picked up on a bond forfeiture bench warrant as well. Yeah. Because you failed to appear on January 10th. Yeah. 24 on a traffic case 22 TR 1207 looks like you only have one case a traffic case and judge Webster issued a no bond hold for you but let me look here yeah and I went to the um, I went to my court date at 5 30 p.m. And I called my bondsman because I was keeping update with him ever since I got pulled over because I just obtained my license. And I think last October and I got pulled over in Great Bend and they told me that I had a warrant out for you guys. And I didn't understand it because I was going to court trying to fix everything. 
And that's when they told me um, I had something for you guys. It's, and I was keeping update with my bondsman every Monday. He'll check in. And a week before my court date, he had, he had asked me, um, don't forget. Well, he told me, don't forget about your court. And I texted him back. Yeah, it's at 530 next week. I'm still going and everything. He said, okay. I went to my court day at 530. But you you never in your life that I know of will ever be given a 530 p.m. court date unless you're somewhere that has night court. And I don't know of anywhere well, except maybe municipalities that might have night court. It would never be at 530. We don't. Everybody leaves at five. Place shuts down. Okay. Security goes home. So I don't. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I got, when I told him, um, when I called them that day when I went there, they was closed, and he told me that I had the time mixed up. And it was supposed to be that morning. I think he said it was like nine that morning or so. Why, why are you going to trial on a driving while suspended anyway? Either on April 22nd of 2022, your license was suspended or it wasn't. No, if no. You're driving and your license is suspended and they can prove they sent you a notice of suspension. It doesn't matter whether you got it. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. whether you knew it was suspended or not. If it's suspended for whatever reason and the state sends you a notice in the mail, all they have to do is send it to the place that you last listed on your driver's license as your address. And if they do that, it's a pres there's a presumption that you received it. Yeah. And it's a strict liability crime. Either you were driving on a suspended license or you weren't. Yeah. So why are you messing around with a bunch of court date court dates with this case unless your license actually was not suspended on April the 22nd of 2022? They okay, this is what happened. I remember I, was, I used to work out here. I was delivering and I got pulled over and he told me I got pulled over by a sheriff and he told me, um, he said, you know, your license is suspended. This is your second time. And I was like, no, this is my first time um, getting notified. And I gave him my license. He said, I got to take your license um, because they suspended. And I gave it to him and I came, came back up here, had the court date. And then a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff personal happened to me. I lost two, I lost two family members, lost my house and everything. So that was my, that was my fault that I forgot about that. And then I went to go, I was working on my license last year in the summer and I was going to court in Andover and they had afternoon court. They had afternoon court. It wasn't in the morning. And I was going there. I was going there and I got my license obtained. I paid my tickets off on the Butler Associates and um, I guess something in a system was messed up because she couldn't see that I paid it. But when I went to my court and I told her I paid it, she unsuspended everything and just told me to pay my court fees. And then like a month later, I got pulled over in Great Bend and they told me that I had a warrant out um, for my arrest due to here. And I, I was confused because I was I was going to Andover court to get everything taken care of when I was able to. So I don't know. That's when they told me that I had a warrant for you guys. And I went to jail, got my bondsman and everything. They had my court. Um, it was January something, January for this year. It was January. And then that's when I, I was keeping an update with him every Monday, letting him know that I was going to go. And then when I went to there, I went at the wrong time. Then I called, I called the next morning. I called the um, clerk next morning. And she told me I had to wait on my letter to get sent out. So that's what I, that's why. I, I was doing just waiting. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like you've ever had an attorney. So here's the deal. Yeah. You can set this for trial again. And you'll go back in front of Judge Webster and you can ask for a court appointed attorney. And I'll probably give you a court appointed attorney that you may have to repay if you get convicted. Mm -hmm. Or you can waive your right to an attorney and plead guilty to this driving while suspended charge and we'll proceed to sentencing today and you won't have to go back in front of judge webster okay. so what would you like to do um, can you repeat it one more time so i can actually get a good detail again okay. sorry i can schedule this case back in front of judge webster 
which will be on July the 1st, you can represent yourself or I can give you court-appointed counsel if you qualify for okay. that hearing. Or you can waive your right to an attorney, enter a plea today, I will sentence you today, and you will not have to go back in front of Judge Webster on July 1st. Okay, I, I think I want, want to do that, want to see her again. All right. So are you currently working? Yeah. Where are you working at? Um, Buddha's Couriers. B B A O B A O U D O Buddha. It's like it's African. Okay. So is it kind of like uh, UPS or yeah, what? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How old are you? I'm 25. Where do you live? It took me a while to sort out what was going on with this guy. So, I did it for you. He has three different charges. The first is from September of 23. It was driving with license suspended, as well as fleeing and attempting to elude. On the next month, 10-23, there was an identity theft, forgery, interference with law enforcement by false reporting, driving with a suspended license, no insurance, expired tag, failure to check for safe passage before passing from a single lane. That's a good one. Um, he took a plea with six months deferred with a year probation, um, which was revoked in January and a warrant was issued in April, which is what he's talking about here. After that happened, he got another charge in November of last year for possession of fentanyl, of MJ, and some paraphernalia. And how long have you lived in Wichita? Uh, my whole life. Okay. All right, so you're, how much do you make an hour? i say about 20 an hour. Do you have any children? Dependent? No. Okay. No, I don't think you're going to qualify for court appointed counsel. So you're either yeah. going to have to represent yourself or you're going to have to hire an attorney to help you out. Okay. Your court date will be July the 1st at 9 a.m. in front of Judge Webster. And now I need to set a bond. I don't know that I'm going to keep him on a no bond hold for a first offense, driving while suspended, even though I see that there have been two different issues with him appearing. He was on a $1,000 quarter court cash or surety bond. I might. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that. In, I think I've seen that in my mail, the $1,000 surety. I might uh, set his bond at 2,500 cash or surety or something of that nature, but what's your recommendation, your Mr. Honor, Camp? The state does not object to any cash surety bond. 2,500 cash surety sounds good. To me. Okay, so 2,500 cash or surety, get your own attorney. Your court date's July 1 at 9 a.m. in front of Judge Webster. July 1st, 9 a.m. Okay. All right, thank you, sir. All right, thank you. I love how matter of fact she is. Why are you wasting our time with that? We go home at five o'clock. I don't know why you were here. She's great. Her next story, a little disturbing. See, what happened was he got kidnapped at a toll booth. Sir, what's your name? Kingsley Uwadia. And where do you live? Wichita, Kansas. How old are you? 41. What were you doing in Butler County when you were arrested? It's driving to Wichita. Hey, he actually brought me back from Wichita to here. I was in Wichita. And he brought me back. Oh, was there some kind of uh, domestic-related incident that was reported? 
she I got pulled over driving and uh, the trooper gave me a ticket. And we're leaving. So she, she gets upset at me and is on the phone while talking to me. I'm not knowing what's going on. She said, drop her off. I'm like, OK, well, where do you want to meet him at? This and that. I'm asking her questions. She just said, drop me off, drop me off. So get to the first exit. I dropped her off. I said, you want me to wait for you? Do you want me to um, uh, take anyone away for you? She says, no, I'm good. I leave, get to Wichita. I get off on the exit. The little gate goes up when I paid. And then I'm trying to drive through. It goes back down, hits the car. And then I back up, hits the car, hit the button. Hey, the gate came down on me and I paid. Two police uh, came around, said, hey. Then they talk and they open the gate back up, pull over there, pull it up. They said, um, get out the car, put me handcuffs. I said, do you know Gail? I said, yeah. I said, she basically, I was keeping the car. I, said, I dropped her off. I mean, which dog? Well, come back over here with us to Butler. We're going to talk to the officer. And if it makes sense to you, we're going to let you go. So, my vehicle is still in Wichita. They drive me all the way back to El Dorado. And he asked me what happened. I said, she, I don't know what's going on. After you pulled me over and gave me a ticket, I'm driving. She's upset. She's on the phone. She's telling me, drop her off. I'm like, where? This and that. So I meet you. She says, drop her off. So I get off on the exit. I did drop her off. And I leave. Okay. So I don't understand. Right. I don't okay. understand. Well, for whatever reason, they didn't file any charges today on you. Right. Because so, I dropped okay. them off. You're, you're going to be released. Hopefully, you've got somebody you can call that can give you a ride back to Wichita. Thank you. Because, I, like I said, I don't understand. Because I, like, I dropped her off. And yeah, I might, I might stay away from whoever this lady you, is. You think I was going to talk to her again after this? I've been here since Monday. Okay. Right. Right. All right. All right. Thank you're you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. You see, what had happened was he ain't got no friends. He ain't got no car. He ain't got no money for no bus fare. And he broke his ankle so he can't even walk. Mm hmm That's what it was. Sorry. Can't walk on a broken ankle. No, bones broke. Can't walk on them when they're broken. They're not together. Can't walk. Sorry. Are you Robert Andrew Cooey? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and 23TR1167, you have a bond forfeiture bench warrant out of Judge Webster's traffic docket for failing to appear when you were on a $2,000 bond with second chance. On October, no, I'm sorry. I guess it was just April 1 that you failed to appear. Does that sound right? Yes, ma'am. She put you on a no bond hold. What, what happened on April 1st? Um, well, about a month ago, I broke my ankle, fractured it, had surgery. Um, my doctor did not want me on my ankle. Um, I did call to try and see what I could do about court because I don't have any close family that lives here in town. I don't have a lot of friends either. And if I did, they were all at work at the time. So I was, I did call the courthouse and try and figure out uh, what time my court was, um, when I needed to be there so I could then forward call and get a ride ahead of time. Uh, I called and they told me that uh, I needed to uh, call my attorney and ask him about when my court is and all that. And I tried to call my attorney. I haven't been able to get through to my attorney since uh, I actually, since back when I was locked up last time, uh, my last court date. Um, so it's it's just been hectic. Like uh, It's not that I didn't want to come to court. It's just circumstances and um, Who is your I, attorney? Who uh, is I, your I cannot remember his name to save my life. Like I said, I've I've haven't even got to talk to him. Uh, I left him my phone, my name and phone number. Um, I've called his office multiple times. I know a lot of people get the same guy. He's just a, a 
public attorney. I just, I cannot remember his name to save my life. Did you get your license reinstated? I didn't. Were, are you living here on car in El Dorado? No, I'm actually on fourth now. You couldn't figure out a way to get to the courthouse in town when you live in town? No, like I said, all my friends and family were at work at the time. I did call around and ask for rides. And I, I mean, I, I see a lot of people walking and riding bikes and riding Well, scooters. that was the thing. I was on uh, heavy restrictions for my doctor for my ankle. I could not. Who's your, who's your doctor? Dr. Sayed. Who? Dr. Sayed at uh, the hospital here in town, Susan B. Allen. Do you have any records of that? Um, all my records are going to be at home or they're going to be uh, at my job where I had to take them. Where's your job? Uh, it's here in town, Curbs Plus. How'd you get picked up on this warrant? How? Um, I was just at home and they came and got me. Okay. All right, I'll reappoint Mr. Patterson. Your court date's going to be July 1st at 8 o'clock. So you got plenty of time to get your ankle rehabbed and walk your way to court. Okay. You better be here at the courthouse. July 1st. Yes, ma'am. Three days before July 4th. That's Should actually my birthday, here. so... Should be a Monday. Yep, Monday. Eight o'clock in the morning, bright and early. When the better wake up with the roosters and get to get to walking and get to court. Thanks, ma'am. Okay. Fourth Street isn't very far from Main and Central, which is we're not too far off there of course at 201 west pine so i'm pretty sure she's pretty serious about a no bond hold and i'm pretty confident that the next time you get picked up you won't get out of jail so that would mean you would basically go from today to july 1st without being able to make a bond or get out of jail at all on this traffic case speeding and driving while suspended first offense Sound that to me that sounds pretty silly to not just show up for court, Mr. Canfield. What is your recommendation on bond? Your Honor, the state would ask for a cash surety bond in the amount of five thousand dollars. Additionally, I will note that those misdemeanor dockets are on Zoom, so the defendant would not necessarily need to appear in person. Yeah, but when they fail to appear, I want them to come here because I know that if they can't make a good connection or can't get on or their Internet's not working or their phone's not working, then they get another, then they get a bond forfeiture bench warrant. So. I pretty well, if I'm going to give them a bond on a case where they failed to appear, I'm generally going to require that they show up at the courthouse so that we know that they have equipment, security's there to vouch for them, that they're, you know, available for court and all that kind of thing. Um, well, I'm going to say, I'm going to double your bond, which is what we generally do when you fail to appear. And it's certainly better than a no bond hold that you're currently on. So 4,000 cash or surety, July 1, 8 a.m. Mr. Patterson, your attorney. They should give you uh, information on Darren Patterson. He's right here in town. His number is 322-7700. Make sure that you appear at the courthouse for your hearing, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. How about a random bonus update? Cold pee, girl. She is still in the Butler County Jail. She was supposed to be transported. 
to state. You know, that's supposed to happen pretty quick. You know, sometimes it takes a week or two because paperwork. This was months ago. I'll link to the original streams in the description in case you needed to know um, what had happened with some cold pee. It's very, very informative. You'll learn a lot of lot. fake pee. Enjoy. Okay. Uh, this is State of Kansas versus Janie Lee Fry, 2023 TR414. State appears by and through Mr. Canfield. Um, it looks like. You were placed on an expedited docket to appear on January 19th, 24, in front of Judge Lee, and you failed to appear. Uh, Miss Satterfield, I showed up. I was just late. Hang on. Hang on. I'm still trying to read through here. Then the warrant was withdrawn. You later appeared. You waived your right to a probation violation hearing. You stipulated to use of drugs. The stipulation was um, accepted. You were ordered to serve a 45 day sanction and then your probation was reinstated. Jail sanctioned to run concurrent to your felony case. And then they filed a probation revocation. I'm going to assume that you didn't show up or didn't do your 45 days. I don't know. Mr. Canfield. Um, I was arrested on the 19th and I did my 45 days and I haven't left since. I've been here since January 19th. Okay, so why is she here? Your Honor, I believe it is because of the OJA's new rule. I do not have the new warrant to show cause, and I don't believe I can access it at this time. Well, what's the jail show? Why they're holding her? KDOC. I was revocated on my correction, so I'm going to KDOC, waiting on my journal entry. Oh. And they combined my corrections and probation to my corrections officer, and she revocated me, so I don't know what that means on my probation. Orange show cause file 2-8. Okay, so what they're saying in this case is that you're unavailable to report because of your DOC commitment. And I guess that's why they did this. And frankly, I think this got ran concurrent maybe to your felony. Oh, the jail sanction ran con uh, concurrent to your felony. I don't know. Let me see what your journal entry said, whether this was concurrent or consecutive to your felony. I would say if you want to waive your right to a hearing on this, we'll just revoke you on this and have it run concurrent to your DOC time. And um, they'll turn your costs and fees over to collections if you don't that's you know, fine i don't have any choice really i gotta go do 18 months so okay uh, i think you only got six months on this and 
I've been here almost four months in Butler County Jail. Okay. So this doesn't say it's consecutive to anything. And if it's silent, that means it's concurrent. I don't know what the felony journal entry looks like, but if you want to just sign a waiver of counsel on this, admit that you're not going to be available to report and I'm going to order that you get credit um, for your time in DOC on the, on this sentence and that you've served your sentence and refer your costs and fees to collections if you haven't been able to pay those off in six months. Yes, ma'am. I agree. I will um, waive my right. Okay. All right. All right. They'll give you a form. Let's just do that and have you be done with this case. And then Amy, would you notify Ms. Ashton? Felter what I did on this misdemeanor case and um, I guess if there's a problem somebody can let me know but I it's only a six month sentence so I'm pretty sure that she will have flattened her sentence which means there's not much else we're going to do but make sure that we collect the court costs there is, uh, Mr. Canfield, I was trying to find it yesterday. I've got to go look for that more recent case I saw. I hadn't really had a case come up before yesterday. I think you were, were you on that case where we were talking about the, the uh, well, it would have been Friday. I'm sorry, because that was my revocation docket. That um, you can't just revoke on a probation because they've been remanded to the Department of Corrections on another one uh, on a case as your basis, your only basis to revoke. Um, no, and I need to that, but this is a misdemeanor, so I don't think it would apply anyway. I believe Ms. Norris was on that hearing. I was not. Uh, okay. I'm familiar with You're that. Right. You are, what, are you familiar with that case? No, Your Honor. Okay, all right. I'll find it, but I don't think it applies to this anyway because it's a misdemeanor. Um, and I and I think they were talking about sending, adding someone consecutively to the Department of Corrections on something that um, they were on probation for simply because they're going to be unable to report because they've been entered into the Department of Corrections system, but I'll find it. But I think it's fine to do it this way, and then you, this case should be closed, Ms. Fry, okay? Yes, thank you, Ms. Satterfield. Thank right, you. Thank you. Take care. I will. Thank you. The 86th Patrol, 117th That's all I have here, Your Honors. Thank you. Thank you. This is a relatively short but interesting divorce hearing. There's quite a battle over child support and insurance. Mom's providing insurance for the kids, but it's not great insurance and it costs a lot of money. Dad doesn't have the option of providing insurance, but dad's girlfriend, wife, stepmom, whatever she is, does very cheap and it's a good policy. Can the court obligate the stepmom to provide insurance through dad? Interesting question. We are going to go on the record in Sarah Hoffman versus Christopher Casilla. It is 2018 DM 127. The plaintiff appears in her attorney's office and with counsel, Mr. Thompson. Um, 
Mr. Von Aiken, is your client with you? He's seated directly to my right. Okay. And then who is Leah Kernett? Your Honor, my name is Leah Soretti. I'm a DCF contract attorney. Okay. I haven't met you before. Hello. Hello, Your Honor. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for doing the good work. Mr. Von Aiken did this kind of work for years, didn't you, Mr. Von Aiken? I did. It's how I got my start, Your Honor. Yes. All right. Speaking of which, um, first, um, tongue in cheek, though, I'm going to say that if you two were my children, I would say somebody's lying. But I won't say that. And we'll just move on to the motion to settle and the response. And I am uh, ready and able, I think, to rule without argument unless you request argument. Okay. So, first of all, the court is going to adopt, of course, the recommendations of Jeannie Erickson and those matters that have been agreed to through case management and uh, allow her or order her withdraw. I think under the new Supreme Court rules, three years is the limit. I don't know that it's been three years, but frankly, Ms. Erickson is trying to reduce her workload, um, not even related to this case. Uh, sometime back, she sent a letter saying she didn't, she didn't uh, want any more highly contested um, appointments uh, or high conflict cases. And so um, I'm going to allow her to withdraw as case manager, which means we won't have a case manager. We'll be back to, you know, where we were. Um, and figuring it out as we go along. And your honor, I, I anticipate filing a motion to appoint a case manager if the court's not so inclined to do that today. I think we're going to go back to um, either mediation or um, LPC, not LPC, but um, conciliation, domestic conciliation. I, I'm not going to just I think I'm supposed to be limited in terms of case management. I don't think that means you just switch case managers. I, if I, you could look at that and tell me if you have a little different interpretation, but I, they should have the skills to be able to do much of it. We've got to have somebody new and I don't think I'm going to make the statutory findings right now. Um, that triggers the case management provisions, but if you want to file something for reconsideration or file a brief or do something, um, you're free to do so. I am obviously going to let her withdraw. And my thoughts were, were we'll see if they can mediate. If they just absolutely cannot mediate, then we need to find someone um, that we can assign to do conciliation. So, all right. With regard to settling child support, the court is going to order $339 a month in child support from June 1 of 23 to October 31 of 23. And I believe, I'm not aware, looks, it looks like it's 335 from November 1. Your Honor, the issue, well, the issue what? with that, the issue with that is there is a credit that Mr. Um, Casita is providing for health insurance for the minor child. And it yeah, looks like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that. I'm going to get okay. to that. That's where right. I think the 335 comes in. Oh, so it should be 339. Correct. 
Okay. Uh, so I'm ordering the three uh, Your Honor, that, that that would not be correct. The 339, both parties submitted worksheets. The 339 for both parties oh. goes through October 31st. The difference is in the is in uh, oh, the uh, time period from, from I, November 1 to now, whether yeah. there's um and I and your honor, I'll, I'll, I misspoke. The three, Mr. Von Option, I misspoke. I thought you were referring to Mr. Von Option's number, which is 319. The 335 is accurate, your number. My apologies. Okay. Okay. Now, obviously, this is a hot topic, so I guess I'll just go there. I am not going to give Mr. Von Aken, your client, any credit for insurance through his wife. This is why. First of all, a step parent has no duty, legally or otherwise, to support a child. Secondly, I have no jurisdiction over her in the event that she should fail to keep up with the insurance or she should terminate the insurance. I only have jurisdiction over the parties, and they're the ones with the duty to support and provide insurance. If your client wants an additional layer of coverage, and has secondary insurance to reduce any out of pocket that he might pay, he's free to get it, but he's not going to get credit for it. So that's Your where Honor, that's. Okay, I understand that. Have you reviewed the child support guidelines? Because I don't, I think the only thing that, that is discretionary is whether the coverage cost is reasonable. And we're talking about $20 a month. We're not talking about, I think that's where the discretion for the court lies. But if, if a party's providing insurance, and the only reason that we're asking that the court order for the insurance to double cover is it it does two different it does a couple of things there one the 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 issue with insurance has really been mom's issue because she's had three different jobs in the last year and there's been concerns about lapse of coverage because she's changed jobs so frequently has other- she ever has she ever not had coverage has there ever been a lapse in coverage i have no idea your honor because it hasn't been reported whether or not she's Mr. Thompson hasn't provided that information. Yeah, the other thing not, it does, Your Honor, if you would like for me to answer my client, we do not, there has not been a lapse in coverage, Your Honor. You know, $20 isn't tons of money if it saves your client money by having secondary coverage. Um, I mean, given the fact she's not gotten any child support for almost a year, I mean, really, come on. I, I mean, yeah, and your my argument is, is because Mr. Because Mr. Thompson wouldn't engage on getting it resolved. I had to file a motion. This is the second time uh, I've had to file a motion on child support. Mr. Von Aiken, I, I think you've been in the business long enough to tell your client to pay something. $50, $75, I don't care what, but you pay something and you probably should pay what you think you owe. And the court could live with that. But just to go an entire almost year and not pay a dime is just, I think it's contemptuous, actually, even though I don't have a contempt uh, motion in front of me. And you could probably defend one because there was no existing journal entry. I, I just find that kind of behavior unacceptable. Uh, and I would say that to anyone, and especially in this case, We've got this child support down low enough to not pay anything for almost a year um, to the mother of this child who has primary residential custody is just, I, I, I don't even think he has an argument to make in that regard. But let's get this cleaned up and cleared up. Um, I, I mean, I guess you can appeal that I'm not properly interpreting the guidelines. I don't see... Um, a situation in which a judge should place upon a step parent to provide primary insurance. One, it would have to be voluntary on their part. Two, the court has no jurisdiction to enforce it. None. So I don't see how the legislature or the Supreme Court rules or anyone else can force me to make an order or agree to something that I cannot enforce within a case. And this is not a case where there isn't insurance. There is insurance. Um, and I think that's attended for parties, not third parties. I understand she's a step parent, but 
She, she has no legal obligation whatsoever to this child. So, uh, unless Ms. Thompson wants the additional coverage and the $20 deduction fine, otherwise I'm going to find that her um, insurance is satisfactory. And, and I, don't know this for, I don't know this for a fact, but I've heard this because I've never had my children or anyone double coverage unless maybe they had a medical card. Plus they had a layer of private insurance, but sometimes double coverage can cause you more problems than it's worth because they're always pointing the finger at each other as to who should be paying and who should be paying what. And that can be a nightmare, especially if you have two people who don't work together very well. So they can't sit down with the bills and go over them. They're trying to avoid paying as little as possible. Whatever the case may be, it's hard enough to navigate secondary insurance when two people are working together on getting the bills paid, let alone where there's no communication. So... Your Honor, I will point out, this is the same insurance company. They're both covered by Blue Cross, just different plans because of the, the employers. And the difference in um, in the deductibles and maximum out-of-pockets are markedly different. Um, and that's a, a, you know, another issue because you have to determine the reasonableness of the insurance. And the in the worksheet, the number assigned, because... Ms. Hoffman's employer does not require that employees pay for the insurance. That is 100% of the family plan cost on the worksheet because that's the way we have to calculate it. Whereas the $20 a month is on a four person plan with a in, with in network deductible of 3,200 and a maximum out of pocket of 8,300. The corresponding numbers for her plan would be 6400 for the maximum out of pocket for the family and 127 12700 dollars for the maximum family um, out of pocket um and it's a high deductible plan so until you hit the deductible you're paying 100% okay well i understand your argument and i don't find that it's reasonable to place a requirement upon a step parent uh, to cover a child of the minor parties. And I don't find that the court can enforce that, nor can the court penalize either party for a failure on the part of the step parent and they have no legal obligations or duty. But your honor, you would be ordering him to carry the insurance. And because yeah. he would be doing so through his spouse, it would be his obligation if for some reason, the spouse's coverage were to drop. I, I'm not doing it. I, I'm not doing it. So if you want to appeal it, go ahead. But I think the responsibility to insure a child is upon each parent. And if your client were working and had insurance coverage and it was a better policy, I would find it more reasonable and allow him to carry the coverage. But he doesn't. He doesn't work. And I am not going to uh, place or put in the hands of a step parent the requirement or responsibility to keep a child insured that is not uh, a legal obligation of a third party that I do not have any jurisdiction over. So that's my finding. Thank you, Your Honor. Right. And, okay. Sorry. So I've already uh, made the finding about child support. I've made the finding about um, the insurance. I am denying the respondent's request for attorney's fees. I'm also denying at this stage the petitioner's request. However, I'm requiring by June 1st that your client, Mr. Van A, can be current on child support. In the event that he's not, then I am going to award any attorney's fees that are necessary uh, or associated with trying to collect that judgment. Understood, Your Honor. 
Your Honor, I, I know it's obvious, but in this case, it seems like the obvious escapes us sometimes. But June 1st, 2024, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. What else do I need to take up today? Um, I think the only other thing that I had on there was an objection to the recommendation regarding the um, split on the on the counseling costs that, that Ms. Erickson had recommended. I think uh, that was, I think that was outside of her purview, and, I, and there was already a medical order in place regarding dividing it um, by percentage of income. And my client received the EOBs for I, that this morning. Okay. I'm fine with that since I'm ordering that he be current on child support as ordered today by June 1st. I'm, I'm fine with doing oh, it that way. I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Doing it which way? Splitting pursuant to. Okay. Previous and if, order he, if he is not current by June 1st, is a 100% of the cost on him for these co pays? My client's been fronting him. With no yeah. reimbursement. No, I, I think there should be a motion for contempt and the court yeah. could, should look at putting him in jail. Thank you, Your Honor. That was my next question, if that. And yeah. just, I do not anticipate an appeal, Your Honor, but for the record, in case uh, Mr. Casher decides to, we do not believe it appropriate for Mr. Casher to receive the multifamily adjustment. I understand the court's order. That's just to preserve any objection for appeal in case Mr. Casher does it. We do not intend to appeal anything, Your Honor. And, and your honor, yes. the guide the guidelines changed January one, and exactly what I told the court last year is the truth: is that that, that is no longer an issue regarding granting a, a multifamily adjustment um, for a new child in, in the payer's family. So I don't know where Mr. Thompson is going with that. It, this is going back to last year in twenty three with different guidelines. I just want to preserve that objection, your honor. I understand, and what he's saying is, if you're going to appeal child support. Yeah and all aspects of it that I've ruled upon or any aspect of it, he wants to be free to, to do yeah. anything and clarify um, because, you know, we've got, I don't know what, eight more years of this, uh, seven yeah, more nine, years yeah. of this. Nine. So anyway. Thank you, Your Honor. Do, does the court want a journal entry prepared or will the court's disposition sheet serve as the court's order? No, we need a journal entry. We need a very clear journal entry. So, Who do you like to uh, prepare that? Well, I don't know. Um, does somebody want to volunteer? I'll take care of it, Your Honor. Okay. Le Leah, is it Soretti? Yes, Soretti, Your Honor. Soretti. Um, do you have any input, any comments or anything with regard to child support? I didn't give you a chance to brief any of these issues or to do anything. That's okay, Your Honor. I, I really just wanted to ensure that we settled the issue of child support today. This came across my desk to refer or to um, basically review for a contempt based on the fact that there had been no payments made since 6 of 2023. But I saw this hearing was upcoming and just wanted to ensure that we came to a final order. I agree that a journal entry is necessary. It needs to be very clear, especially the repayment of arrears and the due date for that so that our finance department knows how to accurately like obligate the new debt. Um, okay. So, yes, thank you for giving me an opportunity. Okay. And, of course, send the journal entry to her for approval as well. Because yeah. I think the law is still clear that when we talk about child support, we can't leave out the 4D attorneys. They have to be noticed Correct, and Honor. involved. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll send, a, I'll send a copy to both counsel and for their approval. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and then... When an issue, you know, the child's still an independent, right? Yes, Your Honor. So. Yes, Your okay. Honor. So I know that's not cheap, but, you know, there there couldn't be a better private school, in my opinion, that the child could be going to. So we sh they shouldn't be fighting about school, per se. Um, and this is the track they've been on with him for a while. But 
if something does develop with regard to issues that need to be resolved between the parents, let's get together and decide what direction is best and frankly cheapest um, for the parties because Oh, I'm sorry. I oh, I don't know why I always have trouble with this name. The mediators in Andover. Um, uh, th that would be the Myers, Your Honor. That the ones. Yes, yes. But what's yeah. the name of their company? It's mediation. It's collaborative collaborative yeah. success. Yeah. Yes, they are very thorough. They are very good, but they can cost as much or more as Jeannie Erickson. Uh, so right. they are not. Uh, I, I've I've got folks who are paying anywhere from two to five thousand dollars a piece, um, and so that's ten thousand um, dollars. And I I just don't. I would like to cut their other costs back as much as we can. Um, and so when something comes up, if the attorneys can't resolve it, I would say that should be your first plan of attack is we've tried to resolve this we can't resolve it give it to your attorney let them contact the other attorney see if they can come to an agreement then if you can't then let me know and you'll have to propose you know your how you believe that we should proceed forward with their whatever parenting issues they have okay are the, how are they communicating family wizard or I don't want to stir up trouble here, but I, I think they're still using uh, because of they were having to communicate with Ms. Erickson. It's it's been entirely by email because they were uh, having to do that connection. So now her. they're losing that. Correct, Your Honor. Correct. Oversight. So I think they need to go to Family Wizard. Okay. Thank. You. Okay, Your Honor. Okay, that's um, what you use in Cedric County, Bryce. Could it be just any parenting app that, that works? I know that that talking I know that talking parents um, for the communication piece doesn't cost them. Our family was just like a hundred dollars a year. Your Honor, the parties used OFW before, and Miss Hoffman still has her account. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that's the only one I'm familiar with, and then that's standard still right now in Sedgwick. Yes. That's the go-to program. Most of the time, yes, uh, yeah. Sometimes they, yes. they 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 have a scholarship program. Um, I have I've had other judges, um, you know, approve talking parents. Okay. Um, again, well, um, the, 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 the standby when you, is when you oh. come up to it. When you come up to it, then if we have to address things through a third party or some other way, then you can propose to me other options. But well, today, I'm just going to say, let's go. Family we'll do well good. Yeah. Yeah, okay. we'll do up thank, you. thank you. And I'll, right, put that in. I'll put that in. Set, thank you. And I'm not going to set another court date at this point. All right. All right. Your All right. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you. Your Honor. Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. This went short, so I'm going to repost the original hearing and then add to it two additional pieces that I have. Kind of crazy update. He's a little bit entitled. Kind of pitches a fit when he doesn't get his way. Here we go. Is what he's saying. We'll see. All right, did you confer with the state about We removing? did, Judge. I conferred a while ago. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Are they in agreement to your motion? They weren't at the time. Okay. Court is calling night mag number 743637, State of Texas versus Joseph Smith. Can I have parties announced for the record? For the state. Jason Garrett. Defense? Garrett Jurek for the defense. And are you Mr. Smith? Yes, ma'am, I am. All right, there's a motion to modify bond restrictions. Uh, the defense is asking 
that GPS be removed. Is that correct? That is the start. Yes, yeah. Your Honor. Judge, we're, we're opposed. This is that being assaulted. Sorry about the firearm. Uh, so we're, we're un unagreed with the total removal of GPS. All right. So with re the, the motion to remove GPS is going to be denied. And here it states that Judge, do I have a chance to reply? Sure. This is a self-defense issue. He has not been found guilty. This is a decorated veteran, three purple hearts, the bronze star. He there, he felt that it was reasonable. No shots were fired. He was, he, the guy who is alleged a complaining witness is running around without a shirt in December, stone on his butt, causing problems. He approaches my client. My client shows his gun as he goes the through. guy comes after okay him. let me let me ask you all this counsel yes ma'am did you view this yes it's on video ma'am. okay so this is where we are he was telling my son he was going to kill him because he was white. well well stop stop so this is where we are where we are is i have that there's another judge who puts you on gps for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon another judge stop so that's what you're on for now, what I'm saying is I'm not removing the GPS. So the next question is, you say in your uh, motion that he's fully employed, correct? Judge, he is 100% disabled. He was working with the National Guard and DPS down at the border. Uh, but since the arrest, he has not been able to assist them. He was teaching marksmanship, I believe, is what you were doing. So I'm a train, or man, I'm a trained scout sniper for the United States. All right, I don't think I was teaching them in weapons and pistol techniques. All right, so I don't, I don't believe with the nature of your charge, they will allow you to continue. No, man, that's why I had to lock up my ranch and, and stop. I have no that employment is not coming in. It's just my wife, and I'm barely making it. Mm -hmm. Judge, may I interrupt? Sure. He is a veteran with diagnosed with PTSD and other issues. I have a client. There's been issues where he's actually called pretrial and super in it. Okay. I had a client, same situation with him. They GPSed him. He committed. Okay, so let me let me stop everybody right there. Do not put put it on this court that somebody's gonna commit because they're on GPS. What I have before me is what I have before me, sir. What I have before me is that they're charging you with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. If somebody wants to file a motion for an examining trial and call witnesses, they can do that. If somebody wants to call in a witness for this hearing, you all can do that. But right now, both sides are just giving me argument. And what I'm telling you, sir, and what I'm telling your counsel is another judge placed you on gps for an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon he, he i don't have any information yes ma'am he done that because i live so far away i live in eagle pass texas mm -hmm. and, and that's that's why he done that all right so here's my question state my, my yes. mental health is suffering i haven't been, had a chance to see my doctors my physical health is suffering mm -hmm. i'm going i'm in remission right now of stomach cancer okay my own home to become my prison Okay, so I don't think anybody's listening to what I'm saying because everybody is entrenched in what their arguments are. So the first question I was asking you, because in your motion, it says defendant is gainfully employed. So what I was going to, well, I know that, I know you're shaking your head now, but that's what your counsel put in the motion. Defendant is gainfully employed. That's why, time out, listen. That is why I was asking, are you employed? Yes, because I'm sure the state is not gonna have any objection to you working. You got to remain on GPS. Now, the next question, you're saying that you have doctor's appointments you need to make. Yes, State, are you going to have any objections to him being allowed to go to his doctor's appointment? So he'll be on partial for his doctor's appointments. He'll be able to go to his doctor's appointments. I can't go to church. I miss my father's funeral. My son's coming in in a week. I haven't seen him in over a year and a half. He's a Marine also. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to see him. Mm -hmm. Your Honor, this is a detriment to my health. Judge, the, the only reason I used my weapon was to escalate the force. I know how to escalate the force. I'm great. I didn't use, I pointed it out. Judge, judge, I'm just going to object at this point. I think they're going with the facts of the case. They are. And, and this is what I keep telling everybody. This is what I want everyone. Take a moment, decompress. This is what I'm telling everyone. Thank you. One, you're telling me he's a veteran. He has a purple heart. This is what happened. I have, I, trust me, all of my male relatives have been in the military. All right. So your service is appreciated. But 
let me just tell you what my job is as a judge. Part of my job is one, to protect the community, right? There are a lot of people who are on bond right now. They're on bond for murder. Some of them have GPS, some of them don't have GPS because whoever read them their rights and let them know their conditions didn't give it to them, right? So the person who placed you on GPS, they read a report, either you were arrested at the scene and you were brought in before a magistrate and that magistrate judge decided that you were gonna be on GPS, then- I was brought in front of a magistrate and I paid yeah. a $100,000 bond to get out. Okay. And I exercised extreme discipline and prejudice when how I'm taught. Mm -hmm. When there is a a threat, mm -hmm. not just to me, but to my family member. All right, we can go off the record. Let me ask you something. All right, so you're telling me all of this. What do you want me to do? Ma'am, I'm not going anywhere. No, no, no. My qu no, no, no. Listen to me. My question is, what do you want me I want to do? I want to be able to take my son fishing before I die. Okay. So you want to take your fine son fishing. What day you want to take your son fishing? Whenever I'd like to. No, you need to give me I, when. I can't, I can't work on my ranch anymore to, with, with, with the Army National Guard or the DPS because oh. it, it had to do with weapons. Okay, so, so there I, you go. So so we know that's off the table. So my question to you is, you want to go fishing with your son. What else do you want to do? Okay. Judge, can we consider tracking? All right, you need to talk to the state about that. All right, step back. Y'all confer. I'm sorry. I'm no, no problem. All right, we're back on Victoria. The state with the position is we're okay with partial for like work, for doctor's business, and anything that the, the judge wants to allow him to partake in with family members. Uh, the, the state would not be opposed to any of that at this particular point. And I've talked to the defense counsel about it. I've had my investigator run some things. And, uh, there's just some stuff that the state is concerned about. However, we're, we're all right. Do you have any objections to medical appointments? No objections. And no objections for work. No objections. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Judge, I want to be object, uh, objecting to prevent the attend church mm -hmm. service on Sundays. All right. This is what we're going to do. It's going to be agreed order. That, well, this is what the state is in agreement to. So there'll be partial GPS for work and medical appointments only. Is there anything else? Um, just if, if I, I, do, I have a father, I have two young sons. If they didn't sort of arrive for I have you know, take my son to work or pick him up, or you know, God forbid he be in a car accident, he skateboards a lot, taking him to the ER on how many times, you know. You need to call your pretrial services officer and let them know that it's been a medical emergency. I tried calling them on the day my father passed away and. I called them 13 times. All right. Them. So what you'll need to do is leave a message with them. If they don't respond, you let your attorney know. I'm usually here. Okay. Thank you, Judge. I, I want to apologize to other members. No, here's the thing. There's no need to apologize. I understand that all of these cases are here for everybody. That's why I always tell everybody, if we're here for a length of time, or if I spend 20 minutes on a case, I will tell you some attorneys get upset. Hey, I need to be somewhere else. You're spending 20 minutes on this case. But here's what I know. What I know is that every case that's in this court is very important to the person who's charged. So if I take extra time with that person, guess what? I want them to be heard. And I know that their case is 100% important to them. So it's important to me. All right. So apology accepted. You're welcome. I want you to know that I did. I utilize the hospitalizations and drug cases the other force that you Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So now you have a, good, a better day than what you've had so far. Oh, no. The, my day has been great. They had a scratch on your face. Your oh, yeah. But you know what? It's going to be fine. All right. Thank you so much. Joseph Smith. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. No car accidents this morning. I'm sorry, what? No car accidents. I'm sorry, what? No car accidents this morning. No. I mean, why would I be in a car accident this last morning? Thursday, last Thursday. I, I've never, I wasn't in a car accident last Thursday. Yes. 
Okay. Did I? Are we in the time continuum? Did I forget yeah. something? That's where you said you were an offender burner upstairs. No. Maybe you need something about the scratch on your face. Oh, yeah, that's not from a car accident, but it was an accident. But, but Sean, why did you bring that up? Because now my mom is going <laughs> to talk about it again. <laughs> mom, I'm taking care of it. I'm trying to take the scar down. It's so hard. None of that stuff is working. I should have done the yogurt thing. Is it too late to do your yogurt thing? You try, Judge. Okay. All right, the court, uh, we're going to go on the record. Court is calling Night Mag number 7436. Three seven state of Texas versus Joseph Smith. Could I have parties announced for the record for the state? Jason Garahan, y'all. Defense. for the defendant. And are you Mr. Smith? Yes, ma'am, I am. All right. My understanding is you're in custody and a uh, state is aware that the court was informed and I believe the state was informed that there was a finding of tampering with the strap and that was uh, found by the magistrate judge and they ordered that you be remanded without bond. So we are now here to hear this. So have both parties received the update letter from pretrial services state? No, I have not seen that. Was that the one that came Monday? Yeah, I've seen that one. All right, so we'll call it this state review it. And state, do you need a copy? No, Judge. I just, I just wanted to uh, read it quickly. Sorry, I'm always done. Oh, no problem. Okay. Oh. All right. So both parties had a chance to review. Yes, you're yeah, on. Right. All right. So according to the updated letter, the office made contact with the defendant. This is what's in the letter, and it states. Uh, the defendant who agreed to travel from his home in Eagle Pass to San Antonio for inspection. However, he did not arrive. The defendant stated he spoke with his attorney and would not be traveling to San Antonio for device inspection. This officer attempted to make contact with the alleged victim in the case, but was unsuccessful and a welfare check was requested from SAPD. As of this writing, the defendant remains in non-compliance. And they said they received a strap tamper alert from Sentinel Monitoring Call Center on May 24, 2024 at 4.13 p.m. And they said this indicates that the defendant may have attempted to cut, remove, or tamper with the strap attached to the device. All right. We're here and the uh, pretrial services officer is here. Judge, it's our opinion that Mr. Va Ms. Valadez there is engaging in official oppression of my client. She has harassed him continuously. All right, so here's the thing. No, no, let, let me no, 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 let me say this. I don't do with beliefs. If people have some facts they want to present, they can present some facts. We, we can call because them. I can tell you that from what I'm reading in the GPS strap tamper, it says that they received a strap tamper alert from Senate Monitoring Call Center, which suggests to the court Pretrial services officer is not in charge of Sentinel Monitoring Call Center. That's a different area. Okay. If they receive from them a strap alert and somebody is on GPS, Sentinel Monitoring will tell them it could be this. Maybe they tried to remove it. Maybe they tried to tamper with it. So, okay. Judge, I'd like to see that alert. I would okay. like to see the documentation that the pretrial received concerning this monitor. All right. Uh, Ms. Uh, I'm sorry, Officer Valadez, do you have an email from them or something with regards to that? Yes, Judge, I can forward you. The uh, I'm sorry, that. you're muted. Oh, I'm so sorry. Just one second. Let us check on our end. Okay. All right. Could you try it again? Ah, <laughs> let me just text you real quick. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm so sorry about that, Judge. Yes, Judge, I can forward you the email I had received from the alert that I'd received. I'm gonna send you. I'm gonna send you my email address, and if you'll send it to me, I can print it out for the attorneys here. Yes, Judge, we'll do. I want to 
Well, that's going on, Judge. I'd like to make. Well, no, no, no. Oh. Just one second. We, we're we're taking this one step at a time. You wanted to see the Sentinel monitoring call center alert, so we're going to get that to you. What? Three times I've done this. Okay, Judge, I just forwarded it to you right now. All right, let me see if it's come through. My computer, I'm being told, is out of date. So hopefully, ah, there it is. Apparently, Judge, looking at this, it shows that it was working completely, no problems with it. No, no here's issue. the thing. It's not the issue of whether it's working. Yeah. What I'm reading, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm reading from it, and nobody, everybody said they had no objection to hearsay, it's saying event information, event, XMTR tamper. Oh, I see that, Judge. Yes. Yeah. All right. You can look at the bracelet there on his leg. It has not been tampered with. It's not been changed. This is the third time they've come in and said that he had a uh, tampering on his device. It has been working fine. There's been no issues with it. At 445 on Friday of Memorial Day weekend, he is in Eagle Pass, three and a half to four hours away. They want him to come into San Antonio. I guarantee when he shows in the San Antonio, there's nobody open. I advised him that on Monday, I will approach the court and, we, and I will bring this issue up to the court, which I did. Okay, so here's the thing. I'm trying to take this step by step and I want everybody to hear me. All right, so defense stated that he believes that the officer, Ms. Valadez, is harassing, and what are the other words that you use? Official oppression. Official oppression. So. Official oppression is actually listed under Texas Penal Code Section 39.03. And what it says is, Texas official oppression law makes it a crime for a public servant to use their office to unlawfully deny someone the rights unlawfully mistreat someone or subject them to arrest, detention, search, seizure, disposition, assessment, or lien, or to sexually harass people. This only applies to public servants. The defense said, I want to see this tampering thing because according to what I'm reading, Officer Valadez is not the one who said he was tampering. The officer received a report from Central Monitoring Call Center that they received a strap tamper alert, all right? Defense said, well, I don't believe it. I wanna see that she actually received it. Okay. So she emailed it to the court, both the state and the defense had it. So here's my question from both parties who are reading the same document that I'm reading. Does it appear that Officer uh, Valadez received a report from Senate Monitoring Call Center saying there was a tamper alert? Yeah. yeah I that's what this says. All right. So she received that there was a tampering alert. Here's my question for both parties. You have someone who is on bond for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. They're on GPS. Whether he should be on it or not, that's not what we're here for. He's on GPS. Someone placed him on GPS. It wasn't this court. What did anybody expect her to do when she receives a tamper alert from somebody who is on for somebody who is on bond for a alleged violent offense, what, what were we expecting her to do? From the state's perspective, Your Honor, she did exactly what she's supposed to do. In fact, I like to have that in every case I have where it's a, a violent offense. So I think Ms. Collin uh, did her job exactly the way she's supposed to do. So what she did, what I'm reading in the report, and I'm not, I'm just dealing in facts, Mr. Smith. Mr. What I'm reading in the report I have is she received a tamper alert and then what she did. And if I'm wrong, correct me. She picks up the phone. She calls you and tells you, you need to come back to San Antonio because she has a tamper alert. And according to this, it says that you told her, your attorney told her, told her, no, I'm not coming back. Well, you can speak if you want to go under oath. I don't know if your attorney wants you to do that. 
I, I, I want to tell what's happened with dealing with her? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma All right. All right. You want to raise your right hand? You solemnly swear and affirm the testimony of you will be the truth and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. Yes, ma'am. All right. You can lower your hand. State your name for the record. Joseph Jefferson Smith. Work. All right. Anybody want to ask him questions? All right. Defense. Mr. Smith, you've had issues with Mr. Ms. Valadez, right? I got this one interim device put on me in January. I had Officer Hudson, who was in charge of me at first. Never had an issue. Never. About three months into her being my case manager, she took another job in Colorado. This is the first time I didn't even know who this woman on the computer screen was. I've never been introduced to her. I've never spoken to her personally. All I know is a voice over her phone. Um, this is the third time I've had to drive from Eagle Pass to here have another one replaced because the Centennial Monitoring Company will call me every other day between midnight and eight o'clock in the morning, two, three, four times a night and ask me, where are you at? And sometimes I've been so aggregated or I've told them, you're monitoring me, you see me on computer, you tell me. I'm sitting in my home of residence, I'm at sleep, four o'clock in the morning. You're waking me and my children and my wife, she has to go to work. It, this is where I'm at. Every time I have a thunderstorm where I live, this thing starts going off like a rape whistle. I myself have called a place in um, San Clemente or Orange County, California, trying to let them know because I was freaking out because it was going off. Then eventually I got a hold of like a duty officer that worked at the uh, future uncle finding place. He told me he would let one of them know what was going on. And if there was an issue, they'd call me back. Never, never been an issue before. The whole tampering with it, your honor, if you would like to, or have maybe one of the officers take a look at it, you can tell it's not been tampered with. There's no cause. I'm not an expert in tampering of well, devices. I, I understand that. Um, actually, I have a huge sore on the side of my foot where it's rubbed me raw, and I and I have a a infection coursing through my veins because it's the circulation in my feet. We're getting. All the surgeries I've had, I can see how fat my hands are today. I swell up. Um, I've had issues with them not charging properly, and I've had to come back and get a new one put on. It's, like I said, this is the third or fourth time this has happened. Um, the issue, and I don't know why there is an issue or why there's so much friction with me and Mrs. Aldez, other than the fact that she tends to speak to me in a demeaning manner, like, and I know she has a job of authority, and I understand that. But also, I deserve respect. And to be told, I'm done talking to you, give the phone back to your wife, is nonsense. It's got nothing to do with my wife. Now, secondly, where I live, I don't get a very good social service. I live right on the Rio Grande. The, the river, the, where the big excess is out of me. So, my wife is secondary number. When they when I can't get ser service, then they can't do to me, they call her, and I'm right there. You know, I'm never more than two seconds, five, you know, a minute away. And she brings the phone right to me, whether I'm in the shower or I'm working on my vehicle in my driveway. Right there. Um... When I leave here, I, it's like I'm punching a time clock. They watch me go home all the way to Eagle Pass. I mean, that's what GPS is. I, I understand. Yeah. Last week, I asked when I left, and um, I, I was I came to see if I could get it taken off. Mm -hmm. I actually asked her, look, um, she called when I left the court, and I asked her, ma'am, may I please stop and buy a book, something to read to keep my mind? You know, I'm going crazy at home, plus I'm hungry. She told me, absolutely not. You can't get out of your vehicle. As a matter of fact, if you stop with something, I need you to fax me a copy of the receipt. Yeah, I mean, that's the way GPS works. I, I understand that, ma'am. But it's it's in the manner of which it is done. There's, there's ways things can be done. And there's ways you talk to somebody that you, that you, you think that, you know, you're, you're a very respectful woman. 
And I know a lot of judges who aren't. And I believe that helps you out in your career. She would get a lot more from me, a lot better conversation out of me. And she would just learn better people's skills. All right, so let, let, like me, let me tell you something. Sometimes people don't have what they call good bedside manners, right? And some people, for example, I have a friend. He's an attorney. And he would always, and he still to this day does it, he'll tell his client every possible worst thing that could, could happen. Things that are out of the realm of possibility that would never happen. And then that person will say like, oh my gosh, I'm terrified. But here's the thing. Yeah. But here's the thing. When people talk to people, yeah, I'm like, eh, let's not be mean to each other. But some people are 100% business and they're not doing it in a nice way. Some people are, look, you're stopping. You're not allowed to stop. If you're going to stop, I need a receipt from the restaurant you stopped at. No, That's I, the way it is. I, but we were just here. Yes. Yeah, so, and and I, correct I, me if I'm wrong. I remember you telling me, look, you know. No, no, no. Stop. Correct me if I'm wrong. When we were here last time, I said that you're allowed for medical appointments. Did I say for anything else? Work. Work in medical appointments. That's all I said. Did I say for anything else? No. I mean, I've been here since nine o'clock. I was driving three and a half no. hours back home. I was, Here's the thing. I had to get gas. When you're on GPS... You're on GPS. And if you're on full GPS, you know what that means? That means sometimes that you, if somebody's having to cook out at your house, you can't even step out to go in the backyard to, to watch the grill. I, 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 All right. No, that. no. <laughs> Listen to me. That's what full GPS is. When you're on partial GPS and it says you're allowed to go to work, that's all you're allowed to do. You're not allowed to make other stops. Now, what I will tell you, there are some pretrial officers who will say, eh, you know, the Burger King is on his way to his house. That's fine for them to stop there. And guess what? That officer is not allowed, to, is, is not supposed to allow you to do that. But there are some officers who do. But then you have some officers who go strictly by the letter of what's in the motion. And if the motion says you're only allowed to go to work, guess what? They're not going to let you stop at Burger King on the way. They're not going to let you stop at HEB on the way. If there's an emergency where, hey, my tank is on empty, I'm not going to be able to make it. Usually they'll let you do that. But this other stuff, stopping at restaurants or let me pick up groceries or let me pick up some eye drops. Some officers will say no. And you know what? They're not wrong for saying that. I will tell you the officer who tells you when you're on partial GPS and you're only supposed to be going to work. That officer who gives you a pass and lets you stop at Burger King and Whataburger, they're actually in the wrong because they're not supposed to allow that to happen. It's because if that officer would allow that and something would have happened at the Whataburger or Burger King involving that person, guess what? It's going to be the officer's fault and that officer is probably going to get fired and everybody's going to rain thunder on that officer because this person is only supposed to be going to work. And this person is only supposed to be going for medical appointments, period. That is totally understood, Your Honor. And oh. I've, I've had her Judge, call. I, well, no, no, he's, he's I, testifying. I've, I've had her finish. call and be like, you know, you know, I'm with my wife. My wife is here if, if you, if you, if you or like two to Why, Where's your husband at now? Why is he driving 63 miles an hour, hour down the road? I'm like, I'm sitting right next to my wife. You know. In my home. And my wife will hand me the phone, you know, here. She, she, they say that you're driving 53 miles an hour down some highway right now. Judge, I'll give you an example. No, no, no. Do you have questions for him? He's still oh. on the witness stand. Okay. No, and with the whole, you know, me ask, I, I, I remember, you know, you told me, you only need to go somewhere, ask. I asked her. She, she shot. She it, said she, no. She shot it down. In this, in this story, you know, I told her it was hey, I was hungry, but I got to stop and get gas anyways because I'm driving three miles. I get something at the truck stop. She was done speaking with me at the link, and she just said, "Give your wife back the phone." She doesn't have anything to say to my wife. It should be with me, Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. When you were in court last Thursday, did you receive a call from Miss Valdez? Multiple times. And what was her 
statements. Why are you still there? I told you you're only allowed there until one o'clock. Um, why, you know, why have you not called me every hour on the hour? And, you know, my wife stepped out and let her know, hey, the court is really busy today. If you remember, I was the last one that day. It was Thursday. I really leave for like five o'clock. She knew he was in court. The GPS would show him at 300. Yeah, uh, she continued to harass him that day. All right, the court was busy. However, we take cases as they're placed up for me to take. So it wasn't my fault that no, you were here till. No, we're not late. saying that, okay. Judge. But, yeah, but, no, I, was did, the, I was the last one that day. Okay. Any other questions, defense? Yeah. Did you tamper with your GPS? I've already sworn on it. There's no way in hell. I mean, if I was to cut it with a razor or a knife or a pair of scissors, it would definitely leave a mark. I can't slip it because my feet look like Mickey Mouse's feet. I have sores on my ankles. Like I said, and I have, I'm starting to get what's called cellulitis blood infection because I can't keep them, keep them wrapped up. It gets wet and dry from the sweat underneath the band. All right, so his question was whether or not you tampered with it. No, oh, ma'am. The one yeah. thing I've done is plugged in and unplugged it. I would offer the GPS as an exhibit that has not been tampered with. There's no marks on it. There's nothing. Judge, just to, uh, just talk to the fiscal. I have looked at it. It doesn't. I don't see any visible marks on it. I do notice that there is two sores and scabs below it. I don't know if that would be an issue. I just want to let the court be aware that I do see visible injuries below the uh, device. That's it just be steady. From a, from a, it's from a rubber in my hand. Okay. Any other questions, defense? Nothing further, judge, except the fact. Well, that... no, no, no. Okay. State any questions? I don't have any questions. I don't have any questions. Further questions. All right. So, uh, Mr. Smith, no. it's my understanding with regards to your communication with Miss, I'm sorry, Officer Valadez was you wanted to stop for food and she told you no? Uh, that was when I left her last Thursday. Okay, so last Thursday. So, with regards to this, I didn't, you know, I think it would stay back to class. All right, so with regards to May 24, 2024, was, at 4 13 p.m., where they received the strap tamper alert from Sentinel Monitoring Call Center, uh, did Ms. Valadez ask you to come in? I got called. At now, my question is I want you to listen to my questions. Did Officer Valadez ask you to come in? Not, I mean, she told me. All right. I, so did I, she, did she tell you to come into the office? Yes. Did she inform you that she received a stramp tamper alert from Senatorial Monitoring Call Center? I, there's extenuating circumstances. No, so my question I, is. Yes, she did. All right. So Officer Valadez told you that there was a stramp tamper alert from the call center, yes or no? Yes, ma'am. And she asked you to come in to San Antonio, yes or no? Yes. All right, what time was that when she asked you to come that in? That was at 16.45 on Friday. Six? Quarter to five, quarter to four, 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 four. That's PM? Yes, ma'am. So she asked you to come to San Antonio? Yes, ma'am. All right, and what was your response to her? First of all, I have no one to watch my son. <laughs> no, I have two. Service dogs, they're there. Secondly, by the time I get there, you know, it's the start of Memorial Day weekend. She, she told me I had two hours to get to San Antonio, which, you know, if you're Mario and Jetty, maybe. By the time I got there, there was going to be nobody there. And what? Well, no, no, no. You, you never arrived. So don't even give me this. By the time I got there, nobody would be there. No, no, I, My question to you, listen, that? listen to me carefully. My question to you is, when she told you to come to San Antonio because she had received a strap, a strap tamper alert from the calling center, what was your response to her? That, that happens every time it thunderstorms and that I was going to speak to my lawyer before I left and let him know what was going on because... You know, I was being set up for failure. There was no way I was going to make it anywhere on time for this. And I didn't feel that it, it, it was. All right. So here's the thing. 
I appreciate that you want to tell your story the way you want to tell it, but I'm trying to get to the bottom of things. So I just need you to answer my question. Officer Valadez called you and said that she received a strap tamper alert from the calling center. Yes or no? Yes. And then she told you that you needed to come to San Antonio to address that. Yes or no? Yes. Then what did you do next? I tried going here, first of all, to let you know what was going on. I had told one of your clerks, they told me you were gone for the day. Contacted the Centennial place myself and let them know what was going on. What did you say to Miss? Did you call Officer Valdez? I, I tried speaking with her over the phone. And she had the entire conversation was with my wife. She would not talk to me. All right. So here's the thing. I'm asking you these questions. No, I, I and and listen to me. In the report that I received, it says the defendant stated he spoke with his attorney and would not be traveling to San Antonio for device inspection. Did you say that? She was never told that. No, ma'am. I spoke with my lawyer. I don't know what was going on. He advised me. No, so how would she get this information? You're telling me that you spoke to your attorney. Your attorney has already stated that he told you not to come. And so you're telling me that Officer Valadez just has a crystal ball? Why is this in this report that the defendant stated he spoke with his attorney and would not be traveling to San Antonio for device inspection? She's had multiple conversations with my attorney. I mean, she refuses to speak to me anymore because she wasn't allowed to. No, my question is, did your wife, Talk to her about this. Thing. Possibly, I know it wasn't me. I, I didn't. I didn't tell her. You know. So okay. I didn't speak her at all. I, I didn't have a conversation with her. I had a conversation with one of your clerks. No, no, no. Stop. Lawyer. You're telling me now that you didn't speak to Officer Valadez at all on Friday. Yeah, when when the strap tampering came in. Oh, well. All right. You're saying so. you just told me that she called you to say that there's been a strap tampering alert from the calling center. Number and she spoke to his wife is here. If you want and, to and, and I was sitting right next to her. Okay. Right. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, judge. May I say something? Oh, just, just one second. You're going to get called as a witness. Okay. So just give us a second. Am I wrong? Did I just, did he just say he had spoken to officer Valadez? All right. Any more questions for him? All right. Any more witnesses defense? I have his wife. All right. Let's call the wife. Yes, Good morning, Your Honor. Oh, Good morning. Your name, uh, what's your name, please? Evelyn Smith. All right. Could you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give would be the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. I do. All right. You can lower your hand and just state your name again for the record. Evelyn Smith. All right. Defense. Miss Smith. Honor about uh, the 24th of May. Did you have a conversation with Miss Valadez? Yes, I did. Okay. Did she call you directly that day? Yes, she did. Did she talk, call her, your husband that day? No, she didn't. All right. Did your husband talk to her that day? He was on speaker. So he was on speakerphone, but the conversation was with you? Yes. Okay. What was the nature of the conversation? She basically said um, um, that it was tempered with. Um, she said, uh, I answered and she said that he had removed it. I was looking at him to where I said, I'm here. He's right. I'm, I'm, he's right outside. I can see him. It hasn't been tempered with, um, what, what is it that you want us to do? Um, she said, well, maybe he moved it, tapped on it or something. I said, let me check We're we're here. Um, it hadn't been moved. I, I put him on speaker. He's like, nothing's wrong with it. I haven't done anything to it. Uh, I asked her if she wanted to call me from her cell phone so she could FaceTime so we could see the monitor. Um, she said she would call me back, which she did call me back 10 minutes later or so. And she said, you're going to have to come to San Antonio. Um, I said, is there any way you can give me about an hour or so because we need to get things together, take the dogs to to their place to stay for the night or um, something to take care of it and to take care of things here. She said, you know, 
She said, it has to be done right now. I said, is there any way? I mean, you can give me some time. I really need to get things taken care of. I haven't even clocked out of work. I work from home. Um, I need to clock out of work. I need to do things. Um, and she said, no, that somebody was going to be waiting at the jail for him. And I said, look, I, I honestly, we just we were just in San Antonio yesterday. We have we're going through a financial situation. It's really hard for us to get things done and get everything going right now. I said, if you can give me some time, let me figure things out. She's like, I don't have time. I said, can I call you back in five minutes? She's like, I don't have five minutes. I will, um, he needs to be here. I said, um, she recalls I would, I started hyperventilating. It was just too much to where I couldn't talk to her. And she was just like, okay, he needs to be, he needs to be here. I'm sorry. And if he's not here, we're going to set out a warrant for his arrest. Um, but he needs to be here. Somebody's going to be waiting for him at the jail. Um, he has until eight o'clock. And I tried to figure things out as soon as I hung up with her. And, um, we called the attorney, and that's what led to us believing that it would be okay if he, he couldn't, if he didn't go. Um, we were not going to make it. Uh, we were not financially stable at the moment. It's really hard for us to travel. Um, it's really hard for him to travel with his condition. And um, I try my best. I'm his caregiver as well, so I try my best to talk to her all the time. I communicate with her, I email her. Um, he, when we were here in court last Thursday, she was emailed, explaining to her she could extend um, until four or five o'clock. Uh, she agreed, she emailed me back right away. Um, our communication is a little bit better because I'm more understanding and I try to de-escalate situations. But um, it, that was a situation on, on Friday. We couldn't just pick up and leave and drive three hours to San Antonio. I also take care of my father who was sick. Um, and it was a matter of having to get my sister to go, having somebody stay there with him, um, having my 16 year old son be okay at the house by himself, somebody to take care of her dogs. It was a lot at once and I just couldn't stop. You offered to show her, Ms. Valdez, the, the ankle monitor on FaceTime yes, that I she did. could see it. I did. And she declined. She said, I'll call you back. That's what she told me that I, that I had to come. Um, I did take video and pictures that are time stamped on my phone, um, showing the device all around because I knew that it might be a problem if we didn't make it. Um, so everything um, is time stamped on that. We tried calling the company itself as well. All right. Uh, State, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, you said your husband has a condition that it's difficult for him to travel. What is mm -hmm. that condition? He has GI problems to where he um, he get, he's unable to move his legs sometimes. So it's hard for me to get him in a car or sometimes if he gets so swollen in his legs and his hands um, in the road that uh, we have to stop several times because he gets a pain. He had a fistula removed, so he gets a pain on his left side. So we stop. Uh, frequently in our drives because he needs to stand up, walk around for about 10 minutes, get back in the car. It's a whole process when we have to travel like this. Ma'am, have you all these medical conditions? Have you given those paperwork and all that information to your attorney? Um, no, we okay. have never been asked. Okay, that. thank you. Mm -hmm. And these are all uh, service related injuries? Yes, the GI. All right, so um, you're saying that they you were informed by the officer for him to report at the jail? Yes, ma'am. All right, so I'm assuming the jail is open 24 seven. All yes, right, and then you're saying that you were given until eight o'clock? She said there was a tech uh, that would be waiting for, for him until eight o'clock only. Um, she did say something about uh, maybe a 30 minute waiver to, to make sure that we get there. Um, and I did tell her like, right now, if I even if I try to make it by six, it's going to be very impossible. Um, she can testify to to how I was trying to work things out and trying to make it make it work, um, but we couldn't come to an agreement. And that's when you called me and said that it would be impossible to make it there by eight o'clock. All right. So, 
are you the person who picked up the phone and told the officer that the defense attorney said not to travel to San Antonio? No. All right. So who's the one who told the officer that? We never talked to her again after that. Um, we got a call. I want to say it was around um, a little bit before midnight from uh, an, uh, another officer. And she asked if we, um, she was following up. She was very kind. She was following up saying that um, she was just uh, wanting to know if we were gonna make it to where I told her we thought we had until eight o'clock. Um, we talked to our attorney uh, and he said that, uh, we, I, I informed her that we were, we were gonna make it. I put my husband on speaker just so that she could uh, talk to him. And she did, and she asked, she's the one that asked him if uh, we were gonna make it. And he said, we were not gonna be able to make it. He All right, so let me, let me backtrack a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're saying that another officer called you and what did, did that officer say, hey, you need to come in? No, she was just following up. She just said- uh, All right, so your answer to one of the things you stated, and if I heard wrong, let me know. You said that you were speaking to this other officer and you said, I thought we had until eight. Mm -hmm. Yes, I told her, um, I said, she gave me a, a timeline. She said that I had to be there until eight o'clock. All right. So again, we're back to this question because this statement came somewhere where it says the defendant stated he spoke with his attorney and would not be traveling to San Antonio for device inspection. Mm -hmm. So did they... And, Nobody's going to get into, you know, the attorney's not going to get in trouble here. I'm just trying to get to right. what advice was given. So my question is, did you or your husband inform either Officer Valadez or another pretrial cell service officer that your attorney said not coming to San Antonio? Yes. All right. So why did it take so long for me to get that information? Please. So are you the one, are you, excuse me, are you the one who told the officer that the attorney said, you're not coming to San Antonio? Yes. All right. Any other questions? Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. All right. Any other witnesses, defense? I have no, no other witnesses, Judge. All right. State, are you going to call the officer? Uh, yes. Well, the state calls for some of uh, this. All right. Any objection to her appearing by Zoom? None, Your Honor. Oh. State. All right. Ms. I'm sorry. Officer Valadez, can you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you solemnly swear and affirm the testimony you give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes. All right. You can lower your hand. Just make sure you keep your voice up so the court reporter can hear. If you'll state your name for the record. Priscilla Valdez. State. Thank you, Honor. Officer Valdez on last Friday, uh, May 24th, uh, after four o'clock, did you speak with Mr. Smith? Yes, I did. And did you also speak to Mrs. Smith, his wife? Yes, I did. They were both, uh, the phone call was on speaker. I could hear Mr. Smith on the other line, on the other end of the call. And can you please tell the court and the judge uh, what that conversation pertained to and why you contacted th those individuals? Yes. So I had received a strap temper alert from Sentinel Monitoring System, which is the d GPS device um, company, about 413, about a strap temper. I had called the defendant's wife, which she's put on speaker to speak with the defendant if he had cut off or tampered with the device. She says that he was working outside on his car and might have tapped it on something, confirmed it with the defendant. He said no. I said um Regardless, he would need to come into pre, uh, to San Antonio to get the device inspection, which is a part of his GPS contract. When he is uh, getting released from the jail, he signed off on conditions. I can read it to you right here. Um, I understand and agree that I may be required to report to pretrial services or central magistrate booking office for equipment inspections. Inspections are a discre uh, discretion of Sentinel or pretrial may occur anytime of the day or night and may result in loss of work. So I had given them, I know that they live in Eagle Pass and it is quite a drive away. Unfortunately, since he has an open case in Bear County, there's no other Sentinel monitoring system close to where he resides. So he would have to make the trip. I had informed the defendant's wife and defendant. And they, the defendant, I could hear him on the other end saying, no, he's not gonna come in. He was just here at court the other day. And he said it across word and said, no. 
He said the F word and said, no, he's not coming. So I had told the defendant's wife, I understand money issues, anything that's happening, but I'm following protocol and my supervisor and we need him to come in. So I gave her a time period between, um, since they live like three and a half hours away, I gave him until eight o'clock, which is four hours. That's more than enough time. I had informed her that if he does not show up, a warrant will be issued due to his violent charge. And there's nothing, I, I mean, he would have to come in. And with Mr. Smith's uh, device, is there any other special conditions or anything associated with him personally, like medical? Have there been any medical uh, records or paperwork turned over to you? Um, since I've been transferred over from Officer Hudson, since he's been on my caseload, he has not once mentioned um, doctor's appointments or any medical issues. I know that he had explained that he does, he has, um, he served in the, like he's a veteran and he has issues going on. Um, but he's never once mentioned to me that he's having a rash or anything in regards to uh, irritating his skin for his device or anything like that. Because if it, he did bring that up to my attention, I would have informed him to come in so we can get the technician to switch it over to the other leg or do what we can to uh, subside that what's going on with the skin and the device itself. And, and just to actually going towards the, I know Eagle Pass, uh, like you said, I think it's about three hours plus away. Uh, is it common when you have a tamper with a, one of these devices that you ask anybody for that matter that's on GPS to come in so it can be inspected? Yes, it's protocol. Like I had mentioned, um, it is a part of his GPS contract. And if he refers back to the GPS contract that he signed when he was being released, it states there that he may need to come into pretrial services or the magistrate booking for equipment inspection. And, and I mean, and, and with these devices, uh, I, I think you heard er earlier, he testified that he's getting calls at three or four or five in the morning. Uh, is that is that something that happens or is that a common uh, occurrence also? Um, it is. It does occur sometimes at night just to make sure that we can confirm where the, he's located with the um, the device and just make sure we're doing our job to follow up on regards to his location. And, and so, it does, I'm so sorry. Okay. Sorry, you can finish. It does occur with GPS monitoring system. It does happen. So in this particular case, it's not anything outside the norm meaning that it's normal for them to get these calls. It's normal for him to be asked to come in. Is that correct? No, it's not a the norm. It's totally normal in regards to having the device on. Okay, thank you. We'll pass away this year. Ms. Valadez, do you have his file in front of you? I do. How many GPS devices has he had on since January? So far since from my caseload, he has had one device being switched out and this would be the second time that I would have the technician uh, look at his device and have it switched out again. Okay, so actually there's been three, is that not correct? I only, have, I only have two on record. Okay, do you have Ms. Hudson's uh, file there in front of you? The previous yes. Did you see the email she sent to me and concerning the uh, health issues with Mr. Uh, Smith? Let me look back at his file. One moment. I do have an email in regards to his mental health that she has sent to you. Um, nothing in regards to medical, physical. Did you have an occasion to meet with him and talk to him about that? You knew he was a disabled vet, did you not? Yes, I was aware of it. Okay. And you didn't bother inquiring whether or not, you know, what his conditions are or what his uh, infirmities are? No, I have spoken to him in regards to his conditions. When uh, court was done on the 24th, I had informed him of going from full house to partial. Per pretrial, he's only allowed to go to attorney's pretrial, bail bonds, medical purposes only for himself, court, and work-related. Okay. So you were familiar then with his medical issues? In regards to his mental health, yes, but he has never once informed me in regards to going to appointments or anything like that. Okay. But you didn't bother inquiring about that, did you? knowing that he was a disabled vet. 
That is not, that is not, does not fall under my discretion in regards to his mental health. If he needs to be referred to the mental health court, that is your responsibility to refer him and get evaluation. Uh, Ms. Valadez, did you have a conversation with Ms. Smith concerning it at asking for additional time to come to San Antonio because they had to firm up some family issues and, and so I had, I had, Yes. So, so I had informed her that I gave her more than enough time, gave them more than enough time. I gave them four hours, which is 30 minutes more. And I had informed her that um, unfortunately he's not able to do the errands that she needs to do prior to getting him to pretrial services for her to do what she needs to do. And then as soon as possible, come to pretrial services as soon as possible. Like it needed to, he needed to be on his way, but okay. when the, the on I'm so sorry. When the on-call officer had reached them, you had uh, he had stated that you told him not to come. So I've had this issue where you're overriding my position and you're telling him things that should not be that he's should be disregarding what I'm saying, and I'm just doing my job. Ms. Valadez, you called him uh, at four forty-five on Friday afternoon, right? I caught him around right when I got the alert. I caught him. It was at 4.13, 4.14. I caught him as soon as I got it. So it was around maybe 4.16, 4.18 in that time frame. And you told me he had to be there by 8 o'clock? I gave him from around to 8 to 9 o'clock. I told him that the technician will only wait so long if he does not appear a warrant will be issued due to his aggravated assault case charge. Okay. And... How long does drive is it from Eagle Pass to San Antonio? I know it's around All right, three. So let me let me just just one second. All right, so here's the thing: you've already testified. I don't know why you're doing the four fingers to me. No, I, I, that I, is, no, no. You were trying to say it's four hours from Eagle Pass. That's why. You, no, no, stop. That's why you were doing it. You, your attorney has already questioned you. If he wants to recall you back, he's more than welcome to do that. But this is what needs to stop. He's questioning a witness. You're not on the witness stand. Do you understand? All right. So Deputy Mejia, can you just have him stand there so I can concentrate on what's being said here and his attorney can concentrate on questioning the officer? You may continue. Uh, yes. So do you know how far it is from Eagle Pass to San Antonio? I know it's around three, three and a half. It's uh, quite a drive. So I gave him a leeway of four hours. And this was Memorial Day weekend, was it not? Did you consider the traffic flow on Memorial Day weekend on a Friday? Yes, I did give him a good, I opened up his schedule and I did give him enough time to travel, but that does not help. I did give him the schedule. I did my end. You told him not to go. Therefore, he got a warrant and a remand with our bond. Isn't it procedure that you send the violation report to the presiding judge? So uh, after, after 4.30, I was no longer in office and it was transferred out to an on-call officer. So you so bypass it. You, so you bypass the preceding, uh, the presiding judge in the case and send it to a magistrate. Is that correct? Due to after hours, after hours, since it was close to midnight when the officer had called him to confirm that he's no longer coming, it does go straight to a magistrate judge that is on call 24-7. I mean, not 24 seven, but after hours. All right. And just so everyone knows, I'm not available at midnight. Uh, well, that, that's my point, Judge. Okay. She's saying midnight, but she told him he had to be there by eight o'clock and he knew and she knew he wasn't coming by eight o'clock. So why didn't she file a violation report before midnight? I'm so sorry. Are you asking why I gave him more time than he should have to appear at the satellite de the department? Are you... Are you upset that I gave him more time? No, my point is they're coming from Eagle Pass. You know he's a disabled vet. You know he has medical issues. You know they have financial issues. Yet you jumped on a warrant against him. Now, did you know the complaining witness was in jail? Yet you were so concerned about the complaining witness. Yeah, I'm just checking. I don't know. Sustained. Well, Judge, it's in the report that she makes a big issue about the fact they couldn't con contact the complaining witness. All right. The objection is sustained. All right. It and is. Yes. I'm so sorry. 
Judge. Any other questions? Uh, one more question. Did you refer to me as a redneck? No. You didn't? No, sir. So if Miss Smith came in and said you didn't have a conversation with her, you didn't make any derogatory remarks about me, even though I would not take it as a derogatory remark? I mean, no, some people get sunburned, I guess. <laughs> okay. All right, never mind. Pass the witness. Any other questions? No. All right, I just have a few. Any objections to me asking a few no. questions? No. All right. So, Officer Valadez, um, one of the witnesses testified, and I believe it was the uh, Mr. Smith's wife, that she asked for more time, and then you said you would call her back. Did that happen? Yes, it did, Judge. All right. So, what were? Why did you need to call her back? What were you doing? I was confirming with my supervisor that unfortunately he did need to come in per the GPS contract. All right. And how many times have you actually seen Mr. Smith in person? I've seen him once in person when he came in for his device inspection in the past. All right. And you stated that twice the device had been switched out. Uh, once per me. And um, if Anything, if he's needed to come into pretrial services today, it would be a second time. All right. So the one time with you that the device was switched out, what was the reason for that? It was due to him having charging issues. All right. And when you say charging issues, was there a concern that maybe the, the device wasn't charging appropriately? Yes. Either the, it, I'm not a technician, unfortunately, but it was either due to the device not um, holding the charge or the charger itself may have uh, the wiring is not as strong as it once was or anything like that. So we just completely changed the device just in case and gave him a new charger. All right. Now, with regards to other issues involving uh, Mr. Smith, the mental health issues, were you made aware of that by Mr. Smith or through some other means? I was aware of it uh, through another officer as well. All right. And with regards to any physical issues with Mr. Smith, did Mr. Smith ever tell you about any physical issues he had? No. no did, his, did his wife, Miss, Mrs. Smith, ever tell you about any physical issues he had? No, Judge. All right. Any other questions from either side? No, no. Uh, Ms. Valdez, when did you meet with Mr. Smith? I had seen him in the when he came in for his device inspection. But you didn't have any interviews with him. You just saw him in the getting a new device in, right? Yes, I had saw him in the, the office. All right. So you didn't sit down and have a conversation with him or interview with him or anything to that extent. Is that correct? What would you like for me to sit down and interview him about? He was coming in for a change of device and a new charger. Well, how about this meeting, your person that you're monitoring to find out a little bit about him? I did introduce myself to him when he was transferred over to my caseload. I did my job and it was over the phone. No further questions. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you so much. If you'll stay on. All right. So what what is being requested here? And so that everybody knows I'm not removing the GPS device. So what we're here for is he's been remanded without bond because he didn't appear. And from the court's perspective, it appears that the defense attorney told him not to appear. And I feel You know, when somebody receives legal advice, it's hard to hold that against them when they're following through on something their attorney told them to do. So I'm just putting that out there on the table. Anybody who wants to pick it up and discuss that. Judge, I take responsibility for that because the court will know that I came in first thing Monday morning to address this issue with the court or Tuesday. All right. So, so here's the thing. So I want to make this clear. And I want to make it clear with you, Mr. Smith. If the pretrial services officer tells you to come in to report, you got to come in to report, period. Because you're on bond for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Whether you feel you committed the offense or not, that's not what we're here about. You know, it's, it, it's a violent offense. A judge 
put you on GPS for that offense. You're on GPS. You're going to be on GPS. Do you under? No, I want you to internalize what I'm saying. That's Do you understand? I understand. That. All right. So you're going to be on GPS. All right. The other thing is everybody is trying to do their job. Sometimes you will have a pretrial services officer who's, eh, I don't want to say touchy feely, but that's what I'm going to say. Touchy feely. How are you doing? Is everything okay with you? Is there anything you need? Anything I can do for you to make this, you know, being on GPS easier? All right. But then there are some officers who are like, hey, guess what? You're supposed to be here at this time. That's when you're supposed to be here, period. Some officers are, no, you're not stopping at the Burger King or Whataburger, even though it's on your route, because guess what? You're not approved to do that. Now, it appears to the court, and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong, from what I gather from all of the testimony is... The call center said that there was a strap tamper. The call center gave that information to Officer Valdez. Officer Valdez called you to check to see if there's a strap tamper. What I can tell you is, and we can go off the record, I've seen some officers, guess what? When there's a report from the call center that there's a strap tamper, they don't call the defendant to say, is there a strap tamper? You know what they do? They turn that right over to the judge because this is a violent offense and people need to know where you are. All right. And no, no, stop. Then the other thing. Her calling and saying, let me call you back. What I'm picking up from the table is she was calling her supervisor. Hey, they're in Eagle Pass. Um, you know, what can we do? And I'm sure nobody asked this question of her. That's for you all to ask. I'm sure she called her supervisor and said, hey, this guy's in Eagle Pass. This is what's going on. Uh, what should I do? And I'm sure her supervisor told her, hey, you had better put that in and tell him he needs to be here. Because if something happens, guess what? It's going to be on her. The rain's going to come down on her because you got this report that there was a strap tamper. And the call center will tell you. All we can do is report it. I've seen plenty of reports. All we can do is report that there may be a tamper. That's what they do. And as far as your attorney saying, well, why did you by bypass the presiding judge of this case, which is me? You know why I get bypassed? Because I'm not working 24-7. Nobody here is working 24-7. So when court shuts down at 5, now sometimes I'm here till 5.30, sometimes 6. Actually, but when court, stop. When court shuts down, guess what? These go to magistrates, magistrates who've been appointed by the district judges and they're there 24 seven. And when I say they're there in 24 seven, they have shifts, but you know, it's eight hour shifts. And then you have uh, the part-time magistrates who are in between, but those are magistrates that are appointed by the district court judges. So the magistrate who signed this and did a remand without bond, that's a magistrate that was appointed by the district court judges. And guess what they see? They see that there's a strap tamper and you don't come in for them to make sure that there's not a tamper. And they don't do this, let me do it by video and let me do it by FaceTime. They don't do that and they're not required to do that. So what I am seeing is, I don't think there is a official oppression by Officer Valadez, what I think is happening is she not giving the touchy feels. She's saying, this is what you have to do, then you have to do it. That's what GPS is about. I don't know why sometimes people think GPS, being on probation, it's supposed to be touchy feels. It's not. When somebody wants you to do something, you got to do it. If this case hasn't been indicted yet, if your attorney wants to file a motion for an examining trial, he's more than welcome to do that. But guess what? While you're in this court, you're going to be on GPS. I can't tell you to ignore your attorney's device, but I am telling you that when pretrial services officer wants you to report, you need to report. She gave you enough time from Eagle Pass, and I realized it was the Memorial Day weekend, but by 8 p.m., everybody is where they were supposed to be. So that's where we are. And I, you probably shouldn't say anything else because sometimes people talk themselves out of the jail. 
I'm sorry, talk themselves into the jail or into prison. So state, we're back on the record, state, defense, state, what are you requesting? State's just requested that he follows the GPS, one, the officer Valdez or any assigned officer, and that if there's a tamper, he comes in and he follows the rules uh, that he signed up for, Judge. Uh, at this point, we're not asking for him to be incarcerated. All right. And I would take that same position, Judge. All right. So here's the thing. Uh, I don't work 24 seven. Everybody needs a vacation once in a while. As my mother would say, her mother, my grandmother told her not made of iron. So I can't be working 24 hours a day. Otherwise, Deputy Laura, Deputy Mejia will say I, I started to get cranky. I, I don't see it or hangry. I don't see it. <laughs> so what we're going to do is then I'll recall the warrant and I'm telling you, and I want you to hear me clearly. When Officer Valadez tells you, you need to come in, you need to come in. You understand? Sure. And we're off the record. And here's the thing. People don't have to be touchy feely. They don't. I wasn't necessarily asking for that. Well, here's the thing. People don't have to be nice when they're talking to you. I would appreciate it if everybody could be nice. But guess what? If somebody doesn't want to say, hey, how's your day going? If Officer Valadez just want to say, hey, you need to be here at 8 p.m. We got a strap tamper. There doesn't have to be, how's your day going? Uh, do you need this? Do you need that? That's, that's really not her job. And I ask questions. And the reason why I ask questions is because I'm trying to figure out what can be done for people to be successful in their life, be successful on probation. So her job is eh, sort of slightly different from mine. So there you go. Uh, Officer Valadez, do you need him to report today? Yes, Judge. I still need that device inspection done. All right. So you need to get the device inspection done today. You're already in San Antonio. Uh, what time do you want him there? Whenever he's done in court, he can go straight to pretrial service and I can inform the technician. All right. So he's going to be leaving from the courtroom and he's going straight to uh, wherever he needs to go. Do you know where you need to go? Down by the front of jail, I believe. It's the same place I used to go when I'm there. All right. Is that where he needs to go, Officer Valadez? Yes, Judge. 222 South Kamal is two blocks down from the jail. All right. Is there anything else? Nothing from the state, Your Honor. Nothing from the defense. I was, I was just, this happened. I believe it's because of where I live. The, no, here's I live the thing. In the middle of nowhere. I understand what you're saying. This, this but, happens but a few you, times a week. Here's the thing. I understand what you're saying, but you need to understand what I'm saying. One, I have no control over the communication issues to Eagle Pass and the calling center. Two, that device is not getting removed. No, no. I, so, I, I mean, I, there's... Nothing was done intentionally to like, try to take it all. Just three right. four times a week. They're calling. Thank you so much for coming in, Officer Valadez. All right. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yes. I don't know if you want to put that in the comments. Yes, I will. Thank you. All right. Uh, here. So Saul Goodman found us an interesting one again. Not that Saul Goodman. So, um, I don't remember his name. Fred has a big jacked up truck. Well, it might not be jacked up, but it's a big diesel truck. And he totally could have worked on it himself. But, you know, he's got too much going on. So he took it to the mechanic, Bob. So Bob gets to fixing it. And, you know, there's more wrong with it than there should have been. So he fixes everything. And... Fred doesn't think it should have cost as much as Bob charged him for it. And instead of, you know, working it out and talking like normal adults, Fred just goes and takes the truck. So Bob comes in and is like, okay, well, he just took the truck and didn't pay me for it. So he calls the cops. Now we're in court. 
Fred says he didn't authorize that additional work and he didn't want those Napa batteries. But Bob says, couldn't got the truck off the lot without it, couldn't do the work without it, couldn't even get it in the garage without it because it wouldn't start. Oh, it's a weird one. I love Kansas. Good morning. Do we have everyone here that we expect to have? I think we've got everybody. Yeah, looks like it, John. Right. Yeah, everybody here. Mr. Hunter's with me, and he's, this is him right here. He may blur in and out sometimes depending on how close to the screen he is. Okay. Well, let's go on the record then, Missy. We are on the record in the 13th Judicial District, the District Court of Greenwood County, Kansas, case number 2023 LM81, Cliff's Gas and Diesel Repair Service versus Scott Hunter. Please announce appearances. Your Honor, the plaintiff appears in, uh, via Zoom with counsel for leading. Your Honor, may it please the court, William McClendon, uh, repairs for the respondent with uh, Scott Hunter. We were last here in this case. Oh, my notes aren't in my file. Uh, we were last here. I could. Um... Your Honor, actually, we have this was a case. If I don't mind, I think I could get the court caught up. Um, we actually have not conducted a formal hearing in this matter. We did have a an answer date set. Unfortunately, this is one of those cases that was filed, I believe, just immediately prior to the whole for, uh, Odyssey system going offline. And it was a little difficult to figure out who had been served. By the time we came to that uh, answer date, uh, there weren't any appearances by the defendant on that date, I'd inquired, but I also couldn't see the returns of service because of everything being down. I inquired of the sheriff because it had gone out of county for service, and there was quite honestly some miscommunication between himself and I. I thought when he'd indicated it had gone out for service and had been returned, but that implied that it had been served. Uh, but I have confirmed with Sheriff Walker that uh, their dispatch has searched and that yes, that in fact, it was not served. It was returned unserved, which is why um, Mr. McClendon filed his motion. So at this point in time, your honor, we, we consent to the motion. We acknowledge that that's the appropriate thing to do because the return was unserved. Um, so we have no objection to the court granting that motion. And at this point in time, um, I'd be requesting that we treat this as a status conference and establish some deadlines and dates moving forward. And I'll let Mr. McClendon add in anything he'd like to, or I'll turn it over to him. Not, not like I get to permit him to do something here. Good grief. Well, with the, with uh, the default, we had a default judgment believing that service had been uh, granted. And then now we have this motion to set aside that default judgment filed by Mr. McClendon on the grounds that there was no legal service. Basically, Mr. McClendon, that's your position? Yes, it is, Your Honor. All right. Well, I will uh, grant the motion to set aside the default judgment, which will take us back to the original petition filed back September. And then, Mr. McClendon, have you, you and your client received a copy of that petition now? Uh, I, I do have a copy of it. Uh, I will need some time to get an answer on file, though. All right. The petition alleges that your client, Mr. McClendon, owes $7,876.41. And you'd like some time to file a response how much time would you like? Oh, uh, would 21 days be appropriate? I was thinking 30 days. Mr. Dean, do you have a thought? It's a pretty short answer to file. I would say 21 is good, Your Honor. Okay. Missy, do you have something in 21 days? Well, Your Honor, actually, what I'd ask is that if it's acceptable to court, Mr. McClendon, that we just have a a date for the answer to be filed 
I would like to have a, a pre a, and just go ahead and set a pretrial date and a trial date. And hopefully in between that, uh, maybe the parties can come to an agreement. And if not, we've kind of got everything mapped out. Um, and a witness and ex, uh, witness and exhibit list, which I think is already required by statute, giving us a limited action for that information to be exchanged. But if we just go ahead and get some agreeable dates, I think would be, that'd be my recommendation as to how to proceed. Mr. McClendon, is, is that agreeable to you, that proposed procedure? It is. If we, if we go that route, we do 30 just for the extra, for the sake of time and compi compiling all that. All right. Uh, Missy, what uh, for pre-trial around 30 days? As he just mentioned, this case was filed right before the court's online system was hacked and crashed. It took him like six to eight months, maybe even longer to get it back online. The Court of Appeals still isn't online, I don't think. This is the system for the entire state of Kansas, like Supreme Court all the way down. One of the problems they encountered was the inability to confirm service. When the claim was filed and the respondent didn't file an answer in the prescribed time frame, a default judgment was entered because that's standard procedure. Obviously, he wasn't happy with this, and so he got an attorney to set it aside to take it to court because he never actually knew about it. They were able to confirm that he was never actually served, so he, they have to set it back so that he has a chance to actually answer because it was their fault. The taking down of the online system caused so much damage and so much hardship for the people involved. It really makes you wonder why someone would do something like that. So after this point, the hearing went on for 20 additional minutes, all scheduling talk. Nobody could agree on a date and nobody was available on the same date. So we're going to jump ahead to the May trial date. morning. We are on the record in the 13th Judicial District, the District Court of Greenwood County, Kansas. Cliffs GDR Inc. versus Scott Hunter. Please announce appearances. Your Honor, Cliffs GDR Inc. Uh, appears through its principal, Cliff, uh, Cliff Strickler, with Counsel Paul Eating. All by Zoom. Okay. Will it, Willie McClendon for the defendant in this matter, Scott Hunter, who appears with counsel. Very well, thank you. Now we had a pre-trial a while back and uh, gave opportunity to try to see if there was any resolution short of trial. Were we successful on that, uh, Mr. Lee? Unfortunately, no, Your Honor. This is just, sometimes you just have a case that uh, has to be submitted to the court for a decision. Uh, fortunately, I think it will be fairly, fairly quick presentation. It's not an overly complicated fact scenario. All right, and Missy, did I leave some papers out there? relevant to this maybe uh no is it in that stack that i put on your desk a little oh, bit ago? thank you it is all right so are there uh and mr mcclendon you're in agreement with those comments yes your honor all right are there any opening statements I, your honor i'd waive opening statements i the court i don't know that the court really needs them for basically an auto repair dispute okay Mr. McClendon. I'll wave as well. I'll wave as well, Your Honor. Very well. Mr. Dean, you may call your first witness. Your Honor, I'd call Scott Hunter. Where is Mr. Hunter? I am not seeing him. He's off to Mr. McClendon's oh, side. Oh, he's Mr. McClendon. Your Honor, my client is actually sitting next to me, but there we go. The way we're kind of configured here, it's easier. When he testifies, I'll turn the I'll turn the, the screen to him and you won't see me. So Very well. so Mr. Um, Hunter, are you ready, Mr. Dean? Yes. Okay. Please raise your right hand, sir. Mr. Hunter, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Please proceed, Mr. Dean. Your Honor, uh, Your Honor. Excuse me, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Hunter, would you please state your full name for the record? 
Scott Hunter. And Mr. Hunter, can you uh, tell me uh, how it is that you came to take your vehicle to Cliff's GDR Inc. for repair? Me yeah, and several people that we come in contact said he worked on diesel pickups, diesel engines. And there's not that many of them close in the country. So we went and spoke to him about working on this one. Okay. And you, so do you recall when it is you first made contact with Mr. Strickler? I think back in May of 2023. And what issues were you having with your vehicle at that time? It was missing out on one cylinder. And did you, so based upon that, you took, you took your vehicle to Mr. Strickler, asked if he could repair it. Yes. Yeah. What other discussions, if any, did you have with Mr. Strickler about the work that needed to be done on the vehicle? That I needed to have this, this mess, uh, identified and we need to fix the mess. I wanted to keep the amount we spent down on that one because we were getting ready to sell it. It was a high mileage pickup and we were going to get ready to sell it. So I didn't want to completely redo the, the engine. I just wanted to miss that care of. Are you a mechanic? My trade? No. Do you do diesel do engine? I work engines? Yes. I've do repaired my own since I was in high school. Do you repair this type of engine? Diesels? Yes. You just didn't want to do the work on this one? I didn't have the time, and not only that, nowadays, too many of the, the wrenches and tools are metric. I don't have the metric set that it takes to work on some of this newer stuff, and it's easier for me to, to hire someone that does do it to do this and not only that we've been in a drought so i was running seven days a week on a, on a bulldozer i didn't have time to work on things all right very good and so you take it in you talk to to cliff about getting it fixed and you told him you wanted to keep costs down and anything else not that i know of did you tell him you were getting ready to sell it? Yes. It's easier to sell a vehicle that runs properly, correct? Well, it needs to hit on all the cylinders, yes. And so after you left your, so did you leave your vehicle there that day that you, you took it in? Yes. And the day I left it, he said that he had given me a, a day to bring it up on. And the day that I took it in and left it, he said that he was running behind and was going to be a little longer before he could work on it. I said, that is fine. That's not a problem. Okay. And you know when that up. was? It's not a unit that I was working every day. Sorry, sir. No, you're fine. And my apologies for cutting in before you were finished. Uh, do you recall what day that was when you took it in? It was back in May. That's all I can tell you now. And just for clarity's sake. You said you had this conversation. So the conversation you had about the repair work to be done on the vehicle uh, was on a different day than the day you brought the vehicle in? No. Okay. No, so that was all on one day. Yeah. I spoke with, with Cliff and told him what we needed done because I knew he had a yard full of, of vehicles there. And he told me then what day to bring it up. And when I took it up, yeah, we talked about what I wanted to do to it uh, when he agreed to work on it. And when I delivered the pickup on that on that day, he told me it's when he said he was running way behind, and he was. He had a lot of stuff there. And what is it that uh, Mr. Strickler told you that day uh, when you advised him about this repair work that you wanted done? He agreed to to do it, I guess. I mean, I don't know 
Well, I'm just asking if you. I mean, yeah, you well, were, I'm trying to think what else there might be. We discussed the the vehicle, and he said straight away that well, he's quite sure it was an injector, and that I also, I mean, I agreed with. Uh, there was nothing about any in depth work that was going to be done on it. There was no in depth conversation about work to be done, other than it appeared there was an injector issue. Oh, just the injector issue and the fact that I didn't want to spend uh, a lot of money on it because we were going to get rid of it. It was high mileage, and I didn't want to have more in a repair bill than what you get out of it. You would agree with me, sir. I, uh, not wanting to spend a lot of money on a on a diesel engine repair, somewhat of a subjective view, correct? It's what subjective. We discussed the amount of money. What said fifteen hundred dollars or so that would get us get us up and going. That's your claim, correct? Yes, that's my claim. So, when uh, what was your anticipation after you left the vehicle and had this discussion with him? My anticipation was when he got time to get it in, he would get it fixed. He would put an injector in it, and uh, it would run when we were done. All right. So, you weren't expecting any other contact other than to say, hey, your vehicle's done and ready to go? I was. I was expecting him after he diagnosed the problem to let me know what it looked like we were going to spend. It's a little bit different than what you just said, but fair enough. So when is it that you finally heard back from Mr. Strickler that the vehicle was ready to go? Uh, a letter out with it wasn't a bill it was an estimate but the first thing i knew for sure was on the 19th day of july and he had sent a text a couple days before i could not read it and i said send me a hard copy because we definitely have a discrepancy here because i could see he was wanting to spend a lot of money on it Sorry, you were breaking up a little bit there. Did you say he sent you a text with what you thought was an estimate? Yes. The reason I thought it was is because it said on it, it was an estimate. Hmm. Okay. And do you recall, Mr. Uh, You called uh, Mr. Strickler trying to call you on multiple occasions and leaving you messages. He sent that text and he sent him. He did call one time and said he was going to be out of the shop for a week. He'd had a new grandchild, family member, something, and he was going to be gone. Okay, sir, do you have a uh, plaintiff's exhibit number two close by? I've got a good call. We did. did you get these in? We you got those emails, right, Mr. McClendon? Yep. All right, so I'm showing you what I've got marked as plans to exhibit number two. I guess if you don't have them there with you, I'm just going to hold. Excuse me, Mr. Dean, did you by chance send those to Missy or file those in the file? Yeah, we, Judge, we emailed them to you. We emailed them to Mr. McClendon. I was under the anticipation that everybody would simply print their exhibits so everybody had them in hand, but if that's not well, the case. If, I'll do if it Missy or I have them, she might be able to just screenshot those for you. Missy, do you have those or did he send them directly to me? I do have them. You do have them? Yes. All right. So, Mr. Dean, you're wanting to uh, present exhibit plaintiff's exhibit two? Well, I'll, I thought it would be helpful for him to have it in hand. I wasn't intended on oh, okay. introducing it didn't... through him. Okay. Um, well, it's whatever you want to do. I certainly don't want to interfere with your presentation. I, today. No, I'll just ask. I'll just go through it in this fashion. Mr. Hunter, uh, would you agree that on uh, May 17th um, at 1035, 
that Mr. Hunter, or excuse me, that Mr. Strickler tried to call you and left you a message? My phone doesn't show that I ever got that. Now, there is one thing, Mr. Dean. Do you have your phone with you? Right here. There is one thing that I would say, and that is when we're cleaning ponds, building ponds, we're in, if we're in an area where the service is poor anyway, which out in the hills in this country, you do have that from time to time. If we're down in the bottom of that pond coming out, we won't register a call. Not so even from my wife, even. and that really is something to worry about. It won't ever show up even once you get back into a, uh, an area where you have service that you missed a call. Not if it didn't ring. Not if it wasn't something that would cause the phone to ring. What? No, it won't. Out of curiosity, sir, what type of phone do you have? It's a Motorola. And it's and we'll, my service. Your ser Verizon. Verizon service. Very good. Now on... Uh, you, would you agree that um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Strickler tried to call you on May 23rd at 8.20 a.m.? I always thought Kansas was flat and that there were like, that's why there's so many tornadoes there, right? That's why Dorothy got her wild ride. That's not true. Kansas' highest mountain is Mount Sunflower, whose peak is 4,039 feet above sea level. But the lowest point is 679 feet above sea level. At the Verdigris River, Kansas is a prairie state whose elevation rises gradually from the Mississippi River Valley in the east to the high plains in the west. The fertile plains of eastern Kansas are quite hilly. Hilly is a cool word. It's hilly. I live in a hilly place. No, I don't. I live in a flat place below sea level that won't even exist in a couple of years. Missy, if you're able to print those out, that would, you can bring those in if you have time. Sorry, Your Honor, my intent was to have the send them to the county attorney's office, have them print them and hand them to you. So you had a hard copy already, but um, fortunately, some of the hearings I had decided they wanted more time, more of my time yesterday than what I yes, thought. Yes, we had that problem. That's right, this morning, five-minute yes. hearing, but it took 55 minutes to get it called to be heard. Um, Mr. Strickler, did you have a chance to look there? May 23rd, 2023. Okay, what are we going to go back to May? Oh, that's Sorry. There we go. Mr. McClendon, is he going through his uh, it, phone it calls? Off. Yes, Your Honor. It cuts off. And it, so we have nothing. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. McClendon. I'm not hearing you here. It, his phone records on a personal device cut off after April. I, so we have I'm still not up. hearing you. I think you're trying to share microphones. It's not picking you up. Okay. This phone records right here and nothing goes. Can you not hear me? No, you're chopping in and up, in and out, and and there it seemed to get a little better. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, that's great, baby. Go ahead. So, uh, looking at his phone records, there's nothing past April of this year. Okay, so. Uh, Mr. Hunter, let me ask it to you in this fashion. Do you recall having a, a phone call from Mr. Strickler in May where he informed you that the injectors were bad and recommended replacing? Mr. Strickler and, called me and informed me that the number one injector was hung open and it needed replaced. And he said also that number five he thought maybe it was a little weak, and that was it. Did he talk to you about the pass-through harness as well at that time? No. And 
Do you recall receiving a phone call from him on June 13th, 2023? Unless that's the call that he made saying he was going to be out of the office, something about family matter, he had a new grandchild or something. Uh, because I, I don't know what it is. Uh, I can't tell you when that many calls come in the summertime. There's a lot of calls come in every day. When's the next time you were able to talk to him? Maybe it's an easier way to ask this. When's the next time you actually remember being able to speak with Mr. Strickler on the phone after you left the vehicle there and he said he would get to it as, you know, as soon as he could, but it was going to be a while because he was backed up. I'm assuming that would be in in June, and that was in person. Okay, June, and it was in person, so you were at his shop? I spoke to him a minute about how he's getting along with it at the same time I was getting fuel. At that time, I got fuel from East Side every day. Okay. My apologies. I, I don't know when you get fuel or what, what you do on a daily basis. So, uh, at that point in time, though, the vehicle wasn't done, correct? Yes. So, when's the next time you spoke to him? What was that conversation about? The next time that I spoke with him is when he said it was done, and he texted me uh, a copy of an estimate, and it says it is just an estimate. He did tell me that, and I said, well, send a hard copy or something because I cannot read it, and I sure can't print it or enlarge it where I can read it. All right. So on June, uh, do, you, do, you have a, do you show a text from him on June 13th saying that your truck is done? On what date, sir? June 13th, 2023. I don't have, yeah, but I don't have anything in the 13th. Yes, Paul. Yeah, well, I thought you were talking about a phone call. Yeah, I've got a text on June thirteenth that says your truck is done, and yes, we did speak after that because that is when uh, I told him first that he needed to send me a hard copy so I could read it, and then on seven eighteen, I hadn't got anything, so I sent him well, another text. Hold on. He, he sent you a picture of a bill. You're calling it an estimate on July 7th, correct? Yes, sir. It says it's an estimate, sir. And that's July 7th? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. And then on July, now, you would agree with me at this point in time, you knew since June 13th your truck was done. No, I knew that he had sent an estimate out for what he needed or wanted to spend on it. All right, let's just back right back up then again. Right above that text on June 13th, did you not just say you received a text saying your truck was done? Yes, I did. And then almost a month later on July 7th, you received a, a text that you're saying was an estimate for the work to be done on the truck that had already been completed, correct? We had had a phone call was there, and when I told him to send send down this information, uh, I'm not. And what he sent was an estimate. Right on the phone call, but you had a text on July seventh as well that was an estimate, as you say, that you couldn't read. Correct? Yes, and it wasn't the full page, sir. It was only part of a page. And then you waited until july 18th to respond back said replied uh could not read in regards to the to the picture of the bill or the estimate excuse me i would have spoken with him at his place of business send a hard bill a um, hard bill in writing send it to my address but I'm, I'm going to ask this question again. I'm, I didn't ask you about a phone call at this point in time. I asked you, you re replied 11 days later to the text of the uh, estimate 
on July 18th at telling Mr. Strickler that you couldn't read it. Yes. Yes, that's in writing. That's provable. And then in... Then what do you show as your next text with Mr. Strickler? I'm sorry, gentlemen. So June 13th was the text. Truck is done. The truck is done. And then there was there a text July 7th? July 7th was a picture of what we refer to as a bill and Mr. Hunter refers to as an estimate. Was that the day he said he... He said, send me a hard copy, or was July 18th, or was that message on both days? Um, on July 18th, I believe he just agreed that he sent a text saying could not read. Okay. And that was the first time he sent that particular text. Is that, is that the test? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. And your owner, maybe it'll just be... Uh, I just wanted to make sure I had this right because I thought I heard him say that that he sent that on the July seventh, and then I heard July eighteenth. So I just needed to clarify. Um, what said. Your Honor, I could actually uh, send screenshots. That's sir, okay. I take it you, yeah, yeah, I sir, I take it you have your phone right there in front of you. Would you agree your phone's going to show on June thirteenth? Your truck's done. Yes, and then on. Uh, July 7th, an actual photo of the bill that you say estimate. Would you agree that it says right on it, sir, that this is an estimate? Yeah, there's, there's terminology that says estimate on it. Would you further agree with me that that's only half well, a page? Oh, wait showing? a minute. Wait a minute. This is, this is <laughs> Mr. Dean's <laughs> questioning, sir. We... You and your attorney will have a chance to um, present your case. Go ahead, Mr. Dean. Thank you, Your Honor. I was kind of enjoying some of the questions. So, would you agree with me at the bottom? It says balance due. Yes, yeah. it does. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And then, would you agree after that, you did send 11 days later a text saying, can't read it. Uh, please send me a hard copy. And then. Mr. Strickler replied right back to you and said, where would you like the invoice sent? And then you replied back the next day to that address, correct? Yep. And that would have been on July 19th. That was the last text message you had. The last one I have showing on my phone. So, when did you receive the hard copy of the bill? It shows on the 19th day of July. It was postmarked in Wichita. We received it. For some reason, the mail was up and running pretty good. We received it on the 21st. Okay. So, I'm going to show you what's been marked as plaintiff's exhibit number one and i do have the hard copy of that now missy printed that and gave it to me and sir this is is that does that look like a the, an accurate reflection of the bill that you received or the estimate that you received as you like to call it move it over a little bit where i can see the full <laughs> again if you can screenshot that if you want counsel is this the one yes, she can put it on the screen if that i think he's got a copy of it there okay. in front of i've got it i've got it mirrored here um with all you right. guys. i have a copy too so go ahead please all right so it says cliff's gas the diesel repair at the top I and mean, at the very bottom it has a balance due seven thousand eight seventy six forty one Okay, that's not an exact copy of what I received. Your your what's what's the bill that show due on yours? Because yours this is actually August tenth, an additional bill print out. Uh, yours you said was July nineteenth. Yep. And what's the July nineteenth bill so that was due? Six thousand five hundred and sixty-two dollars and twenty cents. 
$6,572.26. 65, 62, 20. Gotcha. Okay. And on your bill, did it show fuel injector, uh, excuse me, fuel injector, actual FMG OEM new unit price 693.74 on the top line? Yes, it does. For a total of 4162.44. It shows that, yes. And the next item, valve cover gasket set $92.02. Yes. And the next set, injection pass through harness $194.65. Yes. For a total of 583.95 on that part. Yes, it is. Battery, Napa Legend Professional, uh, 19208. Yes, it does. For a total of 384.16. Correct? Yes. And then uh, basically a core, core uh, is the next one, $18 on each for a total of 36. Yes. And then a credit for that as well. Correct? Yes. A new starter, $278.30. Yes. Starter assembly, remove and replace for $142.50. Yes. Oh, but I skipped over a line up top, uh, the third entry down on the far right hand column, fuel injector, remove and replace $332.50. Yes. And then what does, does your uh, bill have a storage fee? No. MK on it? No storage no, fee. Not. Does your bill have any type of a, a late fee or probably what's actually just an interest calculation on it? No, this, this bill that we're reading off of from 7, 7 to 23 does not have that. Okay. So it's got labor in the amount of $1,675.20, correct, total? Go right down. No, my bill does not have that. What's your bill have then? Uh, if you pull that screenshot up again, we can look at it together, sir. I, I don't have the screenshot. Oh. Does it take you more than a minute to put that up? Oh, actually. Which exhibit is it? Exhibit plaintiff's exhibit one. Sorry. Labor four seventy five. Parts five thousand yes. four ninety seven eighty seven. Correct. That is what my bill shows, Mr. Dean. Yes. And Eureka sales tax nine and a half percent for five sixty nine thirty three. Yes. Total six thousand five sixty two twenty. Mr. Dean, I am not. That's not adding up with Exhibit One. Are you reading from a different? Exhibit. I'm reading from the one he has in his possession, Your Honor. And All I think right. the difference is that so missing the, the storage, Your Honor, that was added in later, but we'll 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 deal with that when we go to admit exhibit one through my clients. So are we on exhibit one or a different exhibit? Did we switch? I'm referencing so this is the testimony that he's giving regarding the and actually uh, I am going to. He said he received a bill on 719, the hard copy. Is that what you're referencing? Correct. This is the bill he received in July. Okay. After uh, Mr. Hunter asked Mr. Strickler to send him a hard copy because he couldn't read it from the text. Okay. I will go ahead and have this. I'm forwarding this particular one to myself. 
and Mr. Strickler's phone. I, I don't know if unless they want to, they've got that marked as a defense exhibit. We could always use that, but I'll go ahead and get that exhibit printed as well, Your Honor, and mark it since that's what's been referenced as it was too small. Um, all right. So, Mr. Strickler, or excuse me, Mr. Hunter. So, you got you were notified July 13th that the truck was done um and apparently you didn't have any contact with him until he sent you a bill a picture of the bill on july 7th i had contact with him in which i told him to send me a hard yeah, that, copy because there are discrepancies we, we we went over that that occurred on july 18th so you have yes. a record indicating sometime between June 13th and July 7th that you had some kind of contact with Mr. Strickler? It was about the bill sent in the hard copy. On what date? I'm not going to try to tell you exactly what it was because it was an in-person thing. I said, send me a bill out. Okay. Sounds good. Now, Mr. Uh, Hunter, after that, would you agree with me that Mr. Strickler tried to contact you multiple times by phone uh, regarding taking care of this bill? No, he did not. I got the hard copy of the bill. And then I was able to see the rest of it. And I still do not call it a bill. I have not received a bill to this day, with the exception of the amount of money that you're trying to sue me for. Because it says very plainly that it's estimate number 3518. And so very plainly that there's a balance due on it, does it not? Yes, it does. Um, so you don't. So, despite Mr. Strickler sending you this bill clear back in early July and then sending you a hard copy again in July and having told you since June 13th that your truck was done, um, you don't believe, so you said he didn't ever try to contact you again by phone to try to get this taken care of, correct? So, no, I'm saying I didn't receive any type of message or call. No, I'm not going to say anything about someone else and and make it out to be that I'm I'm being illegal with them or I'm being improper. I'm saying that I did not receive it. So I'm saying really? that I have returned calls that I received notification of. Just got a curiosity. Were you able to receive a call from anybody in the month of July of 2023? Uh, yes. And in early August of 2023, did you get phone calls from other people then as well? I'm quite sure I did. Okay. So what's the next contact you had with Mr. Strickler in person? In person? Yeah. I haven't had one since the day that we've already spoken of. Just before I got the hard copy of the bill. And it said right on it that I needed to get the vehicle out. And I did. Now, where is that you see the language that you need to get the vehicle out? All vehicles left over 48 hours after repairs are completed will incur a $10 per day storage fee. Okay, that's not a directive for you to get the vehicle out. This is telling you how much it costs to have it there, correct? It does for fact. And so you you got your check ready and you went up to, to go get the vehicle and pay for it, correct? Just when you removed it? Nope. I sure didn't. In fact, you took a second a, a second set of keys to the vehicle, didn't contact Mr. Strickler, went in when he wasn't around and removed the vehicle, correct? He was not at his shop that day. We did get in the pickup and get it out of there. With 
with a second set of keys. Yes, I have a second set of keys to it. All right. So the, the original keys that you took on the, to, with the vehicle is still in Mr. Strickler's shop, correct? To your knowledge. Repeat that, please. The set of keys that you took with the vehicle to when you were brought it in for repair is still with Mr. Strickler. I'm assuming he's still got a set of keys that I'd like to have back. And then uh, when is, did you make, you didn't make an offer to, to pay anything until after law enforcement had contacted you about removing that vehicle that had a mechanics lien upon it, correct? No, that's not correct. Why I had a call do? from Cliff Strickler Monday morning. Uh, he was threatening in his call and told me that that needed paid before it was moved, and yet it says on his invoice that if it's not taken care of within 30 days, he's going to add to it. Standard operating procedure oftentimes is not that you pay the bill before it goes out the door or else you you uh, leave everything set and have a fight in the driveway. He knew that I had not ordered all this much work, and it was time to start working it out. Very shortly after that is when I was contacted by law enforcement and everything transpired from there. And when is it that you cut a check to Mr. Strickler for the work done? Whatever day it was that Officer Cordell spoke with me, he asked me if I thought I owed anything. I explained to him what it was and why. And I said, I'll gladly pay for the work that I've ordered done. So, and you and did after after you took the vehicle, you were contacted by law enforcement, and then you told him you were going to pay what you thought you should on the on the truck, and that was what occurred, correct? For the work that I had ordered to be done on the truck, yes. Okay, um, and that check was not accepted by Mr. Strickler, correct? I'm assuming not. It's never been presented for payment. All right, Your Honor, I don't believe I have any further questions for Mr. Hunter at this time. Very well, Mr. McClendon, cross-examination. Mr. Hunter, um, did you have any agreed upon ice? Did he get provided with any estimates at the original date in May as to how much it would cost? No. We had a discussion that it wasn't to go over $1,500 because that is plenty of money to put an injector in a truck and his labor diagnosis. Did you at any time ever tell him that you want to replace all the injectors? No. And were you clear... What did you tell him exactly when he called you saying uh, injector one and five were missing? I told him at number one, sure needed to replace. And I said, if he thought it was that big an issue to replace number five, I guess we would because he told me that they would be in the neighborhood $400 for injector. And where did you get the $400 from? That was the figure that he quoted me on the phone. So he quoted you $400 per injector on the phone? Yes. And my thought was he's going to put one and possibly two. And you talked about no other work about needing a starter or new batteries or any other type of harnesses, correct? No, the starter and the batteries were fine. The day we started up, packed it off, unloaded it for him. No, he didn't need that. So the vehicle was still in a running order when you dropped it off with him, correct? Yes, it was. This is running rough? Yes. No further questions, Your Honor. It's up to time. All right. Any redirect, Mr. Dean? Yes. Yes, Your Honor, just briefly. Uh, Mr. Hunter, do you, so your starter wasn't dragging at all at any point in time? Wasn't missing at all before yeah, you went took the vehicle in? Huh? No, it was just fine. Started to work perfect. Okay, very good. I don't even have further questions for this witness, Your Honor. All right. Uh, you may call your next witness.
I'll get that. Yes, you are. At this point in time, I would call uh, call Mr. Strickler. Very well. Mr. Strickler, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Please proceed, Mr. Dean. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, my apologies, Your Honor. I need to step over here and grab this exhibit that I just sent to the printer so that we can have those for clarity, and I'll have my assistant forward it to you as well. And, you send it to, and to Mr. McClendon. Sorry. Give me just one. Should you just send that to Missy? That'd be good. Your Honor, that's been marked as a plaintiff's exhibit 12 and been sent out to everybody. Mm -hmm. Mr. Strickler, uh, Your Honor, at this point in time, I'm again call Mr. Strickler. I can't remember whether you swore him in yet or not. I did. You're still under oath, Mr. Strickler? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Strickler, for the record, you are the owner of Cliff's Gas and Diesel or Cliff's GDR, ain't correct? Yes, I am. And how long have you been a mechanic? A little over 16 years. Went into business for myself on July 1st of 2018 and opened Cliff's GDR Inc. So you've, and you've been at that same location since 2018? Yes. Um, we're just going to go through this chronologically, but no, it's going to make it easier. We'll just go through exhibit number one. Did you look look at that and tell me what that is? That is the actual bill. The way my I'm a Napa Auto Care Center, so they have my whole computer set up. So the only way that I can do billing is through this as an estimate, and I can't invoice it and send out invoices until it's actually paid. If I sit, if I if I authorize it as an invoice, it's saying that it's already paid, and then I have to pay the taxes on that afterwards. There are instances where I do have to carry people, or I, I don't have to, but I choose to carry people on bills, so I don't invoice them until they're paid in full. That way I don't pay the taxes. I've, I've carried stuff up to two or three months, that way I'm not paying taxes on something I haven't been paid for yet. So when you say you're a, a, a NAP Auto Care Center, uh, Repair Center, is that some type of agreement that you've entered into with NAPA? Yes, it is. And as part of that agreement, uh, what is it that NAPA provides to you? So I get discounted prices on parts. They, they set up my computer system to where I'm directly attached to their computer system to where I can order parts directly from them. I also, they also have my Mitchell account, which goes through them, which gives the estimates on the labor and everything else. Anything that has to do with computer and billing and parts ordering goes through Napa. So who sets the price on your on this one that we're going to refer to as an estimate, but is actually a bill? Who sets the price for those items on that document? Napa Napa has a matrix that all the bills I I pull the bill or I pull the part directly from them and add it to the estimate. When it adds it to the estimate, it automatically ups the price to what I'm supposed to charge for that price for that part. That is my profit margin from my my actual cost to the build cost. So that's and that's basic, but that's a, all established by Napa. In other words, they're marketing their parts at the prices that they are wanting, but th that they're establishing. Yes. Um, much, I guess, kind of a similar analysis would be a, a car manufacturer. They set their price at the end of the day, and they've got their markups on their on their various components of the vehicle that they manufactured, correct? Yes. But Napa sets the price on their parts, and, and GM sets the price on their vehicles, correct? Yes. In regards to labor, is that something that you establish, or you agree to basically work at the at the NAP, what Napa says you should be charging for that work? So the labor itself comes through a Mitchell account, which is also tied 
to my Napa Auto Care Center. So when I go in and I type in that we're replacing the injectors, it automatically brings up the number and then I click on it and it automatically moves it to the estimate as well. So Napa sets and whether it takes, if it calls for three hours and it takes me six, I get paid for three. If it, if it calls for three hours and it takes me one, I get paid. I'm supposed to get paid for the three, but I generally, I don't, I don't operate that way. I generally mark that labor down. I don't, I just don't feel right charging, overcharging somebody that I didn't put in that many hours on. But you don't ever round up if you go over. No, no, I do not. I, that's home. just that the shop loses at that point. So in plaintiff's exhibit number one, is that a bill that you generate in August of 2023 is basically a follow-up invoice to, to Mr. Hunter? Yes, it is. And you sent that to him? That this, this bill I did not send to him. This is the bill after, the, after he had already come and got the truck. I, I sent the bill that I sent him, the hard copy, I sent to him and I, I highlighted the the ten dollars a day storage and the twelve thousand mile or the and the ten percent late fee. At that point, I wasn't going to charge that. I, I try not to charge that. But then, when he came and got the truck on eight five of twenty three, I didn't realize it until eight seven of twenty three that the truck was gone. And then I called and left a message saying that that's not the way I do business. That everything has to be paid for or some agreement has to be made before the vehicle is removed from my law. And Mr. Hunter, he, but so this, all of this notification. I had is, not, I had not added the storage and I had not added the late fee until the vehicle was removed from my lot without being paid with no intention of paying. So that's the difference between, uh, the, uh, billing that Mr. Hunter was speaking of that he'd received via text. Yes. Yes, it is. And then you sent him a, uh, sent him that bill that also, while this photo may not be perfect of it, would have had this information about the late fee or basically looks like a, an interest rate yes. plus the ten dollars per day. Yes, the hard copy would have that, and it was highlighted on the copy that I sent him. And I believe he indicated he received that on July nineteenth, twenty first. I believe it was marked in which on the nineteenth. And your honor, you probably should have a copy of it. This is the screenshot. Um, I do have that exhibit 12. And so, yes, uh, your honor, at, at this time, I'd move to amend plans exhibit one. Any objection to plaintiff's exhibit one being admitted? Mr. McClendon, I'm sorry, you're still muted. It said no. I could read his lips on that one. No, Your Honor. <laughs> um, no objection. Okay. And Mr. Hunter, does that, or excuse me, Mr. Strickler, does that appear to be the uh, copy of the screenshot that was taken from your phone in the text exchange between you and Mr. Uh, Mr. Hunter? Yes, it is. And I think everybody should have a copy of this by now. Move to admit plaintiffs exhibit twelve. Mr. McClendon, if you'd unmute, and they have any objection? No objection, Your Honor. There being no objection, Plaintiff 12 will be admitted as well as previously admitted Plaintiff's Exhibit 1. So while Plaintiff's Exhibit Number 12, uh, Mr. Hunter has uh, information cut off at the top and bottom because it's a, a photo, um, that's an accurate picture of the, of the billing that was sent to him the hard copy of that bill was then sent to him as he requested, correct? Yes, it, yes, it was. And that would have had the information regarding interest and storage, et cetera, uh, as indicated on the bottom of plaintiff's exhibit one, because it was a full copy. Yes. Now, did you keep any type of a log as to your attempts to contact and speak with Miss Hunter? Miss Miss Hunter, good grief. Excuse me, everybody. Mr. Hunter. During this time period of when you first received the vehicle, yes, I did. And can you tell me what the plaintiff's exhibit number two is? That is the the phone either calls or text messages when I attempted to to contact Mr. Hunter to either let him know that his truck was done or or any kind of communication that we needed in between that. And I 
I talked to him, I think once on the phone, maybe twice, um, twice in person. How is it that you created that log? It was on my, I've since switched providers from US Cellular to Verizon, but it was on my US Cellular bill. So you just went through and, and, and pulled all the numbers for yep. the dates and times. And dates and times, yes. And then it, it says on there that it was zero, 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 or that it was like 10 seconds or 12 seconds or whatever. So on the May 23rd call, well, you, uh, you made some notes. This was actually in person, the 23rd at 8.20 a.m. Okay. Um, that's when we talked in the back parking lot. Okay, so the May 23rd is when the two of you talked regarding the injectors. Yes. And looks like you did mark two down. Is that correct? Um, informed two injectors were bad. Recommended replacing all six. Nothing was said about possibly selling the truck, and that's why I recommended all six. When we when we go in, I'm, I'm not trying to gouge anybody, and I, I didn't add any labor to that. Um, so your labor was for replacing the two injectors that yes. he had he thought was going bad. Yes. So in, in my experience, mechanicing and with injectors and everything else, especially in a high mileage vehicle, you can go in, if you have one, most generally every, every other injector in there has the same amount of miles on it as that one does. So I will, if it's two in there, especially on that one, if it's a V8, I would do it on that whole side. I would recommend all four of that side. Note. This is an inline six. I recommended all six be replaced. And then at the same time, there is a pass through harness that gets hot. And then you can also have problems with that while we're already in there. It's only going to cost you the parts. It's not going to cost you any more labor. We should replace that as well. And he agreed to that. And so I went ahead and ordered everything, got everything coming and repaired the vehicle. Then um, these other attempts. Excuse me, just a moment. Uh, so do I understand correctly that you charged him for replacing two, though you replaced six plus the harness? Yes, ma'am. We're already there, and I don't, I don't, I, do, I just don't look at it that way. It doesn't take us that much more time to go ahead, and I'd already quoted that price for the labor, so we can, we can go ahead and, and do that for the same amount. All right. Thank you. I just want to sure I understood. Yes. And that, that was in regards to labor, your honor. Yes. yes. The labor. Just the labor. Right. Yes. Right. So you also, there's, as I recall, there are notations on that, on your August billing or estimate uh, that indicate that there was uh, a battery, two batteries and a starter that were replaced. What, why, why did you do that? Uh, we went out to start the vehicle and it was completely dead so i put i had two jump packs i put a jump pack on each side <clears throat> the vehicle wouldn't start it would try to crank over but it wouldn't it didn't have enough juice to actually start it so i pulled the cables off tested the batteries one battery had a dead short in it the other battery was so so low it would not take a charge um, it was basically running off of my jump boxes to try and start the vehicle and there's just not enough power there to do so um, so at that point I can't work on it. This was before we even started working on it. I can't work on it unless it runs. So I have to put batteries in it. Um, I replaced the batteries. It does say to replace both. The other one wouldn't take a charge anyway. Uh, it says to replace both is the recommendation. So replace both batteries. When you say says to replace both, is there some type of a... Yes, when... Service manual or this yes, when I go through my Napa Auto Care Center and I put a battery on the ticket and it sees that it has to, it recommends to replace both batteries at the same time. So, and ba and it's just good practice, especially in diesels to replace them both at the same time. Uh, so replace both batteries, went to start it. It just, it, it started to turn over and then stopped. So got underneath of it. I tried to tap on the starter, which generally if it, if the, the starter locks up, sometimes you can tap on it and it will unlock and you can get it to start and get into the shop. Um, tried tapping on it, it wouldn't start. At that point, decided it needed a new starter. It was getting power to the starter. It just wasn't starting the vehicle. Uh, replace the starter and the- Hold on a second, sir. 
regards to starters to, on a vehicle of that nature, are they are they prone to sudden failures? It can happen either way. It can drag on for a little bit. Sometimes you can tap on it. Sometimes you can hit the key three or four times and it'll start. And then sometimes you just go out and it just won't start. Would you say more often than not, it tends to drag a little bit to begin with? Generally, yes. Before complete failure? Is yes. Such as that? Generally. All right. So you replace the starter. Then what do you do? Was able to start the vehicle to get it into the shop. Um, brought it into the shop. Went ahead and scanned it again. Um, uh, it was scanned that two injectors were bad. And just basically to confirm, confirm my diagnosis. Confirmed the two, went ahead and, and tested all the harnesses. All the harnesses were testing good, but with, I think it was 200, I can't remember the actual mileage on the vehicle. Um, it had, I want to say 200, and, yeah, 260 some thousand miles on it. So with the heat and cold, um, it was only a matter of time. Um, so talk to him about, We'd already talked about the pass-through harnesses and went ahead and replaced and ordered those as well. Um, I ordered those online, which took a little bit longer, but they're three times the price through Dodge. So I went ahead and ordered them online to save several hundred dollars to the customer. What would the prices of those injectors been if you'd gone with original manufacturers through Dodge? Uh, OEM would have been pushing seven to $800 my cost. That's with my discount through the Dodge. Okay. So going back to plaintiff's exhibit number two, sir, uh, outside of the in-person discussion where you said they should replace all six and you said he agreed to it. And the July 18th text said that he couldn't read the, the bill. What other contact did you have with Mr. Hunter? Zero. When you would call him um, on any of those dates listed on plaintiff's exhibit number two, whether it be June 13th, 14th, 15th, et cetera, uh, did his phone go to, go to voicemail? Yes, it would ring through and then like ring six, eight times and then go to voicemail. So each time went to voicemail, did each time you leave a message? Yes. Oh, and that's what you've also noted on your, on your sheet as well. Um, and then it looks like there was... Well, we've already gone through the self the text exchange that was self-explanatory. Um, outside of Mr. Hunter's testimony today and perhaps statements that were made following contact by law enforcement, had he ever expressed to you that he thought the bill was wrong? No. Did he call you in late July and say, hey, what's going on here? This isn't what we agreed to. No. But he showed up on August 5th and took the vehicle. Yes. You still have the keys to the vehicle? I do. They're in my safe at my shop. You know, I'd move to admit plaintiff's exhibit number two. You said two? Yes. Okay, two. Or did I already Objection. do that? Okay. Exhibit two, Mr. McClendon, you objection? Uh, I thought it was already admitted, but no objection. I think I actually did one in 12 and then yeah, and I made them. Well, we're admitted. Three is now admitted then. And so now moving to exhibit number three. Uh, can you identify that for me, sir? That is the mechanics lien sale affidavit. And in that regard, you, in, you did you reference that be, uh, that document a little bit ago to, uh, to refresh your recollection regarding some of the specifics on the vehicle and its mileage. Yes, I did. And is this something that you prepared while you still had possession of the vehicle? No, it was after it was the Monday, which would have been the seventh, eight, seven of 23. All right. And this was basically your kind of a first started attempt to uh, go through and try to get some type of lean security on yes free either, work yes either lean on the vehicle or payment for services rendered yeah i moved to make plans exhibit three objection to three mr mcclendon still muted okay. no objection 
Okay, plaintiff's exhibit three is admitted. Okay, now I'm gonna move to plaintiff's exhibit number four and five, just to save time. What are those, sir? Uh, the first one on number four is the, the new starter from Napa and the valve cover gasket from Napa. And then on number five is the batteries from Napa. So these were some of the items that, well, at least the batteries and the starter were un the unexpected. Yes. Who did that plan to exhibit four and five? Mr. McClendon, any objection to four and five submission? No objection, Your Honor. Number four, plaintiff's exhibit number four is admitted as is plaintiff's exhibit number five. Next, I'm going to hand you what's been marked as plaintiff's exhibit six and seven. Uh, exhibit six is the fuel injectors, uh, quantity of six. And exhibit seven is the intake manifold gasket. And again, those are at cost. And then Napa, as you said, basically adjusts. But well, basically, they set the price on the one yes. and the charge for the material. Uh, Your Honor, I would move to admit uh, plaintiffs seven, six and seven. Mr. McClendon, any objection to plaintiffs six and seven? Matt, Matt go on a quick board, diary, Judge. Sure, go ahead. Uh, just so we're fresh on the topic, um, Mr. Strickland, you said you were a Napa um, dealer earlier, correct? Or a yes, Napa I'm first? So, may I ask, why, why are these from O'Reilly? They say O'Reilly on the top. The, the, the injectors from Napa were unavailable for the OEM new, and they were available through O'Reilly's. I'm also an O'Reilly's first call tech, which I get the same basic things from them the only thing i the only benefit i get from the napa auto care center that i don't get from o'reilly's is i have a tow service so if they call back in and we've done something and it's failed then the auto care center would take care of towing them to the closest shop and having it repaired underneath napa's umbrella i guess you would say but o'reilly's offers the same thing okay and so when you were creating this estimate in voiceville, whatever we decide to call it. Um, whose price did you go with? Did you go with Napa's price, even though you it was, purchased I, the price I, from O'Reilly? No, I input O'Reilly's price into my Napa Auto Care Center, and then it automatically, the matrix automatically upcharges to get my profit margin. Okay. So what, what price did you or So you're saying there's an, you put, what price did you input into there? Just walk me through it. So you inputted O'Reilly's price in there. What yes. price did you put in there? For the we'll just go with the injectors. For a 128. And then yes. it came back with an amount of $693 as your upcharge. Or about. Yes, 693.74. So is it is it standard to upcharge by um, fifty to one hundred percent on most of these parts as seen here? That is that is a question for Napa. I don't I don't have anything to do with the matrix. Um, that is that is something that is built into my computer system. That all I do is enter the part number, and then it automatically does everything else. I'll reserve my other questions on the matter for. Um, cross exam, Your Honor. All right, thank you. But no objection to it being admitted. Okay, uh, plaintiffs exhibit six and seven both are admitted. Plaintiffs exhibit eight and nine, Mr. Strickler, do you recognize those documents? Can you identify them? Yes, I do. That is for the pass through harnesses um, that I got online. For the injectors oh. and then one of those is a refund because they something happened and i couldn't I, it didn't show up or something and i had to get a refund on it so that was an original dodge uh 
yes. OEM part. That is an OEM part that I got online, not directly from Dodge. Those coming from Dodge would have been $400 per harness. All right. Then moving to plaintiff's exhibit. Uh, just a moment. Okay. So you ordered those, you didn't get them, and so you got a refund? No, no. I ordered them. Um, there's, there's two. There's exhibit eight and exhibit nine. Um, I only needed, I only have needed six. Um, I ordered and I couldn't get, I think they only had maybe four or five available and I ordered six. So they sent me a refund on the one that they didn't have. And then I had to order the one from a different supplier online. Okay. Thank you. What if I didn't do so earlier, your honor moved to admit eight and nine. Any objection, Mr. McClendon, to eight and nine being admitted? Just another quick war dire to figure out where these even came from. Very well. Uh, uh, Mr. Strickland, where, where is this a screenshot of? I mean, I can see we have an injector harness on there, but I have an email showing, frankly, uh, some foreign country, probably Chinese arts. Uh, I don't. I, um, I guess I don't understand your question. So, where where is this a screenshot from? It's from my. It's a uh, screenshot from, or it's a scan. No, screenshot from my computer. And what website were you on at the time? I couldn't tell you. It's been over a year ago. So the. So this could be just some random part off the internet, not necessarily an OEM part. No, it says right on it that it's a Cummins Dodge OEM part for a 0305 injector wiring harness. Uh, which page are you looking at? Because I don't uh, see anything. Number I see nine, one that says OEM. I see one that says OEM. Number nine. Okay, on Planets Exhibit 8, there's nothing on there that says OEM, correct? No, I don't see anything that says OEM. And you would agree with me that at the top of the page there's an email there that or a forgive my pronunciation but Zai Tong parts yeah that uh, sounds Chinese yeah and uh, on the next one is Ho Diesel on the exhi exhibit 9 yeah okay so you, you don't remember where you got these parts from, though? Yeah, it says right there on the sheet. It was an online but part. It was just some someplace online is what you're telling me? Yes, an OEM part online, yes. Otherwise, they it would have been all, 400 they weren't some all. odd dollars for per, which would have been another $2,400 onto it. But that's that's my cost from Dodge. So it would have been upcharged from that as well. So it had been over $2,400 just for the past three harnesses. When I got the same thing online that came in an OEM box for a fraction of the cost. And did you go through the same process of putting in these prices in for your upcharge calculator from Napa? No. No. So you, what did you charge him? The pass-through harnesses were $192.08. Per and I did so. There was past three hundred one ninety four sixty five. Sorry. Okay, for a total of three thirty two. For a total of five eighty three ninety five. So there are three of them. Where I and I'm just trying to clarify here to the you know because the, there there's questions regarding authenticity of this, Your Honor. I believe of what these invoices are even referring to at this point. Well, I, 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 I mean, yeah, they're, they're parts that he purchased, but I'm just trying to draw the line here because where does he come up with the $500? Because I see no quantity purchased on either of these. No, I think I'm playing as exhibit one under item info. My copy says three pieces. Three nine six six eight zero five fuel injector wiring harness 
for 03-045.9 L Dodge, $336. Does yours show that, counsel? It shows for $336, but he did just state that he didn't provide any upcharge service on this. Okay, but I and thought so, it didn't say how many how many uh, pieces, and it says three harnesses. It's the way I read three pieces. Right, correct, correct. Sorry, uh, sorry, I didn't break it right. Okay, and then on plank, it is six, yeah. seven, nine. Uh, Check your 194.65. I'm seeing, uh, I can't These quite, the there's a, board, there's a smear. That yes. But it looks like. Six minus six, five, seven, plus six, nine. All right. Okay. So someone was talking. Uh, I think I uh, did. Did you have some other question than that, or did I misunderstand the question? I mean, it looks to me like it shows the the quantity out. But if you want to restate your question, yeah, I'll, I'll restate. I was getting on okay. a tangent. All right. So just just to kind of start from a little bit before so did you did did you provide any plug any numbers into the upcharge calculator mr Strickland? on the harnesses yes yes on the harnesses i did okay i can't and sell then, parts at cost obviously and so what number did you how did you come up with your figure for the um fuel injector harness it was a percentage. I can't tell you. I can't remember what it was. You just cut yeah. it up by thirds and then plugged it in. Yeah. So you did the 336 by three, plugged that in, and that gave us a 194 a piece. And then you got the 583 through that. Yeah. Okay. The same thing for the injector wiring harness? No. So what injector, that anything that comes from Napa and O'Reilly's automatically generates into my computer. Anything I buy online, I can't plug that into my computer because my system doesn't recognize it. So I have to come up with the pricing of it. Okay. And so how did you come up with the pricing of that? Of the injector wiring harness for $69 as seen here in exhibit nine? That's... So there, again, there was, it takes six. I ordered six from one vendor. They didn't have six in stock. So they refunded me for the one. Then I, I found another one online, another OEM one online, and I purchased it. That's where the $69 comes from. Then you put all six of those together and then you upcharge it by a percentage and then you divide it. There's two per harness, there's two cylinders per harness. So you divide that by three. And that's how you come up with the, the final number. Okay. Which is still probably just a little bit higher than one of those harnesses would have come from OEM from Dodge. And it's the exact same harness. Your Honor, I, I have no objection otherwise. All right. Well, I thank you for answer, asking those questions. Some of those I had. Um, those are admitted as plaintiff's exhibits. Let's see. Nine and, well, let me see, eight and nine. Correct. Admitted. Mr. Dean, I think it's back to you now to finish with your okay. agenda. Uh, show you next what's been marked as place is number 10. Can you tell me what that is? Okay, so. This kind of explains my matrix to a, to a certain extent. I don't understand how it works, but I went up and I looked the exact same part number up as what we used in Mr. Hunter's truck. I looked it up, I believe it was a day, maybe two days ago, and did a just a regular ticket for a John Smith, nobody. Um, I downloaded the exact same injector that I put in Mr. Hunter's truck and I uploaded it into my system. When I uploaded into my system, it automatically generated the price. It automatically generated everything. And then that's what come up in exhibit number 10. So evidently when I did this job and 
early <coughs> in 23, the pricing was considerably lower because now the injector has gone up. And your honor, uh, essentially, plan is exhibit number 10. You know, we wouldn't typically do this way in a you know, court case if we were in person, but since be doing this via Zoom, essentially it's meant as a monster of exhibit, but uh, that that's the reason for it, um, just to show how that, that system works. We have plaintiff's exhibit number 11 here, which is also meant for demonstrative purposes as well. Can you tell me what that is, Mr. Stripper? That is the exact same injector. It's a new OEM. It's, it's not OEM. It's not a Dodge part, but it's OEM certified. So it's the same. It meets the same certifications that Dodge has if you were to put their injector in. And again, that that's, just that's what you ordered online for him. No, this is the Napa. This is Napa's. This is the, the okay. auto care center part of it. So if I was to buy this injector today, that price, which, which I gave $401 and some odd cents for in 23. Now, if I was to buy that injector, it would cost me $527. Okay, so 401 to 527, that's how much the price has come up. Um, also, it when I put it into my matrix, it came up with the 401, it came to 693.74. With the 500, the injector today, if I was to buy it today for 527, it would go on to an estimate a bill today for $810.78. That is the upcharge matrix that Napa Auto Care has put into my computer. Okay, so. So are you moving to admit those, Mr. Yes, Your Honor. I've interrupted so much. Uh, Mr. 11, or excuse me, 10 and 11, and then that'll, I think that covers all of our exhibits. Mr. McClendon, any objection to plaintiff's exhibits 10 and 11? No, 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 no. All right, plaintiff's exhibit 10 and 11 are admitted. Well, has previously been admitted. Hmm, Mr. Dean? All right. um, Mr. Strickler, was there anything unusual about the way this repair went? Anything that took additional time? Or was this a standard injector injection injector replacement on a on this style of diesel engine? As far as the injectors go, is it straightforward? It, it goes just like they always do um nothing out of the ordinary other than the batteries and the starter everything was normal okay so mr uh, hunter did he did he provide you an attempt to provide you with a check he did and when did that happen and how did that happen um <clears throat> on august 8th um I tried to get the sheriff's department to do a theft of services. Um, Officer Cordell came to my shop and we talked about it. And he said, and I, I don't want you to say what he said other than he wanted to try and get a hold of Mr. Hunter to try and see if he would just pay the bill to where they didn't have to file any charges. Um, so he said to give him 24 hours. So that was on the 7th. On the ninth, he showed back up. He, he said he would be back after five on the ninth. He showed back up after five on the ninth and tried to give me a check for $2,000. I refused that check just because the way things had already gone, I wasn't going to accept partial payment. I wanted payment in full. And to be completely honest, I probably wouldn't take a check anyway at this point. Um, and... At that point, they said that they had decided that it was going to be a civil it, matter. It doesn't. It, okay. In regards to that, to those decisions, it's, that, that's not what I'm asking you. Okay. Sorry. Um, so going back to uh, refusing that check, is are you simply asking the court to to grant your judgment as prayed for an amount of seven thousand eight seventy six forty one? Yes, I am. That does include some storage fees and uh, and interest, correct? Yes, it does. 
And if the judge, uh, if the court would find that uh, interest uh, at that rate was inappropriate, are you at least asking the court to impose prejudgment interest rates set by statute? Yes. And essentially, the billing that you're requesting is as set forth in plaintiff's exhibit number one, correct? Yes. Now, I'll be any further questions at this time. Uh, Mr. Dean, if, if you would please uh, summarize uh, based his testimony what it is that he's seeking. Uh, yes, Your Honor. We have a. Uh, uh, Essentially, the plaintiff was, is requesting that the billing uh, as submitted in the plaintiff's exhibit number one, which has uh, essentially claimed for $7,876.41, be granted. Uh, that does include $1,200.20 uh, that are represented by 50 day storage fee and 30 day 10% late fee, which is just 10% interest charge. Um, the court disagreed with that portion of the claim on the interest. Uh, we would ask the, uh, uh, in the alternative that the court grant prejudgment interest on what's known as a, on what is a liquidated known amount um, that's been in this building uh, from the, basically the date that Mr. Hunter was advised that the vehicle was completed, which was back on June 13th of 2023. Very well. All right. Any other questions on direct, Mr. Dean? No, no further questions on direct, Your Honor. All right. Mr. McClendon, cross-examination. So we're going to rewind a little bit here, Mr. Strickland. Um, Let's go back to your conversation with Mr. Hunter originally. Um, so can you can you go over it again? So start, start from the top. You saw Mr. Hunter and you said you thought it was an injector, correct? Uh, the first time I talked to him, he was driving through the back of the shop and I happened to be in the parking lot and he asked me if I would be interested in working on this vehicle. And he thought that there was an injector bad and I gave him a kind of a time frame that I could have the vehicle and then kind of a time frame it would take to, to get the work completed. Um, he said that would be great. I gave him a time to bring a day to bring the truck up. He brought the truck up and we talked about it. Um, basically informed me that he thought it was an injector. Okay. And did you at any time agree that it might be an injector as well? Not until after I scanned it. Okay. Like I said, the, the pass-through harnesses could also be a problem. At that point, the pass-through harnesses tested fine. Um, the And it turned out that it was two injectors that were bad after okay. diagnosis. And was was Mr. Hunter there at that time, or was this after he no. had already left the shop that you'd done? Your he had already left. Okay. At, that point, at that time, I think we were two to three weeks behind. We'd had a couple jobs go sideways, and I just have a two bay shop, and it was just there. It was nothing was working right at that time. Right. Uh -huh. So when you talked to Mister Hunter again about the work to be done, um, what did he say to you? I informed him that there was two bad injectors, and that basically on a high mileage vehicle like that, that I would recommend to do all six, just because if I wasn't going to charge him any more labor, but while we're there, we should do the other ones. It's only going to be parts that we should do that because he could get a week down the road and it could drop one of the other four injectors. And then we'd be right back at it again, doing the exact same labor claim to fix another injector. So it's easier. It's better for the customer. Everything. If we do all six at the same time, that way they're all under warranty. Everything is taken care of. And um, did you provide him any kind of pricing as to what that might look like? No. None at all? No. You didn't say, I, oh, we talked be about the, the, first, the first couple injectors. We did talk about pricing on that. And what did that look like? I couldn't tell you. It's been over a year ago. I know it wasn't $400 because that's what I get for the injector. And I can't sell it for what I get it for. That's what I got it for at that time. Let's put it that way. 
So you had, you're telling me here that you had no suggestion as to what the price might wind up being? Objection mischaracterizes the testimony. I think it's a fair question. I'll overrule. I I do not I did not do an actual estimate on it. No. Um, if in discussion we talked about pricing, then I can I can guarantee you that it would not have been what I give for the part. I can't tell you what I would have priced that part at at that time because it's been over a year ago. But I, I can tell you it wasn't four hundred dollars. So even that being said, did Mr. Hunter provide you with any kind of idea of what he wanted to spend? No. On this repair? No. Nope. He didn't he didn't say he didn't want to spend a whole lot of money? No. And just so we're clear here, Mr. Strickland, not to dive into your finances or anything, but do you think that 7500 or even the original $6,000 bill, do you, would you consider that not a whole lot of money? Or do you, do you think that's a fair amount or a, uh, a larger amount? Considering that if you were to have it done at Dodge, it would have been $9,000. I consider it fair. But if if you were saying you didn't want to spend a whole lot of money on the truck, would that be a whole lot of money? That was would that be said, more than so. you? Would that be would that be more than you expect to spend? In my opinion, is that what you're asking for? Yes. In my opinion, I would do all six because I'm a mechanic, and that's the way it should be done. But but if you weren't a, a mechanic and you were just trying to get the truck up and running again, but I am a mechanic, and I wouldn't do it that way. I, I, We'll move on, Judge. Um, and just a curiosity here. Um, uh, when it, on the phone log you provided, why instead of why did you just write down the dates instead of you know providing the actual phone bill? Because you said you had the phone bill. At that time, I was through a different provider, and I was just going off of what I downloaded or I was looking at on my phone. So you, so you had to download it, and you had it on no, your phone. That you it was on my it. phone. I've, I've so switched you taken a screenshot of it. It, it was on my phone. It was on your phone, so you could have taken a screenshot of it? I guess I could have, yes. And so you, I mean, this is important stuff because you thought to write it down but you didn't think, hey, the actual bill might be a better form of proving this up? Well, in hindsight, yes, but this is the first time I've actually had to go to court to get paid for a bill, so I didn't know at that time kind of how this all process worked. So I was just taking the information that I had and documenting it in the best way that I knew how at that time. And you didn't think it'd be easier to just take a screenshot and save it on your phone in your picture roll? I'm not a very tech guy, so no. Okay. Um, so let's go to the bill that you sent, Mr. Hunter. Um, would you agree with me that that's not a complete picture of the invoice that you sent? We'll, we'll refer to uh, plaintiff's Exhibit 11, Your Honor. Um, is that not a complete copy of the invoice? It shows the prices, but it doesn't you, include all words. Are you sure? You don't, excuse me. Are you sure you don't mean plaintiff twelve? I, I said twelve. Oh, I thought. You sorry. Said, I'm sorry. I missed. It. Sorry, Your Honor. No problem. Okay. You may need to repeat the question there, Counsel. Since I sorry interjected. So you would agree with me that that's not a complete copy of the invoice, correct? No, that is a that's a picture of the invoice that I could fit in, and I could fit all the the main billing information in and make it large enough to where it could be seen. Mm. At this at this point, when I sent this picture, the other the lower half of that that estimate bill, whatever you want to call it, had never come into play. I was not going to charge him the storage fee. I was not going to charge him the late fee. I was not going to charge any of that. 
I just wanted him to take care of his bill. So that's why he got a cropped copy of that bill. That's what he owes. Then when he couldn't read that and wanted me to send the hard copy, I sent the complete hard copy and I highlighted the bottom part where it says the storage fee part and the late fee part. I highlighted that to where he would, he would see that I was trying to be upfront about it and I wasn't going to charge him that. And then after he came and got the truck is when I added the late fee, the storage fee and everything else to that bill, to the original amount of that bill. So you decide you weren't going to charge him in the original and then you decide later on to charge him. Yeah. If somebody comes up to my lot on a Saturday with a spare key and takes a vehicle that I have 6,000 and some odd dollars invested in, then I, that's going to kind of, and it's set there for that long with no communication, then yes, then now you buy, by that it's, it was due. I was just trying to be nice and not going to charge that. But if you're going to let it sit there for 50 days and then come get it with a spare key and not even call or return phone calls for 50 days, then yeah, you can pay the late fee on that. This is also the first time I've ever charged a late fee or a storage fee in almost six years of service in my own shop. Um, Eric, have just a minute to get this over to me, Your Honor, uh, so I can send it to. I have an exhibit here I'd like to introduce. Um, I do have one that, that you are offering uh, for the Bosch fuel injector. Are you sending another one? Yes, it's a new one that I didn't have originally. All right. So, do you want this first one that you sent to be what, Defendant's A? And that one, Defendants B? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. If you'll send that to Your me. Honor, we've discussed these exhibits. Mr. McClendon and I have had a chance to discuss these exhibits over the last couple of days, uh, just kind of preparing for today, seeing if we could resolve things. But no objection to them. So uh, admit I'm, one. I'm going to text request. you. I'm going to text you a picture of it here, Paul, so it hopefully comes across. So you may not um, have B yet, Mr. Dean? No. Sorry, Your Honor. All That's right. all right. I, I believe it was mentioned. Okay. Uh, this this one wasn't. Sorry, Paul. Okay. I'll look at it here just as soon as it pops up. Well, do we have any anything other than, does Mr. Dean have anything marked as B, or can I go ahead and reserve B for the one that's coming through? Uh, no objection. Uh, can we reserve no. for the one coming through? Okay. No objection. All right. My phone's messing up now. What a <laughs> it's always something, isn't it? You know, I could go print this right now. Okay, I just emailed it to Missy. And there's no objection to it, Mr. Dean? No, no objection. Okay, so A and B will be admitted, although you haven't offered A yet. Do you want to go ahead and offer it or want to wait? Why don't we just wait? Because you may not want to offer it when it's said and done. But I've, yeah. marked, I've marked the Bosch fuel injector exhibit as defendant A. Okay. okay. Let's see. I'll see if I can. I'll see if I can find a screenshot so I can screen share this with the court. That way, should have just done that originally. Um, that would have made things a whole lot easier. Well, I like to have it. Hard copies. I, I know. So thank you. It'll, It'll be coming. All right. But you can proceed with screenshots. Hopefully, a much clearer version will be coming through. But um, yeah. yeah, this will be marked as Exhibit B, State or uh, Plaintiff, <laughs> or Defendants Exhibit B. 
Very well. Um, so, Miss Mr. Strickland, is this a a copy or a, a screenshot of your Facebook page? Yes, it's Strickler, and yes, that is a copy of my Strickler. That's a screenshot. Sorry. Excuse me. Right. And I'm not reading that very well, Council. But you're saying this is B is a copy of Cliff's Gas and Diesel Repair. What is Facebook or a text? That's what my clients. It's, a, it's Facebook. That's what my clients identified it as, Your Honor. Yes. Okay. And I get for the if the court would like. Uh, basically, it's a screenshot of the bottom part. On it, that's posted on Facebook, it only shows the it, that highlighted portion of the bill indicating the storage fee, ten percent late fee, and then there is text that says, "I have been very laid back about handling this the way uh, this the the way a business is supposed to handle things, but things are changing today, and I'll probably have a few cars for sale in ninety days or so." I believe that's the same language taken directly from the bottom of plaintiff's exhibit one that has been cut off of plaintiff's exhibit two, 12. Right, Your Honor. Okay, all right. So even though I don't have the actual exhibit, I have the actual verbiage and from the exhibit one. Yes. And so just to prove it up some more, uh, so this is a copy of your Facebook page, correct, Mr. Strickler? Yes, it is. it's my, not my Facebook page, it's my shop Facebook page. The one for your shop? Yes. Your Honor, at this time I move to admit uh, defendant's exhibit that's one. B. I think, I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Dean, you said no objection to defendant's that's, exhibit. That's page. correct, Your Honor, no objection. Right. Okay, so Mr. Strickler, earlier you stated you never had the problem of anybody uh, not paying earlier, right? Yep. And so, what is the timestamp on that post? That is February fifteenth, twenty twenty-three. I didn't I believe say that's I, hadn't, a I didn't say that I hadn't had people had problems paying. I said I have never charged a late fee or a storage fee is what I said. But had you had problems with people uh, coming in and paying? Yes, I have. Um, so when you went to, uh, start the vehicle, you, you said there were, it was missing batteries or it needed new batteries, correct? Yes. Uh, you don't keep any kind of shop batteries around for vehicles that may, you know, need a battery and you, you know, want to just pop one in real quick. You just go buy a new battery every time. No. I have two jump boxes that I can use to jump a vehicle on a diesel truck that is basically running off the of jump boxes that are designed to jump cars. It wouldn't, it didn't have enough power to jump start a diesel truck. So did, did you ever call Mr. Hunter and say, Hey, um, we need to replace batteries first. No. So you just went in and spent, I believe it was $400 on batteries and didn't care to tell a guy you were going to do that? Well, in order to do the repair that I needed to do, that was authorized to do, I had to have it running. In order to get it running, it needed batteries. And then as it turns out, it needed a starter as well. But it, isn't it possible that Mr. Hunter probably had batteries? Um, it you know, at his house, ready to fit in there. Anything's possible. It, um, isn't it, I mean, would you like, uh, what's your preference of batteries, Mr. Strickler? Do you have a preferred battery that you use? 
If, if it's for the shop, I go through the Napa store. Mm -hmm. But do you, do you have a preference personally? Would, you, would it be different, possibly? No. I, I have three Napa Legends in my boat. I have two Napa Legends in my pickup. Mr. McClendon, do you need to leave yeah. the screen shot up? Sorry, no, Your Honor. Thank you. Isn't it possible, though, that Mr. Hunter thinks Napa batteries are not good and thinks they're junk and doesn't care to have them put in his truck? That's possible, yes. And if that's the way he wanted, if he would have replaced those batteries and brought them back to me, then I would have taken them off the bill. But that didn't happen either. Um, did you call him to ask if about the starter, if it was all right to replace the starter? No, I did not. So, um, Mr. Strickler, uh, why did why didn't you call him? The uh, a starter is a crucial part of the truck. It, I mean, they can be replaced fairly often, wouldn't you say? Once again, in order to get the vehicle into the shop to do the authorized repair, it had to be run. In order to get it running, it needed a starter. Okay. But um, I guess you had no contact with Mr. Hunter, so you wouldn't know that the starter was still under warranty, did you? No. I didn't have any contact with him from May 23rd until the 1st of July. Partially, though, that is because you didn't try to contact him while you were doing repairs, though. Is that correct? Yep. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Any redirect, Mr. Dean? I'll try to make it brief, Your Honor. Uh, so, Mr. Strickler, in regards to repairs that you're making, if the repair has been authorized, essentially, as you're going through to complete that repair that's been requested. Um, you're going to repair any additional item that's basically becomes a, con a component of getting the injectors re replaced, correct? If it, if it affects the original repair to where I can't complete the original repair, then I would replace it or fix it, repair it as needed. And I have gone as far as people that that have had a, had a problem with doing that, that I have taken my labor off of that and just charged basically my cost on the part. But there again, we didn't we never discussed that because the vehicle disappeared. And Mr. Hunter never came to you to say, hey, what's the deal with the starter? What's the situation with these two batteries? No. Mr. Hunter basically wouldn't speak to you following dropping off the truck and saying, fix the, replace the six injectors. Yes. And he did agree with you that if you're going to be in there, replace all six, even though two of them are the only ones that are currently malfunctioning. Yes. And I wanted to be clear. I believe you you stated this to Mr. McClendon, but Mr. Hunter never said anything to you about I'm selling the truck. We got to keep it at a certain cost on uh, the re the repairs, etc. No. And even though this is a diesel, or even though this engine had two hundred sixty some thousand miles, in regards to the diesel engines, that's that's really not what we call high mileage, is it? It's not at all. Mine has 210,000 miles on it right now. Diesel engines, uh, a Cummins diesel engine uh, produced by, by Ram, or I guess was a, this was a Dodge mm -hmm. model at that time. Yes. What would you expect to be able, that engine life on a, be a, a diesel engine of that nature? With proper Injection maintenance and speculation. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh, 
Objection calls for speculation. Response, Mr. Dean, to that objection. Your Honor, we have a 16-year mechanic who repairs diesel engines. Don't think that's probably calling for speculation. Objection overruled. Please uh, repeat the question. Um, he had already answered, Your Honor, that that was not, would not be considered high mileage on a diesel engine. Okay. And I asked how long, uh, what type of life or mileage you would expect to get out of a Cummins Dodge diesel. And, and I heard the answer. So next question. Well, I actually don't think he actually got the answer out. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought he did. Okay. I heard, I heard part of it. Go ahead. <laughs> I do have a couple trucks that we do for farmers that have 500,000 plus miles on them. And in, in diesel engine world, that's, that's uh, not unusual. Not either. unusual. And Dodge Cummins engines, those are diesel engines. Those are diesel engines been around for quite some time. Is that yes, correct? That, yes. How long have those been around? So the 5.9 was up until 07, and that was that started in 1996 to 07 was the 5.9, and then mid-07 to current is the 6.7 model. And the Cummins engine has that been, well, this particular engine, uh, a fairly reliable and dependable diesel engine? In my opinion, it is the best diesel engine made. And that was the 5.9 that you think is the best, or was it the 6.7? But either one, ma'am. Okay. The 6.7 the is just the upgraded version of the 5.9. It's got more horsepower, and it's a little more user-friendly. And going back to the original uh, conversation, I think you had, had indicated to Mr. McClendon that there was some discussion, uh, perhaps some discussion about costs, but you don't, you don't really call, recall that. No, not the actual number. And did Mr. Hunter tell you, well, before you touch a thing on this truck, you give me an exact to the penny uh, cost on what this is going to run? No, he did not. What did he tell you to do? At first, it was diagnose, figure out what was wrong with it. I diagnosed it. He thought one injector was bad. It ended up being two. Um, we talked about the two injectors. I hadn't had a chance to call him when he came through the back of the shop, so we talked about it in person, told him that the two injectors were bad and that if it was my truck, that I would do all six um, just because if you got one or two, it could have been from if you're taking fuel out of a fuel tank like most farmers do at the farm, there's rust involved. There's everything else. So it could have had a blockage in the injector. We don't really know why it failed, just that it failed. So that can move on to injector three, injector four, injector five, and six. And then we're back doing the same job. Possibly, I've done this before where they wanted to stay cheap, and then we do it again in a month. So that's what I tried to explain to him. If you're going to do it, you should do all of them at the same time. I won't charge you any more labor. Let's just do it right the first time and be done with it. And that's when we talked about the pass through harnesses as well. Yeah, he agreed. Yes. All right, for the questions, Your Honor. Ray Cross, Mr. McClendon. Just to clarify, though, you said on your truck you would usually replace all six, correct? If in any truck did, that comes it, through. Yes or no will suffice. Yeah. If it was my but truck, that's was, the way I would do it. But this is not your truck, right? No. Okay. Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. Very well. Anything further from this witness, Mr. Dean? No, Your Honor. Plaintiff for us. All right. Plaintiff for us. Now, gentlemen, it is 12 o'clock. We had from 10 to 2 reserved. Mr. McClendon. They spend the next 10 minutes discussing schedule and time frame and decide not to come back for a week or two. And at some point, you're going to have to pay more for an attorney than the original bill. I know for the business owner, it's principal, you know, not to be taken advantage of. I'm guessing the customer probably feels the same way. But how much effort is it really worth, especially when you don't even try to negotiate and work it out in person? You just automatically jump to legal options? What would you have done in this situation? Honestly, tell me in the comments. I'm really curious how everybody else would have handled it because I 
don't necessarily react to these situations the same way as the majority of people. All right, Judge, I've got that message out. I'm just going to wait to see if I can get a quick response back. Thank you. We had uh, a couple of exhibits kind of informally handled throughout last half of the trial. This uh, copy of the Bosch fuel injector. I'm showing that it was defense A admitted. Is that what you two are showing? That's what I recall, Your Honor, yes. Yes. Okay. And I have what is defense exhibit B, a copy of plaintiff's Facebook page doing business as Cliff's Gas and Diesel Repair. Folks have that as B. Yes, Your Honor. And what, I'm not showing that admitted. Did you show it admitted, either one of you? Which one was that again, Your Honor? It was the one of the uh, Cliff's gas and diesel repair where on his Facebook, he copied his uh, notice of storage that he's going to start collecting storage. I remember it being presented. I can't, I don't recall as to whether there's a request for admission or. I, I'm showing that it hasn't been. Maybe we are waiting for another witness. I and copied then I it because I used it to attempt to impeach uh, Mr. Uh, Strickler. Your Honor, I, I have no objection just considering it admitted. I, I think it, it was probably requested to be admitted. I know I didn't have any objection if the request was made. I'm fine with the court admitting it right now, so we don't need to go back over it again. I mean, I don't, I don't think any additional witness needs to be called. My client, as I recall, acknowledged that that was his Facebook post where Mr. Strickler sitting next to him shaking his head yes. So. And then uh, somewhere along the line, we've been given a blue page. Maybe it's just blue by happenstance, but it's uh, captioned Greenwood County Sheriff's Office Supplemental Narrative. I don't think that's even been introduced, has it? That would be... Uh, testimony that would be coming from uh, Sergeant Cordell. Uh, Mr. Cordell just said, oh, I forgot. Yes, got to find the link. Um, I'll go screenshot the link to him real quick just to make sure. Hopefully that'll help him a little bit. Okay. That's done, Your Honor. Hopefully that'll okay. take care of it. <clears throat> so he's going to be joining us very shortly, it sounds like. That was the impression I got from his text anyway. He said, oh, I forgot. I'll, I need to find the link. So and now I've sent him the link. So that should get him to us sooner rather than later, I would hope. There he is. Good morning, Sergeant Cordell, and welcome back. Good morning. Sorry about that. I forgot about it. I've got a jury trial today, so... And you had some training. We knew you were very uh, busy and occupied. So, Missy, I think we can go on the record now. We are on the record in the 13th Judicial District. This is District Court of Greenwood County, Kansas, case number 2023, LM81. Cliff's GDR Inc. versus Scott Hunter. All parties appearing as before when we recessed on May 16th, 2024, after the first day of bench trial. Paul E. Dean for the plaintiff, who also appears in person by owner Cliff 
Strickler and defendant appearing in person, that is Scott Hunter, as well as by and through his attorney, William McClendon. We left off on May 16th, 2024 with the plaintiff having called witness one, Scott Hunter, and witness two, Cliff Strickler, and admitting exhibits one through 12. The plaintiff then rested. We were at the noon hour and continued to today. So Mr. McClendon can begin his case. Would you, are you ready to proceed, Mr. McClendon? Yes, Your Honor. And Mr. M Mr. Dean, you're ready? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. Please proceed to call your first witness. Your Honor, the defense calls Sergeant Michael Cordell. Sergeant Cordell, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Please proceed, Mr. McClendon. Mr. Cordell, what's your position mm -hmm. with Greenwood County Sheriff's Office? I'm the patrol supervisor for the Sheriff's Office, the patrol sergeant. And uh, how long have you been working for Greenwood County? uh approximately eight years and did you have any prior law enforcement uh judge are you having a hard time hearing i am i was just getting ready to ask you that question can we crank that mr mcclendon you're when, for whatever reason i'm hearing sergeant cordell and he must be hearing you okay but it's, judge, it's, it's getting, very light. getting very quiet sometimes okay mr yeah mr mcclendon very quiet now i'll try to point my microphone closer to me very good. That sounds much better. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see, where was I? Did you have any prior law enforcement experience before that? Uh, yes, I've been law enforcement full-time for approximately a little over 20 years. 20 years total, okay. Um, Mr. Cordell, uh, do you recall what happened on August 7th, uh, 2023? Uh, yes. Uh, would you care to explain what what you encountered? I was contacted by Mr. Strickler, uh, who wanted to make a report of a theft of service because a customer had come in and uh, picked up their vehicle without making payment for the repairs done. And who was that customer? Uh, sorry, I'm, I don't... I. Totally, I'm actually manning the uh, metal detector at the courthouse during this jury trial until I testify, and so I don't have my computer with me. Scott Hunter, I believe. Let's see. I don't know. Uh, how I introduced the document. I would. Uh, let's see. Your Honor, may may I may I introduce a narrative? You can do that. You can screenshot. Sure. Maybe Missy has it to screenshot. Mr. You offering it for uh, basically refreshing recollection. Yes, you are. yes, Paul. No objection. And I will. I will. Okay, I will so admit it. Okay. Hopefully. But you're using it just to refresh the officer's memory, since he doesn't have his file, or are you wanting to? Yes, it's an exhibit. Uh, both eventually. Okay. Just for the refresher now. Your Your Honor. Uh, if it's going to be offered as an exhibit as well, I, I guess technically I don't really have a big objection to that. However, uh, if this, I know this is a bench trial, but I would still, uh, I, I believe that the last paragraph, because it includes officers conclusions as an opinion regarding law, which are, which is basically in court purview at this point in time, that that should not be considered as evidence to be presented in the case. Uh, because that is an opinion on a legal legal decision, and that's what we're here for, for the judge to make a determination. So it, there's no objection to admitting it beyond just recollection of memory refreshed, right. but an exhibit absent. Now, which, how are we marking these? It's a, I show a front and back. What do you folks have? There's three pages. Um, okay, I'm missing a page, I think. Missy, do you have all three pages of, of Sergeant Cordell's narrative? I don't know that 
I got that. If, if Mr. McClendon, you can. If do you have a door you can forward that real quick, William? Otherwise, while you're doing your, uh, if you want to ask him some more questions, I can I can scan this real quick with my phone and forward it to Missy. If that's now, if Missy gets it, she could probably run a copy down it, to the deputy. It's on e. It's on eFlex. I know that, and I can email it to you here real quick. Okay. okay, it's on eFlex in this case. I can print it out real quick. If you could run it down, yeah, I'll you send it, it to you right now. My apologies. I was very prepared last time, and then this time I've got so much going on, and now I'm doing courthouse security that I just I don't even have my computer with me. Now, last time you waited two hours, and we didn't call you. So <laughs> Hopefully they're not out asking you to check the parking lot <laughs> violations in front of the courthouse next uh -oh. <laughs> in your spare yeah. time. <laughs> Uh oh. Yeah, yeah. We pull that spare time. Okay, I emailed a copy to all of you right now. Okay. Just now, so it should be coming through. Let's let's take uh, we either proceed with questions of of the nature that he can remember, or just give him a few minutes to catch up with that. I'm sure it would be under five minutes for him to get a copy. All right, Sergeant, I understand you have a copy of your report to help refresh your memory. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right, then Mr. McClendon will be back on the record. Same parties appearing as before. And Sergeant Cordell still under oath. So please proceed. Um, Officer Cordell, who was... Uh, the dispute between? It was uh, Mr. Strickler and uh, Scott Hunter. And what was the dispute about? Uh, Mr. Strickler stated that uh, Mr. Hunter had come and picked up his vehicle after repairs were made that he had not made payment uh, for those repairs. So that was what he little, was reporting to me at the time. Excuse me, Deputy, you're getting just a little garbled there. Were you able to... Track that. Oh, well, sorry about that. I'll try to talk louder. Um, well, the, I don't know uh, if Mr. it's the louder than the recording. Had... It may have just been the recording making it garbled. I, I think actually, Sergeant Cordell, that perhaps the, the Wi Fi service dropped just a, a little bit in bandwidth because you, the picture wow. froze and your, your audio became a little bit garbled. Okay. Um, I'll repeat that. Mr. Strickler had advised okay. that. Uh, that he had performed work on a vehicle at the customer's request and that the customer had not paid for the work that was done and that he had come and picked up the vehicle at night after the business was closed without making payment. And what kind of work had been performed on the, the vehicle? I was provided a copy of a, uh, a form that showed that six injectors had been replaced, three pass-through pass -through harnesses, uh, let's see, it was six fuel injectors, a valve cover gasket set, three injector pass-through harnesses, two NAPA batteries, and a starter, as well as the uh, labor for those associated items. And what was the total cost on? Um, um, the, the total listed for parts was $5,497.87, labor of $1,675.20, shop supplies of $20, sales tax of $683.34, and a total of $7,876.41. Um, did Mr. Strickler have any kind of... Uh, record that he had tried to contact Mr. Hunter? Yes, he had a, uh, a handwritten list of, of times he stated he attempted to contact Mr. Hunter uh, regarding the truck and, and make, getting payment for it. But this is just a handwritten list, nothing, you know, on his phone going back and showing you the number or anything like that? Correct. It was a handwritten list of, of attempts to contact Mr. Hunter. Um, did you contact Mr. Hunter later that day? I did. And how did that discussion go? Um, I I contacted him and 
he agreed that he had removed the truck from the property. Um, he disputed the amount that was due for the repairs. Um, he told me that uh, he had talked to Mr. Strickler previously about the two fuel injectors that were bad and, and agreed to have those replaced. But he, he stated that uh, he did not agree to doing all six, didn't agree to the pass-through harness, didn't agree to replacing the batteries, and uh, didn't agree to replacing the starter. He also told me that he doesn't use or like NAPA batteries and that he would have never agreed to putting those in the in the truck. Wow. Did um, Mr. Hunter allude to any kind of um, agree previously agreed upon price? Uh, he he said that uh, he estimated that it would cost approximately two thousand dollars, and that he had no problem paying for labor and parts uh, because he wanted the shop to be able to make money. Um, but he didn't think that it should have cost more than two thousand dollars. Um, and did Mr. Hunter state why he decided to go pick his vehicle up? Uh, he said that the, the uh, as he stated, the uh, estimate that he received indicated on it uh, that any vehicles that were left on the property more than 48 hours after the repairs were made would incur a storage fee. Uh, so he didn't want to incur a storage fee for leaving it there. He also stated that uh, there was a stipulation on that uh, document that said that there would be a late fee for any bills that were outstanding beyond 30 days. So he, he assumed that that was indicative of, you know, having 30 days to pay the bill uh, without incurring that penalty. So he didn't think that that meant that payment was due at the time that he picked up the vehicle. And did you, so Mr. Hunter said he didn't think he had to pay immediately. Did you contact Mr. Strickler after your discussion with Mr. Hunter? I did. And what did that look like? Uh, Mr. Strickler stated that he uh, uh, had gotten approval for the six injectors and the pass-through harnesses. Uh, he, he did state that he did not get approval for replacing the batteries or the starter, uh, but that those needed to be done before repairs could be made. But he did state that he had gotten, definitely got approval for the, the six injectors and the pass-through before he did that work. Um, do you know if Mr. Strickler got any kind of signature or anything prior to completing the work? He stated that he did not get a signature on the estimate before doing the work that he had gotten approval over the phone. Um, did Mr. Hunter um, try to make any motion to rectify this wrong? Uh, yeah, so because he believed that the uh, appropriate amount for the repairs was $2,000, uh, he agreed to write a check for the amount that he felt was due. Um, but the day after our conversation, he did give me a check uh, from Cedar Crest Farms LLC for $2,000 made out to Cliff Gas and Diesel. Uh, and then I brought that check to Mr. Strickler the following day. And what did Mr. Strickler do with that check? Uh, he he declined to accept the check because uh, his his concern was if he accepted partial payment that that would negate his ability to collect the uh, full amount. And were any charges brought against Mr. Hunter in this matter? No. Okay. And why is that? Objection, Your um, Honor. That is a sorry, sorry. Yeah, you're right. You're right. This case. You're right. Um, no further questions, Your Honor, at this time. Uh, Mr. Dean, cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in regards to your investigation in this particular matter, uh, was it your understanding that sometime in July, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Hunter had received? Uh, a physical copy of the bill after it had been texted to him? 
Uh, yes. And so he was able to read the issue of the storage fees um, and decided that that was notice to him to come get the truck because he got a ten dollar ten day per ten dollar per day uh, fee for uh, if it was there forty eight hours after the repair. Correct. That's why he stated he came and picked it up is because of the uh, storage fees. And he didn't do that within 48 hours of receiving the bill, did he? Because he, he clearly didn't wait. He waited until sometime after business hours on August 6th to come in and pick up the vehicle with the second set of keys. That is correct. Did anything in your investigation reveal uh, Mr. Strickler excuse me, Mr. Hunter, ever attempting to directly communicate or question with Mr. Strickler the charges? No. In fact, Mr. Hunter only told you what his position was after you made contact with him about a reported allegation of a theft for services. That is correct. And the $2,000 was his personal estimate as I'm reading your report, correct? Yes, yeah, so, he didn't indicate to me when I spoke with him that that was a prior agreement. That's what he indicated to me he felt uh, was a justifiable amount. So, and you don't, yeah, you've taken the statements from the two parties. You weren't present for any of the prior conversations as to whether or not six injectors had been discussed or not discussed, correct? Correct. I have no evidence one way or the other. You just, you've taken each party's statements that they've given you, um, and compiled them in your report. That's correct. Oh. And in regards to uh, did did Mr. Hunter ever indicate to you that uh, since he would never buy those Napa batteries, that he had replaced them and was going to return them to you with that two thousand dollar check? No. Had Mr. Hunter ever made any statement to you that there's no way in the world that that starter could have been inoperable at some point? Uh, he he did uh, make a statement about the starter. Uh, was the statement that he just not authorized that work? I I do remember him uh, telling me that he didn't authorize it. Uh, didn't authorize the work. I believe he told me that the starter that was on it was under warranty. Um, I don't recall him making any statement about the starter couldn't have gone bad or anything like that. Did he advise you that as long as, as far along with paying the paying for the uh, the two thousand dollars that he estimated that you should owe, and um, clearly didn't offer to return the batteries? Did he indicate that he was going to proceed with a warranty claim? No. Did Mr. or did Mr. Hunter ever indicate to you that he had received phone calls from Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Hunter ever indicate to you that he had received phone calls from Mr. Strickler? Uh, no, he did. He did tell me that he received a, a text message uh, with a, a picture of part of the document. Did he show you the balance of the text message exchange dating back into to June between Mr. Strickler and himself? Um, not that I recall. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Any redirect, Mr. McClendon? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Is Sergeant Cordell released then? Do we need him for anything else? I, I have no need for him, Your Honor. I, I have no need to you call thank him. You. Thank you, Sergeant Cordell. Sergeant thank Cordell, you. you are excused from your subpoena released at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McClendon, have you other witnesses? Your Honor, at this time, I can call Scott Hunter. Very well. Mr. Hunter, if you'd come back to the screen, please. This is the defendant. So if you'd please, I could do it one of two ways. I could keep you under uh, your oath from a week ago, but I'll go ahead and just give you another for refreshment. Um, at this time, sir, would you please raise your right hand? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes, I do. All right, thank you. Please proceed, Mr. McClendon.
So, Mr. Hearn, just to kind of go back over what we had stated previously, um, what did you believe the final balance should roughly have been? $2,000 for parts of labor. Okay. And I, where did you? I'm sorry, Mr. McLennan. He cut in and out there. Can you try that answer again? I was of the opinion, Your Honor, that the expense should have been in the neighborhood of $2,000 for replacing the two injectors and its labor. And where did you get this um, uh, estimate from, that you did yourself from? Uh, having had vehicles worked on, and also I researched it on the computer, on Cummins Forum sites, and that's pretty much a standard. Your Honor, then I want to object to the, to based upon foundation for his answer as to uh, the evaluation that he's come up with, to be searching on forum common sites. Uh, that's that's clearly would indicate that he does not have foundation to be presenting that opinion. Um, I'm going to su sustain the objection that. We don't know if the information is reliable. It is hearsay. And uh, so we don't know if he has a proper foundation to testify from or not. Um, what was your understanding of the work to be done? It had a miss in it and he was being replaced the injector that was bad and he later said that had two of them that he wanted to replace and that was the sum total of the work and he would need a new valve cover gasket you said it would or wouldn't need a new valve would cover. okay at any time did you talk the discussion of placing a injector pass through harness no and it wouldn't have needed one, uh, most likely because it was less than a year old. Had you previously replaced the injector capacitor on it? Yes. You're saying you replaced it within the year? Yes. Black, so you want uh. Did Mr. Strickler provide you with any prices, pricing options on his uh, work to be done? He told me that the injectors would run in the neighborhood of $400. And that's the only thing that he ever priced. And was this consistent with the uh, with your parts lookup that you had done on the internet? Yes, it was. And these, and and looking at these parts, you looked at popular resources such as O'Reilly's. Yes. Um, Your Honor, I'd like to refer. I'm sorry. Uh, can you say that again, please? Your Honor, I'd like the record to reflect that Mr. Hunter is referring to um, Defendant's Exhibit A. Send the screenshot. Exhibit A, which has, by agreement, been admitted uh, prior to hearing today. So, Defendant A is admitted, and I will take note that that is what he's referring to. Hearing no objection, you may proceed. And uh, There was no objection when it was admitted, so go ahead, please. Sorry, Your Honor, I, was, I had no objection to him clarifying what exhibit he was referring to. Yeah, I still don't have yes, to object. I, I realize after I made that comment, you had not objected to it. So, counsel, Mr. McClendon, please proceed. What was the uh, first contact you'd had with Mr. Um, Strickler? Did you drop the truck off? When he called to tell me that he had gotten it in and the number one injector was hung open and it was definitely bad and he thought we needed to replace the number five injector too and what day did that happen on 
It would have been in May. I don't think this has records going back that far. You don't. Okay. Did you have any other contact with Mr. Stickler after? Um, or me, go down a different line. Um, and so you would, did you agree to replace the replace one and five? Yes. Did you repl agree to replace any other injectors? No. Did you agree to any other work to be done to the truck? No, just the uh, just the injectors, and naturally, it would need a new valve cover gasket when you're going back together. And what was what was the next contact you had with Mister Strickler? He at one point said that he was having trouble getting caught up. He'd had some vehicles that was running him behind schedule, <laughs> and that he wouldn't be able to get the pickup out quite as quickly as he had thought he could and would. And what uh, time frame was that? I'm sorry, uh, that was short. I'm hearing you very well, Mr. McClendon. Approximately what time frame was that conversation? Shortly after the the phone call where he told me that it was going to need a number one injector and probably a number five. And did you have any other contact with Mr. Strickler? From time to time, I would see him at, at or around his place of business because he's in the back side of East Side, and I would buy fuel there every day. So would see him. It's it's not like I wasn't available. Did you, did you ever approach him? I'm sorry. What was that? Did you ever approach him while you were feeling? Uh, at his side? Uh, yes, the day that we discussed the fact that he was running behind and I told him that that was not a problem, it wasn't an issue. Uh, I was just going to get that pickup ready and advertise on Purple Wave to sell it. Did you have any other contact with Mr. Strickler after that besides seeing him at his side? No, not until we got uh, not until we got the text, the, the stuff we've already discussed. Mr. Hunter, what why did you go pick up the vehicle? Because when he sent me the the hard copy of the bill where I could read it, which we would have received. Uh, on or about July 21st, it said right on it that anything after 48 hours, you started paying a storage fee. And that was already going to be day three. We went to pick the pickup up and brought it home. And I knew that we needed to, to discuss his discrepancy as is already in writing in a text to him. Uh, what day did you go pick up the vehicle? Sorry, I can't hear the question, Mr. McClendon. What day did you go pick up the vehicle? Uh, Let me look at the calendar here right away. The question was, when did you pick up the vehicle? Yes, Your Honor. The afternoon of the 23rd, July 23rd. Do I understand correctly that was a weekend when the business was closed? I don't know if it was closed or not, Your Honor, but it was, it was Sunday on the 23rd. Sunday, thank you. Did you have any other contact with Mr. Strickler after you picked up the vehicle? 
Any other questions after I picked up the vehicle? Hey, the question? Any other contact, Your Honor? Oh. Yes, I had a conversation with him after that when he called me up and accused me of theft, that that's not the way he does. And I told him, he said, well, let's, let's get these discrepancies worked out. And that call would have been on the 24th, uh, Monday. The day that the pickup was picked up. The day that it was or the day after? The day after. Okay. Uh, did you and Mr. Strickler have a conversation relating to pricing or trying to resolve those discrepancies? He called and told me that I I had had stolen from him, and that was pretty much the end of the conversation. I mean, he was very mad. Is short and to the point, and didn't didn't care to discuss it. So I figured we better just put together an estimate and hand him money that we thought it was worth and go from there. Did he start building that estimate? Can you hear him, Mr. Dean? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Sorry, I was muted. I was talking about the flight just a minute. Okay, go ahead. Well, I, I had a good idea ahead of time of what it should cost because I knew what injectors should cost to be put in the thing. Uh, the labor that he showed on his bill was was quite fine. And do you have any other contact after... Um, the twenty the phone call on the twenty fourth with Mr. Um, Strickler to try to resolve this issue. No, after he we went through sheriff's departments in in two counties and Greenwood County, they informed me that Mr. Strickler was accusing me of theft of services. I gave my report to them and, and let it let it go to the law enforcement. That was your conversation with Mr. Cordell, correct? Yes. No further, no further questions at this time, Your Honor. Last examination, Mr. Dean. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> so, Mr. Hunter, you I believe we'd already gone over this last time, but you had uh, you'd received a text back in June telling you the truck was done, correct? June 13th. Yes. July 7th, you received it, and you, you didn't make any contact from June 13th clear into, Judge, do we still have you? Um, and you, you uh, then uh, received, you didn't make any contact with Mr. Strickler from June 13th through at least July 7th, correct? No, that's not correct. All right. What did After you, what did you just, hold on. What did you discuss between those dates? I went by his shop to discuss the whole thing, pay for the truck, get it out of there. And I was told that the shop was closed for a week or 10 days. He was out of town, something, a family matter, maybe a new grandchild, and he was gone visiting. Mr. Strickland, do you recall your testimony from last week? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Hunter, do you recall your testimony from last week? Yes, I recall having spoken on here. Do I remember all the dates yet? It was things that I don't have in writing to a certain extent. Would you agree with me that you never mentioned anything about Mr. Strickler being gone for a week to 10 days and that you'd made attempted to make contact with him? Actually, I do believe we did discuss that, sir. 
Your Honor, I just asked the court to take notice of the record that's already before the court. Uh, oh. I, I will do that. I will review that. But it, it does seem to me I heard something about a grandchild being uh, born, but I don't remember exactly where that conversation fits. So I will re review the record and take judicial notice, counsel. You know, I, what I would say, what I would say is I don't believe the record would reflect he ever attempted to come in and, and make any type of payment. And that's why okay. he wasn't that I don't do know. it. Um, that that it, I think there was maybe he maybe attempted to testify to that fashion in regards to why some of the repair time was taken so long. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. So you you don't know when that occurred, but you made that attempt sometime between June June thirteenth and July seventh. Those two texts, correct? That is correct. And then on July 7th, you received a text. It had a bill on it you couldn't read, so you said mail a hard copy. Correct? That is correct. And you're there every day buying fuel, correct? Yes, sir. So on July 8th, why didn't you just go in and get a hard copy and pay it? I told him to send me a bill. I had tried to pay. I told him to send me a bill. I figured it would be forthcoming. We could take it in and sit down and mull it over. We, meaning me and my family, and we would make payment. Also expected to be for the work that I had asked to be done. So you were already suspicious that the bill wasn't was more than what you believed it was going to be? I was suspicious when I sent him the text saying send a hard copy because it appears we have discrepancies. I thought you said send a hard copy because you couldn't read it. We can't read it. It's only half the bill, the bottom half of the sheet is not there. And I yeah. also I also put in text form that there are discrepancies. You were to send a hard copy of the bill that is readable. You did send a text, but it won't enlarge a print for me. That will need sense, so it's readable as there are discrepancies. So what's the difference between him mailing you a bill and you just going there since you're there every day, as you indicated, and picking it up on July 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, any of those days and just uh, taking care of it? You've been, to, you've been given a hard copy at that point in time if you just uh, asked for it, would you not? Was it illegal, sir, for me to ask for a bill to be sent? I'm not. You don't get asked questions, sir. I'm asking you questions. Okay. The answer is every other vendor we deal with sends monthly statements. Some of them send them out by email, but they're readable, they're printable, they're doable, and they're discussable. That's what I wanted. I wanted where I could read and see what we had and figure out why there was such a discrepancy and go from there and get the matter ended. So it, could, it couldn't have just been handed to you. It had to be handed to you by the U.S. Postal Service is what you're saying. I suppose it could. The report was made that the uh, the vehicle was removed on sometime on August 5th or August 6th. Now you, you're stating that that occurred on July 23rd or 4th. I don't know who said it was on August 5th or 6th. I removed it after I got the letter from him, and it is dated the 19th day of July in Wichita. Are you aware that which Mr. means Strickler a couple of days after that? It would Are you have aware been that Mr. Strickler keeps that uh, those premises under video surveillance. I have no idea. I would hope he would. I'm sure the gas station does too. Now you indicated you just had the uh, the pass through harness replaced in the last year. Yes. By who? What? By whom? Brandon DeBose was the mechanic on it, sir. What was the last name? Brendan DeBose? 
How's that spelled? B U B O S E. D David or B Boy? Brandon Debose with a B. And the last name is D U B O S E, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So, what work did he do on this vehicle? We seem to be having some electrical issues on it. And so we started replacing some things that he thought needed needed done. And when was this work done? Approximately a year before we had it in the shop up there. Do you have that bill? Didn't need a bill. Who is uh, along is along with Ben, an accredited mechanic for the U.S. Air Force? He's my son-in-law. All right, where's he located? McConnell Air Force Base. And. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you were trying, when you've tried to contact Mr. Strickland. So we've got the initial take in the vehicle, the initial or the second contact. Was that correct? You, you had a discussion with him when you first took him to the vehicle, correct? Yes. You had a discussion with him where you say he only mentioned that two injectors probably needed to be replaced. Actually. As a second contact, correct, sir? Actually, there would have been more than two contacts because we spoke with him today that he agreed to work on the vehicle. Then we spoke with him later when we delivered the vehicle on the day he wanted it brought in. And then we had a discussion later on as we just already have put on the record. And so your position is that Mr. Strickler never bothered to mention to you that, hey, these injectors all have the same amount of mileage on them. Probably makes sense to replace them all with two of them. Two of the six already bad. No, it did not. Have you? Re I would uh, not what, have what signed. Did with the, uh, what did you do with the batteries that are in that vehicle? The Napa batteries that were put in in it they're in the pickup they're sitting in my yard and when i talked to sergeant cordell and we discussed it i said if you'll bring my batteries back i'll gladly give him his nap of batteries so mr. i've never cordell had any was, batteries brought back so mr cordell was wrong on his testimony as well he didn't accurately get your all of your words copied down correct i'm not going to sit here and say that man's wrong we had a discussion we were going through a lot of issues at once and it's a matter of his record that it was brought up. Did you work a warranty claim in regards to the starter? I can't. I didn't have the starter. Did you attempt to ever get the starter? No, at this point, it was best for me to stay away from Mr. Strickland. How much did you receive for the vehicle when you sold it? I haven't sold it. So even though that all this work was to get it sold, you haven't sold it. No, sir, we haven't sold it. There's a certain amount of issue with what he claims is an affidavit of lien against the vehicle. Okay, I totally did not know this existed. That's so cool. So it says on here, I, the undersigned, certify that the owner's requesting consent, work was performed, repairs made, or improvements completed, and that reasonable value for materials and services performed were charged. The vehicle has been in my possession since the date of repairs were completed to the present. Therefore, I claim a lien of said vehicle based on these charges. Hmm. So he's certifying that the owner requested the 
work be performed? That's a little iffy. He doesn't have possession of the vehicle. So. No, he does not. And in regards to the affidavit of Lane, where is that? Where 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 did where did you receive that from? It was in your petition. Yeah, so I filed a record anywhere perfecting any type of a lien with that document, sir. Would you agree with that? No. No, I wouldn't agree to it because I don't know anything about it. It says it's a mechanic's lien sale. It shows that he's put a lien against it. Of course, it also shows that he's had an auction. So if you didn't know anything about it, then you don't know anything about it, then you didn't make your decision not to sell the vehicle based upon this paper. What? Would you rephrase, please? So if you don't understand, understand it or know anything about it, you didn't make a decision not to sell this vehicle based upon this paperwork. No, he he explained when he came onto my property that he had a lien against it. And he contacted, I'm assuming, my bank to find out if it was mortgaged in any way, shape, or form. I'm sorry, sir. Was, uh, excuse me, sir. Are you when you say he checked or he had a lien against it? Do you mean Deputy Cordell or do you? No, mean Mr. Strickler. Mr. Strickler. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Mr. Hunter, you had before you ever received a copy of this petition, because you indicated it hadn't been served. Um, you've had possession, according to you, of this vehicle since July 24th of 23, correct? Yes. And you... Uh, well, actually, I think it would have been 23rd. But... Whichever day. And you have it, and even despite not... you, Then you would have had it all the way through dang near December before... Apparently, service was actually effectuated on you and your attorney entered his appearance in this case, correct? December of 23. Yes. So even though you knew, based upon the text, that you had disputes with the bill... You didn't ever attempt to go in and deal with that with Mr. Strickler. You just went in and got the vehicle after hours, correct? It wasn't after hours. I call that after hours or mid afternoon. Your Honor, I don't have any further questions for this witness. Thank you very much. Anything else, Mr. McClendon? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the defense would rest. All right. Your Honor, I have a brief rebuttal. Go ahead, Mr. Dean. Your Honor, I recall my client's stand. <laughs> All right. Since I readministered an oath for him, I'll do it for you. Uh, sir, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Of course, you are still under oath. That's why I said I really didn't need to proceed with the oath. But Mr. Uh, Dean, you may proceed. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Strickler, just to clarify a couple of issues. Uh, when you made the repairs on the vehicle, what did you find in regards to that pass-through harness? Did you find uh, fairly recently installed? No, they were not. Equipment? No, they were not. They were. They looked to be OEM injectors that had been subjected to heat for years. They yeah. were not new. And in regards to the pass-through harness, 
Yes, they were not. New. And they look again the pass through harness, the OEM harnesses. They were not new. They looked to be factory originals. And just for the court's information, which I'm sure she's aware of this, when you say OEM, is that what you mean by the factory original? Yes, factory original. In regards to uh, the uh, the time period in which Mr. Hunter is now saying that you were closed down for a week to 10 days, what do you have any, uh, any knowledge of what he's referencing? No, I do not. The only time my shop has been closed was july of 21 i was closed for a week other than that i may have been gone a couple days but my shop has always been open i have two employees my shop is open five days a week from eight to twelve and one to five did was there any time in uh late june or early july of 23 that you were going any amount of time for a birth of a grandchild or anything of that nature I did have on June 22nd, I did, my granddaughter was born, but we didn't go over until the weekend of, the following weekend is when we went, which would have been the 25th is when we went to see her for the first time, and that was a Sunday. So that's not a day you'd regularly be open? No, we're not open Saturdays or Sundays. So while there's some truth in the in the fact that you acknowledge that yes, you did have a grandchild born last summer, you did you didn't close your shop down for that. No, I did not. And you were never closed at any point in time for a week to ten days. No. Um did Mr. Hunter ever call you and or attempt to walk in since he said he was there on a daily basis and have a discussion with you about anything he was disputing on the bill? No, he did not. And in regards to the time frame in which you reported this to law enforcement about the vehicle being removed, how is it that you knew the date and time? So... I came in on Monday the 7th, which would have been August 7th, 2023, and I noticed that something was missing. I do all the scheduling. I do all the diagnosis. I do everything as far as pickup and release of vehicles, and I noticed that something was missing. So I went in and asked my head mechanic if Mr. Hunter had stopped in to pay his bill, and he had not. At that time, I went in and tried to call Mr. Hunter. And I left a message. I did not talk to Mr. Hunter. I left a message saying that that is not the way I do business. If you're going to pick something up, arrangements need to be made as far as payment goes. Uh, and that, the, but I, I'm, I think I said something about it being 60 days, sitting there for 60 days and no contact. That was on, that was on the 7th. And did you have a way to confirm and be able to actually visualize when he arrived to pick up the vehicle? Yes. The gas station, I work out of the back of East Side Service Station, the gas station that has surveillance, and they showed Mr. Hunter showing up in his maroon Dodge and Mr. Hunter getting out and getting into his other Dodge and leaving in his Dodge on Saturday, August 5th of 2023. And that's what you reported to law enforcement? That it, and that's what I reported to law enforcement, and I reported it on that Monday. And that was August 7th? Yes. Your Honor, I don't have any additional questions. That was a, those are the only limited issues I wanted to do. examination of this rebuttal evidence only. Um. <laughs> Mr. Strickler, uh, you said that you were never closed, but was there a period in that between uh, in June or early July that you were not there, but the shop was open? Yes. Okay. And how long was that period? I run a towing service and several other things that I have going on. So I'm in and out as I'm mechanicing. So there's several times that I'm not there through the day. I have two employees that, that run my day to day. But they, your employees do say if somebody comes in and wants to talk to Mr. Strickler, they say he's not here. I, 
I would assume. I don't know what they say because I'm not there. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. Anything further at this witness, Mr. Just to clarify, Mr. Uh, Mr. Strickler, they, uh, would there have been any reason why your employees would say, well, he's going to be closed for the, he's not going to be available for the next seven to 10 days due to the birth of a grandchild or some other family event? No. I don't have anything for you. Anything further, Mr. McClendon? Oh, no, Your Honor. All right. Any other evidence from any party? Oh, no, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Having rested, do the parties want to give any closing? It would need to be brief, if so. Uh, just briefly, Your Honor, okay. um, which is always a little bit of a question on how brief I could say, according to some judges. Your Honor, essentially what I've just argued to the court is we have an issue where uh, obviously we have a credibility issue that has to be determined by the court. That seems to be the primary issue here. Um, I would just argue that... Uh, Mr. Hunter's testimony and some of his dates and times appear to be more convenient than grounded in, in any other way to verify, uh, whether it be through a log that he ever kept or just, just the, the nature and tenor and demeanor of his testimony. Um, I kind of find it hard to believe that if a mechanic said, listen, we are in here for these two injectors and never mentioned uh, repairing the other four since they would all have the same time and where, that wouldn't seem to be just a normal course. Um, again, I think the credibility in the way that the parties have acted in this particular matter is important for the court to determine. Um, in regards to the repairs that even my client acknowledged weren't authorized, they were also required to perform the per repairs at work um, in regards to the efforts to, uh, to get the vehicle to be able to move. The batteries aren't serviceable, they're not serviceable. If the starter isn't working right, the starter is not working. Um, so I, I, you know, I think those are necessary repairs. And I think under Kansas law would come in, and it, even Mr. Hunter indicated that um, he didn't exactly know what it was gonna be. He, doesn't, he says he only agreed to fix two, but then basically just says it was kind of, you know, get it running. Um, it's essentially his testimony as I recall it. And I do believe, again, that Mr. Hunter has, has kind of uh, changed his testimony slightly uh, from last week to this week. Um, that being said, Your Honor, it would also appear to be consistent with somebody who was owed a bill that they've made multiple efforts to contact as opposed to somebody who, oh, well, no, I never heard from anybody. Um, but even though he's there on a daily basis, never went in in, in weeks to try to rectify the issue. Um, on any dispute that he believed he had, instead showed up after hours to remove a vehicle. Um, and I, again, the report, which was made on August 7th, indicates that uh, Mr. Strickler clearly told him that it had been removed on that, that weekend. Um, I think that's consistent with uh, basically Mr. Strickler's veracity on this particular matter and also undercuts Mr. Hunter on this particular matter um because now he's back and clear up to july 23rd that he picked up the vehicle i could go on and on your honor but i i believe that basically the repairs have been authorized and some additional issues that came up and the and the equitable uh equitable theory of quantum merit would require my client to be paid for the work that he did and again, here we have this vehicle that was supposedly the work being done to, to fit, uh, so it can be sold. It hasn't even been sold, and we're a year later. Mr. McClendon, any uh, brief closing? Your Honor, I would I would just ask the court to uh, recognize that first off, begin with. There are some issues as to the credibility of whether or not these all these parts that are being used are OEM parts. They were some of them, as pointed out earlier, were ordered off unknown or irrecognizable websites, and that uh, the 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 quality and you know uh, legitimacy of these parts are not um, known. <clears throat> Um, I'd also ask to remember that not all work was agreed upon. He, he went in and replaced a starter and batteries um, without ever contacting his client to run up 
an extra thousand dollars on his bill when he knew when it was stated that the client his client wanted to keep costs low and that is all i have at this time your honor thank you. gentlemen thank you for your presentations and arguments when mr scott hunter testified on day one of the hearing as the first witness called by the plaintiff He did tell us that he was uh, somewhat trained as a mechanic himself. It wasn't his profession, but he'd done a lot of it. And at this time, he just didn't want to go to the trouble of doing it himself. He didn't have the time. He was working seven days a week uh, during the drought with his digging service. So thinking that it was missing on at least one cylinder, he did take it to the plaintiff. They did have a discussion. There's agreement between the two of them that they did discuss missing uh, cylinders and that it was going to be sold. There was a, kind of a split between the parties as whether the mileage should be considered high or not. Sounds like it had a good number of miles, but the defendant said it was high and uh, plaintiff said he's worked on trucks that have, I think he said up to 500,000 for that kind of truck and engine. But in any event, uh, the, plaint the defendant said he said to keep the cost down because he was just going to sell it. And, uh, keeping the cost down, that sounds like something reasonably a person would say. But that doesn't mean that the plaintiff didn't keep the cost down. Uh, he very well could have cost kept the cost down and the prices are what they are especially in this day and age of 2024 when, or even 2023 when everything just keeps getting more and more expensive. Uh, the defendant testifies that they had a second conversation, which or the plaintiff testified that they had a second conversation, which the defendant denies, um, or maybe he admitted that one. I take that back. He admitted that they did have a second conversation about uh, numbers one and five of the lifters needing replaced. He denies the further testimony that they just the further testimony of the plaintiff that they discussed. Hey, they've got the same amount of miles on all six of them. If two are out now, one may be out next week, and then you'll have to replace that, and and uh, it could be more expensive. And, so they went ahead, according to the plaintiff, and agreed to go ahead and fix all six. And uh, the, that did require the list of parts for the most part on plaintiff six, exhibit one. There was discrepancy over whether the, it needed an injector pass-through harness, whether that was old or not. Uh, defendant said it was new. Plaintiff said it was a from the factory needed replaced. Now, I believe even the defendant agreed that, that two of those gaskets would need to be fixed. And uh, the arguments or statements the plaintiff made, I think makes sense that they would have had that conversation. We just, well, go ahead and replace uh, the six because if you're going to try to sell it and the customer takes it out and tries to drive it and here comes another bad lifter, that's going to be an issue. But as I go through these items on the bill, the ones that the no. defendant says he didn't authorize or ask for includes the uh, changing of the starter, the starter uh, replacement, and... Uh, the batteries, and I do think that, it, that that should have been discussed, the batteries and changing the starter, and plaintiff suggests that it was, defendant says it wasn't, uh, or plaintiff's argument was that he couldn't get it into the garage to fix it, and and uh, if you want the, the, if the defendant wanted the truck to be fixed, it'd have to have the starter replaced, the batteries replaced, and get it into the shed to be fixed. Uh, he certainly couldn't defend it, sell that without a starter and batteries in it. Uh, 
But I would have said, uh, just give the batteries back if you if the defendant dislikes those batteries that Napa sells and and get his own. But that didn't happen, as I heard just moments ago. The batteries are still sitting in the truck in the defendant's yard. And uh, same with the starter. At this time, I find that uh, the section of the bill showing the expenses and the prices charged, as well as the labor, the labor being $1,675.20, as well as the labor $5,497.87, sales tax, uh, or shop supplies, let's see, shop supplies 20, sales tax uh, 683.34 for a total of $7,876.41 is due to the plaintiff and owing by the defendant. And I grant judgment in that amount to the defendant. Now, Mr. Dean, as I understand that that figure does not include storage fees is that correct uh, that should include that did include all of, that did include uh, the where, where did you see that on the bill i mean okay so, 50 days i strike from that the 50 days storage of $500 and the 30 day 10% late fee of $720 so your, your honor if you would go to what's been marked as uh plaintiffs exhibit Okay. And we play this exhibit number one, and okay. the bill's dated August 10th, 2003. It actually, for whatever reason, the billing software populates that under, it, it adds it into the labor. Mm -hmm. But at the bottom, right above that line and the totals, it has 50 days storage, 530 days, 10% mm -hmm. uh, late fee, uh, $700.20. When I... Property report that when I've done the math on this bill, those numbers got added to the those numbers get added in and show in the labor line at six seventy five uh, twenty. Um, and if you add those numbers to the five hundred plus the seven hundred and twenty um, plus the labor and some of the other charges up above, that gets you to the one thousand six seventy five twenty. Well, I'm, I'm also looking at plaintiff's exhibit 12. That does not have the late fee added to it, does it? Is that uh, without those two figures? 12 is the bill that was first initially sent to uh, to the to the defendant. Right. And um, it, no, it, there had not been any of those assessments made. So if I take away from that uh, 7,800, if I take away the storage and the late fees, does that not revert back to the original bill that was emailed of 6,562.20? Haven't done the math on it, so I don't know. Um, I believe, yes, I believe that it should. 6,572.20 is up. That's not quite what the bill shows, 6,562.20. But I, I thought there was some testimony to that effect, but without labor, that sounds correct. Yes, yeah, six thousand five sixty-two twenty. Okay. Now the reason I'm not going to authorize no. the storage and the labor is because I don't believe that there was testimony that the parties agreed to this. Nothing was in writing, so the defendant wouldn't have seen those figures or that agreement, and he didn't sign it. And even the exhibit. Uh, Defense Exhibit two, or Exhibit B shows that it wasn't until uh, February 16th, the 23. Well, that would have been before he brought the vehicle in, but he did put it on his Facebook feed that he was going to start adding storage and late fees. Uh, but I don't see where that, I didn't see any evidence that that was discussed and agreed to before the bill went out. So I'm, I'm going to strike that amount, $500 for 50 days of storage and $720 for 30 day late fee. I'm striking them 
because I think that that is what the evidence supports. But I can understand the plaintiff's frustration in uh, having the vehicle so long without payment. And I think that it's very troubling that the defendant would just go in on on a day off and, and take the vehicle with an extra set of keys. I might come to a different opinion on whether it was only civil versus criminal uh, because he did drive off, the defendant did drive off with batteries that didn't belong to him. If, if he didn't have an agreement for him, he would have trespassed if the, the building was closed. I mean, there are a lot of possibilities, but I don't make any decisions on those possibilities because they're not asked for and they're not really relevant on this particular case. Uh, is there anything else I need to address, counsel? Um, just to clarify, Judge Gr judgment was granted in the amount of six thousand five sixty-two twenty. Yes, I believe is what the court stated just a minute ago. Yes, that is what the court. And stated. then I, I know we had made a request for prejudgment interest. Um, that's in any event. I, however, the court that, overruled uh, that. Uh, is Mr. McClendon? Do you want to be heard on prejudgment interest? Your Honor, um, if the if they just if the court decides to award prejudgment interest, I'd um, ask that they stick to the statute or uh, award statute limited amount, which I believe is twelve percent. Is in yeah, that would is twelve. Yes. Yeah, it it can't be what it's got to be that. Uh, the, I, and I presume counsel's referencing this added paragraph that I'm not considering where it does talk about late fees or whatnot. So, well, I, because this is what I would refer to as a fairly liquidated amount, I believe under the statute, you have authority to grant prejudgment interest because we've been sitting here. Not only is it's not Mr. Trickler has been out almost 10 months in regards to the labor and the materials that he supplied in this beat on this item. But I think I, I would say that essentially I think it'd be, you know, that it wouldn't necessarily, I don't know when the court would want to start that, whether it was going all the way back to the uh, state building or to the filing of the petition, but I would suggest the filing of the petition. Your Honor, if I may, I'd also like to bring to the court's attention that we did, and not to fault Mr. Dean, but we did wait a large amount of time for him to wrap up um, trials and such as well. I will grant uh, prejudgment interest. I will follow the suggestion of... Uh, the date of the filing. I'm, I'm looking at the date of 7-7-23 when the first bill went out through email, but uh, I will grant pre-judgment starting with the day of the petition and of course post-judgment from this date. Anything else? Mr. Dean, I trust you'll file the journal entry. I will get it prepared as fast as I can. I will tell everybody that my system's out the rest of the week, so I'm somewhat flying, I'd say with almost no arms. <laughs> She's gone. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not even going to reference it being one hand. I understand. No -handed. And then, of course, Mr. Hunter, I'm sure your attorney will, if he hasn't talked to you about having a 14 day appeal period to appeal to the uh, clerk of the, I'm sorry, to the Court of Appeals, the Kansas Court of Appeals. And if you do file, I believe thirty for this case is it not, Judge? The, the, I don't recall with what the statute says. Uh, the, we'll follow the language of the statute about appeals bond. There is in the mail. I think on this personal property, basically, would be the amount of the judgment. Uh, it would be the the appeal bond. Uh, that is what I, I typically like to do, but I thought maybe they had a 
And judge, with this being a civil case, I think it's actually 30 days from the day of the filing of the journal. Okay. The, the 30 day follow the statute, 30 days. Okay. All right. So is there anything else we need to address, Mr. McClendon? This time for me, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Anything further? Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Thank you all very much. This hearing is adjourned. Have a great day, everybody. I find it really interesting that Judge Webster notes that she would have considered criminal charges if they were brought before her in this. She doesn't like that he went and just got the truck because he wanted to. That's not how we do things. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. Have a good day, everyone. I will see you soon.